Arch Obler's Plays. The Mutual Broadcasting System has the pleasure of presenting the 23rd broadcast of a special series of plays by radio playwright Arch Obler. Tonight's play, Rocket from Manhattan, will be introduced by Mr. Obler. Prophecy is an easy thing, for rarely is the prophet brought to judgment. Tonight I bring you a false prophecy. The place of our story is a great rocket speeding away from the moon. Yes, away. For the first trip to the moon has finally taken place, and a triumphant airship is now rapidly returning to the Mother Earth. Here, then, is a story about a tomorrow 55 years hence, September 20th in the year of our Lord, 2000. <laughs> If you're worried about our landing, I'm not. You worried, Reynolds? No, sir. Everything's in perfect order. Sure, Doc. There's going to be a round trip. Anyway, there's 24 hours before we have to worry about that. Yes, Doctor. It's a time for celebration. Oh, I'm glad to be alive, boys. I'm glad to be alive. I'm, I'm riding, riding on, on a rocket train, and soon I will arrive. Reynolds. Oh, Major Reynolds. Are you men out of your minds? You, Major Russell. Reynolds is still a boy, but you're a mature man. Please act mature, eh? Oh, but I'll grant you that our adventure has gone well. Well is right. We've been to the moon. My congratulations. Hello? Thank you, Major. Thank you. I'll put the medal on my other chair. Will you men listen to me? We're 48,000 miles from the Earth. And headed right for it. We're not there yet. Doc, pardon the expression, but you're a gloomy Joe. I am a realist. The doctor, the possibilities of anything going wrong are remote. Surely we're entitled to relax a little and relish the fact of what we've done. Yeah, we've done it, Doc. Even if we never get back, we've done it. We've been to the moon, and it'll always be there on the books. I'm not interested in becoming an historical fact, Major Russell. The data we've collected, that's my only interest. May I ask you and Reynolds to get back to your post? Oh, but everything's going like clockwork. Look at the gauges. But we are out of radio contact with the Earth. Yes, sir. But we are on course. Doc, what is wrong? Wrong? What should be wrong? Well, the kid's right, Doc. Ever since we made the circle and started back, all these days you've been acting as if we didn't make it. We've gone 243,000 miles, and we're three-quarters of the way back, and we're in, Doc. We're in. So what's the matter with you? How old were you, Major, when the Second World War ended? Oh, about five. What's that got to do? And you, Reynolds, you weren't even born. No, sir. I was 21 on that day in New Mexico when they set off the first chain reaction. 21. Doc, you mean to say you were in at the beginning of it? Of course he was. Dr. Chamberlain was one of the original research men in the Atomic Bomb Project. Back in 45. The only one of them alive today. Well, what do you know? So that's why you wanted to make this trip, Doc. I mean, you... Yes, Major. You wanted it as a substitution for what you missed as a boy. The excitement and glory of war. Oh, right, Doc. It's that's... true, and Reynolds here is young and idealistic. And the scientific wonder of it was what he wanted. And I... I was there at the birth of an era. Now atomic power is driving me into space, back to the Earth where it all began. And I'm thinking... Yeah, Doc? That's not pertinent to any of this. We've no time to discuss our emotions. There's work to be done.
Airspeed 23486. Airspeed 23486. Interior temperature uh, 68.2. Interior temperature 68.2. Well, that's it. Yes. Any radio contact room? No, sir. How about that, Doc? Unfortunate, but not very vital. We're definitely on course. How much longer will it be, Doc? Ten hours. At the most, ten hours. In the middle of LaGuardia Field. That's where I'd like to land. I hope not. Uh, Texas. Isn't that it? Sure, sure. We'll hit the flats right on the nose. If the auxiliary jets work. They worked on the moon. They'll work on landing. We're the good luck boys, Doc. We can't miss. <laughs> you have the optimism of a 16-year-old. Then would you better get back to your radio, try phone contact. Yes, sir. Major, check the jet temperatures. Uh, right jet, 1580. Right jet, 1580. Left jet, 1583. Left jet, 1583. Speed, 24832. Speed, 24832. XR1 calling CQ. XR1 calling CQ. Hello, hello, hello. XR1 calling CQ. XR1 calling CQ. Hello, hello, hello. Any luck? No, sir. Put your transmitter back on automatic. Yes, sir. <laughs> Why do you laugh, Major? I was just thinking about how many millions of telescopes are turned in our direction. Yes? What you said a few hours ago. I mean, about my wanting the excitement and adventure. That's true, you know. I'm 60 years old, and I guess I just lived for this chance. The Army had no okayed my going. Well, here I am. Once we land, I'll admit, frankly, I'm going to cash in on every bit of it and have myself a time. You know something? I get the feeling kind of depressed when I think it'll soon be over. Well, there's no reason for depression, is there? I couldn't answer that. Why not? And you've been wondering, undoubtedly, why ever since we left the moon, I've been acting strangely. That's right. I've never believed in predestination. And yet there's been sort of a motivation of faith in my life. At 21, I was part of that research team trying to adapt atomic power to military purposes. When that first bomb went off over the New Mexico desert, a newspaper man repeated the words, What hath God wrought? And no one quite knew. I've been waiting 55 years for the answer. I think I found it a few hours ago on the moon. And it's an answer full of horror. a few more hours, isn't it? Yes. Will we have to put on our compression suits the way we did on the takeoff? Yes, of course. Uh, Doctor, may... May I ask you something? Yes? Uh, before, you spoke of finding an answer on the moon. And, and then you didn't say any more. Well, I've been thinking about it. I was wondering if it was something that the... Major couldn't understand, and that's why you didn't speak of it further. And now you want to know? Yes, sir. I, I haven't lived anywhere as long as you two have, but my life has been built around atomic power. My dad, he was one of your men. Why, ever since I was a child, becoming a physicist like dad was, and you are, and Dr. Oppenheimer, and all the rest, why, that was it. Now, all of a sudden... The way you spoke before, as if all our research has been criminal. Do you mean that? You... Collision radar. Get at it. What's the matter? What's the matter? Object approaching. Where? Where? Fifteen degrees west. There it is. Meteorite. It's a meteorite. It all. Um... the closest. It was indeed. This sardonic indeed to collide with a meteorite at this point in our journey. I, I use a stronger word than sardonic, Doctor. Yeah, like fatal. It's all clear. Well, I, I'd better get back to you know, my... Reynolds. Reynolds, you asked me a question before and I want to answer it. You too, Major Russell. I want you to hear this. Sure. Reynolds overheard what I said to you. That I'd found the answer to a very old question on the moon. 
He said that he felt that somehow I thought all of the research on atomic power had been criminal. No, oh, young man, I don't believe that. Not at all. Criminal to know more about a way of nature? No. The answer I, I found was something else. I hadn't even an answer, perhaps only a theory. When we came within a hundred miles of the moon and then began to deaccelerate, to turn back, what did we see through the observation ports? Well, Doctor. Sir, no, doesn't... please, let me tell you what I saw. The craters of the moon. Great, gigantic craters, and as we came closer and closer, the look of them was so familiar. Not because I'd seen them through telescopes and in photographs, but for some reason that I, I couldn't quite understand. Craters of the moon, and suddenly, at the very moment when we'd come as close as we dared and our ship swung in an orbit to return, suddenly I knew. It was a memory of another crater I'd seen 55 years before in New Mexico from an observation plane high over the ground a few hours after the first atomic bomb had lit the sky with a new sun. Yes. The crater in the crust of the earth that bomb had left was the same as the craters of the moon. Do you understand? The crater our bomb had left on the earth was the same as the craters on the moon. So what? I don't get it. Yes, Doctor. What are you getting at? Why, the crater in that desert was a thousandth of the size of the ones you're talking about. I suddenly began to think. Was it not possible that the moon had gone through the same evolutionary processes as our Earth before our Earth? Yes. Wasn't it possible that men had come into being on the moon, developed their own civilization, had known scientific progress, even as we have, but long before we Earthmen had known it? Say, Doc! You do understand. These men of the moon had discovered the secret of atomic power long before we did, and then had used it to blast and to tear each other. Yes. Yeah. And the craters on the moon, that terrible devastation, was the record of the destruction of their civilization. A final war, which had burned up the very atmosphere and left the moon a dead planet circling endlessly through an airless sky. All right, Doctor. Presuming your theory is correct, that, that the moon men had started through a war, a, a chain atomic reaction that they couldn't stop of. What? what? It indicates that they were fools. Yeah, that's it. Fools. Are we any wiser? Airspeed? Two, four, eighty-two. You'd better cut it down. Right, how much? About fifteen percent. Right. You get anything, Reynolds? No, sir. Would you come here a moment? Yes, sir. Will you help me with this port covering? Yes. Mm -hmm. Either there. All right. Well, try to take a look, huh? Yes, that's it. Uh, 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 there she is. Mama Earth. Reynolds, the cameras? Yes, sir. How much should I run, Doctor? Put it on automatic exposure. Yes, sir. Six more hours, eh, Doctor? Or less. I'm sure we haven't made a mistake and headed for Venus. What are you... <laughs> Oh, it's just a bad joke, Doc. Oh, there's no two ways about it. The outline of the continents, we can't make any mistake about that being our home address. I wonder how much they can see of us. Where are we, six, seven thousand miles out? You know, this reminds me of the time about 25 years ago. The Army sent me up to a thousand miles to take observation photographs. We remember how the atomic reaction motors were then. We got up about 500 feet. Major. Off. What? What? Look down. Look. Hmm? What? Well, I don't see anything. Look, I tell you. Reynolds, come here. What's the matter? Something well, wrong? the doctor says... Reynolds, out. look. You see? Yes. What is it? I see it, too. Bright lights going on and off. What's going on down there? Doctor, are they signaling us? Are they signaling? It's 6,000 miles. Why? Why should they? That's right. There's no such plan. Look at it. It is lights going on and off. But they're all from one area. Can you make out where? North America. Then they are signals. The candle in the window. Your own question. At 6,000 miles? Wait a minute. Are they explosions? Explosions? Major Doctor, is that it? Are they explosions? I don't know.
CQ, CQ. Hello, hello, hello. I'm oh, sorry, Doctor, I can't raise any. Doc, Doc, come here. Yes, but look, the closer we get, they are explosions. Three more hours, we'll know. I want to know now. Reynolds, what's the matter with you? Why can't you make radio contact? I'm doing everything I can. Major. Major. Doc, what are the craters? Look. Craters. Craters? At this altitude, you couldn't possibly... After each flash, I do see them. Okay, okay, what does it mean? Well, what are you looking at me like that for? What does it mean? Dr. Major, something coming through. Oh, what about time? I, I can only hear it faintly. What? What? Please, let me listen. United States. What? Oh. Reynolds, what is it? Tell us. What? Boy, I... I couldn't quite make up. He, he said... Said what? Tell us. War. He said war. Blasting the United States off the face of the earth. Blasting. Right. It, it, it's a joke, isn't it? Isn't it? sending now. What now? It began an hour ago. No warning. Projectiles radio controlled. Point of origin unknown. Oh, it stopped again. The transmission. That's enough. Where's the international police force? What's being done about it? Doctor. Doctor, did you hear it was an attack without warning? Who could it be? What's the idea? The explosions are increasing in frequency. Reynolds! Reynolds, is there anything more coming through? No, nothing. I... Yes. Yes, they started transmission again. All right, let's have it quick. Some station in Midwest. I can't get the call letters. Who cares? He says... It's hell. Ground shaking. No bombs landed near, but air reconnaissance. So gobble, I can hardly make out. Well, well. It started an hour ago. Everything burning. Now oh, it stopped again. There's nothing. Doctor. Doctor, in heaven's name, what do you think it's all about? Stop staring out of the window and talk to me. What are they doing? What do you mean, what are they doing? They're bombing us, blasting us. It's war, but who? I've got to find out. Reynolds, find out who. What? No use, there's no transmission. Doctor, those bombs, where are they coming from? Can't you tell by the trajectory? At this distance? And what difference does the face of the enemy make? It, it It's happening, that's all. Smash them. I always said we should have smashed them. Exterminated them 50 years ago. Oh, they were so peaceful for so many years. And... The flashes are increasing in frequency. Reynolds, get on that radio. I'll try again. I've got to know who, the devils. We had agreements with everyone, the international devils, all of them. Call them devils, I don't even know who they are. Reynolds! You got anything? No, no, I don't. Doctor, faster. Let's get down there faster. Let's open it up. You know better than that. We're entering atmosphere. Increased speed, and we burn up like a meteorite. But I'm an army man. All my life I've been coming through. What? What? The bombs? Nothing can. I can hardly make it out. Keep at it. Panic. Paratroopers. Who? Who? Last message from United States of It's ended. There is no more. We get down there faster. Only 500 more miles. Look at it down there. Our Air Force, protective measures. What happened to them? What happened? Doctor, you, why don't you say something? 
We're going to sit there for hours watching. This isn't a scientific experiment going on down there. They're blasting us to pieces. Us, us. Your atomic bomb, the great secret. Hold it over the world and have peace forever. You said that. Yes, you. I was a kid then. I heard you say it over the radio when they gave you a medal. Hold it over the world and have peace forever. Well, what do you got to say now? We had a wonderful 55 years. What? Everybody had a wonderful time. Reynolds, what's the matter with him? He's gone. No. Let him finish. First, we hung the criminals 55 years ago. And as soon as their body stopped swinging, we left the crowd and each went back to his own house and shut the door. You said the peace would hold forever. I... I said it because... I thought that when the secret was put away, the people of the world would remember the terror. I, I said to myself, now, surely now that they've seen the possibility of the disintegration of their earth, they'll be drawn together once again into the, the family of men as it must have been in the beginning. I, I forgot what years could do. I forgot how quickly forgetfulness comes. I forgot that in only a few years, Hiroshima and Nagasaki would be only... Yesterday's sensations for a nation eager for sensations for today. You keep asking me who's sending those bombs against us, who? I tell you, we're sending them against ourselves. Because had we made our way of life something more than a confused dream of shiny machines and happy endings, those bombs would not be flying at us. I said the peace would hold forever because I thought out of that war at last man had learned that there was no defense against hatred and revenge, but the defense of education for the unity of people. It was a race, gentlemen, against time. And we wasted our last 55 years running backwards on a track of chromium and plastics. And so we've lost. Forever. We've never lost. Look, the blasts are increasing. Doctor, again. look. The color of the blast. Oh, dear God. What? What? Doctor, it's nitrogen, isn't it? Nitrogen, what? The fools, the everlasting fools I've won. The blast, more and more. They started something they couldn't end. The color of the blast, they've set off hydrogen atoms. I, I, I don't know what you... We used uranium, plutonium, and when the initial blast was over, that was all. But hydrogen, that's part of life. One reaction sets off the other, like setting off an endless chain until... Look down there. Blast. Faster and faster. They're spreading. The fools. God help the fools. A sheet of flame around the earth. Doctor, tell me, what is it? It burned up all the atmosphere. Burned up? Reynolds, what does he mean? The chain reaction burned up all the air. Oh, my God. Major, Major, the left jet. Right. Where are we going? There's no air, no life. The moon, the earth, the same. Uh. How much fuel? There's the gauge. Two, three hours? Yes. Yes, I think that's right. Isn't it, Major? Yeah. What? What do we do? You ask that question now? The Major no longer asks it. Do you know the answer, Major? Sure. We'll circle around. Then we'll crash. <gasps> no, 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 no. No, it'll be all right, my boy. My words again. Have peace forever. Another story to tell you today. This one is about a crime in which nature, not man, trapped a murderer. Do you want to hear it? Now, starring Paul Fries as your teller of tales, another story from The Black Book. 
Yes. From the world's most fabulous collection of strange and unusual stories, The Black Book, I've selected a story by Nelson Bond. He calls it On Schedule. Mr. Henry Foster, manager of the Midwestern branch of Updike and Updike Investment Brokers, sat comfortably in the men's lounge of the club car as the train swayed and rumbled over the Jersey countryside. He had the quiet air of a conservative middle-aged businessman and held an expensive briefcase on his lap. He sat there gazing out of the window through the bright noon sunlight at New York's jagged skyline. It made him think of a huge stock market graph. And for the hundredth time, Mr. Foster mentally reviewed the steps he must take. The wheels beneath him sang a deeper note as they hit the downgrade to the Hudson Tube. Mr. Foster studied his watch and thought to himself... In one minute and 56 seconds, this car will enter the darkness of the tube. It will be absolute darkness, for I shall step from the lounge and throw the master switch. Every light in the club car will be cut off. <laughs> yes, my plan is perfect. For the last three nights, Mr. Foster had taken this train from Jersey to New York, stopwatch in hand, plotting his every move. He knew that exactly three minutes and 39 seconds from the time the club car entered the Hudson Tube, it would glide into Pennsylvania Station carrying a dead passenger. Young Prentice, now so casually lounging in the last compartment, smoking a cigarette with Detective Mooney, would be dead. His throat cut by the knife Mr. Foster had concealed in his briefcase. It was rather a shame, he thought, that Prentice must die, but there was no other way to handle it now. There'd really been no other way right from the start. From the very day he'd called the young accountant into his office for a very private conversation. Come in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Foster? Oh, yes, Prentice. Have a chair. You recognize this, Prentice? Well, of course, sir. It's one of our account books. Right. Now, I've made notes here of certain entries in that particular volume that strike me as, let us say, uh, in error. What do you mean, sir? What do I mean? Prentice, turn to page 67, if you will. Well, go ahead. Have it? Yes, sir. Mr. Harriman's account, is it not? That's right, sir. Now then, look at the entry of June 14th. Well, Prentice? Uh, I don't understand, sir. Do you want me to read it? No, Prentice, I've read it. If there's an error, Mr. Foster, I'll check it immediately. Too late, Prentice. $300 is missing. And you're a fool to have taken it. Mr. Foster sat back and waited for the young man to deny everything, or at least to think up some kind of an excuse for having doctored the firm's books. But Prentice did neither. In fact, it almost seemed to Mr. Foster that he was smiling, and this he was unprepared for. If you'll agree not to press charges, Mr. Foster, I'll pay back the money as soon as possible. Prentice, I had entertained rather high hopes for you. Seems a pity... And all for a mere three hundred dollars. May I go now, sir? You'll resign, Prentice, but yes, you may pay back the money. And at least remember that if you must steal, Prentice, make it big, worthwhile. I'll stay down tonight if I may and clean up the work on my desk. If you like. Goodbye, Prentice. Goodbye, sir. <laughs> It was a pity, Foster thought, to lose a young man he'd consider so promising. But at least the young fool might learn his lesson from it. Next morning, Mr. Foster found that he had, and learned it well. 
He was looking through his mail when the telephone rang. It was Prentice. He wanted to see Mr. Forster at once, and curiously, there was no pleading in his voice, but rather an amused tone of superiority and self-possession. A few moments later, he was seated in the office with an account book in his hand. Do you recognize this, Mr. Foster? What is it you wish to see me about, Prentice? On page 20 in that book, you can see where I made $50 from Mrs. Jackson, the same way I made $300 from Mr. Harriman. I haven't checked all the books yet, Prentice. No? If you have anything to say, Prentice, say oh, it. Oh, or... I have something to say, all right. I've been up all night studying these books, and I've discovered a few things I had vaguely suspected. The most important being that the few hundred dollars I've stolen are chicken feed compared to the thousands that have landed in your pocket. Just what do you mean, Prentiss? I'll tell you. It took some time to figure out how you've been doing it, but I know now. I, I sort of stumbled on the answer, you might say. I've heard just about enough, Prentiss. Not yet you haven't. Here's how it works. A client phones in to sell a certain stock. Now, this order must have your okay first. And when it reaches your desk... Young Prentice talked on for an hour uninterrupted. For Henry Forster was something of a philosopher, and he found a certain wry humor in the fact that only through the cheap dishonesty of a mere accountant had his own really magnificent thievery been discovered. He allowed Prentice to finish and congratulated him on his cleverness. And then he made the only gesture possible under the circumstances. At first, Prentice was doubtful. Yeah, but what if we're caught? We'd get 20 years at least. Nonsense, nonsense. It's foolproof. But 100,000 a year, that's too much. Precisely. <laughs> and that's why we'll never be caught. Remember, Prentice, only petty thieves are caught. $300 thieves. Yes. You're right. I'll go along. Good, good. Let's shake hands on it, my boy. It was a strange partnership. The callow youth and the state executives. Both of them thieves. But even so, it went well for a few months until suddenly lightning struck. Mr. Foster was in his office when he heard about it. Yes? Listen, Foster. I'm at the corner in a phone booth. Ran out as soon as they came in. What? Uh, who came in? The home office auditors. Three of them. They just walked into the office, unannounced as usual. Right. Now you listen to me, Brentis. Yeah. Stop your sniveling and be a man. Now, they can't discover a thing. Not a thing, unless you give it away with your foolishness. But they'll suspect something. I'm sure of it. Shut up and get back to your office. Do you hear me? All right. But I'm scared. As it turned out, young Prentice was right. The auditors did suspect something. And in the end, Forster was summoned to New York. His employers suspected, yes. But they could prove nothing. And Mr. Foster soon returned to the Midwest. His method of thievery was perfect. Or so he thought until a New York detective, Ed Mooney, appeared on the scene. A few days after his arrival, Mooney came to Mr. Foster's office with terrifying news. Well, Mr. Foster, that's the long and the short of it. Prentice is not as stable a character as you are. Prentice is a fool, Mooney, and I'll have him in jail for such slander. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. Meantime, we've offered him privilege of state's evidence freedom if he'll come to New York and give his information there. Why, you mean you take the word of a mere boy before mine? Oh, we'll check on everything he has to tell, all right. All right, Mooney. Go ahead. Check all you like. You'll find nothing. Nothing. We'll check. In good time. <laughs> And so it was that young Prentice must die. Detective Mooney was assigned to bring him east, and he was seated beside him now in the compartment at the end of the club car. For the last time, Mr. Foster looked at his watch. In ten seconds, the car would enter the blackness of the Hudson Tube. 
He rose and stepped out into the narrow aisle. His hand found the light switch and jerked it down, plunging the car into complete darkness. Then he moved through the startled passengers to Prentice's compartment. This, too, he'd rehearsed the night before, 17 strides to the end of the aisle, a minute and three quarters in all to reach the compartment, and a split second to plunge the silencing knife into Prentice. That left two full minutes to race up to the car in front, and then the train would be at Pennsylvania Station. Before anything could be done, Foster would be lost in the streets of New York. Fifteen steps. Sixty. Seventeen. He turned now and opened the compartment door. His outstretched hand found the tweed-clad figure of Prentice. What? The knife blade stabbed and twisted. And then suddenly... Sunlight! Fierce and brilliant sunlight flooding the car, revealing everything. Prentice's horrified and gasping face. Foster, knife in hand, and Detective Mooney with a gun already half out of his pocket. Utterly bewildered, Foster jumped back and the sunlight vanished as quickly as it came. He turned down the corridor just as Mooney fired. The bullet smashed between his shoulders, driving him forward onto the carpet. Mr. Foster came to for a moment just as the train was grinding to a stop at the station platform. Two thick-soled brogans that were Mooney stood like walls close to his eyes as he lay there on the floor of the club car. The fool... A pitiful, murdering fool. If he lives, he'll get the chair for this. You know, it's funny how it timed out. So he stabbed Prentice just as we hit the light of the air shaft. Mr. Foster's eyes closed in shame as much as in physical pain. The air shaft. Yes, that's all it was. An air shaft full of bright noon sunlight. His one mistake, the one flaw in his otherwise perfect plan. You see, he timed everything on night trains only. The Black Book stars Paul Frees as your teller of tales, assisted today by the noted Hollywood actor John Daner. Nelson Bond's story, On Schedule, was adapted by John Meston and directed by Norman MacDonald. The special music is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week, I'll have another story for you from the Black Book. It's most unusual, and it's called My Favorite Corpse. Tonight, Playhouse on Broadway brings you the big finals of its intercollegiate acting competition. Four talented campus performers compete in a specially written play in which one of them will win $2,000. Don't miss this dramatic program tonight on most of these same CBS radio stations. Clarence Cassell speaking. Remember, the comedy treat that can't be beat is Jack Benny Time, Sunday nights on the CBS radio network. Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of crime, of death by violence. Here in the bleak stone structure which is Scotland Yard, there is a warehouse of souvenirs, where ordinary objects, a briar root pipe, a dingy white glove, a lump of twisted sealing wax, all have a history of murder. This length of sash cord is quite commonplace. You might see something like this in any window frame. 
Harmless looking bit of rope. It seems so. Frayed at one end. Cut all cleanly at the other. Just the right length to hook around a man's neck and twist. Today, that bit of sash cord can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. <laughs> Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Outside these walls of blackened brick and slate is London, where since daybreak the river has borne an endless burden of traffic. On fog shrouded bridges and in narrow streets, tens of thousands of pedestrians have jostled one another, all very much alive. But here, within this room, the connoisseurs of crime may see recorded for posterity in cabinets, in wooden trays, in jars, carefully labeled and preserved, the evidence of vindictive death. This sash cord, a short piece of rope, grimy, frayed at one end, not remarkable in itself, yet it came from the stage of a famous theater in the city of Brighton, where Octavia Kenmore, actress manager, was concluding her annual engagement. The alley of that theater was like any other, a corridor of darkness between the street and the stage door. And one September evening, a man came running out of the shadows, startling the doorkeeper who sat dozing in his chair. Mr. Carter, what's the trouble, sir? You'll find out soon enough. Operator? Operator? Sinjin Carter here, Mercury Theatre. Send an ambulance quickly. There's been an accident. One of our stagehands. He's lying unconscious in the alley. Hurry, please. Yes. One of the cast, Mr. Carter? Who is he? Tell me. It's Buckland. I can't bring him round. I try. Yes, Buckland. Oh, Miss Kenmore will be terribly distressed. Stage carpenter with her for 20 years. I dare say she will. Hadn't we better go and lift him in, sir? But perhaps there's something could be done. No, no. It, it's better not to move him till the doctor comes. It may be serious. And we wouldn't want to injure him, you know. A man found dead or dying. A phone call. Then the waiting. Over the crumpled figure stood old Tom Snellen, doorkeeper... And St. John Carter, leading man, waiting. Waiting until an ambulance drew up at an inter and came to kneel beside Jeff Buckland. Which one of you called us? I did. You said the man was unconscious. Well, he looked to be. I'm no physician. This man's dead. Shot through the heart. You'd have done much better to have called the police. The police arrived and actors coming into the evening performance were questioned. The star of the play in the theater early as was her custom was left undisturbed. The constable at the door admitted a young plainclothes man. Inspector Mitchell. Yes, Jordan? Uh, one of the men found this, sir. Hidden under some rubbish in the alley. 32 caliber. Thank you. Oh, uh, Mr. Ellis. Attention now focused on David Ellis, stage manager in Miss Kenmore's troupe. Ever seen this pistol, Mr. Ellis? Why, yes, it's the one we use in the play. I keep it in my desk. Oh, the usual license for it. Uh, what sort of ammunition do you have? Oh, blank cartridges, of course. 32 blanks. It's not loaded with blanks now. Bullets. And one chamber has been fired. I must warn you, Ellis. Anything you say henceforth will be written down and may be used as evidence. Well, you mean you're arresting Dave? But you can't. He never hurt anyone. Who are you, young lady? Miss Kenmore's secretary. My wife, Inspector. Oh, please, Lucy. But this is... Oh, Inspector, you don't understand... Jeff was our friend. He's been well, like a father to both of us. And while you stand here wasting time, the real murderer is getting farther well, away. That will do, Lucy. I take it there's been some trouble. Please, sir, state your business and then leave. I can't have my theatre disrupted 15 minutes before curtain time. Oh, Miss Kenmore. Now, Lucy, control yourself. Will someone be good enough to tell me what has happened? Certainly, Miss Kenmore. I had hoped it wouldn't be necessary to disturb you just at present. 
But one of your stagehands, Mr. Buckland, was found this evening outside... Octavia Kenmore, distinguished actress manager, darling of the provinces. Equally adept at comedy or tragedy. Of course, I'm gravely shocked. Poor Mr. Buckland. A good and faithful servant, Inspector. Oh, but it is preposterous of you to suspect Mr. Ellis. My stage managers never kill people. In any case, I can't spare him. We ring up in ten minutes exactly. I'm extremely sorry, Miss Kenmore, but Ellis is a material witness. He must come to the station house for further questioning. It was his pistol It was that... my pistol. I own all the props used in my the play. The license is in his name. Legally, he is the owner. Then I demand that you release him in my personal recognizance. I'd like to do that, ma'am, but unfortunately your entire company is under surveillance and is only permitted to perform tonight. Ellis, you must come with me. Very well. Go with them, David. <laughs> Lucy and I will be down to see you. And the inspector, as soon as we possibly can. Thank you, Miss Kenmore. The police left the theater, except for certain constables on duty at the door. And in her dressing room, Octavia Kenmore made ready. Lucy, my child. Ah, oh, me. How weak a thing the heart of woman is. Come. Don't be downcast. Oh, how can I help it, Miss Kenmore? With David in prison. Nonsense. He's only detained for questioning. He isn't charged with any crime. I'm thinking of Geoffrey Buckland. An excellent good man. And the best stage carpenter there was in England. Was he married? His family's in Manchester. I'll have to telephone them immediately after the performance. What? You really mean... You're going on? Certainly I am. And you will do Davy's job tonight. What? Me? Run the show? Why not? You've seen David do it often enough. And work is what you need. There's no time to think. Now, quickly now. Check the stage for the first scene and while I repair my makeup. Go, my child. The play went smoothly. The curtain rose and fell as the actors took their calls. Lucy Ellis, listening to the applause, realized suddenly she was quite calm and self-possessed. But her composure was nothing to that of Octavia Kenmore. She descended on the police station not many minutes later. Ah, Miss Kenmore and Mrs. Ellis. Come in, won't you? I am in, Inspector. Now, I expect a full explanation of what you have accomplished by imprisoning my employee these past two hours. Uh, please sit down, ladies. There's plenty of time. Is there? I expect to leave Brighton tomorrow night. Taking my stage manager with me. Is he all right, Inspector? He's not in chains or even in a dungeon, Mrs. Ellis. In fact, he's quite comfortable. Oh, thank heavens for that. If you will both be seated, madam. Since you insist. Thank you, Inspector. Well, have you nothing to tell us about this case? I'm waiting at the moment for our pathologist report. Of course. Yes, routine police procedure. Well, the man's been shot. That was quite obvious. The bullet is important, particularly in court, to establish the actual weapon. It seemed to me the hand that fired the weapon is a more important consideration. Eventually, Miss Kenmore, and inevitably, I trust. We'd like to know more about uh, Buckland's background, his habits. Did he drink, for example? Despite the general opinion, there are many in the theatrical profession who are not addicted to alcohol, Inspector. Mr. Buckland was a decent man... Octavia Kenmore told the truth about the murdered man, a non-drinker, except for an occasional pint of bitter after the show, a devoted family man in an occupation where family relationships are often difficult to maintain. There was nothing to indicate a motive for murder. In all the years with me, I have never known him to miss a single performance. He was a craftsman who could rig and handle any production, heavy or light. With him on the job, my stage managers had an easy time of it. Everyone liked him. His only fault, perhaps, was that he was too loyal to me. We're not being much help to you, are we, Inspector? Oh, yes. You've helped to fill in the picture. I've learned a lot. Well, what have you learned? Two important things, Miss Kenmore. First, that Buckland was not a man who made enemies. All my reports bear this out. And also, that he was extremely devoted to you. Hmm. You think that's significant? Extremely. You keep a close rein in your company. You should know of any jealousies or quarrels that occurred. I'd know about them, yes. I'm sure of that. You're not the person to tolerate friction or even bad habits in members of your troop. Come in. 
Pathology report, Inspector. I knew you wanted it right away. Thank you. Yes. Well, this is interesting. Why wasn't I told of this before? You know what they like in the lab, Inspector. They wanted to be sure. Absolutely sure. I see. Miss Kenmore, can you think of a reason why anyone should want to shoot a dead man? <gasps> oh, hardly. A useless procedure. You seem so. It has happened. Apparently, Buckland was dead of strangulation before he was shot. Today, the instrument of that murder, a piece of sash cord, can be found in the Black Museum. It was a good question. Inspector Mitchell repeated it. Can you think of a reason why anyone should want to shoot a dead man? An interesting problem, is it not? The medical report is very definite. Buckland was strangled with a thin piece of rope. Because he wore a scarf about his neck, the marks weren't noticed till they brought him to the lab. He was dead before the bullet ever was fired. Inspector Mitchell then went back to the scene of the crime, the alley beside the theater where the body of Jeffrey Buckland had been found. And with him, at her own insistence, went Octavia Kenmore. What are they looking for, Miss Kenmore? The thin piece of rope, of course. They'll never find it. If the murderer had an ounce of brains, he'll have taken it with him. Oh, it's strange. I don't suppose this alley ever had so much light turned onto it before. It was strange. Men searching every cranny, their flashlights pointing and probing, picking up grillwork balconies, iron ladders and fire escapes thick with rust. The men themselves silhouetted against the light. Oh, Miss Kenmore. Yes? We found this, caught up in that various trade. I think it's the weapon. Our lab can tell us definitely, of course. I see. A piece of lash line. What's that? Lash line, did you say? Yes, it's the sort of rope we use backstage to lash the scenery together. Much the same as ordinary clothesline? Or sash cord, yes. Would you be able to identify it as belonging to your stage equipment? Oh, that's hard to say. Miss Kenmore, Inspector... Yes, Lucy? One of the stagehands reported to me tonight. They'd had trouble with one of the sets. The line was too short to make it fast. Could you locate that piece of scenery, Mrs. Ellis? I think so. I told him to leave it on top of the stack so that we could replace it in the morning. Well, let's go on stage then, shall we? Do you know, Miss Kenmore, as a youth, I was strongly attracted to the theatre. Were you indeed, Inspector Mitchell? They moved through the stage door onto the platform. This is the flat, the one with the short lash line. You see how it works, Inspector. The rope is flipped round the iron cleats and tied off at the bottom, so the audience sees only an unbroken wall. I understand perfectly. The core of this rope matches the piece found in the alley. Rust, stains and all. What does that suggest to you, Inspector? There's little doubt in my mind, Miss Kenmore, that the person we want is a member of your own company. Yes, I've decided that for myself some time A ago. member of your company, I think, cut off this cordage to strangle Buckland and someone else familiar with these premises took the pistol from Ellis's desk. Then you don't think my husband's guilty? I haven't said that. But I must check once more who actually was here, backstage, between the hours of six and seven. I was here myself in my dressing room. And Sneller, the doorkeeper, was on duty. He surely... He took his statement, of course. He uh, seemed a bit evasive now that I think of it. I won't hear a word against him. Sneller's perfectly honest. I take an oath on it. Is he? A remarkably sound sleeper all the same? What do you mean? The extraordinary thing about his story, he claims to have been dozing in his chair. He didn't wake even when a pistol was fired not 30 feet away. I think perhaps I'd better go and visit him. Then I'll come... No, Miss Kenmore, not this trip. Investigations of this kind are sometimes dangerous. The old man lived close by the theater. Four flights of well-worn steps led to an attic door. What do you want? What is it? You're Mr. Snellen? I am. We're the police. My name is Mitchell, C.I.D. Should I show you my credentials? No, I, I recognize you, sir. G come inside. John Snellen had no need to be afraid, but it was his nature to be timid. Merely an old man who wanted to avoid trouble. 
Sometimes when arguments occurred, it was his habit to pretend to be asleep in his cubbyhole behind the stage door. Did you expect me to believe that when a pistol was fired close by you, you didn't even hear it? I can't rightly say this. There's heavy traffic in the street that time of night, you know. If I did hear a noise, I must have took it for a passing car. Yes, I'll admit that's a likely explanation. Perhaps I ought to. Uh, yes, what is it? If there's something you haven't told us, I advise you to come out with it. What had he seen and heard? A trifle. But possibly a trifle of importance. Almost enough to send a man to the gallows. I know I should have spoke of it before, sir, but... Well, it was a little before seven o'clock and Mr. Buckland was inside near his toolbox talking to this flashy dressed young fella. And Mr. St. John Carter, he was there too, j just standing by, so to speak. Could you hear what they were saying? No bookmaking in this house. That was what Buckland said. Miss Kenmore won't stand for it. She's strict about such things. Oh, yes, sir. Everyone knows that. Miss Kenmore won't have gambling in her company. An actor would get himself discharged if she caught him betting the horses or some such thing. What else did Buckland say? Well, he warned the fellow he'd go straight to Miss Kenmore. He said how this man had been following the company all along the tour. And Carter and some of the others had been betting with him. But, but that was all. The three of them went out together, still talking. And that was the last you saw of him alive? Yes, sir, it was. And Mr. Carter, sir, it struck me at the time. He came back a little later. Went up to his dressing room, I guess, and then went right out again. But he seemed so cheerful and high-spirited. I thought the gentleman must have settled their differences all right. Carter didn't come back again till he found Buckland's body and called the ambulance. That's right, sir. It begins to make sense, Inspector. Begins to, Yes. But why the stage manager's gun? And why shoot a dead man? Why? Why indeed? Why steal a gun to shoot a dead man? Hoping to find the answer to this question, the inspector went to Brighton Jail to call on David Ellis. Look here, inspector. Why are you holding me without a shred of evidence? Won't I be permitted to travel with the company when they leave tonight? It all depends. On what? Your replies to a few questions. Ask them by all means. How much gambling goes on in the company? Not a great deal. Some of the actors bet a few shillings now and then. Actually, their salaries are so small they can't afford to be reckless. Does uh, Miss Kenmore know about it? <laughs> Not a chance. If she did, we'd have replacements in a matter of minutes. It would follow, then, that an actor who wanted to keep his job would be careful that such information never reached Miss Kenmore. Well, I'd certainly say so. Is there anyone in the company who needed that job badly? What do you mean, badly enough to commit murder? Yes. I doubt it. Of course, you never know. In troops like this one, most of the supporting cast are either on the way up or down. A dismissal might mean the end of a career. Ellis, has anyone a reason for wanting you out of the way? No. Why? Whatever for? That gun was stolen from your desk, loaded with live ammunition, and after the murder it was left where we'd be sure to find it and hold you responsible. Oh, I can't believe that anyone would do a thing like that. Uh, unless... Unless... No, Inspector, there really isn't anyone. Indeed? Well, there is, though. No matter how clumsily he may have gone about it, I can't help feeling that our murderer has tried to pin his crime on you. For the moment, I'm going to let him think he succeeded. How did he do that? By keeping you locked safely up here in jail. A short time later, Inspector Mitchell was admitted to Miss Kenmore's suite at the Shorefront Hotel. Any progress to report, Inspector? Not much, I'm afraid. Have you been to see David? I have. I left him in the best of health. Well, why are you holding him? David didn't kill anyone. You know that as well as I do. I'm afraid I don't know it. I've met many murderers in my time, Mrs. Ellis. Most of them look quite as innocent as your husband. Besides, I have a hunch he could be somewhat more cooperative. In what way? Tell me, is there anything you know of that your husband might be concealing? Or some, well, mistaken idea of gallantry? Something perhaps concerning you? Why, no, I hardly think so. I seem to remember a melodramatic little scene I accidentally walked in on. Oh, but that was nothing. Just because St. John Carter made some advances to me and, and David resented it. Oh. That may be more important than you think, Mrs. Ellis. In fact, it may be the piece of information I... Inspector Mitchell thought that he knew the killer at last. 
But it takes evidence to bring a man to court. Then Miss Kenmore made a helpful suggestion. You said you were a devotee of the theater, Inspector Mitchell. I am indeed, ma'am. Did you by any chance see me as Lady Teasel? I did. A most marvelous performance. Then you recall, of course, the third act. I have something of that sort. A crucial moment in a famous play, when standing behind a screen, the lady overheard a villain's treachery exposed. Such a dramatic device as might be used effectively off stage as well as on. At the theater before the matinee, the acting out began. Oh, St. John, may I see you a minute? Of course, Lucy, my dear. Not given up hope for Dave, I trust? No, not at all. That's the proper spirit. Still, I understand we're leaving Brighton without him. Please, I'd rather not discuss it. Uh, perhaps in his absence you won't mind so much my paying you little attentions. Like the old days, eh? St. John, Miss Kenmore's waiting. She wants to see you at once. Really? The great Miss Kenmore? Mmm, that sounds ominous. It is. She's breathing fire and brimstone. Is she? And it so happens I come from a long line of fire eaters. Lead the way, my girl. Octavia Kenmore was seated at her makeup table. Behind her, the tiny dressing room was crowded with trunks and props and costumes. In an alcove, hardly noticed, there stood a screen. Here he is, Miss Kenmore. So I can see, yes. Hello, what's the long face about? Nothing to do with me, I'm sure. You've been placing bets on the races, Mr. Carter. Oh? Therefore, I'm compelled to dispense with your services. Here's your check and return fare to London. Your understudy will replace you at the matinee. See here, you... You can't do this. I have a contract. This check covers the terms of your contract. Miss Kenmore, whoever told you this was lying? A man in danger of his life seldom lies. If Ellis made this accusation... No, David. Your friend. Your flashily dressed friend who admits to bookmaking. And may shortly admit to murder. Oh, so Morgan has squealed, has he? If that's the word, yes. I gather he's ready to implicate you. You try. That kind always does. He did the killing. He can't drag me into this. I'm afraid you're already implicated quite seriously, Mr. Carter, and by your own words and actions. Oh, well, Inspector Mitchell, isn't it? What sort of game is this? The glorious game of play acting. Congratulations, Miss Kenmore. A very successful little playlet. You haven't got anything you can prove. Mm, no use bluffing. You took the pistol, didn't you? From Ellis's desk and shot Buckland with it. I didn't kill him. He was dead before. You are under arrest, Mr. Carter, and charged... With willful murder. It wasn't me, I tell you. Morgan choked him with that bit of rope when, when Buckland threatened him with the police. Morgan had no license and a previous record, too. It would have been jail for him. He did it, and after that Yes, I... you thought quickly. You tried to take advantage of the situation to frame Ellis so that the field would be clear with his wife. No. No, Carter, you may not have killed anyone, but you are an accessory after the fact, and you did put a bullet through a man's heart. A delicate question for the jury to decide, but I predict you'll pay the penalty... Come along now, and come quietly. Today, that piece of sash cord, properly marked and ticketed, lies in a glass case in the Black Museum. People of the theater can be, and most often are, fiercely loyal to one another. Octavia Kenmore was such a person, an actress manager who accepted responsibility not only for her company's professional welfare, but for their personal happiness as well. St. John Carter was an exception to the rule. But then his career had an exceptional ending, taking his final bow as he did on a platform 13 steps high at 8 o'clock one winter evening. Well, the murder weapon is on exhibit for all to admire in the famous room at Scotland Yard. And now, until we meet here again for another story from the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We are all doomed 
said one philosopher. It is inevitable. It is fate. It is destiny. Our lives hang on a slender thread from one day to another. We place our daily existence in the hands of total strangers and pray for the luck of the draw. We do it when we drive down the highway, when we fly in an airplane. We do it when we elect a president. It is not death we fear, but the inevitability of it. The destiny of one, the destiny of millions, can rest in the hand of a single person. That's right. Ignore the truth. Go make your report. Tell them a lie. Dr. Baylor, it's all in your mind. You can't allow this project to continue. It's flawed. It's dangerous. There is only death. You alone have the power to stop it. You're talking insanely. You fool. Are you also blind? We will be destroyed. And you are the only one with the power to save us. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Death on Project X, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Victoria Dan and stars Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by x Lax and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Details, details... In the infinity of government bureaucracy, have you ever wondered about those workers whose job it is to look after the tiny pluses and minuses? The supposedly insignificant paperwork that maintains the order of our society. For them, the sum total of any of our lives is written on a slip of adding machine tape. This is in no way to demean those who pursue these rather thankless back office careers. But even the dullest of jobs is never totally predictable. And obscurity can often end with a call to the front desk. You are probably wondering why I sent for you, Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins is on sick leave, sir. I'm Hughes. What happened to, uh, to Krebs? Transferred to another department, sir. Well, what about... Traggerty uh... retired last month. Hughes, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, how long have you been with the project planning office? Five years. And, of course, you've uh, served on the review board before? No, General. No? You worked for the planning office all this time and you've never gone on a field inspection? No, sir. Well, then how can you possibly be acting assistant director? Seniority, sir. What, uh, <clears throat> what was your previous position? Until last week, I was supervisor of accounts and records. Accounts and records? Now, no, 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 no. You, you won't do it. You, you won't do it all. Uh, hello, Haskins. General Glynn here. What do you mean sending me this, this, uh, this Hughes fellow? He has no experience. What? Are you sure? He is. Huh? No? All right. All right, I'll get back to you. This is, uh, incredible, Hughes, but according to the director, you're the only available staff member familiar with Project X. Yes, sir. The accounting section is acquainted with every detail of every project. Well, uh, <clears throat> let's hear what you know, Hughes. Yes, sir. Uh, Project X, filed under Category 723, Miscellaneous Research, Secret Type D, Defense. Total expenditure to date, $1.87 billion. Location, one-half mile underground. Craig Installation. Personnel, 89 men, 43 women. Uh, yeah, that, that's enough, Hughes. You certainly know the raw facts, but knowledge is no substitute for experience. No, sir. Now, this department is overextended. Uh, just find us an excuse and... We'll drop Project X. Drop Project X, sir? Or Project W or V or whatever we find sufficient grounds for termination. Uh, General Glynn, what would you call sufficient grounds? Uh, a bad morale for one and uh, misuse of funds for another. Yes, I'm sure you could spot that particular one, Hughes. And of course, there's uh, also the high risk quotient. Now, in other words, you have reasonable doubt that adequate safeguards exist to ensure a margin for error. Well, I'm supposed to be able to determine that, sir. I'm a, no scientist, sir. I'm an accountant. Hughes, I've got my hands full as it is. General, the responsibility. I mean, I've never... I know that, Hughes. And you know that. But so help me, don't you let them know it's your first assignment. I did want you to have a look at the main generating plant, Mr. Hughes. 
Well, it's very impressive, Colonel. Not to mention efficiency. As the project's chief power source, it can't be beaten for maximum utilization of fuel anywhere. Yes, sir, I've seen the figures. Mr. Hughes, I just want you to know that the Project X staff is completely at your disposal. I appreciate your cooperation. Yes, that's it, cooperation. The research we're doing here at X, it's at least important enough for a little common courtesy. I'm sure you've run into some real belligerent types on other inspections, haven't you? Uh, yes, I, uh, I have, certainly. If we're finished here, I'd like to take you on to the primary testing facility. This, of course, is the main lab. You won't find another as well-equipped in the entire country. At a cost of nearly $67.2 million, I should think not. You certainly know your figures. Well, details have always intrigued me, Colonel. Facts, figures, these things are the black and white. They are the ultimate indicator of success or failure. You sound just like an accountant. Well, you might say I'm interested in seeing a financial outlay for this project as justified by its progress, Colonel. In other words, the boys at the planning office still want to know if they're getting their money's worth. Well, I assure you, Mr. Hughes, at Project X, you certainly are. Now, by the way, I'd like you to join me for dinner. If you have no other plans, thank you, Colonel. I'd be happy to. Memo to General E.F. Glynn. My first day at Project X. Record most favorable. First impression. Project director extremely cooperative. Facilities well planned and in good order. Staff efficient and congenial. No evidence of any morale problems. Come in. I said come in. Someone slipped the note under the door to your quarters? Yes, that's right, Colonel. Strange. Colonel, do you have any staff members here who might be uh, a little unstable? Uh, Mr. Hughes, our people are carefully screened to avoid just that. Over 130 men and women engaged in top-secret defense research, constantly under stress, and there are never any difficulties? Well, of course, we're human. Occasionally, some of our people experience depression, fatigue... It's normal. And you say there's no morale problem? Here? No, not at all. I'm sure even you noticed how well our people seem to work together. Do you have any conception of how crucial our research is? Do you think I'd risk it all on demoralized personnel? Well, Colonel, sir, I merely inquired. I wasn't insinuating. I told you we have nothing to hide. We're an open book. Then you won't mind if I paid a visit to your infirmary? Of course not. I'd like to meet your staff psychiatrist. Staff psychiatrist? Yes, I just think a brief talk would clarify things for me, Colonel. I'm sure there are no real problems, but I pride myself on being thorough. Uh, can I help you? Well, I'm looking for Dr. Baylor. My name is Eli Hughes. I'm from the Project Review Board. Oh. You must be Dr. Hillary, the Project Medical Director. Uh, yeah, that's correct. You have an unusually high efficiency rating, Doctor. Yes, I do what I can. Well, I wanted to speak with Dr. Baylor concerning cases of fatigue. Uh, fatigue? Well, according to the Colonel, the only personnel problems here stem from sheer physical exhaustion. Uh, well, I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Hughes. You'll have to come back when Dr. Baylor's available. Well, uh, maybe... Maybe you could tell me, Dr. Hillary. Well, I'm afraid not. I am rather pressed for time. In other words, you don't wish to cooperate with an official government inspector. Uh, Mr. Hughes, don't try to pull rank on me. This is your first time out. That's not true, Doctor. It is written all over you. You don't even understand what we're all about here, now do you? Well, I most certainly do. You don't know anything. Adrian. Hello, Dr. Hillary. Who is the man? Uh, Adrian, I'd like you to meet Mr. Hughes. Hello. Can you swim? I beg your pardon? Swim. Can you swim in the water? In fact, I don't. But you must. We're going to be with the fishes, so we must know how. Isn't that so, Dr. Hillary? Yes, Adrian, that's true. But, Doctor, what, what is she talking about? I didn't mention the seahorses. 
We're going to be with the seahorses, too. Seahorses? Yes. We'll all be together. The fishes, the seahorses, and the people. That's a fact. Doctor, have you been practicing your underwater breathing like I told you to? Yes, I certainly have. That's good. That's very good. Doctor, could uh, we step outside for a moment, please? Uh, Adrian, we have to go away now, but we'll be right back. Okay. Would, would you uh, explain to me what that was all about? You mean Adrian? Well, that girl talks like an idiot. An idiot? Well, let me tell you something, Mr. Hughes. That girl happens to be Dr. Adrian Orman, the chemist. That girl? Yes, assistant to Professor Shoup, the man behind the X-Factor. Well, I don't understand. What happened? Well, a few weeks ago, she, she just snapped. Just like that? Yeah, I'm no psychiatrist. I'm a surgeon. But I can tell you this. She was very dedicated, a perfectionist. She wasn't satisfied with the final conversion formula. Shoup's formula? Right. She insisted that there was an error somewhere. It just didn't uh, feel right, was how she put it. In any case, she went for days without sleep, without food, and looking for some imagined error. Well, she finally cracked. From sheer fatigue. Oh. I'm very sorry. Are you? Are you really? Yes, doctor, I really am. Well, you shouldn't be. To feel sorry is to care. And to care is to become involved. What's wrong with that? He's here, isn't he? The man from Project Review? Uh, uh, Jerry, this isn't good for you. Now, you should stay in bed. I'll go. I will, just as soon as I talk to him. You're the man, aren't you? I'm Eli Hughes from the planning office. Please listen to uh, me. Jerry, I want you to stop this. But he has to know. He has to know how sad it is. A tragedy, that's what it is. Jerry, Jerry, you can talk to Mr. Hughes later. Now, we're busy now. I'll go. I'll go, but please, tell him how sad it is. Yes, I'll tell him. Because he shouldn't be afraid to cry. Tell him. Make him see. He'll cry, too. Yes, Jerry. Because it's so sad. <sighs> Dr. Hillary, that woman is crazy. Yes, I know. That's all you can say? What else can I say, Mr. Hughes? I've already told you. Yes, I know. You're a surgeon, not a psychiatrist. Well, what does the project psychiatrist have to say about this? Mr. Hughes, Dr. Jerry Baylor is the project psychiatrist. The Bible says, physician, heal thyself. Obviously, we have just met the perfect example in Dr. Baylor. If this woman is the resident psychiatrist, what can we expect from her patients? Are the lunatics indeed running the asylum? That is, if Dr. Baylor really is a lunatic. After all, who are we to say? We don't make hasty judgments here. We examine all issues carefully. We'll be back in a moment with Act Two. Last five years, Eli Hughes lived a carefully ordered life in an adding machine world where two plus two always came out four. Suddenly elevated to the rank of project investigator, he has been sent out on a seemingly routine check of a top secret research center. And he must make a judgment based on only two things, experience and instinct. Lacking the first, we can only hope he has a little of the second. Instinct, that subliminal sense that tells us something is wrong. Colonel, what I want from you is an answer. An answer to what, Mr. Hughes? That woman I met just ten minutes ago in your infirmary. According to my records, she's still on salary as a full-time staff psychiatrist. I'm aware of that. Well, then perhaps, Colonel, you can explain to me your reasons for not reporting this situation. Mr. Hughes... What do you really know about Project X? I'm acquainted with all the facts. Oh, I'm sure you are. You know the statistics, what we spent. But what do you know about us? What are we doing here? You're doing research. What kind of research? Complex research for the defense program. Do you know the nature of the research? Yes, you're developing another weapon. No, not just another weapon. The ultimate weapon. 
This weapon will render all others obsolete. Yes, I've heard that before. No. This is the highest level of achievement we can ever hope to reach. Nothing will be as sophisticated. X is capable of destruction on a level that is incomprehensible. Colonel, I was talking about Dr. Baylor. So am I. The X factor is the cause of Dr. Baylor's breakdown. Let me explain. There are over 130 men and women working on this project. They have actually constructed a device which, if ever put into operation, could obliterate an entire country in a matter of moments. Moments? Well, I don't see what this has to do with... Let me finish. Our people are working on the ultimate weapon. Can you imagine the moral and ethical implications? The guilt resulting from association with the most devastating weapon ever built by man... Dr. Baylor worked around the clock with some of our people. She listened. She cared. Unfortunately, she had no one to discuss her own doubts and guilt she had absorbed from others. The strain was too much. You mean she broke from the pressure? That's right. And so you understand yes, why... I'm, I'm sorry, Colonel. I had no idea, but... Still, this must be reported. The woman must be sent home. Why? Well, because this woman is a government employee drawing a 37,000 salary. That's your reason? Well, Colonel, isn't that reason enough? We're speaking of a broken woman, Mr. Hughes. Uh, yes, I understand that. Well, if you understand, then where is your compassion? How can you send this woman back into a world she no longer fits into? A record forever ruined. I can't help that. At least here, she does no real harm. That woman is harmless? Absolutely. She still has the delusion that she's helping her fellow workers. She feels useful. Would you take that away from her? Well, I'm not, I'm not trying to. I mean, I have to follow regulations. So you'd send her away and strip every last vestige of dignity from the woman? Do you have any idea how overextended this project is? She no longer qualifies as a member of your staff. And how do you know what qualifies someone as a member of my staff? Now listen, Eli. Now let's forget the formalities for a while. I want you to erase from your mind the stereotype of cold-hearted military officers. I care about this project. And I care about these people. And I think what's good for one is good for the other. But I'm talking about efficiency. And I'm talking about humanity. Well, you can't have both. Who sir? says so? Maybe you've been behind your desk too long. Or maybe you've been on so many field inspections that we all begin to look alike to you. No. In fact... In fact, what? You'll have to excuse me, Colonel. I have work to do. You're uh, making a first mistake, Mr. Hughes. You are becoming personally involved with this project. I am not. If something is disturbing you, why not just put it in your report? Because I... I want to be fair about this. I know you've just been talking with the Colonel. As a result, you've made your second mistake. What are you talking about? I mean, you just can't leave well enough alone, can you? You're beginning to doubt yourself. Doubt this project. Is it really worth all the expense, all the trouble? And what do you think? Well, I can't answer. I refuse even to let myself think about it. If you want answers, why don't you talk to the man who made it all possible? And just who are you talking about? The man behind the X Factor. Professor Shoup. But I want your opinion. I already told you, I have no opinion. And if I did, I certainly wouldn't advertise it. To you or to anyone else. Project X is the only sure way to a permanent and lasting peace. The, uh, ultimate weapon, Professor? But of course. Well, I don't understand how a weapon will bring peace. Isn't it obvious? Well, frankly, no. If we have the means of destroying our enemies before they are capable of responding, who would ever dare attack us? Well, what if you did use it? Wouldn't it destroy everything? No. Let me explain to you what the X Factor really is. It is the power to harness the elements contained beneath the Earth's crust and channel them for our own use, 
a virtually unlimited source of natural energy combined with the power to control it, actually direct it. In other words, pinpoint destruction. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I had no idea. That is why it will bring us peace, because to contemplate war in the face of Project X is to be faced with obliteration without hope of escape. The choice will have to be that of trust and peace. Yes, I never thought of that. You must admit it all puts the matter quite in perspective, does it not? It certainly does, Professor. Tomorrow, Eli. Yes, Colonel. I thought about what you said about Dr. Jerry Bailey. I'm not going to make any mention of it in my report. It's uh, not necessary to the case. Thank you. As far as I'm concerned, if you consider Dr. Baylor to be a member of the Project X staff, I won't dispute it. What brought about this sudden change of heart? Colonel, I am not a man affected by sentimentality. Oh. My primary interest is saving the government on necessary expense. As a full-time staff member, Dr. Baylor receives a yearly salary of 37500 If, however, she were discharged from her position here and put into the care of the Army Medical Center, annual cost for maintenance and therapy would approximate 52000 not to mention the monthly stipend to her dependents, bringing a total expenditure per annum to well over 63000 Keeping the doctor on at Project X will be a savings to the government of 26500 you're very efficient, Mr. Hughes. I try to be. What? What are you doing in my room? They said you were leaving. Yes, that's right, Dr. Baylor. But you just arrived. Well, I've been here three days. That's not long enough. Don't you realize that? Doctor, I find that the time was sufficient. I know what you're going to tell them. How could you? You don't have to be a mind reader. Everything's fine here. That's what you'll tell them. Everything's ship-shape and okay, but you're wrong. Dr. Baylor. Jerry, I really have to be packing. That's right. Avoid me. No, I'm not trying to I avoid... I understand. I know the kind of person you are. You've taken orders all your life, and now you're afraid to make trouble. No, that's not true. It's true, and you know it. But I upset everything. I'm the broken cog in the wheel. Well, just you listen to me, because I'm a psychiatrist. I know what I'm talking about. Yes, of course you do. Don't patronize me. Jerry. Jerry, I understand your situation. Really, I do. In fact, I think you're quite a remarkable woman to have endured what you have. But I have already filed a primary report, and it's time for me to leave. But you can't go. Not until you see the reality. The reality of Project X. You can't permit it to continue. I had doubts about the usefulness of this research myself, but then Dr. Shoup explained it to me, and it does make sense. Shoup? Shoup is out of his mind. He is out to destroy us all. How can you say that? He's a believer in peace. You're wrong. He wants to destroy us, and he will, unless you stop him. Jerry... Jerry, believe me, what you're going through now is due to fatigue. You've been stretched to the limits of exhaustion. You fool. Are you blind? Destruction is near. Why won't you believe me? Jerry, don't you see? It all has to do with the fact that you absorb other people's guilt, the ethical and moral. No. I have beheld the future and have paid the price. The horror was too great for anyone to remain sane. But you, Eli, you can save us. But you won't. No. No. You're right. You're right, Eli. Don't permit yourself to care. Leave now before you begin to doubt. Don't let yourself care, or you'll be destroyed. Leave now. This minute. Before it starts to eat away inside you. Jerry. Jerry, what is it? Before it's too late. Before the caring 
destroys you. Jerry, what's wrong? I see. Under the facade. You are sensitive. Like the others. You are vulnerable. Jerry, what's the matter? Before it kills you. Jerry. Answer me. Jerry. Well, how is she? Mr. Hughes. What happened, Doctor? Why, why, why did she faint? She didn't faint. She's dead. Dead? That's impossible. She's dead, Mr. Hughes. No, I don't believe that. Why, only a few minutes ago, she was standing right here talking to me. I know. Well, how could, how could she die just like that? The truth, Mr. Hughes, is that Jerry Baylor is dead because she had no desire to go on living. That's a reason? It has to be. Because other than that, there is no reason under the sun why this woman should be dead. The road to resolution starts with doubt. The best way home's the farthest way about. So said the poet. Doubt. It begins as a wispy thread of curiosity. It would have been so simple, so easy to have gone back and declared that all was well at Project X. But now doubt, the ultimate weapon of man's own conscience, has been planted inside the practical, well-ordered mind of Eli Hughes. And that is going to prove very unfortunate for him when I return with Act Three. to live. There is no power on earth quite like it. And even doctors are at a loss to explain the most critical patients whose sheer tenacity brings them back from death's door. Conversely, many people believe that there exists also the will to die. But what about Dr. Jerry Baylor? Could we say then that she actually died of despair? Of some terrifying vision? This woman should not be dead. The fact still remains, Doctor, that she is. Now, there has to be some sound medical explanation. There always is. All right. Her heart stopped beating, so she died. In fact, though, she wanted to die, so her heart simply stopped beating. Now, do you understand the difference? No. Life life was another torment for Jerry. Each day became more and more difficult to face. Visions of total annihilation. She was firmly convinced that it was actually going to happen. The thought was unbearable. How are you going to list her death? Natural causes. What else can I say? That's how I recorded the other two. Other two? What other two? Yes. This is the third death we've had here in the past six months. Well, I wasn't informed of any deaths. Yeah, that's correct. Now that you bring it up, They occurred away from the installation on two staff members who had recently resigned from the project. Officially, they were no longer connected with Project X, although I consider the deaths to be work-related. How did they die? One in an accident, the other cardiac arrest. Both had previously been under the care of Dr. Baylor. I see. Doctor, would it be possible for me to look through Jerry Baylor's office? I thought you were leaving, Mr. Hughes. Not just yet. Ah, Nothing so far, nothing. Now, she had to keep some kind of records, I'm sure of it. But where, where... Wait a minute. One of these. Tapes. Maybe it's on tape. Received news today of Dr. Vanetti's death. The second death in under a month. There must be a correlation. She did put it on tape. Well, maybe now I can get some answers. In conclusion, both of the deceased scientists had the following in common. 
They worked in the same lab. They both had previously expressed anxieties to me connected with the safety of Project X. Both admitted to an overwhelming sense of doom. Both had unusually high sensitivity ratings. Sensitivity ratings? Oh, what can she mean by that? It's uh, sort of an unofficial scientific term, Mr. Hughes. A sensitivity rating is a scale that Dr. Baylor used to classify the intuitive nature of her patients. Uh-huh. Now, she believed that some people have a, a greater sensitivity to stimuli than others. Now, she was almost afraid to use the words uh, extrasensory perception, but she believed that some people have a kind of uh, antennae that enables them to detect danger present in any everyday situation. Oh, a kind of uh, sixth sense, Doctor? Uh, if you go along with her theory, I, I guess you could call it that. Oh. Well, that would explain what happened to those two scientists, and even Dr. Baylor. Well, you can believe that. I don't. I just think that what happened to the three of them, like what's happening to Adrian inside that room there, some people can't cope with stress. It's as simple as that. I don't know, Doctor. Uh, what about this girl, Adrian? You met her. She cracked after Jerry was no longer able to function as staff psychiatrist. Well, maybe... Maybe there's a connection somehow. I'd like to talk to her again. Well, if you want, Mr. Hughes, but I, I really don't think it's going to give you any answers. Unless, that is, you already have one in mind. Hello, Adrian. Oh, hello. Do you remember me? You're Mr. Hughes. You can call me Eli. Okay. Eli, have you learned to swim yet? Uh, no, no, but, uh, I will. You better hurry up. You don't have forever, you know. Yes, uh, Adrian, did you know a man named Dr. Vinetti? Who? Dr. Vinetti. He was a chemist like yourself. Both you and Dr. Vinetti came to work at X around the same time. Dr. Vinetti? Yes, he worked alongside you and Professor Shoup. Professor Shoup? Yes, that's right, Adrian. Now, maybe, maybe you can tell me about Dr. Vinetti. No, I don't want to. All right. I don't want to upset you. Do you see these figures, Professor Shoup? uh, What are you talking about? Do you see our calculations, Shoup? You've made a mistake. Why won't you double-check your figures against ours? Professor Shoup, why are you so stubborn? Your calculations are off. What what calculations? I can do a backstroke and hold my breath underwater for almost one whole minute. Adrian, what calculations are you talking about? I don't want to talk to you anymore today. You're too serious. I hope you don't mind me disturbing you, Professor Shoup. Oh, of course not, my boy. Now, you were asking me about Dr. Vinetti and poor Adrian. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, did you all, uh, how do I put it tactfully? Did you all get along well? <laughs> Very tactful, my boy, but unnecessary. In fact, the three of us got along famously. Just famously we did. Uh-huh. Well, the reason I'm asking you is because Adrian mentioned something to me about some calculations being off. Oh, poor Adrian. She was very distressed about Dr. Vinetti. They were very close, I understand. In other words, there are no calculations. Well, certainly there are. The calculations on my conversion formula. We start testing next week, and I'm very excited. And so is the colonel. I, I take it that Dr. Vanetti disagreed with you on some of your figures. No, yeah, he certainly did. But I set him straight quickly. Yes. Professor, who double-checks you? Everything is double-checked by the most qualified member of this staff. Me. Uh, you're, you're joking, aren't you? Mr. Hughes, I double-check myself. No, on along. I have got work to do. I 
think you're taking this all too seriously, Eli. Colonel, I heard him with my own ears. He said he double-checks himself. Well? I, I don't know about you, but I call that an extremely unscientific attitude. Now, I certainly intend to mention it in my report. I'm beginning to have my doubts about Professor Shoup. Oh, now, look, you have to understand, the professor is a genius, an absolute genius. Colonel, I find your attitude very unprofessional. I'm raising serious doubts to you about the emotional stability of your chief scientist. Now, how can you just dismiss it with a shrug of your shoulder? Because, well, it's this way, Eli. We're testing X on a very small scale next week. And as a favor to me, I'm asking you to let this all ride until after the test takes place. Now, you're not serious. Now, what if Dr. Ramon Vanetti and Dr. Adrian Oramad were right and the professor was wrong? That, Eli, is extremely unlikely. Well, I'll go along with that, Colonel. The question is, can you afford to take that chance? So you're going away? Adrian, I wanted to thank you. Thank me? Yes, you... You helped me make a very important decision. I'm going to make my report today. Terminating Project X. Terminate? It means that Professor Shoup won't be able to carry out the testing next week. I thought... It would make you happy to hear that. Eli, you can't stop it. It's too late. No, it isn't. You can see it, can't you, Eli? You're one of us. I can see that. One of us? You have it. The sensitivity. You know what's going to happen. The miscalculation and the conversion formula will set off a disastrous chain reaction. Adrian, I told you. I already told you I'm going to stop the test. No. They'll stop you. They won't let you. Goodbye, Colonel. I'm glad there are no hard feelings. Not really, Eli. We do have a full week before the test. Something might always come up. The last word does belong to the General. Well, I'm sure the General will support my findings. Perhaps, Eli. But when he hears the results of our testing, I don't believe he will. Well, you'll be shut down long before the testing, Colonel. Eli, we can't be closed until you make your report. In case you forgot, Colonel, I'm leaving today. Not really. What are you talking about? You're a civilian. This is a classified operation. We have to debrief you. And that's going to take time. Well, I've got a level three security clearance. I'm just being technical, Eli. I have the option to detain any non-military personnel for a routine security check. How long will this check take? Exactly one week. One week? Well, that'll give the professor time to begin his tests. It will. Colonel, this is deliberate. It is. But you can't. I mean, you can't carry on those tests. If the calculations are even slightly off, there'll be a terrifying chain reaction. You're dealing with the forces of nature. We're talking about cataclysm. Unleasing the violence from beneath the Earth's crust. The elements raging uncontrollably. Eli, I think you've been taking this all a bit too seriously. You think I'm crazy, do you? Maybe I am. Maybe man wasn't meant to foresee his own destruction. But it will happen, Colonel, unless I stop it. Only I have the power to stop it, and I must, or else we perish. Civilization will perish. And I must go at once and make my report. Eli, you're not going anywhere. Not for a long, long time. No, lie down, Mr. Hughes. How, how long have I been here, Dr. Hillary? Huh? Almost a week. <laughs> Doctor, it still isn't too late. There's still time. Uh, I told you, Mr. Hughes, not to become emotionally involved. Now, look what it's done to you. No, 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 it doesn't matter. Not really. I I can't stop destiny. Please, please, don't tire you. She was right. Jerry was right. It's a mistake to care. It'll destroy you if you care. Please, Mr. Hughes. Eli. It won't be long now, Doctor. We'll, we'll all fall in. Down, down. 
to the bottom of the ocean, back to the fishes. Well, rest now. The fishes and the seahorses. General Green? Ah, yes, come in, Corporal. I want you to take a letter to the director of Project X. Ready, sir. To the attention of Colonel Lilly, Project Director. Sir. In lieu of a progress report from investigator Eli Hughes, our secondary review committee has voted to send a replacement sometime in the following few weeks. In the interim, as Project X poses no immediate threat to the safety of this country, permission is hereby granted for you to continue with your research. Signed, Major General E.F. Glynn, Commander-in-Chief of Military Forces, Atlantis. Atlantis? You mean we didn't tell you that this story was about Atlantis? Well, after all, we never exactly told you it wasn't. One thing is for sure, though. We don't have to tell you how this story ends. Undoubtedly, you have already heard the ending. Atlantis was destroyed. I'll be back in a moment. Is man bent on destroying himself? This story was offered merely as a fable to make you think and wonder. That's what this program is all about. To expand the imagination, heighten the senses, tantalize the curiosity. Was there really an Atlantis? What could have happened to cause such an advanced civilization to vanish from the face of the earth without a trace? Our cast included Larry Haynes, Robert Dryden, Catherine Byers, and Cork Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. This is John Steele, reporting on Adventure. Maybe you call it Kalimantan. Maybe just plain Borneo. But to me, it spells just one name. Rajrani. She was beautiful. The kind of beauty that makes you think of the misty moonlight of the tropics. I call this transcribed yarn Vampire. Funumero was just a fishing village on the south coast of Borneo until a guy named Muhammad Ali opened up a place there. After that, purity and innocence died natural deaths. But you could buy provisions at Muhammad Ali's. You could buy anything from American soft drinks to Chinese narcotics. In Funumero... If you want to go anywhere at all, you have to go to Muhammad Ali's, unless you go swimming with sharks and octopus in the bay. Or you want to take a stroll through the jungle and be eaten alive by assorted spiders and ants. Me? I wanted a cold drink in human company. So, I went to Muhammad Ali's. I picked up a beer and carried it to the only vacant chair in the place and found myself looking at a human mountain seated across the table from me. I figured the guy for a trader of some kind, of uh, indifferent nationality. A pleasure, my friend, to offer you a cigarette. Thanks. Permit me to extend a light? Thanks again. American, of course. Basically. I was once in your country, San Francisco. 
delightful city. It was the last time I saw it. Are you familiar with Borneo? Mm, not too well. But this is not your first time here. No, no, no. No, you seem at home. My name is Vraken, Jan Vraken. I'm John Steele. What do you think of this place? Mm, it'll do for what it is. Well, I find it revolting, Mr. Steele. I seldom come down here. I have a charming little bungalow just up the river. Oh? English colonial. Wide sweeping veranda all the way around it, surrounded by beautifully kept lawns and rose gardens. An oasis of refinement in a barbaric country. Well, I'd like to see it before I leave here. Well, do me the great honor of being my guest, and tonight we, we can enjoy supper with champagne. Well, why not? And shall we leave this dreadful place? Those girls make me sick. <laughs> Jan Vraken owned a jeep that had seen its best days, but it was just right for the short journey along the jungle path that ran along the banks of the river. If only you were staying a little longer, Mr. Steele. Why? I would arrange to entertain you. A tiger hunt. Do you enjoy hunting? On occasion. Well, my favorite sport is wild boar. At least twice a year. Anything wrong? There she is, Mr. Steele. Who is she? Standing there among the trees, staring at us. Pretend you do not see her. Well, who is she? Rajrani. That's her name? Yes. She's gorgeous. She's wicked. Well, is she taboo? It is no laughing matter, Mr. Steele. <laughs> she thinks it is. You're really scared of yes. us. Yes, I am terrified. I don't get it. Do not misunderstand. I, I was happy to meet you. Even under normal conditions, I would have invited you to my home, but... But what? I, I was deathly afraid to come this way alone. All right. Why? I wanted company. Because of that girl? Girl. Yeah? She is not human. Oh, no? You laugh, Mr. Steele. <laughs> she looked very human to me. She, she is a vampire. Say that again. Don't make fun of it, Mr. Steele. Didn't you say she was a... Vampire, yes. Oh, I see. Oh, no, I'm not mad, Mr. Steele. Everyone in this neighborhood knows what she is. Mm -hmm. That's all? She is a vampire of the, of the most deadly sort. Well, there were a few at Muhammad Ali's. Only they didn't look as clean. Mr. Steele Rajrani has already killed two men this year. You're really serious about this. I fear I am her next victim. Next victim? She watches for me. I, I see her sometimes at night time, watching my house. <laughs> Just listen to her. <laughs> Jan Bracken was no madman. He was simply a badly scared man. We drove on. His bungalow was a big one. All he had said it was, and miles from anywhere. Modern furniture mixed with some fine rattan pieces and set off by delicate oriental decorations. I have no servants, Mr. Steele. Oh, you're doing fine. Can I help? No, just be comfortable. You do your own housework. Of late, I am forced to. I cannot find servants. Too far off from town? They will not work for me. No? If it were not for the filth of the town, I would live there, but I cannot tolerate filth. <laughs> not after this place. And so I remain here. In my terror. Oh, come on. Yet you know, Mr. Steele, I can understand something. For instance? I told you Rajrani has killed two men this year. In each case, they themselves went to her. She did not come to them. Look. Oh, but it's it... true, Mr. Steele. And I can understand. Better finish your drink. They had to go to her. They were fascinated by her. <laughs> that I can believe. They resisted for a time, then succumbed. But I will not, Mr. Steele. Oh, yes, I... I confess she fascinates me. She's very seldom out of my mind. She's quite a gal, chum. Let's face it. She is very, very alluring. There's no better word. Alluring. The English language is rich, but it contains no better word for her. Who were these uh, two fellows she killed? Two natives. <laughs> two natives whose heads were full of voodoo nonsense. Do you know how... A vampire kills? I know how the vampire bat kills. Punctures a tiny hole in the skin. And feeds on the blood of its victim. Mm -hmm, yeah. And in that manner, the two natives died, Mr. Steele. Their throats punctured. <gasps> Please, look through the window. What? Look through the window. There she is. She's out there. She stood there, near one of the rose bushes, the moonlight shimmering around her. It was queer, but I felt a sort of cold shiver. 
Suddenly there was something about that girl's beauty. It gave me the creeps. When a guy has vampires on his mind, that's one thing. But when the vampire is a beautiful jungle gal, that's something else. This particular vampire was the original sarong girl. Okay, so Barneo is a strange country with strange peoples living in it. So maybe this is the kind of experience that had to come from there. It happened along the Famine River. The scene was a gorgeous one. The moon looking like it was hanging on the top branches of a tall palm tree. The jungle. Just beyond the cultivated grounds of the gleaming white bungalow of a retired trader named Jan Vrakken. I was Vrakken's guest for the night, and we'd both seen Rajrani staring at the bungalow. I'm no judge of human vampires, but if Rajrani was one, there was a lot to be said for her species. Out there somewhere, among the bushes or the trees, out there waiting. Waiting? For what? For one of us. For me to go out there? Why don't you take the chance? Are you joking, Mr. Steed? <laughs> Where'd she come from? A village a hundred miles up river. Oh? She was driven away from her village. Yeah? Now, here, break this. Thank you. And she came down here. Mr. Steele, she destroyed three men in her own village. Oh, three of them, huh? Of course, you don't believe any of this. What do you know about her? Who is she? Her grandfather was English. But she's native. Oh, yes. I don't see any sign of her now. No. Does she speak any English? English or Dutch, they all do. Yeah? English, most likely. Have you ever spoken to her? No. Has anyone around here, I mean? I don't know. But where does she live? Who knows? Somewhere close to where we first saw her tonight. But where? Among the trees? In a cave, perhaps. What does she live on? Did you ask? <laughs> We waited for Rajarani to show herself again, but she didn't. I had every intention of going out to her. Maybe because I had to convince myself she was as normal as I was. But the night passed without further incident. And next morning, Jan Brocken drove me back to town. Isn't this the place where we saw her last night? Yes. Will you stop? Stop? Yeah. <laughs> By all means. You see, during the day, she is harmless. I can be brave. Brave enough to take a walk over there? A walk? Yeah, we may see her. Well, I... Or you can wait here. No, no, no. I do not care to be left alone here. Well, let's take a look around, huh? Very well. There. Are several small caves just beyond these trees. We can look into a few of them. <laughs> She's across there. Smiling at us. Come on. No. And stay here. Yes. Be careful, Mr. Steele. Be careful. Hello? Hello, Rajrani. They tell me that's your name. Yes. And you do speak English. Oh, yes. A lot of rocks around here. May I sit down? <laughs> <laughs> you have a sense of humor, eh? You are a funny man. You talk like you think I'm child, I'm woman. I'll buy that. Buy it? Figure of speech. Forget it. Who are you? I'm not on your mailing list. You wouldn't know me. My name is Steele. John Steele. John. It was my grandfather's name. Oh, that's so? Did he teach you English? Some. Why do you frighten my friend back there? I make fun. I laugh and he's frightened. He says everyone is frightened of you. I know they're frightened. You are not frightened. No. Do you uh, want me to be? No. You want food? What do you have? Fruit, many nuts. Not now. Is that all you eat? It is all I can get. I cannot hunt. I cannot kill animals. Well, wouldn't you like to live in a house? Oh, no. Look. Would you like me to bring you some food? Yes. Some cooked meat, bread, things of that sort. Would you like that? Cooked meat? Mm -hmm. Yes. You bring that to me. I'll bring it to this place after sundown. Will you be here? Oh, yes, I will be here. You bring to me. I'll bring you a mess of food, sure. And some milk. You like milk? Yes. You bring, please. See you tonight, then. Goodbye now. I wait for you. Yeah, that'll be fine. <laughs> so you 
will meet her tonight. After sundown. And you will take her food. Yeah. I resent this, Mr. Steele. You what? I resent it very strongly. You shouldn't drink so much in the morning, fella. What can she mean to you? Oh, so that's it. But you will do well not to go to her. You're all mixed up, chum. No, no. No, Mr. Steele, I am not mixed up. I am, and I, I confess this freely, fascinated by that girl. And I resent your, your audacity. Your reckless courage. Look, you take her the food. Go on my place. You know I won't. You can. Thank you, no. Well, suit yourself. Why did you tell her that you'd go there tonight? Why not during the day? Well, you say she's harmless during the day. So you deliberately. What, what was it like, being so close to her? You, you took her hand once. What, what did it feel like? I felt my heart pounding, Mr. Steele. I, I wanted to rush over there. Just, just to be as close to her. After a while, I left Riken. I bought a lot of food, had it packed up, then went upstairs to my room. Later in the day, I went down again to eat a meal. Riken was still there, soaking up liquor. I stayed away from him. About five that afternoon, I was back in my room doing some writing. I didn't hear you knock, chum. I did not knock, Mr. Steele. Be careful with that gun. I am drunk, Mr. Steele. Capable of anything. You look at me and you see the flabby hulk of a man that you despise. <laughs> but you are wrong in one respect, Mr. Steele. I am possessed of considerable courage at this point. I am drunk with it, shall we say. Yeah, let's say that. The package on your bed. Is that food? For us, honey? Yeah. I will pay for it. I will take it with me. Oh? I am taking your place, Mr. Steele. Not in that condition. In this condition, as one gentleman to another, I am going in this condition. You better sleep for an hour. I can't get that girl out of my mind, Mr. Steele. No matter if she must destroy me, I must go to her. You see? I am drunk, and I am not afraid. Find that gun. You must not follow me, Mr. Steele. Oh. Okay, okay. But you will, hmm? I can read it in your mind. You will try to take her away from me. I... I can't let you interfere with me, Steven. <coughs> you... You would have followed me, Steven. <laughs> Jan Bracken was drunk when he fired at me. He couldn't miss. I was standing only four feet away. But his hand wavered. I felt a red-hot pain. The bullet clipped the side of my neck, just barely touched it. And I went on living. My reflexes are good. I didn't even think. I just dropped to the floor and stayed there. Sure, I was dazed. But I had sense enough not to be overly heroic. A second bullet might have finished me off. Bracken was satisfied. He picked up the food package I'd bought for Rajrani and ran out of my room. Where is she? She must be around here somewhere. Rajrani! Answer me! It's Jan Varken! I have come for you! You hear me? I am here, you hear me? Rajrani! You hear me? Ah. Ah. That was her. Where are you? Don't you hide from me. I know you're here. I, I have some food for you, right? Food. I bought you a lot of nice food. You hear me? Please don't make me wait. Must you torture me? Where are you? Where are you? Oh, why doesn't she show herself? What is the matter with her? Oh. oh, you're so beautiful. Please, please do not go away. I want to touch you. You are so beautiful. I do not care what you are. Look, here's the food I brought you in this package. Take it. You still there, Rajani? I do not see you. <laughs> oh, I am 
am so sleepy. I am so sleepy. I must sleep for a little while. Just a little while. <laughs> So beautiful. Oh, yes. A man could die for the kiss of a girl like you. Oh, no. Not, not my throat. Not my throat. Not my throat. <laughs> Don't be a fool. Steel, there's, there's blood. There's blood on my throat. What? I fell asleep, Steel. She came to me, the vampire. She came to me as I slept. I, I, I felt her kiss me, then I felt... Ah! Here, hold it, hold it. Now let me look at your throat. There's a puncture there, Steel, a puncture. Mm. I'd have died if I had not awakened. I woke up in time. I felt her there. I, I brushed her away. I heard her laugh at me. Steel, she must be destroyed. Shut up. There's two ways only steel to destroy her kind. The silver bullet or the sharpened wooden stick. Shut up, you idiot. My throat. Oh, my throat. She was killing me. I would have died if I had not wakened when I did. <laughs> you, you hear her? Come on, stand up. Yes, yes, help me. I, I feel sick. I ought to slug you for that bullet. Oh, forgive me. I, I was drunk. I was not myself. Come on. The path's over there. Now either go home and sleep or go back to town. To town, of course. But what are you going to do? Never mind me. Go on. You get out of here. There were tiny marks on Brocken's throat. There were traces of blood. In a country like Borneo, that was all the proof necessary. It was one thing for a few natives upriver to accuse Rajrani of being a vampire. But if a European walked into town with the kind of evidence Rockin could show, Rajrani's goose was cooked. They'd hunt her down and make sure she was dead. And somehow I couldn't quite go along with the vampire theory. I don't know what I expected to accomplish, but after Rockin had left me, I lay down in the same place where he'd been lying. The grass was wet, the bugs started crawling over me. But I waited, quite sure that Rajrani was watching me. So that's it. <laughs> Rajrani, come here. Yes? Look, you're in serious trouble. Do you know that? Trouble? Will you trust me? Yes. Give me your hand. Let's get away from here. Yes. There are some islands off the coast. I have a lot of friends on one of them. I'm going to take you there. You'll be safe there. Safe? You don't even know what it's all about, do you? <laughs> here now. We'll have to get down to the beach without being seen. If we're lucky, we may be able to borrow a boat. You see? Across there? Out to sea? Yes. That strip of land, that's an island. We've got to get over there. Many boats on sand. We take one? Uh Uh-huh. The problem is to find one with oars in it. Boats with sail? Good, I'll settle for that. No! Yeah, catamaran, even better. Come on, help me push it into the water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Okay, now. Hurry, climb aboard. Stop them! Stop them! Come on. Keep well down. They may start shooting. I'll have the sail up in a jiffy and we'll be on our way. There was an offshore breeze. It filled the big sail of the catamaran and we glided away from the beach towards the island. I saw Vrakken and half a dozen town toughs running towards the beach. They fired a few shots. 
The catamaran was hit in several places, but she kept afloat. We reached the island in about an hour and a half, and I took Rajrani to a friend of mine, a resident missionary and his wife. I told them about Rajrani, and that was all there was to it. They took her in. Friends, you've just heard Vampire. The answer was simple. Superstition and a readiness to believe in any kind of voodoo. In each case, the men who had died had been drinking to fight their fear of the vampire. And once drunk, they had driven themselves to go where they thought Raj Rani would be waiting. Maybe she always was, as when Vrocken went to her. And once there, their senses left them. Sure, they were killed, but death was the result of self-hypnosis, plus something else. Something did puncture their throats. Something punctured the skin of my throat as I lay where Vrocken had been lying in the grass. A particularly vicious species of tick, and I brushed it off, but real fast. And so much for the vampire. Be around next week for a story I like to call Skid Row. Maybe you think it's Bleecker Street, New York City, east of 6th Avenue, or in San Francisco. At any rate, it's the longest street in the world. It's anywhere you go from Skipper Street in Antwerp to Wallamaroo, Sydney, Australia. From the Limehouse Causeway in London to Gore Street, Calcutta. It was back some years ago when I first ran into a guy named Sailor Jones. I'd seen him before that and I saw him afterwards. But it was in 1948 in Calcutta where my association with him began and his strange story unfolded. Heard with me on this transcribed John Steele adventure were Wendell Holmes and Inga Adams. I'm Don Douglas. So until next week then, and skid roll, remember, adventure is where you find it. But don't look for it. It may find you. Remember to be with us next week for another episode in the series John Steele, Adventure. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In our lives, we all travel to many places where we will be the stranger. The unknown waits for us in other countries, other towns, even new roads, a different turn on an unfamiliar street. And are we really any different from the traveler of ancient times? Aren't we still dependent on the kindness and goodwill of others? Even the most suspicious of people must ultimately be confronted with a situation where he must trust his money, his possessions, or even his life to a stranger. You're mistaken, Orville. I can leave here any time I want to. Stop pretending, Pamela. You know you can never leave Silver Tree Island. Yes, I can. No one ever leaves Silver Tree Island. And you know why. It isn't true. It's impossible. You know why now, don't you, Pamela? Don't you? <laughs> mystery drama, The Island on Silver Tree Lake, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Victoria Dan and stars Patricia Elliott. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. say has gotten smaller. It grows smaller every day. This incredible shrinking process has to do with our advanced technology. There is scarcely a patch of ocean or earth anywhere that has not been duly accounted for 
on some vast atlas. The previous frontiers of mystery are rapidly losing their magic. The once untamable Amazon is falling victim to the bulldozer. Enchanted islands in the South Pacific are used for atomic bomb experiments. Still, with it all, there are places, even in this country, that remain relatively untouched by the mass of civilization. Places that we call the back roads of America. Officer, I, I don't understand why you pulled me over. I, I uh, good evening, ma'am. My name is Trooper Leroy LaRue, Jr. Your name, ma'am? Allen. Uh, Pamela Allen. Mm -hmm. My license is in my purse. Is your car, Miss Allen? Uh, no, I, I rented it at the airport in uh, Memphis. Where are you from, Miss Allen? Uh, it is Miss, isn't it? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm from New York. Miss Allen, are you aware there's a posted speed limit here? Officer, I wasn't speeding. The posted limit is 45. I was doing 45. <laughs> you can't give me a ticket just for that. <laughs> Miss Allen, now have I said one word about a ticket? Now, you've obviously been seeing too many of those movies about cigar-smoking southern policemen picking on poor Yankee motorists. Uh, I only know... Now, listen. The limit means 45 miles an hour conditions permit. Now, you know what that means? Now, it's just been a rainfall. Now, this is the lake road, and it's bad enough when it's dry. It curves and snakes, and then, you know, if you aren't familiar with it, well, it can be pretty dangerous. Uh, I see. Oh, thank you for the warning, officer. Hey, you ain't going to wedding, aren't you? Uh, how did you know... Over in Weaverville, right? Hmm? Right, but... Well, that fancy package with the bows on the seat next to you. Now, what else could that be but wedding present? And who else is getting married tomorrow except Sally Lynn Wilkie? You know Sally? <laughs> no, her. <laughs> Listen, you're talking about the love of my cousin Earl's life. Now, it broke his heart when she went up north to that college... Now, he waited and waited for her to come home after that, but, oh, no, she said she had to find herself. <laughs> Got herself a couple of interesting degrees. She's back home for good now. Finally caught up with her, catches up with everybody sooner or later. Uh, uh marriage, that is. Now, I tell you, they're dropping like flies around me. Officer, I... Uh, but, uh, well, I see I'm being a bit of an annoyance. No, no, it's just that well, I... Well, the truth is, Miss Allen, you know, you got me just a bit flustered. But you be careful now. It's nearly dark, and you have to be extra mindful of those sudden twists and turns. I appreciate your advice, Officer uh, LaRue. Hmm? I'll be as careful as I can. Oh, we have had some terrible accidents on this part of the lake road. You know, cars skidding right in the embankment. Well, I'll certainly try to get to Weaverville in one piece. Okay, bye now. <laughs> bye. Sally Lynn. An old college roommate. <laughs> I wouldn't make this trip for anybody except you. Whew. This really is a boondock. Middle of nowhere. Oh, I'd hate to run out of gas here. Oh, oh, that was close. Oh, this road really is dreadful. The way it twists. Oh, that curve. I, I, I'm going into a skid. I, I can't stop. I, I'm going to go right off. I must have blacked out. I... Oh, no. <gasps> Look at the car. The windshield. Everything. What a mess. A mess. Or at least I... I think to be in one piece. Now what am I... What am I supposed to do? I'm in the middle of nowhere. It's dark. There's no phone, no... No houses. I, I guess I'd better start walking. I must have walked halfway around the lake by now. There's nobody. There's nothing. Oh, oh, it's oh, up there ahead. A dock. I, I think I see a boat. Oh, it is someone. Hey. Hey. Hey, hello there. What? Well, who's there? Oh, oh, am I glad to see you, sir. I didn't think there was anyone. 
around here for miles. I'm here. Always here. I just ran my car into a ditch a few miles back, and I... I I would really appreciate some help. Oh, had an automobile accident, you say? Yes. Where, where would the nearest gas station be? There ain't none, except in town. Oh, that's over five miles in the dark. Well, but is there a house nearby? Nope. Not that I know of. Well, but what's that out, out there? Out where? Uh, well, I, th- I think I see some lights out, out in the center of the lake. Oh, no. Oh, don't you know what that is? No. Should I? Well, that's the Silver Tree Lake Resort. Resort? <laughs> out here in the middle of nowhere. Well, not many people have heard of it. It's, it's very, uh, how do you say, exclusive? Uh, well, well, would they have a telephone there? You mean you'd want to go there? Well, yeah, just to use their phone. Mm. Oh, I don't know. You make it sound as if they've got guard dogs or something. Oh, they do. A big brood of a German shepherd. Um, but he don't bark at me. I mean, in my boat. He knows me. I make deliveries at the island. Drop off guests a couple of times a week. Supplies, the, the Sunday paper. Well, m- m- might you be able to give me a lift over in your uh, in your launch here? Oh, I'd be happy to oblige you, miss, uh, for a fee. Yeah, the going rate is half a buck. Well, all right. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'd take you for nothing, but it's been a slow week, and, well, the price of gasoline these days... <laughs> never mind, never mind. Here's your money, Mr. Oh, no, uh... just call me Charlie. Hey, come on, hop in now. Watch your step. Here we are. Silver Tree Lake Resort. Oh, beautiful. What I can see of it. Oh, hey, hey, does, does he bite? Lucy, no, not at me, doesn't. Yeah. Good boy. Good boy, Brucey. <laughs> well, follow me. I'll take you to meet the manager and his wife. Uh, they'll be up in the main lobby just ahead. Hey, anybody home? Well, Charlie, how are you? Hey, who's this young lady? Oh, Miss Pamela Allen. I'd like you to meet the owner and manager of Silver Tree Lake Resort, Mr. T.J. Harrison. Well, how do you do, sir? I, I I was hoping that perhaps I might use your phone. Oh? I, I just badly ruined my car. Yes, yeah, you had an accident. Uh, yes, yes, so you have, Miss Allen. I, I can see you. I can see you hurt yourself. No, no, n- not really. I, I would just like to use the phone. Oh, well, I'm afraid it's impossible to switch boards out of order till the morning. Hey, that storm we had early this afternoon knocks the wires down. Oh, I see. You know, the best thing you can do now is to get some rest. You know, we can put you up one of the guest rooms. There's plenty of space. Well, well, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, what credit cards do you accept? <laughs> credit cards. Oh, uh, Miss Allen, you don't really think we charge you for our hospitality. I mean, to a traveler in distress. Well, this may be a hotel, but you're a guest of management. Now... Haven't you ever heard of Southern Hospitality? Well, I... I appreciate it, Mr. Harris. Hey, Varney. Oh, Varney. Come on out here, honey. Hey, uh, Varney, here's my wife. What is it, T.J.? I was just sitting down to dinner. Uh, honey, this is Miss Pamela Allen. She's uh, she had an accident with her car. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So I insist that she stay the night, you know, rest up. Of course. But I, I don't want to put you to any trouble. No, no, no trouble at all. Now, is it, Varney? No, no, of course not. I'll show you to your room. What's a lovely room, Mrs. Harrison. Please call me Vani. And I wish you'd call me Pamela. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your kindness. We're kind of a simple place here, but I think you'll find everything you need. Try to get some rest. You must have had quite an ordeal. Well, good morning, Miss Allen. Did you sleep well? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Uh, again. I-, I was wondering about the telephone. Well, I understand you didn't have supper last night. Now, I insist you sit right down this instant and have a nice big country breakfast. Oh, thank you. But but I never have much of an appetite in the morning. I really wanted to call the gas station about well, my car. Look, this buffet. Now, what would you like? Hmm? Ham, sausage, hash browns, fresh root cup. Hey. 
Do you like sweet rolls? Just a cup of tea. Well, now, you just sit right down at that table over there, and I'll have Orville bring you a tray. Good morning, Pamela. Did you sleep all right? Great. I, I want to thank you. Really. Uh, listen, Bonnie, I-, I-, I don't mean to appear anxious, but are the phones still out of order? What? The telephones. Are they repaired yet? What telephones? You know, the ones that that connect you to the mainland. We don't have any telephones here. What? But your husband told me last night... You must be mistaken. There have never been any telephones here at Silver Tree Island Resort. And here you thought the plot was never going to, as they say, thicken... Was T.J. Harrison so embarrassed about not having telephones at his little island resort that he'd actually lie about something so petty? Or is it really so petty? What ulterior motives could anyone possibly have for something like that? He must have lied for a reason. In any event, he'll have a chance to explain himself when I come back with Act Two. thousand years ago, a Greek writer said, what is pleasanter than the tie of a host and guest? Things haven't changed much since then. Hosts still like to entertain, and guests still worry about overstaying their welcome. Pamela Allen, en route to the wedding of an old friend in the back country of Mississippi, has just spent the night at a hotel in the middle of a lake. Following the promise of the hotel manager that the phone's would be working in the morning. Now it seems her very gracious host neglected to tell her that there aren't any phones on the island. No phone? No, of course not. But why would your husband tell me there were phones if there really weren't? You were in such a state he probably didn't want to upset you. What kind of a place doesn't have telephones? Pam, you have to understand, Silver Tree Island is a place where people come to... Escape the pressures of the outside world. They leave their cares behind. No television, no radio, no telephones. The people prefer it that way, and we cater to our clientele. I guess that makes sense, but still, I... Sure it makes sense. TJ is the perfect host. Oh, hey, here comes Orville with your breakfast. Thank you, but I'm really not very oh, hungry. nonsense. You've got to eat something. You went to sleep on an empty stomach. Uh, Orville... Uh, this here is Miss Pamela Allen. Here's your tray. Orville is the resort social director. Entertains nightly in the Starlight Lounge. How nice. But we all help out in the dining room. Gives the place a homey touch, wouldn't you say? Bonnie, I, I don't want to seem ungrateful. But, you see, I'm expected at a wedding this evening. I really have to get someone to tow the car. It's rented. I've got a lot to do. I was wondering if after breakfast... Hey, now, don't worry about a thing. Just be down at the dock in half an hour. Charlie comes with deliveries about then. He'll give you a ride back. Oh, that's a load off my mind. Thank you. I, uh, I've already had my breakfast, but you shouldn't be eating by yourself. Say, Orville, why don't you sit here with Miss Pamela Allen? All right. Won't you excuse me? I think I see T.J. You're not eating anything. I never eat in the morning. Orville, how long have you been working here at Silver Tree Island? Work? Well, that's what you do, isn't it? Your resident social director? I don't call it work. I call it music. But you'll hear me tonight after dinner. I won't be here. Sure. That's what they all say. What all who say? The guests. Oh, I- I'm not a regular guest. Well, they all say that, too. What are you talking about? Don't you know by now? They're not going to let you get away so fast. Uh, Do you mean to say that... that they're going to try to get me to stay longer? As a regular guest? Well, you could put it that way, yes. That's ridiculous. Charlie's taking me back in his boat as soon as he drops off some supplies. Mm Mm-hmm. Why do you sound so skeptical? Skeptical? 
Heck, I'm not skeptical. <laughs> In fact, I'll walk you down to the landing myself. There's Charlie now. Right on schedule. Oh, I wish I could have found the Harrisons before I left. I wanted to thank them for their hospitality. Hey, Brucey. Here, boy. Come on. Come on. It has to be the gentlest breed I've ever seen. Don't let this pussy cat of a dog deceive you. He's a German shepherd. And he can be fierce if provoked. So uh, you, you'd better get back off the land. What's he growling at me for? That dock is his personal property. Get back. Get back off it. What's the matter? I told you. Brucey doesn't like people trespassing on his dock. But you didn't growl at me last night. Well, that was different. But why? Because I was with Charlie? No. Because you were arriving. Not leaving. Brucey doesn't like to see visitors go. Oh, that's just wonderful. Oh, um, that's... Here's Charlie. I'm uh, sure he'll be happy to escort you. Hi, Charlie. Uh, what are you two doing at the dock this morning? I hope you don't mind, Charlie, but I was hoping to hitch a ride back to the mainland with you. Oh, you did, did you? Yes. Does she really think I'm going to take her back? What do you say? Well, after what you've seen. After what I've seen? What do you mean? Well, it's out of the question. Out of the question now. Now, if you'll just excuse me. Oh, I understand now. You you want me to pay you, right? <laughs> now, you are a smart young lady. Is it still 50 cents? Uh, let me just... Uh, here. Uh, do you have change for a $5 bill? Nope. Or the, could, could I trouble you? Sorry, I never carry money. Well... Here, then. Take the whole five. Are you kidding? It's worth it for me to get going. Well, not to me. I don't deal in paper money. It's 50 cents clear or no ride. But that's five dollars. Perfectly good U.S. currency. Well, I'm not interested. The fee is 50 cents. Exact change only. You're the most unbelievable person I've ever met. Now, see what you've done. You've upset Brucey. You better come back to the hotel, Tom. How could anybody be so mercenary? Young lady, you can always complain to the management. Well, I'm afraid my hands are tied, Miss Allen. Charlie is an independent operator. But surely, Mr. Harris... Now, over the years, he's developed what might appear to outsiders as somewhat eccentric ways. Yeah, now, one of them is a 50-cent charge. In fact, he charges 50 cents for just about everything. It certainly is eccentric. Mm. Well, Mr. Harrison, I'm sure then you won't mind if I trouble you for the change of a... Change? Why, well, you don't understand, Miss Allen. I thought I explained to you last night. <laughs> We're a hospitality house. We never accept money. But you're a hotel, surely. No, have... no, no. And you have the wrong idea about us, Miss Allen. We never charge our guests anything. What? Do you... Do you think I run this place for the money? Well, uh, why else? No, no, no. This is not the kind of business you think. Charge our guests money. No. Our people are here to get away from the world. Now, money is the root of all anxiety and all frustration. Mr. Harrison, if you don't believe in charging money, it's no affair of mine. But I've got to be in Weaverville by early this afternoon. Now, first, you told me some story about there being phones on the island, which there aren't. And then your wife told me I'd be sure to get a ride back with Charlie, except now it appears I can't do that unless I come up with exactly 50 cents, which you say you don't have. Now, what is going on here, Mr. Harrison? Don't you know? No, I'm quite confused. Well, then I'll clear things up for you. We like you very much and would like to invite you to stay. Stay? Here. That's right. You see, well, I, I wouldn't normally be so pushy, but Vani really likes you. And Vani doesn't often take to people. I mean, she really seems to get along with you. I'm very glad, but still... Uh, Vani, Vani has been ill recently. I am sorry to hear that. And uh, already you sort of, you know, brung, brung her spirit back into her face, the shine back in her eyes. Oh, there is nothing like the companionship of young people. Especially when her husband is a, <laughs> such an old fogey like me. Oh, you're not old, Mr. Harrison. <laughs> well, thank you. But the truth is, I'm, 
I am twice as old as Ronnie, and sometimes there's that unavoidable... What, what is it they used to say, uh, generation gap? Well, at least, well, couldn't you stay the weekend? I told you, I have to be in Weaverville by this afternoon. Well, why don't we discuss this after lunch? After lunch? We just had breakfast. Oh, uh, will you excuse me, Miss Allen? I'm wanted at the desk. A new guest. Mr. Harrison, I... Uh, after lunch, Miss Allen. Uh, talk to me after lunch. Uh... I don't know what you're so worked up about. Although I seem to be getting the runaround here. Do you? Really? Uh, what is this, some sort of inquisition? No, I just meant... Well, you seem to enjoy it here. A person has to be a fool to want to leave a place like this. Listen. <laughs> That's a very rare nightingale. Stay, Pamela. I can't. I, I've got things to do. It would be so much better if you wanted to stay. You make it sound as if I have no choice. But you... You don't. What did you say? You're here to stay. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. You can't go back. You know you can't go back. Nobody can ever go back. What? Nobody ever leaves Silver Tree Island. Oh, well, really? I... Ever. That's the price you pay instead of money. You never leave. I don't believe it. It's true, and you know it. Oh, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Oh, quit joking around. It isn't funny anymore. I'm not joking. Look, I've got to get out of here. I, I mean, I left a $35 wedding present in an unlocked car, a rented car with a smashed windshield. I know. A 76 blue sedan. Needs a new windshield and some work on the front grill. How, how, how did you know what kind of car I was driving? Why shouldn't I know? T.J. told me. Mr. Harrison, but uh, how does he know? He knows everything. He always knows the circumstances of the death. The, the what? The death. You know, like your death. My death. What is it? He said it was uh, some kind of a head injury, I think. Your... <laughs> You're telling me that I'm dead. What do you think I'm doing? I don't like your sense of humor, Orville. It's very sick. Pamela, why don't you face facts? You had an accident. You died. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> and you're out of your mind. I'm alive. No. No, you're just a soul. Like the rest of us. You know you're dead. And you know where you are. Oh, and where am I supposed to be? Where all souls go. The island of the dead. The island of the... what? Of the dead. Otherwise known as... Hades. Hades. The island of the dead? Is it possible that Pamela is actually dead? Is progress so universal a concept that the afterlife also changes with the times? The island of Hades becomes a homey resort surrounded by a pleasant lake? Or rather, do people see only what they want to see? We'll see what lies ahead when I return with Act Three. Thousands of years, Western civilization has held on to its belief of some kind of afterlife. Greeks and Romans had legends of an underworld called Hades, run by a gloomy Olympian god and his young, pretty wife. The dead reached Hades by ferrying across the dark river Styx and were greeted at the gates by a huge three-headed dog named Cerebrus. Now, in our story... We have a pleasant southern resort island, the owner and his younger wife, and an ominous German shepherd guarding the boat dock. If there are any parallels, well, they really aren't intentional. 
Hades. Uh, you're telling me that this place is uh, Hades. It is. <laughs> this whole thing is ridiculous. You skidded off the road. All right. You say you blacked out? Uh, yes. But you weren't in the car when you regained consciousness? No, I was on the grass somewhere. Somewhere. Don't you remember? Um, actually, it's all hazy now. Anyway, it's not important. Oh, but it is. You regained consciousness outside your car, a distance from your car. You were thrown from your car. I, I, don't, I don't remember. I, 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 I don't know. Thrown from a car, and you don't have a scratch on you. Going over 45 miles an hour. Don't you see? You're beginning to forget already. That's part of it. What kind of car were you driving? Um, uh... I can't seem to recall. Mm -hmm. What color was it? Uh... I don't remember. You see? The wind of forgetfulness. Well, you're just trying to frighten me. I'm just trying to make you see the truth. I, I, I've got to get moving. I, I'll be late. Late for what? Do you remember where you have to be? Of course. I, I've got to, uh... I, I've got to, um, go over to the... Uh, strange, I, I, I can't seem to... to you remember? Me. I told you. Face facts. You're a resident. A permanent resident of Silver Tree Resort. No. No. No, there, there, there must be some explanation. Pamela. Pamela, wait. You can't go. There's no way off the island, don't you see? Come on, Brucie. Let me go past. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. I'm not going to steal the boat. He'll bite. He'll bite, you know. So if I'm dead, I won't feel it. Oh, you'll feel it, all right. I don't understand this. I, I don't understand any of it. Why won't anyone let me leave? Hello. How are you feeling? Oh, Pamela, answer me. What have I done to make you angry? I want to leave. Nobody will let me leave. Is this such a bad place? No. Not really. Has anyone treated you unkindly, made you feel unwelcome? No. Then what's the problem? Bonnie, is this place really... really... Yes, it is. And am um, I supposed to be... Everyone here is dead. That's what makes Silver Tree Island Resort so uh, exclusive. The ultimate in exclusiveness, if that's the appropriate word. I'm really dead. Hey, it's not so bad. I'm 27 years old. What, what, what did I ever do to Pamela? I was a lot younger than you when I came here. I cried and I wanted to go home, but... Well, what's done is done. I'm here. And it really isn't that unpleasant. We can be friends. Orville seems to like you and he usually doesn't bother with people. I'd be very flattered if I were you. Twenty-seven years old. And I never really... I never really loved someone. You might as well face facts. Why? Because that's the way things are. Why do I have to accept that? Because you have to. That's why. Bonnie, I don't have to accept anything. But you do have Some to. Some people. Most people. Almost all people. But not me. And what do you intend to do about it? Bonnie, when I go into a store and they sell me something and I decide I don't want it, I go right back and I return it. Even if the store has a strict no-return policy, I return it and I get my money back. Do you know why? No. Because that's how I was raised. My mother told me, Pamela, never let anyone sell you something you don't want to buy, and I never have. But this is different. How is it different? You're talking about a... Uh... Non-returnable item. That's where you're wrong, Bonnie. 
everything is returnable. T.J., honey, Pamela here wants to talk to you. That's right, sure. Is uh, everything all right, Miss Allen? No, everything is not all right. Oh, no? Well, what's wrong? I, I'll take care of it right away. I am not pleased with the services of this establishment. What? How can that be? I find the quality not to my satisfaction. Well, uh, what exactly don't you like? Is it the food? You call that food? I've eaten sandwiches out of vending machines that tasted better. Oh, you can't mean that. I insist you provide transportation for me back to the mainland. Well, now, I will oblige you in any way a good host can, Miss Allen. And I'll improve your meals. I'll do anything a good host should. But the successful host is one who's made his guests feel uh, so welcome that they never wish to leave. And I fear I have not succeeded with you. But never mind. I am working on it. <laughs> You play very beautifully, Otto. I don't understand it, Pamela. What exactly do you want to get back to? I... I don't know. And why are you so anxious to get back? It doesn't make much sense. All I know is... I'm not ready for... For this yet. No one ever is. I've got to leave while I still have this resistance. It'll pass with time. How long... Have you been here, Orville? How long? <laughs> oh, I don't know. An eternity, maybe. No, really. H how long? So long, I can't remember. But I know you can't ever leave here. I know someone who tried once. Who? Oh. There was this musician. He was at some kind of a concert, and his wife was at home alone, there was this terrible accident, and the wife was dead. The man went out of his mind. He couldn't believe what had happened. I think I know that story. Do you? Yes, it's the story of... Now let me tell you how it ended. The man knew where she'd gone, so he came here. Charlie took him across in his rowboat. There weren't power boats in those days. And he went before the king of the underworld to beg for the return of his wife. At first, the king refused. But then the musician started to play his lyre. He played a song. A song so sweet and sad about a young girl painting flowers in an open field. A girl that the king had loved at first sight and brought down to the underworld to be his queen. And the king was moved to tears, told the musician he could have his wife. He could return with her to the world of the living, if only he didn't turn around and look behind him on the journey homeward. But he did look behind, didn't he? Yes. And Eurydice, the wife, vanished into dust, didn't she? Yes. Into dust. It was your wife, wasn't it? Yes. It was my wife. Times change. Names change. You're Orpheus, aren't you? It was so long ago. Sometimes I've almost completely forgotten about it. I'm sorry. Oh, about what? Listen, I never fool myself. I'm a musician first. A performer. That's what's the most important to me. That's my first and real love. The other kinds of love... Uh, they become gentle memories that become part of my music. But it's the music. That's what's important. The music. That's it. The music. What is it? Oval, you're going to help me get out of here. No, no, no. I, I don't want you to go. If you call yourself my friend, you'll help me. But what can I do? I used to be quite a mythology buff, Orville. I remember some more details about the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. He was the greatest musician the world has ever known. I know that. Isn't it also legend that he played music so moving, so exquisitely touching, that he caused all who heard it to lay down and weep? 
How did he get past the gates of Hades, Orville? How did he get past that ferocious three-headed monster, Cerebrus? I, I don't... You know how. He played a song so sweet and gentle. The huge animal wept. It became a lullaby. And soon Cerebus was fast asleep. Then he just walked right on past the sentinel and into Hades. And that is how I'm going to walk right out of here or swim, if that's what it comes down to. I, I can't do it this time. Why not? I don't want to. I, I like you. I want you to stay. Didn't you tell me that you were an artist first? I am. So, let's see how much of an artist you really are. Can you create another legend now? Or do you really have doubts that you've lost the old touch? I, is that what it really is? No. Or... No, I still have it. Then... Show me. Show me, Orville. Better than I thought. I won't have to swim. I can take Charlie's launch. I don't know, Pamela. Start playing, Orville. Play more sweetly than you've ever played before. Lovely, Orville. Oh, I'm a boy again. I'm on the high seas, cresting those waves, those oars. My muscles are rippling. I'm cutting those oars through the waves like a knife through butter. Oh, that's beautiful. something about him. Charlie's all taken care of. Now get rid of this dog. Here, Brucey. Here, boy. There. Now go ahead. Hurry. I don't know how long I can hold them. Thank you, Orville. Thank you. Hurry. Hurry. I'll never forget you for this, Orville. I'll never forget. Never forget. Hey! Hey! Never forget. Miss Allen, Miss Allen, are you all right? Officer. Officer. Yeah, Leroy LaRue Jr., you remember me, don't you? It's still nighttime. How, how can it still be nighttime? Oh, boy, you, you've gone into one heck of a skid, miss. Oh, look at this car. For a minute, I thought you were dead. Now, you really look dead. I'm... I'm all right. What? I, I, I feel fine now. I, I, I don't understand it. I, I could have sworn you were dead. But the dead don't come back to life, do they? No. No. They don't, Officer LaRue. Of course. They don't. Or do they? After all, anything is possible in this day and age. Anyhow, who is to say whether or not this wasn't all some dream? Maybe there really isn't some actual life and death struggle that has gone on since the beginning of time. Maybe there is really no place called the Isle of the Dead. In any event, one thing we do know for sure is that this is the place right here where you'll be when I return shortly. lesson. Don't always feel you have to pay for something you don't want at the moment. Some people can be mighty persuasive salesmen, but the fault, dear Brutus, is truly with the customers who so readily purchase whatever is foisted upon them. With most of us, we are so ready to accept our fates because someone tells us that is the way it is to be. But is it? 
Our cast included Patricia Elliott, Lloyd Batista, Terry Keene, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. And now stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program... The Whistler. Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the whistler's strange story, The Witness. Like so many people, Paul Kilburn was his own worst enemy. He had brilliance, charm, and youth, and he never let anyone forget it. When he graduated from college, he received the American Award for the most promising student of architecture at Andover University, and he never let anyone forget that either. Yes, Paul Kilburn had a lot to learn, and as an assistant in the architectural firm of Joseph Abercrombie and Company, he was given the opportunity to learn, but he refused to accept it. Now, for the third time that week, Paul strode defiantly into the company office, giving plain evidence of his resentment and his third hangover of the week. Paul. Yeah? Mr. Abercrombie's been looking for you. Has he found me yet? You're an hour late. An hour and a half late. You'd better think up some story for him. I did the best I could. A uh, little Miss Cover-Up. Everybody's office, pal. Don't you ever get tired of being grand, Edith? Paul, be quiet. And tell Mr. Amber Crombie Mr. Kilburn is here and happy to confer with him at any time. I'm free now, Mr. Kilburn, if that's convenient with you. Perfectly. Perfectly. After you, Mr. Abercrombie. Sit down, Paul. All right. I'm tired of warning you, Paul. This is the third time this week. And before that, well, I'm just lost. And time. if I don't mend my ways in the future, I won't have a future. Isn't that the way it goes? You don't have a future now, Paul. Not with us. You're fired. I'm what? Fired. You're the most promising member of our staff. There's no question about that, but I think we can manage without you. When you lose some of your egotism and replace it with some sense of responsibility... Come back and see us. You didn't expect that, did you, Paul? Joseph Abercrombie and Company was to be a mere stepping stone for you. A lull before the storm of success. But not now. You keep up your front of careless indifference, even when Edith insists that the two of you go out for a cup of coffee together. But inside, you feel like a whipped schoolboy, don't you, Paul? Oh, Paul, what are you going to do? You tell me. I... I feel awkward. Why? I'm the one who got fired. I... I just do, Paul. I've watched your work. You're going to be a great architect. Well, it's too bad you didn't reach Abercrombie with that news. I know I'm acting like a schoolgirl on her first date. Oh, hey, well, uh... What are you trying to say? 
It's hard for me, Paul, because, well, we've only gone out once or twice, and you've been so distant. Oh, no harm, Matt. I know. Look, Paul, I've inherited $20,000. $20,000? Oh. I wish I had your luck. You have. Come again? 20000 is enough for you to open an office of your own and keep going until you make it on your own, Paul. Yeah, but what about you? Where, where do you come in? Anywhere you say. You can consider it a loan or make me a partner in the firm. I can handle the office end. Yeah, but, but why take a chance on me? I'm not very steady. I've slept through an alarm clock ever since I was in long pants. I never sleep through an alarm clock. And I never forget to set it either. I'll phone you every morning and get you up. No, no, it's too good. Why? What else do I have to do for this backing? Nothing, except stop drinking. My offer goes as I made it. I'm talking about you. Don't you want anything more out of this? Well, yes, I do. What? You. I want to marry you, Paul. <laughs> When you hear a commercial on the radio, you naturally assume it was written by some advertising man, don't you? Well, frankly, friends, the best commercials about Signal Ethel are written by you drivers yourselves. Here's what I mean. All I have to do is spend a little time around a signal station. Pretty soon in drives the owner of a shiny new car who boasts, That Signal Ethel sure brings out all the pep and power they build into these new high-compression motors. Well, answers the owner of a 42 model, this baby may not be new, but it sure runs like it with Signal Ethel. Then a tourist who had stopped for one of Signal's free maps chimes in. The thing I like about Signal Ethel is the way it takes me over these big western hills without shifting or clattering. Well, the only trouble, friends, is that there isn't room in one commercial for all the enthusiastic things drivers say about the premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline. To discover them all, you'll simply have to try a tank full of this super-powerful super-fuel. Which is the best idea, anyway. Try a tank full. Then let its performance in your car write the best commercial you've ever heard about Signal Ethel. about halfway, don't you, Paul? You let her set you up in business all right, and you become engaged. But you conveniently put off the marriage to some future date, or, as you tell Edith, until you've proved yourself worthy of all she's done for you. And as time goes by, you're forced to admit that she has a wholesome influence on you. Your drinking stops. You adopt regular habits. But the instantaneous success you expected as an architect comes very slowly, doesn't it, Paul? Well, how about it, Mr. Crawford? What do you think of these plans? Young man, if there weren't a young lady present, I'd tell you exactly what I think of them. Why, what do you mean, Mr. Crawford? I mean to be blunt that these plans you drew up, Kilburn, are utterly worthless as far as I'm concerned. Now, wait a minute. And if this is your idea of what I need, then, young man, I don't need you. Good day, sir. But, Mr. Crawford... Now, let him go. But... All right, Paul. And don't worry, darling. We'll do this thing yet, together. I'm sorry, Kilburn. I, I don't like to go into this on the phone, but these plans of yours just won't do. So far, I see no indication that you want to incorporate anyone's idea except your own. Well, if you have such hot ideas of your own, why did you come to me in the first place? That's odd, Mr. Kilburn. I was just about to ask myself the same question. Why the... Oh, Paul, you, sh you shouldn't get so angry. You shouldn't... I don't need guys like that. Yes, you do, darling. We both need them. A lot of them. 
And somehow we'll get them, too. For the first time in your life, you begin to know what hard work is, don't you, Paul? You have to work hard. And Edith, beside you every step of the way, works even harder than you do. Nights, days, weekends. Until finally someone says the words you've waited to hear. Well, sir, Mr. Kilburn, I've seen everything. Is there, is there anything I missed, Mr. Benson? Oh, no, no, not a thing, Kilburn. This is a work of art. You're a fine architect and an, an excellent architect. Well... We're so glad you're pleased, Mr. Benson. Oh, yes, indeed. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you one thing. If this is a sample of your work, you'll never want for clients. If I can help it, I'm happy I had sense enough to hire you. And that's just the beginning, isn't it, Paul? The Benson contract was a big one. And from that, others began to come in. After a while, you become used to the idea of success. That's easy, isn't it, Paul? But getting used to the idea of marrying Edith one day is something else again. But you don't really want to lose Edith completely. She's so convenient. Still phones you every morning to get you up. Takes care of all sorts of annoying details at the office. Even you have to admit she's a big part of your success. But you can't put her off indefinitely, can you, Paul? And one afternoon about a month later... As Edith comes into your workroom, you have no way of knowing that the time of decision is near at hand. Someone to see you, Paul. Shall I tell her to wait? Her? Patricia Wilson. Never heard of her. Everyone else has. She's a tobacco heiress. Just flew in from Rome a few weeks ago. And she's very pretty. Oh, money and beauty. Both, I'm sorry to say. Oh, by the way, I'm sending your drawings to the International Society of Architects and Designers competition. Okay, if you say so. Nothing to lose and 10000 to gain, to say nothing of all the honors. No, oh, suit yourself. And you can send that tobacco heiress in. Oh, I'm in, Mr. Gilson. I'd have been in earlier if I'd known that geniuses come so young and so handsome. Well, I'd have come out, Miss Wilson, if I'd had any idea the tobacco leaves had such a lovely flower. <laughs> we'll get on. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, of course, Edith. Uh, sit down, Miss Wilson. I will. Now I know I want you to design me a house. That's good. Yes, it is. And I know exactly what I want. And architecture is one of my hobbies. Oh, can't you leave the architecture to me? Well, what would I do for a hobby, Mr. Kilburn? Find another one. Like, uh, horseback riding, you say. When? Well, let's see now. Excuse me, Paul. Yes, what is it? This contractor at Silver Lake House is on the phone. It's about some trouble with the peg flooring. Why trouble? There's nothing to putting that in. Perhaps you'd better talk with him, Paul. No, not now. Tell him... Uh, well, uh, tell him I'll be out there right away. All right, Paul. I'll call the parking lot and have him send your car Yes, on. yes, do that. I'm uh, sorry, Miss Wilson. Not at all. I like spirit in my architect. Well, this contractor's always telling me something can't be done. I know all about peg floors. Practically put them in my house by myself. Uh, now, uh, where were we? You just suggested horseback riding, and I just asked when. But I'm going to take back my question. Oh? Mm-hmm. Make a statement out of it. We'll go riding Sunday. Oh. <laughs> Patricia's very sure of herself, isn't she, Paul? And that Sunday, and the next and the next, when it isn't horseback riding, it's golf, or the races at Del Mar, or dinner and dancing. It's always something, and it's always Patricia. You see Edith less and less. It's good business, you tell her. Patricia's wealthy, and she knows everyone worth knowing. Edith never says anything, and you push her hurt, suffering looks to the back of your mind. But Patricia is not so generous with it. <laughs> oh, oh, that was wonderful. Yeah, yeah it was great. <sighs> you won again. Oh, of course, darling. I always win. Didn't you know that? I've wondered. Oh, well, maybe not always at that. For instance, are you still engaged to that little mouse of a secretary of yours? Technically. Why? I told you why before. I don't appreciate having that plain little creature as a rival. 
Winning over her would be an empty victory, and losing would be unbearable. Well, what do you want to win? You don't know? I don't think so. Oh, now you're being insulting. Maybe. How do I know you haven't pulled this off in Rome, Paris, or London? Pulled what off? A victory, and then left the sap holding his hand. <laughs> you're not far wrong. Well, well, I don't intend to be another sap. <laughs> you're not going to be. Does that mean you'll marry me? Yes. When? As soon as you break off with that little secretary of yours. No, I, I, I told you. I'll let her down as soon as I could. I better be very soon. I don't like waiting. You try, Paul, but you can't bring yourself to do it. Too many people know how much Edith has helped you when you were down and out. And besides, deep down, you're too much of a coward to tell her the truth. And on Monday morning, you come into the office late with a hangover. Good morning, Paul. Hello, Edith. I warn you, I'm about to do something I never did before. Yeah, what? I'm going to kiss you right here in this oh, office. Oh, no, please, Edith, no. Stop it. All right. Maybe I should have told you about the telegram before I tried to kiss you. What, the telegram? Yes. Listen. Mr. Paul Kilburn, congratulations. The International Society of Architects and Engineers is pleased to announce that your designs have been selected as the most original and creative in the field of architecture. You have been named the Society's Architect of the Year. The award will be made officially on Sunday, July 15th at the Stratton Club in a banquet to be tendered in your honor. H.M. Wakefield, President. Do I get that kiss? Yeah. Oh, Paul. I'll be so proud when I watch them present you with the diamond pin and the $10,000 at the banquet. Of course. I'm sure you will. I know, Paul, it's all over the papers. Congratulations, darling. Thanks, Patricia. Oh, I've been a busy girl. Rushed down to Antoine's to have myself fitted for a new gown. Where do you see it the night of the banquet? You shouldn't have done that. Why not? I'm taking Edith to the banquet. I have to. No, you're not. Now, be reasonable, Patricia. You know I love you. I tell you, there's nothing I can do. All right. I like your little Edith play Cinderella for one night, but after that, Paul, you're going to get rid of her. And I mean rid of her. She's not going to be your secretary or anything else. Is that clear? Yes. I promise you. She'll go. The banquet is a gala affair. You and Edith are in the seats of honor at the first table. And at the next table, staring coldly at you, Patricia with some obscure architect. And as if further irony were needed, your former employer, Joseph Abercrombie, is selected as Toastmaster. You're completely miserable, aren't you, Paul? In a few minutes, you'll be presented with $10,000 and the highest honors of your profession. And you wish you were a thousand miles away. You take your usual form of escape, don't you, Paul? The waiter... Another whiskey and water, please. Please, Paul, darling, no more. You called for me in your car, remember? You can drive if you think I've had too much. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before we officially present the award to the architects of the year, I'd like to tell you something about this year's winner. I, I know him very well. I had the honor if I can use that word, of being the only man who have fired him. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that he proved himself a better man than I. <laughs> Before I say any more about him, however, I would like to pay homage to the woman behind the throne. It was her financial and moral backing through thick and thin that made Paul Kilburn what he is today. And she is soon to become his wife. I want Edith Kramer to stand up and take a bow. Thank you. Thank you very much. I shall always remember this night. 
You can see Patricia's eyes staring at you from the next table. They're ablaze with hatred. And there's nothing you can do but sit there and smile mechanically. You're called to the rostrum where the diamond pin is clipped onto your lapel. And you receive the check for $10,000. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Patricia is at your side. I'm not waiting any longer, Paul. Finish with her tonight. Don't drive so fast. Look, you told me to go ahead and drive. Now, don't tell me how to do it. All right, dear. Let's be happy tonight. It's such an important night, Paul. Oh, you're so blind, Edith. Can't you see it's over? Is it? You know it is. Oh, Paul, I... Oh, stop that. You're the one who's blind, Paul. Don't you see she'll ruin you? In a month, you'll be a drunkard and a bum. I'll take my chances. If you leave me for that... that Patricia... I swear I'll tell everyone. If that's the only way I can hold you, I'll make you look so cheap. You, you hear me? Oh, oh, oh! oh stop it, Edith. <laughs> that's not going to help. <laughs> oh, Paula, that's a car. <laughs> I guess so. Come on, let's get out of here. But, Paul, the other car. There's a man lying on the road. Yeah, I see him. Maybe he needs help. Edith. Come back here, Edith. He's not moving. Get back in the car. He's dead, Paul. I'm sure he is. You see anybody else? No, but it's dark. Any other cars? No. That's a break. Not this thing alone to start. Come on. Come on. There. Gas station just around the bend. We can call the police Holy, from there. Are you insane? Manslaughter and liquor on my breath? But, Paul... You can't do anything for him. You said he was dead. Thousand thoughts race through your mind as you drive Edith home. Somehow, you manage to get her car in the garage without being seen. And as you stand with Edith at her front door before walking to the corner cab stand, Edith gives you something else to think about. Someday you'll forgive me for loving you so much, Paul. Oh, no, no. Not now, Edith. I can't say You're I going get... to forget about Patricia. Because I won't give you up now, Paul. Ever. What? What, what is this? I wouldn't do this if it were just for me. But it's for you, too. I'm a witness, Paul. The only witness to the accident. So? We're going to get married, Paul. Soon. She means it, doesn't she, Paul? All the way home in the taxi, you think how much she means it. Inside your own home, the swirl of thoughts engulf you. The accident. Edith. Patricia, drunk driving, hit and run. Patricia, Edith. Hour passes, two. Then one thought emerges clear and demanding, and you know what you must do. Hello? It's Paul, Edith. I want you to come over right away. Happened. Nothing. We're going to be married, that's all. Paul, it's three in the morning and you... I'm oh. fine. I just throw a few things in the bag and grab a cab and come over. I'll pack my bag and by the time you get here, we'll take my car and drive oh, south. darling. Oh, my. What's wrong? I just remembered. You have a nine o'clock appointment with Mr. Healy in the morning. I've got my alarm clock set for seven, so I'll be sure and get you up. Edith, for heaven's sake. Oh, oh all right, darling. Forgive me. I, I'm not quite awake... This is sudden. Oh, Paul, darling, I'll hurry. I came as soon as I could, Paul. 
I hope you haven't changed your mind. No, Edith. I haven't changed my mind. Oh, Paul. Paul, I'm so happy. I... Paul, no. You work quickly, just as you'd planned it, Paul. Hurriedly drill the wooden pegs out of three of the heavy oak planks in your floor. Push them aside and stuff Edith's body in her suitcase into the 18-inch clearance underneath. This will do for now, won't it, Paul? Until you have more time to safely dispose of the body. You replace the planks, hammer in some new pegs. Then you reach for the phone. I want the police department, please. Police headquarters? This is Paul Kilburn, number four, Linwood Lane. Yes. My fiancée is missing, Edith Kramer. She dropped me off at my house about 11, said she was going straight home. I've been trying to reach her ever since. No one answers. I can't imagine what's happened to her. Would you please? My number is East Hills, 49283. With cars costing as much as they do today and the future supply of new ones uncertain. Most all drivers are interested in ways to make their cars last. And there's no better way to make your car last than to reduce engine wear due to lubrication 50% with amazing new Signal Premium Motor Oil. Just consider what a 50% reduction in engine wear can mean to you. With new Signal Premium, your car should keep its like new pep and power twice as long should go twice as many miles before needing an overhaul due to engine wear. If your car isn't already an oil eater, new Signal Premium should double the period during which you continue to enjoy low oil consumption. And get this, you can enjoy all these extra benefits of this superior quality heavy-duty type oil at no increase in price at Signal stations. So if you want to keep your car's performance up and expenses down for a long time to come. You know the oil to change to. New Signal Premium. You know where to get it. At friendly, independently operated Signal Service Station. Well, Paul, it's all over, isn't it? Edith Kramer's death. Her body hidden temporarily beneath the floor in your living room. You've reported her absence to the police in the hope that their search for her will lead them to her car in the garage, the one you were driving when you killed a man late tonight. It's Edith who will appear guilty, isn't it, Paul? Yes, you're sure now that Edith's hold over you is gone. And as the hours pass, You find yourself thinking of Patricia and the life of luxury the two of you will share while you patiently await word on Edith's disappearance. Finally, it comes. I'm Lieutenant Nicholas. You're uh, Paul Kilburn? Oh, that's right. Come in, Lieutenant. Have you found her? No, not yet. But I'd like to. Looks like she killed a man last night. What? Get and run accident. E- Edith? Oh, that's impossible. We found her car in a garage. Looks like an accordion. It's the car, all right. Oh, but where is she? Skipped out. At least her bedroom looks like it. But we'll find her, and we'll have you to thank for it when we do. Me? Yeah, if you hadn't reported her missing, we'd never have found her car. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. Uh, what time do you have now? Now, uh, just about 7 o'clock. Yeah, been a long night, hasn't it? Mind if I use your phone? No, no, no not at all. What's that? Uh, my alarm clock in the bedroom. Hmm. It doesn't sound like it. 
Wait a minute. Oh, right here, under the floor. I'm standing over it. The suitcase. What's that? That nothing. Nothing at all. What's an alarm clock doing under your floor? W- well, you, you see, I... I believe I'll just find out for myself, Mr. Kilburn. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, Lieutenant. Come in, will you? I want you to help me tear up some floorboards. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. And before you start your vacation trip, be sure to ask your signal dealer for a free copy of Lane's Guide, a booklet prepared by an independent travel organization to help you find good eating and lodging places. While no pocket-sized booklet can include all the good hotels, motels, and dining places, Lane's Guide covers a representative selection in hundreds of cities and towns. And a copy of this handy publication is yours free at Signal Station. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Hi Averback, Eve McVeigh, Betty Lou Gerson, John Daner, and Jess Kirkpatrick. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen. Story by Meyer Dolinsky, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday, when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for the Horace Height Show, which follows immediately over most of the East stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Auto Light and its 96,000 dealers bring you Mr. Joseph Cotton in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Auto Light presents the story of a man who craved power, position, and money and destroyed himself accomplishing it. A tale we call Watery Grave, starring Mr. Joseph Cotton. Why, it's Oscar Otto. You're looking way below par. I feel that way, too. Well, let Dr. Wilcox have a look. Uh, huh. Well, Oscar, I'd say you're suffering from a case of worn-out spark plugs. Let's visit the nearest Autolite spark plug dealer. He and his exclusive Autolite plug check indicator will quickly show if I'm right. And suppose you are. Well, if that exclusive Autolite plug check indicator shows that your spark plugs are worn out or wrong for your style of driving... The Autolite spark plug dealer will install a bright, brisk set of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs to give you smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. Okay, let's go. But how do I find the location of the nearest Autolite spark plug dealer? Why, that's easy. We'll call Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. She'll gladly tell us his location. Let's go, Oscar, because uh, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with A Watery Grave and the performance of Mr. Joseph Cotton, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. How did it happen when everything was so good? How did it get destroyed in five short hours? How did I start to die?
In our city, a district attorney is an important man. Our city is an important city in the nation. Therefore, I am important as its district attorney. The logic of law, the deductive reasoning that leads to everything. It was only reasonable that such powerful interests should come to me. I had a case against McNeely which could have destroyed him. What is it, Mr. McNeely? I'm not in the habit of making these calls myself, Mr. Callum. That's obvious, but then you're not in this position very often either. It's a daring thing you've done. Only a question of getting a sufficiently strong case against you. I've broken other district attorneys for attempting it. Well, they never had the evidence I do. I don't think you'd want to try breaking me. I can send you to prison for life. You're right. And yet, where I can't destroy you, I can prevent you from advancing, getting to a greater position, a more prominent position in political life. What does that mean? It means that it's no longer a question of can you be bought, but how much you want. I've waited a long time for this moment to be able to bargain with you. <laughs> I, uh, I respect your strength and perception. It's worth a great deal to me, Mr. Callan. But there's the matter of my chief witness. If I don't prosecute you, he'll go to the state district attorney, perhaps to the federal government. And that is part of what you will give me in exchange for the wealth you're going to receive. Who is your chief witness? I can guarantee you he'll not testify. I would rather give myself my own guarantee on that matter. It would mean his uh, death, wouldn't it? Mr. Callan, all of us, any of us, even the most noble of persons must look the other way sometimes. It's easy for you to say that. It's easy for you to do. To look the other way becomes the easiest thing in the world after a while. All you have to know is why you're doing it and what you have to gain. How does one look the other way? How does one achieve the facility for turning around at precisely the right moment? A trip to Europe. My wife has always wanted to go to Europe. She likes things like that. His name trip to Europe is something that is dreamed of. Spoken of it often. His name? Bartell. Ah, yes. Oh, yes. My good, trusted friend, Bartell. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Mr. Callan. Who was Bartell, a man from the streets who had muscled his way into life? Who was Bartell? Circumstance had made him a witness to McNeely's worst plan. Destiny had placed him in a position of value to the district attorney's office. This valueless man, Bartell, happenstance and coincidence, had made him the keeper of dark secrets and illegal events which could have smashed an empire. An empire I was now partner to merely because I told them a name and look the other way. The first night out, I waited on deck after dinner, waited for Betty to come out, and we would go to the main saloon. No, it felt good to know your way in the world, to know when to look the other way. Sometimes you only have to do it once, if you plan right. And Betty could have everything. A bigger house, another servant in the house. Up, up, moving up. So secure, I didn't even hear his footsteps approaching. So positive all was going well, I didn't even think of caution. So certain of success. Everything for Betty. I was so pleased. You're the only man I ever trusted. Uh, Bartell. The only man. And a D.A. besides. Uh... And you can still trust me. Even after you said my name? I'm getting rid of McNeely for you. Are you? You turn state's evidence. If you didn't believe I could get rid of McNeely, you wouldn't have dared turn state's evidence. I believed you. I trusted you. Let's stop the game. Why did I ever think I could trust you? Now, tell me, you're a smart man. You went to college. Because it was to your advantage. Because... If the law could get rid of McNeely for you, that was better. And safer. So don't have any illusions about trusting me. You never did. You needed me. That's different. And you needed me. We needed each other. We still do. Nothing's different. Uh, you're on the bond, Bartell. You're leaving the country without permission. McNeely gave me permission. He had me shot at, and I was wounded. See my shoulder? 
fat on this side, fat from bandages. You don't have a passport. I don't need that either. I have money. How'd you get aboard? Oh, it's simple. Easy to stay hidden for a day. The second and third day, that's something else. I can fix it so you won't be let off, so you'll be sent right back. Mr. Callan, I can put you in prison if I'm sent back. My word would prevail against yours in any court of law. Maybe against my word alone. But not McNeely's hired gun, so both our words against yours. You have him? Some of my men do, yeah. He's safe at home. Oh, I could discredit your testimony. Ah, then why argue? I have nothing to do with you. You got no choice, Mr. Callan. I'm warning you, Bartell. Well, what do you do? Kill me? <laughs> You're not the kind who thinks like that. You kill by law, the legal way. And I'll find a way by law. Once I'm in Europe, they have different laws. All right. I'm a realist, Bartell. So? I only take calculated risks. What's your price? I have more money than you do, Callan. You couldn't buy me. Then what do you want? But you have more prestige than I do. You're liked. You know your way around the talkers. Well, talk me off this ship. You're impossible. Find a way. You'll be discovered before we dock. Not if you put me up in your cabin. Bartell, wherever I'm involved, I'll listen and meet a man halfway. But but me, me alone, not my wife. If you involve my wife, I won't do a thing for you. Not if my wife's involved in any way, not a thing. I'm in a squeeze, Callan. I'm finished unless you help me get into Europe. But you'll be finished with me. I got enough power for that. I'll find a way. All right, I'll go with you. No. Meet me here in one hour. I walked away calm. I made a point of walking away confident, but my stomach felt sick. Maybe I'd thought of trying to kill him then and didn't know it. I'd been raised to respect human life. I'd been educated to be decent, to forgive. But Bartell wasn't human, he was a beast. And is there anything in the ethic which says we cannot protect our lives when attacked? Bartell was destroying me, pulling me carefully, built world down about me. A world Betty must know nothing about. A world I had built to protect Betty. From law school to ward politics to assistant district attorney... The long way up, the hardest minds to fight, the most realistic men to please. Only the toughest stay with it. Only the toughest and shrewdest get to my position because my position leads to the highest offices if you're smart, if you look the other way. Maybe I knew I wanted to kill him then. The sea was calm, the ship wasn't pitching, yet my stomach was sick. Half an hour was gone and still no plan. Where to go? Who to turn to? What to ask? Nothing anywhere. My mind posed questions for which there were no answers. Would I lose all I owned in the world? Problems for which there were no solutions. If I lost everything, would Betty go too? Were the two things inseparable? My success and Betty? I'll be ready in a minute. Betty, Betty, Robert, is that you? Who is it? Oh, Robert, you didn't answer. There. Drink helps. Helps what? I, uh, you go to the dining saloon yourself. I'll be along soon. You mind if I ask what's wrong? I can handle it. Yes, of course. I'll be in the dining saloon. Uh, wait a minute. Come back. All right. What is it? You were going to leave, weren't you? I don't understand. You'd have left me. You saw I was troubled, very troubled, and I wanted to talk to you, but you made me ask you. Oh, please, don't get angry, Robert. Please don't you argue. You always make me ask you for your attention, always, ever since we've been married. Not always, Robert, not ever since we were married. Most of the time. You changed, you got quiet, you never wanted to talk about things I was doing. You never accepted my suggestions. You didn't understand the legal profession, the workings of law. That's why I stopped giving suggestions. It wasn't suggestions I wanted, it was encouragement to have you believe in me. But you never did. The more I gave you, the more I tried to give you, the less you seemed to care. Oh, please. You think stop. all these things come out of the sky? Do you think they were given to me? I had to fight for them. To fight to get things for you. I never asked for them. Oh, but you took them. You never refused them. You never said, no, I don't want a lot of clothes. No, I don't want a fur coat. You never said no. Stop shouting. Stop shouting. Everything. For you. But you give nothing in return. No love or affection or like, not even liking. Oh, stop. Why didn't you ask for a divorce? I'll give you a divorce. Easy. Simple. Is that what you want? 
Oh, I can't stand anymore. Fear. Oh. You're not going to leave now. My arm. You know why you want to divorce me? You know why you won't? Because of these comforts. And that's all you want. And you'd lose them. You'd lose them overnight. Why do you do this? I've paid for everything in my life, for everything. Everything you have. Only now it's time for you to pay, too. <laughs> To kill a man is the easiest thing in the world to do To kill a man who would take your wife from you I know the logic, I know it's wrong Bartell wasn't taking my wife from me But he was taking position and wealth And those things kept my wife to me I thought I knew Bartell had to be destroyed and she would have to be partner to it. That way she'd never leave. That way I'd achieve everything. That's why I told her the story as if I'd memorized it, as if it was the only thing I'd ever thought about, as if Bartell's death was the last obstacle in our life. No, Robert. Please, don't, Robert. You'll distract him up there on the deck, at the dark place on the deck. Don't ask me. Don't make me part of this. Together. We plan it. Together, we need him. Together. Come on, Betty, the hour is up. Bartell's hour is up. Bringing you Mr. Joseph Cotton in A Watery Grave. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Ah, thanks to your Autolite spark plug there and his exclusive plug check indicator, Oscar. And those new ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. They're right at home in my ignition system. That's because Autolite spark plugs are designed by the same Autolite engineers who design the coil, distributor, and all the other important parts of complete ignition systems used as original equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. What type Autolite spark plugs did I get, Mr. Wilcox? The new Autolite resistor type, Oscar. They give double life, greater gas savings, and quicker starts as compared to spark plugs without a built-in resistor. And the Autolite resistor spark plug is only one of a complete line of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs designed for every use. So, friends, take a tip from me and see your Autolite spark plug dealer. Have him check your spark plugs. And remember... From bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Joseph Cotton in Elliot Lewis's production of A Watery Grave, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. How did I start to die? Then, at that moment, as we walked along the deck, did I start to die then because I knew I would kill Bartell? Does one die a little if one plans to kill a human being and die more when one does it? And to compound it, Your Honor... Funny to think, Your Honor. Funny to think that way now. To compound it by knowing your wife hates you more than anything in the world because she's terrified infuriated by her hate, but pleased with her terror? How can she hate me so? In, in so short a time, I gave her everything. I tried to be something important for her, and rich for her, and killed for her. As we walked along the deck, I had no real idea how I would kill Bartell, no exact idea, but it had to be done. I held Betty's arm tightly as we approached the dark part of the deck near the railing. 
the place where the hotel was, not actually a railing, an entrance for a ramp with only a chain across it. Bartell. Bartell, this is my wife. What did you decide? I, I've been talking to her. I've been explaining to her. What did you decide? Don't talk to me like that, Bartell. Don't ever talk to me like that. Do you put me in your stateroom? We... Yes, yes, of course. And guarantee to get me off the ship? I couldn't guarantee. Guarantees and things like this are impossible. There are officials to get at, ship's officers, and finding the right people. Oh, you're good at putting in a fix, Mr. Callan. You've been putting in fixes all the way from the slums up to the penthouses. Ship shouldn't stop you. Don't say things like that. Why not? Everybody knows how McNeely pays off, and you're one of McNeely's boys now. Anytime he wants to put his fingers in a dirty deal, he'll use your hands don't, to do it. Don't talk like that in front of my wife. Now, yeah, she'll get used to it. McNeely doesn't care who knows about his dirty-handed men. Shut up. Shut, Shut up. up. I lunged at him. He didn't even reach for his gun he was carrying. He didn't think I was capable of doing it. His back was against the chain, his good arm flailing wildly. Over the chain, over and into the water. I didn't see in the darkness. I didn't know until I heard the scream. Let go! Let go! Oh, it was too late for Bartell to let go. Get a grip on my wife's arm before I could move, before I could do anything. It was insane. She was pulled over the side, too. Over into the water. I had to save her. There was little I could do to save her would be to save Bartell, but I didn't hesitate. I know that sure of it. I grabbed the nearest life preserver and hurled it over the side. I could barely see them struggling in the water with the ship's propellers coming nearer. And then I knew I would have to jump. I would go over. I could still finish Bartell and save Betty. Still, I could have everything, and it would be called an accident. I went over the side. Robert, get the light. Lie flat. Don't try to swim. The watch from the propellers. Betty staying afloat near the life preserver, and beyond that, Bartell struggling with one good arm, struggling to get to the life preserver first. I forgot about Betty. I forgot everything except that I had to get him before he took the life preserver. You'll never get it. Keep, keep back. A gun. I have a gun. Nothing now. Robert. Robert, don't. Keep, keep away from me. Now. Keep away. Now, Bartell. Now try to talk. I am sure. Now, tell your story underwater. No! Tell it. Oh, no, no! From the sea, tell your story. Tell it from the sea. It was Bartell of us. Take the preserver and hold on to it. Don't you understand? It was Bartell or us. I never knew you. Well, the ship will turn around and pick us up soon. You must understand. I never really knew you. It takes something to kill a man. Bartell was the killer. A ruthless man. I know I was the one who forced him to turn state's evidence. Something horrible in you. Maybe that's why we've been growing apart. Maybe I saw it, but didn't recognize it. I'd never seen it before. You see it every day in the eyes of the people. That's a lie. Look at the murders. Look at war. Can't make people kill each other if they don't want to. Could you? How could you? I'll never forget the look on his face when he knew he was going to be drowned. But you were going to do it. Oh, crying. Crying for him. Crying for a hoodlum, a, a killer. Crying for a gangster. Yes. 
tears for him. Oh, I don't deserve it. Why should he be cried over? Why him? You, you never wept for me. I weep for you, too. I don't need pity. I don't need your pity. I'm not giving you pity. I'm trying to find a way to forgive you. Yeah. Hold on to the life preserver. Don't. You'll drown if you let go. Get away from me. Oh, you clawed me. Don't come near me. You only want the life preserver. All right, you want to believe it. It's true. And I'll get it. I'll claw you. i claw your oh, eyes. You'll never have a chance. The water carried me faster. You'll never catch up to me. I'll, I'll catch up. Oh, Betty. Don't be a fool. Come back. Oh, Betty. Oh, come back. The ship will turn around. Oh, the ship will save us. Die, Robert. Die like you'd let anyone die for you. Die for yourself. I, I don't need a life preserver. I can hold out until the ship turns around. They're still going for the horizon. The ship. They'll turn around. I'm the biggest sweet on the ship. They'll miss us and turn around in a few minutes. What makes you think you're so important? What makes you think you'd be missed? I. I am important. What makes you want to be so big, so much? Oh, it was for you what I have struggled so hard to get. Oh, for you. For yourself. Getting rich to please yourself, but you never enjoyed it either. You would have left me if I'd stopped. Stopped making so much. I only wanted love. Only wanted a family, your love, your children. Only yours. Oh, you mean that. Oh, you do mean that. Too late. Too late. Oh, we can't. Oh, in time, we can forget. How? <clears throat> How can I forget? How can you? Oh, you're right. It was for me, and it wasn't for me. Money for the wealth. It was for power. Not, not even that. Oh, darling, my darling, my darling Betty. Oh, my wonderful Betty. Rob, the ship is turned. Hold on, Rob. I can't. And I'll come to you. The life preserver can support both of them. When did I start to die, Betty? I'm dying now. When did I start to die? Don't. Don't talk to me. Hold up, Robert. Hold up. When I knew I would kill Bartell. Oh. It was sooner. When I said I will look the other way. Yes, Mr. McNeely. You can kill Bartell. I will look the other way. Hold up, Robert. Yes, Mr. McNeely. When I started... To die long before years, before maybe I've been killing myself all my life, a slow way. Well, a subtle way. Dolly, please hold on a minute longer. Mm. Only a minute. I can. My darling, I love. I love. Robert! by Autolite, tonight's star, Mr. Joseph Cotton. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. And during these early months of 52, the Autolite family joins in saluting the leading manufacturers who install Autolite products as original equipment. 
Our Autolite family is made up of the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and in still other Autolite plants in many foreign countries. It also includes more than 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite, as well as 96,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our Autolite family will salute the leading truck manufacturers who use Autolite products on the next Autolite Suspense television program. If you live in a television area, check the day and time of Suspense on television so that you'll be sure to see this program. And remember, be with us next week for another thrilling Autolite Suspense program on radio. Next week... Our star will be Mr. Frank Lovejoy in the recreation of an historical puzzle, a radio dramatization of The Wreck of the Old 97, a story based on fact and presented on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. A watery grave was written for Suspense by Arthur Ross. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Betty, Stan Waxman as McNeely, and Joseph Kearns as Bartell. Joseph Cotton may soon be seen in The Untamed, a universal international picture co-starring Shelley Winters. And remember next week on Suspense, Mr. Frank Lovejoy in The Wreck of the Old 97. Last July, the nation's worst flood in a decade smashed through Kansas and Missouri. The Red Cross was on the job to relieve the suffering and shelter the homeless. This was only one of 300 domestic disasters in which the Red Cross gave aid last year. To carry on its vital work, the Red Cross needs your financial aid now. Give generously. This is the CBS Radio Network. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman! Kellogg's Pep, P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Batman tells the Man of Steel the incredible fact that the anonymous perpetrator of Robin's threatening letters and telephone calls, Eric Larson, died two weeks previously. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, uh, which is it? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a button? Well, you never can tell until you open your package of Kellogg's Pet and see which of those three kinds of prizes you'll get. So every prize is always an exciting surprise. It might be one of Pep's 18 slick comic buttons, picturing one of your favorite comic strip characters to pin on your beanie cap or your jacket. Or uh, it might be a model fighting plane, one of seven thrilling plane models in the series, all made of colored cardboard and easy to assemble. Or your next Pep prize might be a beautiful full-color bird picture from a series of 24 each with a description on the reverse side so that you can name and know any of these birds around. And say, speaking of birds, you'll sure be an early bird to the breakfast table when Kellogg's Pep heads the menu. Because every spoonful of these crisp whole wheat flakes is brimming with cool come on. Each spoonful is a treat in itself. Why, every bowl of Pep just about doubles the fun of breakfast. Yes, sir, you'll say that catchy Pep flavor is strictly terrific. So get going, gang. Ask Mom for Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, and look for your prize inside the package. Now, the adventures of Superman. Summoned by Batman, the one individual who is aware of his double identity, Superman, in his guise of Clark Kent, listens to an amazing story concerning Batman's young companion, Robin. 
It was the story of how Robin's father and mother had been literally murdered by a man named Eric Larson. And of how Batman, though unable to prove the double murder, had succeeded with Robin's help in sending Larson to jail for extortion. But yesterday, as you remember, Batman told Clark Kent that he had been receiving threatening letters and phone calls from a man he was certain was Eric Larson. Believing Larson had been paroled, Batman contacted the warden at the state prison, only to be told that Larson had died in the prison two weeks previously. As we continue now in the living room of Batman's house, he has just dropped this bombshell into Clark Kent's lap. For a long moment, Kent is silent. Then... When did you receive the first threatening letter, Bruce? Well, let's see. Today is Thursday, just a week ago. Mm -hmm. That would make it a week after Larson presumably died in prison, right? Well, there's no presumably about it, Clark. I made a careful check, talked to the prison doctor, even know where he was buried. Well, it's obvious, then, that if Larson's dead, he couldn't have written the letters and made the phone call. That's what I thought. So I called in a handwriting expert. I showed him the threatening letters, and I showed him a letter Larson had written to Robin's father five years ago. Uh Uh-huh. He said the handwriting was identical. I even went further than that. You remember that I told you I recorded one of the anonymous telephone calls on my dictograph? Uh Uh-huh. Well, the reproduction wasn't too good, so I bought a record recording machine. Set it up near the telephone, and last night when one of the calls came through, I made a record of it. This morning, I located two of the circus people who had known Larson for years. Played it for them. They both swore it was unmistakably Larson's voice. Do you uh, have the record here? Yes, Would you like to hear it? Yes, if you don't mind. Okay, I'll set it up. It'll just take a minute. Say, incidentally, how much does Robin know about all this? Oh, practically nothing. He's been asking a lot of questions, but I've been stalling him. No sense getting him all upset. No, that's what I was going to say. As a matter of fact, that's why I sent him over to Jimmy Olsen's tonight. Get him out of the way so you and I could talk freely. Good. Uh, Did he go along? No. Alfred, our butler, went with him. Okay, it's all set. Are you ready? Shoot. I'm just calling again to warn you that nothing can save that boy. I'll follow him to the ends of the earth. Who is this? You know who it is. What do you want? You know what I want. Revenge. (laughs) Well, that's all. He hung up there. Uh Uh-huh. This was uh, last night? Yes. Do you see now why I'm worried, Clark? Yes, of course I do. This sounds serious, Bruce. It is serious. That's why I need your help. Why, if anything happens to Robin... Now, take it easy. Nothing has happened to him yet. Sure, I know that. But what can we do to prevent something from happening to him? Well, let's see. There are two possibilities here. Either Larson prepared those threatening notes and phone calls before he died. Before he died? Well, yeah, see, he could have written the notes and recorded his voice on a phonograph record and then slipped all the stuff to an accomplice to be used in the event of his death. Yes, I suppose so. But why would Larson have gone to all that trouble? He wanted revenge, didn't he? Yes, but so he dreamed up this way of, well, sort of haunting you and Robin from his grave, so to speak. Well, that could be. But you said you saw another possibility. Yes. Well, what's that? The possibility that Larson is alive. That's ridiculous. Why is it? Because, as I told you before, I talked to Warden Hobbs and the prison doctor. They both assure me that he is dead. I see. Look, Bruce, uh, do you mind if we check with them again together? Well, no, of course not. But it's just a waste of time. Well, maybe not. Let's see. It's pretty late. It's not too late to pay a visit. Let's go, Bruce. Now, look, wait. If you're operating on a hunch that there might have been some conniving at state prison, get that out of your mind. I've known Warden Hobbs for years, and I'll swear to his honesty. I know him, too, and I also think he's honest. Well, then why bother with a long trip up there? Well, for one thing, because I can't think of a better place from which to start getting at the bottom of this mess. You see, before we can make any moves at all, we must first determine definitely whether Larson is dead or alive. Personally, I'm still not sure either way. All right. I still say it's a waste of time, but I'm willing to go through the motions to satisfy you. Good. We'll take my Batmobile. It'll get us up to state prison in two hours. <laughs> The supermobile will get us up there in two seconds. The what? Just wait till I strip down to my Superman costume and I'll show you. Oh, of course. How stupid of me. There we are. All set. Up with this window. And up with you. Now you ready? Let her rip. Okay, here we go then. Out! Up! And away! <laughs> The 
whole story up to this minute, Warden. And I can't understand it, Wayne. You say you identified those threatening notes as being in Eric Larson's handwriting? Without question. And the same goes for his voice over the telephone. But that's impossible. That's what I thought, until Kent here suggested that maybe Larson wrote the notes and recorded his voice before he died. What? Oh, I see what you mean. But another the... possibility, Warden, is that Larson is still alive. Oh, no. He isn't alive, Kent. I can personally vouch for that. Why, he died suddenly two weeks ago. Here, in state prison? That's right. Where was he buried? Across the road in the prison cemetery. Would you mind letting us see his grave, Warden? Well, what in the world for? What's the idea, Clark? Oh, I'd just like to see it. You don't mind, do you, Warden? Well, I, I suppose not. Come on. We'll pick up a lantern and walk over there. Thank you. Let's go, Bruce. <laughs> Here's Eric Larson's grave, Kent. Mm-hmm. This one right here? That's right. His name is on the temporary marker. See? Uh-huh. Well, Clark, you satisfied now? Yes. Yes, it's just as I thought, Bruce. Well, what do you mean? Larson may have been buried in this grave. He may have been. I tell you he was. I saw him buried here. I don't deny that, Warden. But Larson's not here now. Warden Hobbs stares unbelievingly at Clark Kent, while Bruce Wayne's eyes widen in amazement. What does this mean? We'll know more in a moment when we return with the startling climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, gang, it's a cheerful thing just to see a dish of Kellogg's Pep at the breakfast table. Pep looks so crisp and sunny and golden that, well, you can hardly wait to pitch in. And believe you me, a bowl of pep tastes just as good as it looks. Those crunchy whole wheat flakes are crammed with sunny, catchy kind of flavor that, well, the same flavor that pep is famous for. Pep, you know, is called the sunshine cereal. Yes, sir, when it comes to brightening up breakfast, pep's a terrific hit. And pep's terrific, too, when it comes to swell prizes. Three different kinds of prizes. One or the other in every pep package. Makes each prize seem three times as exciting because you never know which one you'll get next. For instance, uh, you might find a colored cardboard model of a fighting plane, and you'd be smart to collect all seven model planes in the series. Or uh, you might find one of Pep's 24 full-color bird pictures with a full description on the reverse side to help you know these birds every time. Or you might find a bright-colored comic button picturing one of 18 different comic strip characters to, to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap. So get in on the fun, gang. Ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep first thing tomorrow. Standing by Eric Larson's grave in the darkness of the state prison cemetery, Clark Kent has just startled Warden Hobbs and Bruce Wayne, who was really the famous Batman, by saying, Larson may have been buried here, but he's not here now. What? You're out of your mind, Kent. If you'll have the casket dug up, Warden, you'll see I'm right. I'll do no such thing. I saw Eric Larson buried here myself two weeks ago. I see no reason for dignifying your ridiculous statement by digging up anything. But, Warden, we might... Oh, ball, the, the, the ridiculous... Hey, how would you know anyway? Huh? Well, I... I uh, Kent uh... wouldn't make a statement like that unless he knew what he was talking about, Warden. No? Well, I'll say he doesn't know what he's talking about. Why not open the grave and find out? Are you afraid? Well, of course not. I'll have it opened and show you. Good. Now, you wait here. I'll get a couple of men. <laughs> Some cast. Looks like it's solid bronze. That's what it is, Wayne. Larson left a thousand dollars and a will requesting that he be buried in a bronze coffin. Okay, boys. Set it down right here. Right. Yeah. Now, good. Now, you and Mike go back to prison, Jones. I'll call you when I want you. Okay, Warden. Come on, Mike. Come in, Richard. Uh, hold that ladder a little higher, will you, Wayne? Okay. I'll unscrew the headpiece and prove I'm right. How's this? Fine. Hey, that's funny. The screws were removed. Were? I could have told you that. But look here. There are none in the lid at all. Well, how do you suppose that happened? Oh, I can't understand this. I saw the lid screwed down. Open it, Warden. Well, that's what I'm going to do. Great heavens! Why, the casket is empty. Uh-huh. It's, it's incredible. Hey, look here, Kent. How did you know it was empty? How? Oh, uh, I, I could see... You the, couldn't uh, see through six feet of earth in a bronze coffin lid. Well, uh, look, Warden, the... Only Superman could do that. Only a... Only... <coughs> Some... What's the matter, Warden? I, I don't know. I, 
I feel queer. Dizzy. What? So, so do I. I... Hey, Here, hey, what's the matter with what you is two? It? Everything is going around, around, black. What? Black. Bruce. Black. Black. Bruce, for heaven's sake, what is it? Black, I... Clark, I, I, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Clark, I, wait a minute. Clark. I've got you, Bruce. Bruce. Warden. Great Scott. They're both unconscious. What's happening here? Puzzled and alarmed, Clark Kent kneels by the motionless bodies of Bruce Wayne and Warden Hobbs. Looks in bewilderment from them to the empty bronze casket of Eric Larson. What has happened to Bruce Wayne, who is really the famous Batman, and to the state prison warden? And what is the explanation of the empty casket and the strange notes and telephone calls, which apparently came from a dead man? Don't miss a single episode of our fascinating new story, fellows and girls. Tune in tomorrow, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, when you line up all the famous names you know, you'll find Kellogg mighty near the top. That's Kellogg, the greatest name in cereals. And here are some of the good things Kellogg packs into each plump, tender biscuit of Kellogg shredded wheat. Flavor, natural nut sweet flavor toasted just right. Nutrition, fine whole wheat nourishment. And for economy, Kellogg packs 15, 15 biscuits in every package. And they're made to fit the bowl. Try them soon. You'll like Kellogg shredded wheat. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman and Batman, still baffled by mysterious notes and telephone calls from a man who has been authoritatively pronounced dead and buried, discover a more immediate danger. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, the busier you are at school, the smarter it is to go in for a real bang-up breakfast. Because uh, if you don't eat right in the morning, how could you have fun at your work and, and take in more fun besides? So tomorrow morning, just get next to a bowl of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. See how those crisp, tender flakes of whole wheat tickle your taste. Put you in a mood to eat hearty. Take in that sunny, catchy Pep flavor, all golden toasted. Why, you'll say Pep's one prize dish. Or you might say Pep's a 49 prize dish because there are 49 different prizes you can get in packages of Pep. One in every single package. For instance, uh, you can collect seven exciting colored cardboard models of fighting planes. Easy and fun to assemble. And you can collect a, get a great new series of 24 bird pictures, each with a full description on the reverse side to, to help you recognize these birds every time. And then there are those 18 bright-colored comic buttons, each with a famous comic strip character to pin on your beanie cap or your jacket. So get busy collecting all three kinds of those wonderful prizes. Ask Mom to get you a package of Kellogg's Pep next time she goes shopping. Now the adventures of Superman. Called upon for help by his good friend Batman. The Man of Steel has found himself faced with a baffling mystery woven about a series of anonymous notes and phone calls, all threatening the life of Robin, youthful companion of Batman. The handwriting in the notes and the voice of the caller were both definitely and unmistakably identified as those of Eric Larson, a man who had been sent to prison by Batman for practicing extortion on Robin's late parents. 
Yet prison records showed that Larson had died a convict two weeks before the threatening notes and phone calls had begun. As Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne, Superman and Batman visited the state prison, where they were shown Larson's grave. Then, when Kent, employing his X-ray vision, announced that the grave contained an empty coffin, the warden ordered it dug up. As the coffin lid was opened to prove Kent was right, both Wayne and the warden began gasping for breath, and a moment later lost consciousness. As we continue now in the dark prison cemetery, Kent is quickly resuming his identity as Superman. Listen. wonder what made them both choke and pass out like that. Unless... Great Scott, of course. That odor from the open coffin like a bittersweet perfume. Better get them upstairs where the air is clean and clear. Under my arms with them. There we are. Now, up, up, and away! <laughs> There, this is better. Yes, they're beginning to breathe normally now, thank heaven. Ah, Bruce is starting to come around. What? What what happened? Easy, Bruce, easy. Superman. That's right. Everything's under control. Yes, I'm sure of that, but... But what happened? I'm not quite sure, except that just a minute after we opened the coffin lid, you and the warden passed out, so I brought you up here. Oh, yes, sorry, no. Hold it, Bruce, hold it. Warden's beginning to come, too. So I'd better take you down and change back to Kent. It'll save answering a lot of embarrassing questions. Sure, go ahead. Okay, here we go to the prison grounds. Down! There we are. All right, you stay here with Warden Hobbs, will you, Bruce? I'll change behind that tree. Check. Uh, Kent. Wayne. Oh, right here, Warden. What happened? We passed out, both of us. Oh, yes. Now I remember. I got dizzy. I couldn't breathe. Then out like a light. <sighs> If it weren't for Super... Uh, I mean, if it weren't for Kent, I don't know what we would have done. Kent, where's Mr. Kent? Oh. Hi, here, Warden. How do you feel? Oh, much better now, thank you, but... Here, wait I... a minute. Let me help you up. Uh, thanks. You okay? I can manage all right. Good. Say, how did we get here from the cellar? Oh, never mind that. What's more important is what hit us. It's a gas of some kind, I think. A gas? Uh-huh. Yes. Kent said he detected a peculiar odor when we opened Larson's empty coffin. Oh, good heavens. I, I almost forgot about that. Coffin is empty, isn't it? Empty as old Mother Hubbard's cupboard. Now I recall. You said that before we dug it up. Hey, how did you know it, Kent? Uh, how? Yeah, that's right, how? Well, you see, I... I, Why, that's easy, Warden. You see, if... If uh, Larson has been sending notes and calling me, why... Yeah, that's right. If he's been doing all that, he couldn't be dead and buried. Isn't that what you mean, Bruce? Well, yes. Yeah, sure, that's right. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, that's... Well, that's what I think prompted you to say the coffin was empty, wasn't it? Uh, why... Uh, stop uh, trying to kid me and yourselves, too. Hmm? I know Larson's dead. I saw him before he was buried. I saw him buried in the prison cemetery. There can be no mistake about that. Well, then where's his body? That's right. You saw the empty coffin. Well, I don't know. This, this whole thing is so mixed up. Not to me. Personally, I'm sold that Larson's alive, that he escaped through some trick. And I still say he's dead, despite the empty coffin. I don't agree with you, Well, right? this seesawing is getting us no place. Look, Warden, the prison doctor who pronounced Larson dead, where is he? Well, let's see. It's just after 11 o'clock. He's probably making his last rounds into the infirmary now. Well, can we see him? Of course. Good. There's some questions I'd like to ask him. Come on. There's no question about it, Mr. Kent. Eric Larson died here in prison. Yeah, you see, Kent? Now, just a moment, please, Warden. Uh, Dr. Marsh, the last time you saw Eric Larson, were you feeling all right? What's that? What are you getting at? Just a minute, Bruce. I asked, were you feeling entirely well, Doctor? Of course I was. Why do you One other question, Doctor. When you examined Larson, did you notice any uh, unusual odor in the room? Oh, now I see what you're saying. Uh, Why, no, not that I remember. Why? What are you driving at, Mr. Kent? Well, maybe something, maybe nothing. How about the undertaker who handled Larson's body, Warden? He was buried from here. Oh, I see. Now, I can't waste any more time on your ridiculous notions. As far as I'm concerned, Larson is dead. And my only responsibility is to contact the police to investigate the disappearance of his body. Yes, you're quite right. Thank you for your time and trouble, Warden. Thank you, too, Dr. Marsh. You're, you're welcome. welcome. Let's go, Bruce. <laughs> Well, that's that, Clark. Now what do we do? We've still got to determine whether Eric Larson is dead or alive. Well, he's dead, of course. He must be. I admit I thought he might not be, but you heard what Warden Hobbs said and the prison doctor. Yes, but me, I'll buy your theory that Larson wrote the threatening notes and recorded his voice before he died. Yeah. He turned them over to an accomplice who exhumed his body and is now using the notes and records to try and scare the wits out of Robin and me. 
Or perhaps lead us into some trap. Well, it could be. I don't think it's a good possibility, but... What puzzles me now is that curious odor that came out of the coffin and knocked out you and Warden Hobbs. What is it? Who put it there? Yes, that is a puzzler. But I don't see what it has to do with whether Larson is dead or alive. Well, it just might have everything to do with it. How do you mean? Well, I'll tell you after I make another test which ought to tell the story. I'll just strip down to my Superman costume and we'll zip back to your house and have another listen to that record of your conversation with your mysterious caller. Okay. There we are. All set. You ready? Anytime you are. And up with you. Right. Here we go. Up and away! <laughs> Give it a lot of volume, Bruce, and please don't talk while the record is on. Huh? Tell you we're just wasting time. I don't think so. Well, what do you expect to tell from the record? Half a dozen people who knew Larson swear it's his voice. Now you're wasting time. Start the record, will you? Okay. Nothing you can do can save Dick Grayson. I'll follow him to the ends of the earth. Who is this? You know who it is. I don't. Well, what's the meaning of this? What do you want? You know what I want. Revenge. Well, that's it, Clark. You satisfied? Yes. Yes, I'm satisfied that Eric Larson is alive. What? I said Eric Larson is alive. Startled, Batman stares at the Man of Steel. We'll return in a moment for the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, here's an idea to help you with your collection of pet prizes. Whether it's the model planes or the bird pictures or the comic buttons. Uh, Sometimes it may happen that the prize you get in your package of Kellogg's Pet is a duplicate of one that you already have. For instance, uh, you may collect two Curtis Helldiver model planes when you're trying to collect Pep's seven different model planes. Well then, just swap duplicates with the gang. And you can swap duplicates of those slick, full-color bird pictures, too, to help you round out your collection of bird pictures. Or if in your next package of pep you find a comic button picturing, uh, oh, say, Moon Mullins uh, when you were hoping for one of Orphan Annie or Superman, somebody in the gang's sure to want to make a trade. Now, that way you'll have fun getting together your collection of all three kinds of pep prizes. And all the while, every morning at breakfast, you can be piling in those crisp, delicious flakes of pep. Think of the keen, catchy flavor, that fresh, full wheat flavor, that terrific pep flavor. Yes, sir, a bowl of pep is strictly on the beam. So ask Mom for Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, and look for your prize inside the package. After listening to the record which Bruce Wayne made of a telephone conversation, Kent said, Eric Larson is alive, Bruce. You're wrong, Kent. He can't be. He died in prison. He's alive. If his voice had been recorded before his death and played over the telephone on a phonograph... I would have detected the scratching of the needle, slight as it might be. I have pretty sharp ears. Yes, I Although know. Although his replies dovetail too closely with your questions to be on a record. Even if he figured out what you might say and planned his answers accordingly, there would have been a slight pause when the needle was lifted to the next groove and a slight sound when it was set down again. But there was neither pause nor sound. We did not hear a record. Oh, wait a minute. Warden Hobbs said Larson died, and so did the prison doctor. Right. Now, Hobbs has a fine reputation, and besides, I've known him for years. He wouldn't take part in a hoax like this. I know that. I didn't say he took part in it. Well, then how... I don't get it. Remember that strange odor like bitter perfume when Larson's empty coffin was opened? The stuff that knocked you out? Well, what about it? I'm quite sure it was from a drug which had been in Larson's body. A drug? Yes, you've heard of curious drugs used in India and in certain islands in the Caribbean and as so-called witch medicine in portions of Africa, haven't you? Well, certainly. I've heard of many such doings, but what has that... stuff causes a complete suspension of organic activities in the human body. Even paralyzes the heart for a certain period. Well, yes, I've heard of that, but... Great Jupiter. I'm beginning to see now what you're driving at. Good. Your angle is that Larson put himself in a sort of state of suspended animation which made him appear dead. Exactly. But he must have had a confederate. Someone in on his plan who stood by to exhume him after he was buried in that bronze coffin. Certainly. Probably the same one who procured and slipped the drug to him. Then if we can find out from Warden Hobbs who visited Larson, we could trace him or them That's and... just what I have in mind, Bruce. So let's... Wait. Listen, what's that? Sounds like pounding on your front door. Come on, let's see who it is. Okay. Oh, great Scott. What's the matter? Wait till you see who it is. Go on, open the door. 
Good Jupiter, it's Alfred, my butler. Alfred! Alfred! He's unconscious and bleeding from a head wound. Poor old fellow. Clark, I just remembered something. Alfred was to stay with Robin tonight at Jim Olson's house. Uh oh. This looks bad, Bruce. Plenty bad. <laughs> Their faces drained of color, Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne stare at each other over the unconscious form of Alfred, Batman's trusted butler. Each of them fearful of expressing the worried thoughts that race through his mind. What has happened? Does Alfred's condition indicate that Jim Olsen and Robin have fallen into danger? Perhaps even into the hands of Eric Larson, who, according to Superman, is still very much alive? We'll know more tomorrow, gang. So don't fail to be with us again. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, what makes a famous name famous? Well, Kellogg is famous as the greatest name in cereals. And one reason is Kellogg's shredded wheat. Those are the plump, tender biscuits made to fit your breakfast bowl. Fifteen. Fifteen of them in every package. Each biscuit toasted just right and full up with natural nut-sweet flavor. Mom knows Kellogg's shredded wheat is good for you, too. This is whole wheat. So remember Kellogg, gang... Ask Mom for Kellogg Shredded Wheat. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcast. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P E P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Serial, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman and Batman, on the trail of the men suspected of threatening Robin's life, are unaware that Batman's young companion is facing sudden death. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, uh, which kind of pep prizes are you collecting? Uh, model airplanes, full-color pictures of birds, or comic buttons to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap? Well, by now, you must have quite a flock of them because, of course, there's a prize in every single package of pep you open. And they sure are swell prizes. All three kinds. For instance, in your next package of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, you may find a colored cardboard model of a famous fighting plane, one of seven in the great pep air fleet. Or uh, you'll find one of 24 beautiful color pictures of birds with a full description so you can identify these birds anywhere. Or uh, you'll find one of a grand series of 18 colored comic buttons with characters straight out of the funnies. Just as if Pep's golden Christmas and, and sunny flavor weren't a prize all by themselves. Why, Pep's is strictly terrific tasting that a bowl of those crunchy golden whole wheat flakes makes breakfast a regular fun feast. You get that catchy pep flavor, and bingo! Your spoon just naturally dips down in your bowl for more. So ask Mom to get you a supply of Kellogg's Pep tomorrow, first thing. And now, the adventures of Superman. A series of anonymous letters and phone calls threatening the life of Dick Grayson, who we know as Robin, Batman's young companion, were identified as coming from Eric Larson, a man who had been sent to the penitentiary five years ago on Robin's testimony. But to Batman's amazement, he was informed by the prison authorities that Larson had died two weeks before the threatening notes and calls had begun. Alarmed for Robin's safety, Batman called in his friend Superman, and together they visited the state prison where Superman's X-ray vision revealed that Larson's grave contained an empty coffin. Back at Batman's house, Superman listened carefully to a recording of Batman's conversation with the mysterious caller, and then announced... There's no doubt left in my mind, Bruce. Larson is alive. Alive? Mm-hmm. Well, then how... Well, my hunch is that he used a certain oriental drug that placed him in a state of suspended animation, which even fools doctors. 
pronounced dead, he was buried. Oh, I get it. Then he was dug up by a Confederate, came out of his unconscious state, and, and... began his campaign of revenge against Robin. Before Kent and Bruce Wayne, who was in reality Batman, could move to further explore Kent's theory, they heard a heavy knock on the door. Rushing out, they found Alfred, Batman's trusted butler, unconscious and bleeding from a head wound. Suddenly, Wayne remembered that Alfred had gone with Robin to Jim Olsen's house. As we continue today, they have bandaged Alfred's wound and are trying to bring him to. Listen. Kent, what do you think this means? Do you think that Lawson... Yes, oh. Wait a minute, we'll know soon enough. I think Alfred's beginning to come oh. around. Oh. Alfred. Oh. Alfred, what happened? Wait a minute, Bruce. Oh. Give him a chance to come out of this before you start firing questions. But Robin and Jim were... patient, Bruce. Here, Alfred. Drink this. Uh. Drink it. That's it. That, my... I mean, Mr. Wayne's... Yes, Alfred, what happened to you? I... I did my best. What do you mean? But, uh, easy, Bruce. They... They were too much for us. Who was? Who are you talking about? Wait, Bruce, wait a minute. Now, Alfred, take it slowly from the beginning and tell us everything that happened. I... I can't, sir. I can't. When I think of those two boys... What about them, Alfred? They're... They're gone. Gone? Gone? Yes. yes. I... I'm afraid we may never see either of them again. <laughs> Startled Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne stiffen with shock. A split second later, they both galvanize into action, each terribly worried about his young friend. Then, after a flurry of swiftly fired questions, Alfred begs them to stop and settles down to telling the story of what happened. You see, Mr. Wayne, Rob, I mean Dig, and I went over to Jim Olson's house tonight, as you directed. Yes, yes, go on, Alfred, go on. Yes. Well, the... There was a picture at the cinema nearby which the boys wished to see, and I saw no arm in their going since I was to accompany them. Oh, I shouldn't have let them go. You warned me that Dick was in danger. That's right, but you did go, Alfred, so now please get on with the story. Yes, sir. Mrs. Olson, Jim's mother, said she was too tired to go with us, so we set out alone. We were walking up the street. It was quite dark when Jim noticed a car stop up ahead. Funny, what is, Jim? A car stop in front of Stuffy Phillips' house. Oh, so what? Oh, Stuffy and his folks are visiting his sister up in Boston. They're not coming back till next week. Well, maybe they decided to come back early. But but they haven't got a car. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter, Master Jim? Yeah, what's eating you, pal? Don't you see those men standing by the car? Sure, they must have a flat. See? One of them's putting a jack under the bumper. Oh, oh, yeah. Come on. What's the matter? You got the willies or something? No, but... Well, it's dark, and I didn't notice they had tire trouble. I just saw them standing there. <laughs> Perhaps Master Jim thought they were stick-up men. What? Uh-huh, and he's scared. Look, Alfred, I'll hold his right hand, and you hold his other hand. Right oh, Master Dick. Oh, cut it out. I okay, was... Hey, boys, grab him. Master Dick, look out! Hey, what is this? I told you, Dick, this is trouble. You'll find hey. out, sonny boy. Oh, yeah, maybe you'll find out something. Oh. Try this for size. Oh. Let him have it, Alfred. Right oh, Master Dick. Take this, you ruffian. Oh. Oh. Look out, Alfred. Oh. struck me on the head with the butt of his gun, and I went down. I didn't quite lose consciousness, but I couldn't get up. My head was swimming, and my legs were like water. Dick and Jim continued fighting, but they didn't have a chance against those big ruffians. They were carried into the car, which sped away with Dick and Jim leaving me lying there. I uh, managed to get to my feet after a while, but I was pretty dazed. I staggered over to the boulevard and found a taxi, and, well, here I am. Great Jupiter. Clark, Carrick Larson, he must be behind this. Now, wait a minute, Bruce. It must be Larson. He's been threatening Dick, and you've I... just convinced me that he's alive. Oh, I know, but that doesn't prove he did this. Did you notify the police, Alfred? By Jove, I quite forgot, Mr. Kent. I was too dazed, you I'll see. call Inspector No, Henderson. no, wait, Bruce. Let Alfred do it. Now, get this, Alfred. Tell Inspector Henderson exactly what happened, and tell him I said to look for a man named Eric Larson, who supposedly died at the state prison two weeks ago. But if he died, I don't understand. He didn't die. Tell Henderson I'll see him and explain later. But meanwhile, to broadcast an alarm for Larson. Have you got that? Yes, sir. Then get on the phone in a hurry. Come on, Bruce. Into this room. Right with you, Clark. All right, quick now. Strip down to your costume. This is a job for Batman and Superman. Right. Look, can't you know I don't scare you? Really? Well, I'll admit I'm scared now. If Eric Larson has Dick. Got to keep cool. Wait. Uh-oh. Thunderstorm. That's not going to make our job any easier. Hurry it up, Batman. Right. Okay, I'm all set. Good. All right, up with this window. Yeah, get a good grip on me. Check. I'll hang on to your belt, and for heaven's sake, show me some speed. I'll show you plenty of speed. Up, up, and away! Well, here's where it happened, 
Batman. That's the Phillips house. There was a fight here, all right. Look, the lawn's all cut up. Yes. Well, the rain has washed away any good footprints, though. Uh oh, I was afraid of that. Yes, and it washed away the tracks of the car, too. Well, where do we go from here? How do we find Robin and Jim? I don't know, Batman. You've got me. It looks as if we're stumped. <laughs> Deeply worried, Superman and Batman stand in the dark, teeming rain, temporarily stymied in their efforts to trace and take Grayson and Jimmy Olsen. Meanwhile, in the small room of a bungalow in the thinly settled outskirts of Metropolis, Dick Grayson awakes with a throbbing headache to find himself lying on the floor, his hands tied behind him. Struggling painfully to a sitting position, he sees for the first time the only other occupant of the room, a heavy-shouldered, bullet-headed man in a torn jersey who sits tipped back in a chair against the wall. Who are you? Don't you know, Sonny boy? Me, I'm Sandy Claus. <laughs> oh, a comedian, huh? Where am I? In my castle up at the North Pole. <laughs> Ain't it cold, though, huh? <laughs> Look, pack that coin in the can, will you? What's this all about? Where's Jim Olsen? You mean the skinny punk with the freckled puss? You can skip the graphic description. Just tell me where he is. You really want to know where he is, sonny boy? Of course I do. Now give, where is he? In your father's mustache. <laughs> oh, you dumb clown. If I could just get these ropes off, I'd... You do what, Grayson? I... Jeepers. No. No, it can't be. <laughs> Surprise, eh? Hello, boss. Hey, listen, this here... Get kid. out of here, Willie. Okay, Dick. Why the shocked look, Dickie boy? Recognize an old friend? His eyes popping, Dick Grayson, who is really Robin, stares at the lean, hollow-cheeked man whose burning eyes reflect his hate. The man who has sworn vengeance on him and who had been buried as dead. We'll return in a moment for the startling climax of today's episode... So stand by. You know, gang, it's always a smart idea to give yourself plenty of time in the morning for breakfast so that you can take it easy while you're eating your Kellogg's Pep. Because Pep is so good, you want to get the full golden toasted flavor in every spoonful. Yes, sir, you don't want to skip one bit of the fun of eating those crisp, catchy flakes of whole wheat. So uh, tomorrow morning, just hitch up your chair and settle down to some mighty smooth eating with Pep, the sunshine cereal. Is it delicate and light? Does it taste terrific? And you get a swell surprise when you see the nifty prize in each pet package. A real surprise of a prize. Could be you'll find a model fighting plane in colored cardboard, one of seven great pet planes you can collect. Or uh, could be you'll find one of 24 new full-color bird pictures with a description on the reverse side so that you can be hep on birds. Or uh, could be your next pet prize will be one of 18 bright-colored comic buttons sporting a, a famous comic strip character like Perry Winkle or, or Harold Teen or Superman himself. So start collecting all three kinds of these keen pep prizes. Ask Mom to get you a supply of Kellogg's Pep from the grocer tomorrow. In a room in a bungalow on the outskirts of Metropolis, Dick Grayson, his hands tied behind him, stares incredulously at Eric Larson, then gasps. What can it be? You died in prison two weeks ago. <laughs> Do I look dead, Grayson? No, but but how? I don't understand. Five years ago, when you helped send me to the penitentiary, I told you I'd get back at you. Didn't I? Now my time has come. So it was you and your gang who grabbed Jim and me tonight, wasn't it? That's right. It's been a long time since I'd seen you, you know, and you've grown up since then. Because I couldn't be sure in the dark which was you and which was Olsen... I took you both. What did you do with Jim? Oh, I took care of him. What do you mean? What do you think I mean? You... you killed him? Let's just say I made sure he can't describe me to the police. You see, the police think I died in the state prison. <laughs> I want them to keep on thinking that when they find your body... Dick Grayson stares at the hollow-cheeked, burning-eyed man whom only Superman and Batman suspect is alive. The man who came back from the grave to avenge himself upon Batman's young companion. What will happen to Robin and what has happened to Jimmy Olsen? 
At the moment, Superman and Batman are without a clue. Tomorrow's episode is packed with suspense, gang, so don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is the copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazine and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Think of the wonderful toasty things that taste good on a frosty morning and you think of something crisp, crunchy, crinkly. Crumbles! There's that name again, slips in every time. Crumbles! Kellogg's Crumbles! Just seems to go with words like crisp and crunchy. It's such a toasty kind of cereal. Sort of sweet and mellow rich. And you know, it's the only cereal in the whole wide world in those little crinkly shreds of good whole wheat. So, uh, when you think of good tasting words like crisp, crunchy, crinkly, that means crumbles for breakfast. Kellogg's Crumbles. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting... Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Superman on the trail of Eric Larson is unavailable at the time when he is most needed. Hello there, gang. This is your pal, Dan McCullough. Say, uh, your collection of pep prizes must be pretty far along by now. That is, if you've been saving the prize in every package of pep you open, because there's one of three different kinds of prizes you may find there. For instance, uh, maybe you're collecting those snappy pep comic buttons. There are 18, you know, in the series, each picturing a favorite comic strip character to, to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap. Or uh, maybe you're going in for those bright-colored bird pictures. There are 24 of those to collect, each with a full description so that you can wise up the gang on birds. And uh, have you rounded up all seven of those colored cardboard plane models? Each one's a, a model of a famous fighting plane, like a Lockheed Ventura or a British Lancaster or a Curtis Helldiver. All in all, that makes 49 different prizes you can collect. One in every package of Pep, the sunshine cereal. And meanwhile, you can be enjoying breakfast with those crisp golden whole wheat flakes of Pep. Mmm, mmm, how Pep does make with a flavor. A catchy, fresh flavor. A sunny, toasted flavor. In short, a Pep flavor. And it really sends you. So, for prize eating and your surprise prize, ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep tomorrow. <laughs> Now, the adventures of Superman. A series of anonymous phone calls and notes threatening the life of his young companion, Robin, prompted the famous Batman to ask his friend Superman for help. Together, they investigated a man named Eric Larson, whom Batman suspected because Robin's testimony had sent him to prison. Batman and Superman had just discovered that Larson had cleverly escaped from prison when they were advised that Robin, whose real name is Dick Grayson, had been with Jim Olsen when they were both seized and spirited away in a car. Now, with both Superman and Batman unaware of his and Jim's whereabouts, young Grayson, his hands bound tightly behind him, lies on the floor of a bungalow on the outskirts of Metropolis. Eric Larson, a hollow-cheeked man with deep-set, burning eyes, chuckles mirthlessly in response to a question about Jim. Then he speaks. I've taken care to see that Olsen will not be able to describe me to the police. Now, when... You mean you killed Jim? I don't have to draw you a diagram, Grayson. But... But he never did anything That's to... neither here nor there. You, my young friend, are important to me. It is for this moment that I endured five long years in state prison. Yes, five years a prisoner behind bars. That was too good for you. Why, you... You should have gone to the chair for murdering my mother and father. You can never prove that. Maybe not. But I did prove you blackmailed them until you bled them dry of money. Yes. Yes, you did. And for that, I swore to get you. And now, I've got you. 
And I'm going to make you pay heavy for the time I spent behind those gray stone walls. If the police don't track you down and take you back where you belong first. <laughs> Not a chance, son. Not a chance. No? Well, smarter crooks than you have been tripped up by the police. Don't forget that. Uh, smarter, perhaps, but not so careful. Oh, uh, yeah? What makes you so cocksure? Because, Master Grayson, I am legally dead. What? That's right. I don't suppose there's any harm in telling you now that through the use of a certain oriental drug, I fooled the prison authorities in pronouncing me dead. Then after I was buried in the prison cemetery, I was removed by a, a friend. And here I am, ready for revenge. Oh, but, but they'll catch on. Somebody will find out. Batman, my friend Bruce Wayne will find out. He'll manage to... <laughs> You're whistling in the dark, Grayson. You're squirming. And that does my heart good. The only trouble is there's not much time left for me to enjoy your performance. Because in just a short while, I expect Mr. Marsh to arrive. Mr. Marsh? And when he comes, the curtain falls on your performance. Why? Who's Mr. Marsh? You'll know soon enough. So start saying your prayers. <laughs> Please, Mr. Wayne, relax. We're doing everything we can to find young Grayson. Well, I'm sure you are, Inspector, but I tell you we'll never get anywhere unless you put out a dragnet for Eric Lawson. Now, look, let's be sensible. What's the point in looking for a dead man? The point is, as I told you before, Clark, Ken, and I are both convinced that Larson's alive. That Larson affected a prison break through the use of an oriental drug that causes suspended animation, causes death. Ah, poppycock. Just a moment. That's my phone. Hello? Yes, Healy? What? What? The falls? Jumpy catfish, how did he... What's that? A kid. What's happened, Inspector? Just a moment, Wayne. Yeah? Yeah, go ahead, Healy. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, it does it that. Sure. Did you call the river patrol? I see. Okay, I'll be right out there. What is it, Inspector? Well, there's a kid caught in the rocks at Horseshoe Bend, Wayne. The head of the fall. What? Yeah, he's about 16 years old, Healy says, as near as they can judge with binoculars... He can't hold on much longer, and they can't get a rope to him. A skinny youngster with ginger hair, freckled. Well, well, that sounds like Jim Olsen. Yeah. Come on. Come on, I'm going out there. Oh, Jupiter, maybe... Maybe Dick... Oh, Inspector, wait. Huh? We've got to call Clark Kent. Well, why do you want to bother about Kent? What can he do? You'd be surprised. Look, he's up at the state prison talking with Warden Hobbs. Please have someone call him, Inspector, and tell him what happened. Okay, I'll tend to it on the way out. Let's go. <laughs> sure this man, Wilfred Ellis, is the only visitor Larson had during his stay in prison, Warden Hobbs? He's the only one shown on the records, Kent. Mm-hmm. And Ellis must be the one who brought him the drug and perhaps helped him escape. Are you still harping on that drug, Kent? Yes, I am, Warden. Because I'm convinced he's alive. But we won't waste time arguing. I've got to find him, and when I do, I'll find Jim Olson and Dick Grayson. But I've got to work fast. Would you give me the address of this Wilfred Ellis, please? Of course. Yeah, here it is on his visitor's card. The Great American and International Circus. Well, did you say circus? That's right. Why? Well, nothing. Only Larson used to be ringmaster of a circus, and Dick Grayson's parents were performers in the same outfit. Is that so? Yes. This sounds like a hot lead, Warden. Now all I've got to do is find out where the great American and international circus is playing. Uh, wait till I answer the phone, Kent. No Kent. time to wait, Warden. Many thanks for the information. So long. Well, you're wasting your time, Kent, but good luck. Thanks. See you again. Warden Hobb speaking. This is Metropolis Police Headquarters. Is Clark Kent up there? Kent, well, he just left my office. Is it important? Yeah, very. Just a minute. Maybe I can still get him. Hold on. Kent! Kent! Oh, oh that's funny. He's gone already. That fellow must move like the wind. Now I'll catch him at the main entrance. Main entrance, Cannon speaking. And Mr. Clark Kent just left my office in a great hurry. So he must be at your gate now. Will you step well, out? He's not here, Warden. What? Are you sure? Yes, sir, I'm sure. Well, well. Where in blazes did he get to? Amazed, Warden Hobbs scratches his head. Unaware that Clark Kent as Superman is by this time rocketing through the skies to pursue his latest clue. Still unaware of the latest development at Horseshoe Falls, where Batman in his guise of Bruce Wayne has just arrived with Inspector Henderson. Standing on a bank of the river bend, 
Wayne focuses a pair of binoculars across the swift flowing water to a mass of black jagged rocks 100 yards away at the head of the rushing, tumbling falls. There, clinging to one of the rocks at the very brink of the foaming cascade, Wayne sees a small, thin figure. For a split second, he peers at the figure, then gasps to Henderson. Inspector, that is Jim Olson. Jim Olson? Yes, I'm sure of it. A suffering catfish. Here, let me have those glasses, Wayne. Here you are. Sergeant Healy, why doesn't that police boat shoot a rope out to him? They've been trying to, but the poor kid can't let go his hold in the rock long enough to reach for it. If he does, he'll be swept over the fall. Yes, Jim, all right. Say, how'd he ever get out there? I don't know, Inspector. Can't that boat work in closer and send a swimmer out with a rope? The current's too strong for the boat to get any closer, Mr. Wayne. And any swimmer would be pulled over the falls before he could reach the rock. Well, I know one who won't. What do you mean? Say, why are you taking your shoes off? Why do you suppose... I'm going in after Jim. What are you, nut? Oh, don't you be drowned. Maybe not. Anyhow, something's got to be done to help Jim. He can't hang on much longer. But you won't have a chance in that water, Wayne. Listen, Inspector. Contact that police boat and tell them to shoot a rope out ahead of me. I'll drive it, tie it around my waist, and carry it out to Jim. Then they can pull us both back in. No, wait. Come on, now. Stop, Wayne. Don't. Wayne, come back. Come back, you fool. <laughs> Shouting vainly, Inspector Henderson and Sergeant Healy watch with horrified admiration as Bruce Wayne, who is really Batman, begins a seemingly futile fight with the powerfully rushing current which reaches for him with hungry, cruel fingers. We'll see what happens to him in a moment when we return for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, gang, you can cram a lot more fun into your day when you go in for a real bang-up breakfast. Because when you eat right in the morning... You've got what it takes to have fun at your schoolwork, and more fun besides. So, uh, tomorrow morning, include in your breakfast a bowl of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. See how those crisp, tender flakes of whole wheat tickle your taste, put you in the mood to eat hearty. Take in that sunny, catchy Pep flavor, all golden toasted. Why, you'll say Pep's one prize dish. Or, uh, you might say Pep's a 49 prize dish, because there are 49 different prizes you can get in packages of Pep. One in every single package. For instance, uh, you can collect seven exciting colored cardboard models of fighting planes. Easy to assemble. And you can round up a great new series of 24 bird pictures, each with a, a full description to help you identify these birds in the air. And then there are those 18 bright colored comic buttons, each with a famous comic strip character to, to pin on your beanie cap or your jacket. So get busy collecting all three kinds of those wonderful prizes. Ask Mom to get you a package of Kellogg's Pep next time she goes shopping. Swimming powerfully, a rope from the police boat tied around his waist. Bruce Wayne, who is really the famous Batman, has fought his way through the swiftly surging river to the jagged black rocks at the head of Horseshoe Falls. To one on which Jimmy Olsen clings with his last ounce of strength. Now, as Inspector Henderson and Sergeant Healy watch from the riverbank with bated breath, Wayne throws an arm around the exhausted Jimmy, braces himself against a rock, lifts his other arm in a signal to the police tug to tow him and his burden in. He made it, Healy! He made it! Never saw anything like that, Inspector. Look, he's got Olsen. He's starting to pull him toward the boat. I see that. Man, that Wayne is terrific. And they call him a playboy. Playboy or not, he's got what it takes, all right. Say, why don't they pull him in faster? Yeah, they've got to be careful not to snap the rope. On the jagged rocks here, sharp as razor. You see? They're trying to keep the line clear of the rocks. Yeah. I don't like the way the rope's cutting across that. Holy handy, Inspector. Look, the rope broke. Great heaven, they'll be swept over the falls. Swim, Wayne. For Pete's sake, swim oh, this way. No, you say, have I got a chance? Not a ghost of a chance. <laughs> Aghast, Inspector Henderson and Sergeant Healy watch as Bruce Wayne, still clinging to the limp, exhausted Jimmy Olsen, struggles to fight his way out of the hissing, white, boiling, angry water, which stubbornly sweeps them on toward the very brink of the rocky fall. With Superman as yet unaware of their predicament, can anything save Batman and Jimmy now? And what of Batman's young companion, Robin, condemned to death by Eric Larson, escaped convict who swore vengeance? Tomorrow's thrilling episode will have you sitting on the edges of your chairs from start to finish and winds up with a terrific surprise. So don't miss it. Tune in. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman.
Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, on a shivery morning, when your first idea is to beat it down to breakfast quick, dang, that's Crumble's weather. That's when you want a toasty kind of cereal with zip and go. That's when you think of toasty words like crisp, crunchy, crinkly. Crumbles! Kellogg's Crumbles, the only cereal in the whole wide world made in those little crinkly shreds of good whole wheat. Sort of sweet and mellow rich. And so good for you. Mom knows that. So when you think of something toasty on a cold morning, think of Crumbles! Kellogg's Crumbles! And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual... Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman affects a thrilling rescue of Jimmy Olsen, but runs into a baffling blind alley with Batman in their effort to trace Dick Grayson. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, the swell prize in each package of Kellogg's Pep is only one of three different kinds of pep prizes you can get and collect. That's why collecting pep prizes keeps right on being fun for weeks and weeks. First off, it's mighty exciting to see which kind of prize you'll get in your next pet package. Uh, maybe it's a bright-colored comic button picturing a favorite comic strip character, 18 and all to, to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap. Or uh, maybe it's a bird picture in gleaming color. You can collect 24 of them, each with a full description on the reverse side. Or uh, maybe your next pet prize will be one of seven colored cardboard plane models, a cinch to put together. Yes, sir, you keep right on having fun when you're collecting the prizes and packages of Pep, the sunshine cereal. And all the while, you can keep on enjoying breakfast with those crunchy golden whole wheat flakes of Pep. Flakes all crisp and, and fresh and catchy tasting as you spoon them up. I mean, Pep makes with a flavor in a strictly terrific way. So get going, gang. Ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep tomorrow and look for your prize inside the package. <laughs> Now, the adventures of Superman. Jimmy Olsen and Dick Grayson, who was really Robin, were captured by Eric Larson, an escaped convict who had sworn to destroy Batman's young companion. In his hideout, Larson told Dick that he would be done away with as soon as a man named Marsh arrived, and inferred that Jimmy was already finished. But yesterday, the police sighted Jimmy in the river, clinging desperately to a rock at the head of Horseshoe Falls. As a police boat hovered nearby, unable to get in close enough to rescue the boy reporter... Batman fought the angry rapids and swam to Jim with a rope. But just as the police began to draw them to safety, the rope broke. As we continue now, Batman, supporting the half-drowned Jimmy, has managed to grasp a jagged rock at the very brink of the roaring cascade. Fighting to keep the rushing, swirling water from sweeping him and Jimmy to death in the falls, Batman feels his great strength heavy. Listen. Can't hold on much longer. Only Superman could save the day now. I guess they couldn't reach him Almost lost my grip that time. I'm sorry, Jim Boy, I did my best, but I'm afraid this is the end of the line for both of us. Oh, here you are, Clark. Wherever have you been? Up at the state prison, Lois. I think I have a clue to Eric Larson. I just got to find out where the great American and international circus is Never playing. mind that now. Come with me. Where? To the Daily Planet radio station and hurry. What for? I'm going to broadcast for Superman. Superman? Why? What's up? It's about Jim. Oh, Clark, Jim. I'm just... Wait a minute, Lois. Wait a minute. What's happened? No, we can't stop now. Oh, poor Jim. Only Superman can Wait, save Wait, I said. Tell me what happened. What about Jim? He's in the river. What? At the top of Horseshoe Falls, hanging onto a rock. The police can't get a rope to him and... Great Scott, I... Well, don't just stand there, Clark. We've got to broadcast it for Superman. I told you only he can save Jim. You stay here, Lois. I, I I think I can contact Superman. You? How? Never mind how. Just stay here. Only I'm not too late. Clark! Clark, wait! A 
Rushing across the Daily Planet city room to a deserted storeroom, Clark Kent strips off his business suit and stands revealed in the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Up! Up! And away! Throwing open a window, the Man of Steel rockets away and flashes across the Metropolis River. Streaking above wooded shores, he comes upon the river as it sweeps around Horseshoe Bend and rushes pell-mell toward the Great Falls. Then, spotting Batman, who is still struggling to hold Jim and himself from going over the falls, Superman dives in. Okay, Batman. Everything's under control. Superman! Right. Thank heaven. I'll take Jim. You hang on to my cape. Check. Is he... He's alive. Good. The poor kid took an awful beating. What about Robin? I haven't seen him. What? If he were in the river, too, he must have been swept over the falls. Maybe not. But Jim will know. I'm going to take him to his house now. Hang on. All right. Here we go. And away! Now you heard what the doctor said, Mrs. Olson. Jim's going to be okay. Oh. Just has to stay in bed for a day or two. Sure. I'm fine, Mom. There, you see? Now you go to your own room and rest, Mrs. Olson. Mr. Wayne and I have to ask Jim a couple of questions, and then we'll be going, too. Well, all right, Mrs. Now, Jim, you feel up to talking? Sure. I, I feel a little weak, that's all. But tell me something first. What about Dick Grayson? Is he okay? But don't you know? Uh, we thought you could tell us. Gee, I don't know, Mr. Wayne. Was he in the river with you? I I don't know. I was hoping you could tell me. Oh, Clark. Take it easy, Bruce. Look, Jim, you'd better start at the beginning, from where those men jumped you and Dick last night and took you away in the car. Now, first, do you know who they were? No. Did you hear any names mentioned? No, except the driver was called Joe. Well, that's a lot of help. Go on, Jim, go on. What happened? Well, these guys dumped Dick and me in their car and drove off pretty fast. Uh-huh. We didn't know what it was all about, but when we asked them, they told us to shut up. They said if we yelled, they'd shoot us. Uh-huh. We couldn't see anything because we were on the floor of the car. I know we were near the river or the harbor. How? Oh. Well, because I could hear foghorns. Oh. Then I heard one of them say... Slow down, Joe. I know which one is Grayson now. This is a good place to get rid of the other kid. We'll wrap him on the noggin, dump him out, and roll him down into the water. Oh, then what? Well, the next thing I knew, something hit me behind the ear, and everything went black. I don't remember anything else till I came to in the river. The current was sweeping me along, and I could hear this roaring up ahead. I just about had time to realize I was being carried into the falls when I was on them. I managed to catch onto a rock, but everything was starting to go black again. Then Mr. Wayne got there. Thank heaven he did. But what happened to Dick, I've got to know. We're going to find out right now. Come on, Bruce. Oh, where? Are you downstairs. Hurry. So long, Jim. Oh, look. Goodbye, can, Jim. can I go with you? Nothing doing. You stay in bed and obey the doctor's orders. We'll be in touch with you as soon as we find Dick. Clark, will you please tell me what's on your mind? Come on downstairs. Okay, but I'd We like... know now that Eric Larson was behind this. Well, sure, but how... Well, I've got a lead to him. Uh huh. What's that? I discovered that he had only one visitor while he was in prison. A fellow named Wilfred Ellis. Ever hear of him? Wilfred Dellis. That sounds familiar. He's with a great American in international circus. What? That's right. Eric Larson was ringmaster of that circus five years ago. Mm -hmm. And Dick's parents were aerialists with the same outfit when Larson cut their high wire and murdered them. Correct, but for heaven's sake, keep your voice down, Bruce. Wilfred Dellis. Yes, I remember him now. He's a well known clown. A clown, eh? Yes. You say he was Larson's only visitor at state prison? That's right. Now, let's go. Now, wait a minute. If Ellis were Larson's only visitor, he must be the one who brought him the drug which made him appear dead. And then helped Larson escape from prison. Of course. So I figure Ellis should be able to tell us where Larson is. I see. Okay, come on. We've got to hop up to Buffalo. Buffalo? Well, what for? That's where the great American and international circus is playing. Found that out while the doctor was working over Jim. Oh, I see. Well, let's get going right away. Just a minute. Why? Okay. Nobody out in front. I just stripped down to my Superman costume. I can't if I could only get my hands on that Larson. Well, if this lead works out, you'll have your wish. There we are. Now, up with you, Batman. Check. Oh, if only this lead hasn't come too late. Just keep hoping. Here we go. Next stop, Buffalo. Up! Up! And away! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the big show, and all for the price 
Hands of a quarter. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. The biggest show on earth going on on the inside. Here's the manager's wagon, Bruce. Come on. Come in. Let's go, Bruce. Yes? My name is Clark Kent, reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet. This is my friend Bruce Wayne. How are you? What can I do for you? We'd like to talk to one of your performers, if we may, Wilfred Ellis. Wilfred Ellis, eh? Uh Uh-huh. Well, I'd like to talk to him myself. What? What do you mean? I mean that after all the money I spent building him up to be a star, he walks out on me. The dirty ingrate. Walked out? You mean he's quit the circus? That's exactly what I mean. Of all the ungrateful dirty tricks, that one takes the brass ring. Well, tell me, when was this? I mean, when did he leave you? Last week. Well, do you have any idea where he went or where he can be found? No, I don't know, mister. If I did, oh. believe me, I... Well, wouldn't any of the other performers know? Nope, he just walked off the lot in Metropolis last week. After mentioning to one of the animal men, he was quitting. And nobody's seen hide nor hair of him since. Hey, that's bad. Now, how are we going to find Robin? <laughs> Dismayed, Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne hear the circus manager tell them that the circus clown, their only clue to Eric Larson and Dick Grayson, has disappeared. We'll be back in a moment for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, most fellows and girls who eat Kellogg's Pet eat it mainly for one reason. They eat Pet the Sunshine Cereal because those crisp, sunny whole wheat flakes taste strictly terrific. I mean, Pep's got the kind of flavor that makes you wish your bowl of Pep were twice as big so that you could cram in more of that keen, catchy Pep taste. Sure, Pep's a cram course all right come breakfast time. And all that swell flavor isn't the only reason Pep gets an A-plus rating. Pep's hep in the prize department, too. Yes, sir, Pep gives you three different kinds of prizes, one or the other in each package you open. For instance, your next prize may be a bird picture in brilliant color with a full description on the reverse side. Collect all 24 of them, and you'll be wowing the gang with your knowledge of these birds. Or uh, maybe your next pet prize will be one of seven exciting colored cardboard plane models, easy to put together. Or maybe it'll be a bright colored comic button, picturing a favorite comic strip character, 18 in all, to pin on your jacket or beanie cap. There's one or the other of these three snappy prizes in every pet package. So ask Mom to keep you supplied with Kellogg's Pep for sure. While Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne find themselves in a blind alley in Buffalo, back in Metropolis in his bungalow hideout on the outskirts of the city, the hollow-cheeked, burning-eyed Eric Larson is saying to Dick Grayson, whose hands are tied behind him, I finished your father and mother, Grayson. And as soon as my friend, Mr. Marsh, gets here, I'm going to finish you. Hey, Eric. What is it, Willie? That guy you were waiting for, you know, that Mr. Marsh. He's here. That's fine. Bring him right in, Willie. Bring him right in. Okay. Right this way, Mr. Marsh. Now, sonny boy, this is it. After five minutes more, there'll no longer be a reason for keeping you alive. Black eyes burning feverishly in his sallow, hollow-cheeked face. Eric Larson grins evilly in contemplation of the revenge he has planned for Dick Grayson. And we know to be Robin. Is this the end for Batman's gallant young companion? Or is there yet some way that Superman and Batman at this moment miles away can locate Robin in time? Tomorrow's episode tells the story with many thrills and much excitement. So don't miss it. Tune in again, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pet, the sunshine cereal. When you think of toasty words like crisp and and crunchy, crinkly, you just naturally go right on to crumbles, Kellogg's crumbles. So toasty and sweet and mellow rich on a frosty morning. What a dish for breakfast. The only cereal in the whole wide world made in those little crinkly shreds of good whole wheat. 
And uh, you know about whole wheat, don't you? You know it's good for you. Sure. So get your wholesome whole wheat in crisp, crunchy, crinkly crumbles. Kellogg's Crumbles. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman and his friend Batman are still trying desperately to pick up the trail of Batman's young companion, Robin. Unaware that at any moment, they may be too late to save the boy's life. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, uh, which is it? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a button? Well, it's anybody's guess until you open your package of Kellogg's Pep and see which one of those three kinds of prizes you'll get. So every prize is always an exciting surprise. Sure, it might be a a beautiful full-color bird picture from a series of 24, each with a description on the reverse side so that you can reel off the name of any of these birds around. Or uh, it might be a model of a fighting plane, one of seven thrilling plane models in the series, all made of colored cardboard and easy to assemble. Or uh, your next pep prize might be one of Pep's 18 slick comic buttons, picturing one of your favorite comic strip characters to pin on your beanie cap or your jacket. And say, speaking of characters, you'll be a mighty happy character yourself when you dig into your bowl of Kellogg's Pep. Because every spoonful of these crisp whole wheat flakes tickles your taste with its keen, catchy, sunshine flavor. Every bowlful is a treat. Every dish of Pep just about doubles the fun of breakfast. So get going, gang. Ask Mom for Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, and see whether the prize inside your package is a bird, a plane, or a button. And now, the adventures of Superman. Certain that Dick Grayson, who was really Robin, was in the hands of Eric Larson, an escaped convict who had sworn to destroy the youngster, Batman and Superman followed their only clue, a circus clown who they believed had helped Larson escape from prison. But when they arrived at the circus, they were dismayed to learn that the clown had quit and left with no forwarding address. Meanwhile, in a bungalow on the outskirts of Metropolis, Larson had just finished telling Dick that he would be shot as soon as a man named Marsh appeared when Willie, a henchman, announced the arrival of the mysterious Mr. Marsh. As we continue now, Marsh, a slender, neatly dressed man with a toothbrush mustache, follows the huge Willie into the room, where Dick Grayson, his hands tied behind him, stands before the hollow-cheeked Eric Larson. Send your man out of the room, please, Larson. Well, Willie's all right, Mr. Marsh. You needn't worry about it. Send him out of the room, I said. Okay, okay. Go on out and wait in the hall, Willie. Okay. Sure, boy. Close the door after you, please. Okay. I tell you, you're wasting your time, Marsh. This boy is Dick Grayson. He looks like a Grayson, but I must be certain. Here, have a look at this, Marsh. I took this wallet off him. It's got his name in it and his address. He lives over on Wickersham Drive with that rich playboy, Bruce Wayne. I wish that playboy were here right now. We'd fix your clocks. I see. So your name is Dick Grayson. So what? What's this all about? Who are you and what do you Quiet, want? punk. What were the names of your father and mother, boy? Mr. and Mrs. Grayson, of course. Now, look, Marsh, you're not going to get anywhere with no, this. Wait, Larson. There's something else in this wallet. A snapshot. Don't you touch that. This is very interesting. A young man and a young woman in the costumes of circus aerialists. Put that away. I didn't notice the snapshot. Let's see it. Keep your dirty hands off that picture, Larson. Both of you. Say, that's the kid's father and mother. Are they, Dick? That's none of your business. Uh, I think I know a way to find out. Ah, here's my cigarette lighter. What are you going to do? This snapshot was covered with cellophane. Apparently, Dick treasured it. But if it isn't of his parents, I'm sure he won't mind my burning it, so... No, don't! It's the only picture I've got of them. I can only get these ropes off. And these people are your parents. Yes. Now put that picture away. Stop handling it. Shut up! Now, you see, Marsh, he's the right... Just a minute. 
What were your parents' names, Dick? I want a straight answer now. John and Yvonne. Where was your mother born? In France. Now, are you satisfied, Josh? Just one more question. Did you ever see your paternal grandfather, Dick? Your father's father? What's it to you? This is important to you as well as to me. Answer me, Dick. Did you ever see your paternal grandfather? No, I didn't. My grandfather was angry with my father because he joined a circus. And then because he married my mother, who was an aerialist in the circus, too. He wrote my father he never wanted to see him again. So none of us ever went near him. Your grandfather was very poor, wasn't he? Poor? Shucks, no, he was a millionaire. A millionaire? Correct. I'm satisfied, Larson. This is the boy. Take care of him. (gasps) What? Wait a minute. You didn't tell me the kid's grandfather was a millionaire. What difference should that make to you? What difference? Why, when I finish this kid and his grandfather dies, as you say, he's dying now. Grandfather dying? Well, well, go on, Larson. Then you'll inherit his millions. Exactly. According to Mr. Grayson's will, if anything happens to his grandson Dick here, I, his companion and secretary, inherit the entire estate. Sure. What? You mean my grandfather wants to leave me his money? That's right. He's got soft-hearted in his old age. He even wants to see you. As a matter of fact, he thinks I'm going to bring you to him. Oh, I'll be... Now I get it. You're getting millions out of this, Marsh, and you're giving me a measly $5,000 for taking the risk, doing your dirty work. I got you out of jail, didn't I, Larson? Yeah, but... And I'm giving you the chance to revenge yourself on this boy, the person responsible for your prison sentence. So what? I still say five grand isn't enough for this job. I say it is, Larson. Not when it means you're getting millions. I want my share. You're getting all you deserve. Don't give me that. If I talked, where would you be? Oh, like that, eh? That's the way it could be. Unless you want to discuss giving me a decent cut. I see. How much would you consider fair? I want half of what you get. Fifty-fifty split. Be reasonable, Larson. If I guarantee you, let's say, a half million, how would that strike you? Half a million? Well, well, that might be okay. But you've got to put it in writing. I'll put it in writing as soon as you get rid of Dick Grayson. (laughs) That'll be a pleasure. Now, do it right now. Now, now, wait a minute, Larson. I warn you, you're putting a noose around your neck. <laughs> Listen to the little punk. What's more, you'll even be done out of your share of my inheritance. Now, uh, look here. This man's a crook, Larson. Don't just stand there, Larson. Do away with him. Okay, here I go. Hey, boy, come here quick. Get away, Willie. No, listen, you've got to listen. They're on to you. What? Who is? The cops. What are you talking about, Willie? The radio. Go listen to the radio. Go ahead, boys. The cops, they're on to you. Yippee! What? I told you, pal. Hurry up, boys. Come on, listen to the radio. This sounds bad, Larson. You bet it's bad, brother. Worse than that for you. What do you watch this little punk? Come on, Marsh. Let's see what this is all about. How could they know that, Larson? Uh, I don't know. Larson is 43 years old, 5 feet 10, about 160 pounds, brown hair, sallow complexion, black eyes. This man is dangerous. Report any information on him to headquarters immediately. That is all. Purpose. How'd they find out I was alive? I can't imagine. But I'm afraid that means... That drug you sent me, it was no good. What are you talking about? The prison authorities declared you dead. They even buried you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I can't understand it. I, I'm worried. They'll find me. I'll never get out this time. They'll throw the book at me. Send me up for life. Maybe... No, no, no. Take it easy. Don't lose your head. I'll see you safely through this, Larson. You, you will? Yes. Go in and finish Dick Grayson. Then I'll take you to the Grayson yard and we'll sail away to some place where you can live in peace. No. No, nothing doing... I can't kill that Grayson kid now. What do you mean? The cops know I'm alive. They know I grabbed the Grayson kid. That I sent those notes to Bruce Wayne telling him I'd get Grayson. So now if they find him finished, they'll know I did it. I'll get the chair. I'll... Don't worry, Larson. They won't find you. No. No, I can't take the chair. Oh, yes, you can, Larson. And you will. No, I... I... What? What's the idea of pulling a gun on me? Because I plan to use it on you. What? No, no, Marsh, look. This I... works out very well. I'm going to kill you, Larson. me? But I... Yes, of course. This works out beautifully. You see, I killed you and Grayson. 
Then call the police and tell them I got here just too late to prevent you from shooting Dick Grayson. You see? Why, you... You dirty double-crosser. Did you think I'd be fool enough to let you live, knowing all you do about me? Yeah, but... But why did you get me out of jail if To you... get rid of Grayson for me. Then I was arranging for you to accept the blame for it. Now I'll just change my plans a bit. I'll shoot you, then Grayson. And then call the police and tell them I shot you trying to get away. No. No, you... You wouldn't do that, Marsh. I wouldn't? For several million dollars? Just watch this, sucker. No! No! We'll be back in a moment with the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, whenever you see a fellow or girl race into breakfast, you can guess right off there's probably a bowl of Kellogg's Pep waiting at the breakfast table. Sure, because when Pep leaves off the menu, it's mighty hard to wait for breakfast. You keep thinking of how how tender and how crisp those whole wheat flakes are. And you keep looking forward to your first taste of Pep's sunshine flavor. And then, when you do dig into your bowl of Pep, was there ever such a smooth treat? And say, while we're speaking of smooth, did you ever see anything to beat the slick prizes Pep gives you? Three different kinds of prizes, one or the other in each package of Pep. For instance, uh, your next prize may be a bird picture in brilliant color with a full description on the reverse side. Collect all 24 of them, and will you be wise on these birds? Or uh, maybe your next pep prize will be one of seven colored cardboard plane models, easy to put together. Or uh, maybe it'll be a bright colored comic button, picturing a favorite comic strip character, 18 and all to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap. There's one or the other of these three knockout prizes in every pep package. So ask Mom to be sure and get you Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. <laughs> small room where he is held prisoner. Dick Grayson, who is really Robin, has been working feverishly at his already loosened bonds. As the huge Willie, worried at what he has heard on the radio, stands near the closed door, his back half turned to Dick. Now, as a shot rings out from behind the closed door to the next room, Willie jumps with fright. Listen, what was that, Willie? Why, that, that was a shot. Uh Uh-huh. Could, uh, could our little playmates be quarreling, do you think? I gotta see. Hey, how'd you get them ropes off your hands? A little gremlin did it for me, Junior. Now, you big gorilla, I'm going to use this lasso to show you what it feels like to be tied up. Oh, uh, yeah? I'm going to pin your wrist. What? Hey, what? Get this rope off of me. You're rope, doggy. Hey. I'll make sure you hey. stay hey, that I way. Don't do that. Because I've got things to do and fail. Hey, Using the silken rope he always carries for his operations in the guise of Robin. Batman's young companion snakes it around Big Willie's ankles, trips and then flashes it around and around the huge man from feet to shoulders, trussing him up helplessly. Then, thrusting a handkerchief into Willie's mouth, Robin steps quickly and softly to the door, opens it cautiously, and is about to make a run for it when suddenly... Stand where you are, Grayson. <gasps> Mr. Marsh! That's right. I've just finished Eric Larson. Now I'm going to finish you. <laughs> Almost free, Dick Grayson is trapped by the murderous Mr. Marsh, the cunning brain behind Eric Larson's amazing escape from prison, the man to whom the boy's death is worth millions of dollars. How can Superman and Batman, hundreds of miles away, come to Robin's help now? We'll know tomorrow, so don't miss the next thrilling episode in this exciting story. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is the copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, when you wake up in the morning and you can see your breath on the frosty air, gang, that's Crumble's weather. Just calls for a toasty kind of cereal with zip and go. Calls for toasty words like crisp, crunchy, crinkly. Crumble's sure just fits, doesn't it? Kellogg's Crumble, sort of sweet and mellow rich. The only cereal in the whole wide world made in those little crinkly shreds of good whole wheat. It's Crumble's weather, gang. Time for crisp, crunchy, crinkly... Kellogg's Crumbles. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. 
This is the Mutual Broadcasting... Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, while Superman and Batman continue to track down a clue to Robin's whereabouts, their young friend has successfully managed to free his bond, only to face a murder-bent madman. Hello there, gang. This is your pal, Dan McCullough. Say, hey, I'll bet you're on the go these days, right from the moment you wake up, taking in all kinds of school games and fun. But I'll also bet that you can take in even more fun when you eat a good breakfast. Sure. And that's why now's the time, more than ever, that you also want to pack a good bowl of Kellogg's Pep under your belt. Every single dish of Pep gives you solid whole wheat nourishment. Plus, and these crisp, delicate golden flakes of Pep tastes so downright terrific that you'll want to eat hearty. They're so strictly delicious that they're fun to eat. And for an extra bonus of fun, just take a look inside your next package of Pep for your prize. Your surprise prize. Because you may find an exciting colored cardboard model of a fighting plane. Easy and fun to assemble. There are seven model planes you can collect. Or uh, you may find one of 24 full-color bird pictures with a description to help you name each of these birds when you spot it. Or uh, your pet prize might be a bright-colored comic button picturing one of 18 famous characters straight out of the funnies to pin on your beanie cap or your jacket. All three kinds of pet prizes are super. So ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pet, the sunshine cereal, and look for your prize inside the package. And now, the adventures of Superman. Five years ago, a man named Eric Larson secretly murdered the parents of Dick Grayson, who, as we know, is Robin, the young companion of Batman. Later, Dick's testimony sent Larson to jail on a charge of extortion, and he swore vengeance on the youngster. Recently, with the aid of a man named Marsh, who would inherit the fortune of Dick's wealthy grandfather in the event that anything happened to Dick, Larson escaped from prison and abducted the boy. Marsh then appeared and shot Larson, planning to shoot Dick, too, and blame it on Larson. However, Dick managed to escape from his bonds. But as he was leaving the room in Larson's bungalow in which he had been imprisoned, he came face to face with Marsh. Raising his still smoking gun, Marsh said, I've just finished Eddie Larson. And now, Grayson, I'm going to finish you. As we continue now, the boy who is Robin acts fast. Leaving his feet in a sudden headlong dive, he crashes headfirst into Marsh. Then as Marsh staggers backward, the breath momentarily knocked from his body, Robin spins about and spotting a flight of stairs, races up them with the agility of a cat. Reaching the top of the stairway, he wrenches open a door just as Marsh, recovering, fires two shots after him. Phew, that last shot parted my you hair. You can't get away, Dick. Says you. Oh, jeepers, that guy means business. Good, there's a lock in the door. There, that'll hold until I get out of here. Now, where's the window? Well, that's funny. I don't see any window. Christopher Columbus, I'm up in the attic and there's no window. No stairs either, except the ones I came up. Uh Uh-oh, you're in the soup, Robin, lad. Open the door, Grayson. Go away, Marsh, you bother me. Open the door, I say. Are you kidding? Then I'll break it down. That door won't last long. A trap, but good. Really worried, Robin casts another desperate look about the dim, dusty attic and sees no chance of escape. Meanwhile, several hundred miles away on the circus grounds in Buffalo, Superman and Batman in their guises of Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne are pursuing their only clue to Eric Larson, the man who abducted Robin. The person they seek is a Wilfred Ellis, a circus clown who had visited Larson in prison. And as we join them, they are near the entrance to the big tent where they are speaking to Joe Genesco, an animal trainer. I understand you were the last person to speak to this clown, Wilfred Ellis, before he disappeared from the circus last week, Mr. Genesco. Is that right? Why, yes, I guess I was, Mr. Kent. Well, you could have knocked me over the feather when Freddy told me he was quitting. I thought he was happy here because, well, he was getting billing on all the posters and really starting to make himself a name, you know. Did he tell you where he was going? No, he didn't. Did he have a family? Oh, just a sister. 
She used to be with the circus, too, a bareback rider. Where does she live, do you know? She runs a boarding house in Chicago. Where in Chicago? Let's see. Uh, Freddie and I had dinner with her the last time we were in, Shy. Oh, yeah, I remember. It was over on North Avenue, across from Lincoln Park. She calls it the White Horse Inn or something like that. White Horse Inn, eh? All right, thanks very much, Mr. Tinesco. Come on, Bruce. Right. Well, much obliged. You're welcome. I uh, say, look, if you catch up with Freddy, say hello for me, would you? You bet. All right, quick, down behind this tent, Bruce. Right. I'll strip down to my Superman costume. No, we yeah. zipped to Chicago, huh? Right. Freddy Ellis is the only person who visited Larson in prison. So he must have brought him the drug and then helped him escape. Which figures that he should know where Larson is now. Right. Where he is... Robin must be. I certainly hope so. I'm worried sick about that boy. Relax. I'm sure we're on the right track now. There we are. All set. You ready? Shoot. The white horse in, then. Hang on. Up! Up! And away! It's very important that we find your brother, Miss Ellis. So if you know where he is... What do you want with Freddy? Well, it's, it's very important. Take my word for it. I don't take anybody's word, young man. I'd have to be in with a circus most of my life and then run in a rooming house. Well, now, listen. Just I... a minute, Clark. Let me handle this. Uh, Miss Ellis, I'm quite a circus fan. Didn't you used to do a bareback riding act with Great American and International Circus? Why, yes, I did. Did you, uh, see me, Mr. Wayne? Oh, many times. Uh, you were wonderful. I remember that double somersault you did while your horse was in full gallop. Why, that was terrific. Well, it's real nice of you to remember that. It's quite a long time since I retired, you know. It seems like only yesterday to me. You were so wonderful. Why, Mr. Wayne, that's so sweet of you. Let me give you a cup of tea. No, I, I couldn't think of bothering you, but uh, about your brother, Freddie. Ah, that no-good rascal. He still owes me $50 he borrowed ten years ago. What's he been up to now? We think he helped Eric Larson escape from prison. Larson, huh? Another rascal, if I ever saw one. The meanest ringmaster I ever worked with. So Freddie helped him escape, did he? Well, I can believe it. They're two of a kind. They steal the pennies out of a beggar's tin cup. Uh Uh-huh. But, look, uh, do you have any idea where Freddie is now, Miss Ellis? Well, I might have. But it don't seem right to turn on my own brother. But... Uh, Just a minute, Clark. Uh, Miss Ellis, do you remember John and Yvonne Grayson? The Flying Graysons, they were called? Why, of course I do. A lovely young couple they was. And wonderful performers. Such a pity they had that terrible accident. They left a little boy, too. A sweet youngster. Yes, and we think that youngster is in the hands of Eric Larson. And that Larson means to do away with him. What? That's right. That's why we're so anxious to find your brother. You see, we think he knows where Larson is. Good heavens. Now will you help us? Well, I certainly will. Why, I can't believe it. Larson and Freddie helping him? Why, sure, I'll tell you, Mr. Wayne. Last year, when Freddie started to get special billing with the circus, he bought a little chicken ranch, see? Oh, where is this ranch, Miss Ellis? In California, in Central Valley. Central Valley, California. Of course, I'm not sure Freddie went there, though. We'll find out in a few seconds. A few seconds? Uh, uh, Very soon, that is. Uh, Thanks loads, Miss Ellis. Yes, thanks a million. You're very welcome, but... See you again sometime. Come on, Bruce. We're off to California. My name is Clark Kent, and this is Bruce Wayne. How do you do, Mr. Ellis? Uh, hello. I suppose you gentlemen want to buy some chickens? Well, no, no. We'd like to ask you some questions. Questions? Yes. About Eric Larson. Eric Larson? That's right. We want you to tell us where he is. Oh, my my goodness. Why, why he's dead. Oh, no, he isn't. He's alive, and you know it. He is? Don't give us that. You know he's alive. Because you helped him put over that trick on the prison authorities. And then you helped him escape from his grave. Don't holler at me. I get nervous when people holler at me. Then quit stalling and talk. I don't know what you're talking about, I tell you. Hey, you listen to me. I'll... Now, wait a minute, Bruce. Look, Mr. Ellis. You visited Eric Larson several times in prison, didn't you? Why, It's no use denying that. It's in the prison records. I wasn't going to deny it. Yes, I went to see him, but but only because he owed me money. I knew he had some money someplace, and I wanted him to pay me. Oh, baloney. Please, Bruce, please. You were the only visitor Larson had in prison, Ellis. I was? Yes. The day after your last visit, Larson apparently died. I didn't have anything to do with that. Honest, I didn't know... You didn't know what? I... I... Are you trying to say you didn't know what was in the drug you slipped to him? No, I didn't. I didn't know what it was. The man just said... Uh, What man? Oh, dear, why don't you let me alone? I didn't kill Larson, I tell you. I didn't. I'm so worried. I... 
I was afraid the police would come and say I did it. That's why you quit the circus and came out here, eh? Yes. I was afraid they'd say I did it, but, but I didn't. And now it's on the radio, and you say that maybe he's alive. He is. This, this is a trick. Everybody's trying to trick me. I didn't have anything to do with, with killing him. It was the man... The man... What man? Well, the... Uh, come on, come on, give. What man, Freddy? Tell us all about it, and we'll help you. But you've got to tell us everything. And the truth. All right, Mr. Kent. I'll tell you. Good. I'll tell you everything. I can't stand it anymore. I'm afraid of the man and the police. I'll tell you everything. Mopping his perspiring face, the little fat ex-circus clown, Freddie Ellis, prepares to tell Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne all he knows. We'll be back in a moment with the startling climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, gang, it really gives you something to look forward to when you realize you can get not just one kind of prize, but one of 49 different top-notch prizes in each package of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Sure, you'll find a prize in every package. For instance, you may find one of 18 different comic strip buttons, each picturing a favorite comic strip character. Or uh, you may find a colored cardboard model of a fighting plane, one of seven exciting plane models in the series. Or uh, you may get a beautiful full-color bird picture from a series of 24, each with a full description on the reverse side so that you can make like you're an expert on birds. Now, that makes 49 different prizes you can collect. And that's only a part of the fun in Kellogg's Pep. Think of the good eating fun in these crisp whole wheat flakes, all crammed with keen, catchy flavor. I mean, Pep's delicious, a prize in itself. Yes, sir, a bowl of Pep the Sunshine cereal is strictly on the terrific side. So speak to Mom about it today. Ask her to get you a supply of Kellogg's Pep from the grocer first thing tomorrow. And remember, look for your prize inside each package of Pep. As Freddie Ellis begins his confession to Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne in California, another scene is taking place thousands of miles away in the outskirts of Metropolis. In the dim, dusty bungalow attic in which he is trapped, Robin pales as the man named Marsh finally breaks through the thin door and steps into the attic. I told you you couldn't get away, Dick. And now you're trapped. Wait, don't forget, Batman will make you pay for this, and the police. Nobody will make me pay. I've already shot Larson. I'll tell the police I got here just after Larson shot you. And that I killed him in self-defense when he tried to get away. I'll... What's that? Sounds like the police. The police? I didn't want them here yet. Now I've got to put you away fast. No, don't shoot. Don't! That... That'll take care of him, all right. Now to get ready for the police. Without stopping for more than a quick look at Robin's motionless figure on the floor of the dim attic... Marsh turns and hurries back down the stairs. Is Robin really dead? Are Superman and Batman so close to the truth too late to save the gallant youngster? Or are things not exactly what they appear to be? There's a startling surprise in Monday's exciting episode. So don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement... The Adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, uh, what goes with the kids in other countries? What do they look like and how do they dress? Well, Kellogg has the answer with the cutouts on packages of Kellogg's Crumbles. And the kids in your family will have a swell time with these dolls of all nations. Cutting them out, changing their costumes, collecting all six countries in the series, like Norway, Holland, China. Two cutout dolls to every package, you know, and they're dressed like the real thing. That's dolls of all nations on packages of Kellogg's Crumbles. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman! Kellogg's Pep. 
P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman and Batman, continuing their efforts to find young Dick Grayson, are stopped dead in their tracks by a shocking discovery. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, uh, you'd have a hard time hunting up prizes that are as much fun to collect as the prizes and packages of Kellogg's Pet. Mind you, not just one kind of prize, but three different kinds, one or the other in each package of Pep you open. And are all three kinds fun to collect? Take, for instance, those bright-colored comic buttons, each picturing a favorite comic strip character. Boy, will you look slick with all 18 of them pinned on your jacket or your beanie cap. Or uh, take that snappy series of seven pep model planes made of colored cardboard and a cinch to put together. Or those 24 full-color bird pictures, each with a full description on the reverse side, helping make you a mighty wise bird yourself. You'll find one or the other of these three kinds of prizes in every package of pep. Forty-nine different prizes in all that you can get. And while you're collecting them, you'll be enjoying just about the slickest, keenest tasting dish ever. Yes, sir, those crisp golden flakes of pep sure do let loose with a flavor. I mean, pep makes breakfast a terrific affair. So ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, and look for your prize inside the package. And now, the adventures of Superman. Because he was in line to inherit a large fortune if anything happens to Batman's young companion, Robin, a man named Marsh plotted to do away with the youngster. Knowing that a convict named Eric Larson had a bitter grudge against Robin, Marsh arranged his escape from prison. Then, after Larson had abducted Robin, Marsh shot the convict and proceeded to put Robin out of the way himself, planning to report to the police that he had arrived too late to save the boy, but just in time to prevent Larson's escape. Meanwhile, believing that a circus clown named Freddie Ellis could help locate Larson, Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne traced him to a chicken ranch in California. And as we continue now in the kitchen of the ranch house, the frightened little clown has promised to tell all he knows. Listen. About a month ago, when the circus was in Metropolis, a man came to see me after the performance. He said his name was Marshall. Marshall? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Kent. He was a slender man with a slight British accent. Rather dark, with a little mustache. I'd never seen him before, so I was kind of surprised when he walked into my dressing tent. You're Freddy Ellis the Clown, aren't you? Yeah, that's right, sir. I enjoyed your act very much. Oh, thank you. We aim to please. Yes, sir. <laughs> Say, uh, you clown chaps have to work pretty hard, don't you? Well, two shows a day and always on the move. Well, it's no picnic and you don't make a fortune either, chum. But why bring that up? Are you the inquiring reporter? No, I, um... Look, can you use $2,000, Ellis? Can I use two... Will you mention that figure again? $2,000. $2,000? Do I have to murder anybody? Good heavens, no. I just want you to perform a slight service for a friend. A uh, slight service for a friend? Righto. For which I will pay you two thousand dollars. Oh, what lovely music you make, sir! Look, there's a quiet restaurant nearby. Shall we retire there and continue this beautiful friendship? Well, you see, Mister Kenton, Mister Wayne, I was well, rather broke at the moment, as I usually am, and this gentleman's offer interested me. Of course, I had no intention of going through with it if there was anything dishonest about it. You understand? I'm sure you didn't. Oh, of course. Go on, Mister Ellis. What happened then? Well, we. Went to the restaurant and found a quiet booth, and there this gentleman who had introduced himself to me as Mr. Marshall took up from where he left off my dressing tent. Now, this is all you have to do, Ellis. The next time you go up to state prison to visit Eric Larson... Huh? Look, how did you know I... Uh... How did I know you visited Eric Larson? Yes. I happen to know a great deal about this circus, and about Larson, and about you too, Ellis... I know you do visit him, and that's all I care about. Because the next time you go up there, I want you to bring him something. Yeah? Like what? Look. I'm looking. All I see is your cigarette, so what? This isn't just a cigarette, Ellis. No? Well, it 
Sure looks like one. Yes, but instead of tobacco, there's a sealed message rolled inside of it. A message? Right. Information which Larson wants. No kidding? Yes. Now, all you have to do is slip this to him, and I'll pay you $2,000. Just for that? Hey, what's the information in that thing? That is none of your business. Well, what do you say? Oh, I don't know. I, I might get in trouble. Why should you? You have this phony cigarette in a regular pack. When you sit down across from Larson and take out your cigarettes, remove this one and slip it to him through the screen. Oh, it sounds easy enough. Of course it is. I'll pay you 1000 now. When you deliver this uh, message, I'll pay you the other 1000 Well? Okay, I'll do it. Good. I have the first 1000 right here, and... Uh... Gave me a thousand dollars and the phony cigarette. A couple of days later, it was a Friday. I went up to state prison and slipped the thing to Larson. But I didn't know it was poison. Honest, I didn't. It really wasn't poison. Oh, it must have been because the very next day Larson died. He didn't die. He only appeared to. What? There was an Oriental drug in that fake cigarette which simulated death, caused suspended animation in Larson, so that even the doctor was fooled. You mean Larson is really alive, like the radio and papers have been saying? Whom do you think you're kidding, Ellis? Bruce. Well, what do you mean, Mr. Wayne? You know all about it. And you know where Larson and Rob... I mean, Dick Grayson are. Look, no, Bruce, I, I swear I don't. I don't believe you. Now talk or buy him. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Bruce. Wait, take it easy. I think he's telling the truth. I don't. And I'll tell you why I think you're wrong later. Look, Ellis, where can we find this fellow Marshall? I don't know, Mr. Kent. Well, you said Marshall was to give you the other thousand dollars when you did the job. Uh, how were you supposed to contact him? Oh, well, I was to phone him at the Metropolis Hotel and huh? leave a message for him to call me. All right, well, did you do that? Yes, and he came to see me and paid me the other thousand. That was right after I got back from prison. Okay, we'll take it from there. Come on, Bruce. Oh, wait a Don't minute, Don't waste Clark. time arguing. Come on with me. We've got to shoot back to Metropolis in a hurry. <laughs> We did have a Mr. Marshall staying with us for a short time, but he checked out of the hotel yesterday. Uh -oh. Did he leave a forwarding address? Why, no, he didn't, Mr. Kent. He uh -huh. said he wasn't expecting any messages or mail. Where was he registered from? Uh, here's his card. You can see for yourself. He's from London, England. Hmm. No street address. No. Anyhow, we haven't got time to go looking all over London for him, Clark. Besides, we don't know that he went back there. Or that he actually came from there, Bruce. Or that his name is really Marshall, for that matter. No. I beg your pardon. Now, look, it's very important that we trace Mr. Marshall, so... Yes? Uh, could you let us see the room he occupied? He, he might just have left something behind, you know, something that'll give us a lead. Oh, I'm sorry, but two ladies are now occupying the room. Uh-oh. Oh. I assure you, though, that Mr. Marshall left nothing behind. I see. Uh, well, where do we go from here, Clark? Well, you've got me, Bruce. I... Wait a minute. You keep a record of your guests' outgoing phone calls, don't you? I mean, your, your switchboard operators mark down the numbers called, don't they? Why, yes, good idea. yes, but we don't keep a permanent record. Well, Marshall just left yesterday. Wouldn't a record of his call still be available? I, uh... Hmm, I suppose so, but... Well, this is most unusual, Mr. Kent. I... Unusual? It's a matter of life or death. Now, please help us. Well, then... That case, I'll see what I can do for Thank you. you. It'll take a few minutes. That's a few right. gentlemen will just oh, wait. Oh, wait. Uh, I suppose you're hoping Marshall may have called Larson, making it possible to trace Larson to the phone number. Is that it, Clark? Exactly. It's a long chance. But keep your fingers crossed, Bruce. They're crossed, chum. All of them. And my toes, too. <laughs> Numbers Mr. Marshall called from his room. There are only a few, fortunately. Let's see them, please. Uh huh. Recognize any of these, Bruce? Yes, I know this first number. It's the Mayflower Department Store. Well, nothing doing there, Clark. Uh, I guess not. Seems to have called it a couple of times. Hard to get deliveries these days. That's why. Uh, I know this third number too. You do? Yes, it's Bright Brothers, big men's haberdashery. Well, he certainly didn't call Larson there. No, well, that leaves only two other numbers. You recognize either one of them? No, but we can trace them at the phone company. I have a police card. So have I. Come on, let's get going. Uh, thank you, clerk. Yes, thanks very much. You're quite welcome, gentlemen. Goodbye. I've tried.
trace those two numbers for you, Mr. Wayne. Oh, fine. What names are they listed for? This first one, Metropolis 4602, is the You Drive It Car Rental Service. Oh, I guess he just wanted to rent a car. We draw a blank there, Clark. Uh-huh. Well, there's one number left. West 3404. What's that one? Uh, that's in the name of William Roush. William Roush? At 4695 Greenvale Avenue. 4695 Greenvale? Why, that's way out near the city limits. Clark, maybe Larson... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Easy, Bruce. We'll find out in two shakes. Come on. Hurrying from the phone company offices, Clark, Kent, and Bruce Wayne prepare to streak to 4695 Greenvale Avenue, hoping it will turn out to be Eric Larson's hideout. We'll return in a moment with the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, gang, for a smooth job, just notice how the keen taste of Kellogg's Pep puts the clutch on you. You get that strictly super pep flavor, and right off, it gets you. And from then on, it's you for pep and pep for you. And you wouldn't think of doing without those crisp golden flakes of whole wheat for a single breakfast. Pep's that delicious. Every crunchy flake practically melts in your mouth, all tender and toasty. Yes, sir, if you're hep to Kellogg's Pep, you're hep to a mighty smooth dish, all right. And you're also hep to those slick Pep prizes. Prizes that are always surprises because you never know which one of the three different kinds of prizes you'll find when you open your next Pep package. For instance, uh, you'll get either a colored cardboard model of a famous fighting plane, one of seven in the great Pep Air Fleet, or uh, you'll get one of 24 pictures of birds in brilliant color with a full description on the reverse side. Or else, you'll find a bright-colored comic button picturing one of 18 characters from the funnies to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap. Ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, tomorrow and look for your prize inside the package. Clark, Kent, and Bruce Wayne, as Superman and Batman, have just arrived at a small bungalow in the thinly settled outskirts of Metropolis. Startled at what his X-ray vision perceived through the closed door, Superman has pushed the door open. Followed by Batman enters the shade-drawn living room. There, sprawled on his back on the floor, is the inert form of a man. Batman, look. Great Jupiter, that's Eric Larson. Uh-oh. Are you sure? Of course I am. Hold it. No, we're too late. He's... Yes, he's dead. But Robin, where's Robin? I don't know. Maybe he's in another room upstairs. Now, look. Now, wait a minute. Robin! Robin! It's no use, Batman. Robin isn't in this house. Right now, I don't see anyone else here, except Larson. Startled and more worried than ever, Batman looks at Superman. Now they both believe they have come to the end of the trail, only to draw a blank. Where is Robin? What happened to him after he fell to the floor in the attic when Marsh fired at him? And where is Marsh, the man who wanted to destroy Robin for the sake of a large inheritance? Our story has taken a strange new twist, and stranger, even more exciting things are to come. So don't miss tomorrow's tense episode. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. You know, gang, words can have a wonderful taste to them. Like on a frosty morning, you can almost taste words like crisp, crunchy, crinkly, uh, crumbles. Sure, that name just fits, doesn't it? Crumbles. Kellogg's Crumbles. Just seems to go with words like crisp and crunchy. It's, it's such a toasty kind of cereal. Sort of sweet and mellow rich. And you know, it's the only cereal in the whole wide world in those little crinkly shreds of good whole wheat. Crisp, crunchy, crinkly crumbles for breakfast. Kellogg's Crumble. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the... Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P, E, P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Serial, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Batman tells 
the man of steel, he has given up all hope for Robin, his young companion. He receives a startling surprise. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it's almost a sure bet when you see a fellow or girl with that raring to go up and at him look that there's been a good hearty breakfast somewhere in the picture. And did I mention Kellogg's Pep? Why, Pep is such an appetite tickler that it makes you, well, it makes you want to eat hearty. Sure. Are those crunchy whole wheat flakes terrific? Mmm, mmm. That sunshine flavor, that strictly pet flavor, is sure lure for your taste. You know, Kellogg's Pep is called the sunshine cereal. It's famous for crisp, golden, sunny goodness. And Pep is famous, too, for swell prizes. Yes, sir, there's a prize in every package of Pep you open. For instance, uh, your next prize may be one of 18 bright-colored comic buttons with pictures of your favorite comic strip characters to, to pin on your beanie cap or your jacket. Or uh, you may find a colored cardboard model of a fighting plane, one of seven model planes in the series. Or uh, your next pet prize may be one of 24 full-color bird pictures with a description on the reverse side so that you'll be hep on birds. You'll be mighty keen about all three kinds of pet prizes. So ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep tomorrow, sure thing. And now, the adventures of Superman. Searching desperately for Robin, who had been abducted by Eric Larson and escaped convict with a bitter grudge against the youngster, Superman and Batman followed a trail which led clear across the continent and back again. Finally, they arrived at the bungalow on the outskirts of Metropolis where Larson had imprisoned Robin. To their amazement, they found Larson dead from a bullet wound but no sign of Batman's young companion. As we continue now in the shade drawn living room of the bungalow, Batman says, I'd like to Superman. This looks like the end of the trail. Don't say that, Batman. Oh, let's face it. This was our last hope. Now, we look. We figured that when we caught up with Larson, we'd find Robin. I know, but now that's Larson's that... dead, and heaven only knows what happened to poor Robin. This isn't at all like you, Batman. Don't give up hope. He may be all right. Chances We'd are... We'd have he heard just... from him by this time if he were. Well, maybe he just can't communicate oh, with us. Oh, nuts. I'm convinced Larson has done away with him. As he swore he would. All right, then who shot Larson and why? What's the difference? Larson was a bad apple, a blackmailer, and a murderer. He might have quarreled with one of his Wait gang. What? Thought I heard something. I don't hear anything. Wait a minute. There it is again. Oh, what? Wait, Scott, someone's downstairs in the cellar. Come on, Batman. <laughs> Give me a hand, Batman. All right. Somebody under this coal pile. Hey, Jupiter. Is it Robin? No, no. Ah, here he is. Don't shoot, fellas. Uh, Don't shoot. What the... Boy, it's a great big guy tied up like a bundle of water. I didn't do nothing. I, I, I Boy, didn't... what are you doing here? Wait till I get him untied. There we are. There. Can you stand up now? Yeah. yeah sure. Thanks, pal. All right. Start talking. Who are you? My name's Willie. Willie Doak. Well, listen, Willie. Well, Robin, what... Uh... Was Dick Grayson here? Yeah, he... I, I, I mean, uh... He was? What happened to him? Where is he? Oh, wait a minute. Who, who are you guys? What are you wearing them funny clothes Never mind for? us. What happened to Dick? Where is he? Who? Dick Grayson. Never heard of him. Now, don't give me that. You just said he was no, here. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Now, you better talk and talk fast. Where is he? None of your business. Now, get out of my way. way. No, you don't. I'm back here. Hey, let go. Don't worry, oh, Batman. He won't get away. Stand still, Willie really, boy. Yeah, go on. I'll kill you. You're not killing anyone. Now, are you going to tell us what happened here and where Dick Grayson is, or... No, I ain't. I'm going to bust you apart like this. Oh. Okay, you're asking for it. Up with it. Hey, what the... Now, let's hey. buzz around the Leave cellar a bit. The wind ought to pull you off. All right. Out of boy, Superman. Give him the word. I hey, got it out. Look out. Almost bumped into the wall that time. Between those feet. Hey. Down the furnace. Hey, stop. Put me down. Put me down. How are we doing, Batman? <laughs> You're making me dizzy. Stop it, stop it. Put me down, please. Still in a killing mood, Willie? Oh, no, I was just kidding. Put me down. All right, down we go. Gee, but uh, I'm dizzy. So sorry. Here, I'll hold you up. No, no, don't touch me. You, you... Creep, you... You must be Superman. Right. Now, shall we take a little trip to the moon, or is your tongue sufficiently loosened to talk through? No, 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 no more flying. I'll, I'll talk. Well, it's about time. Now, where's Dick Grayson? Up. Up in the attic, I guess. In the attic? Yeah, he... No, he isn't. Tell the truth, or do we go to the moon? Okay, okay. Well, Marsh cornered the kid in the attic, see? Then I heard him shoot. 
Then Marsh come down looking for me, but I was hiding here in a cold... But where's place. Dick? Oh, he must be still up there. Maybe... Maybe he's dead. Jupiter. Dead? Wait, Batman. I tell you, the attic is empty. He isn't in this house. I'm going to make sure. Okay, but it's a waste of time. Come along, Willie. <laughs> All right, Willie, let's get on with your story. You said somebody named Marsh shot Larson and Dick. Who was Marsh? A guy. That's all I know. Eric, Eric Larson waited here for him with a Grayson kid. He said he couldn't knock him off till Marsh got here. Tell me, was Marsh a slender, dark man with a little mustache? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Well, he must be Marshall, the one who sent the Oriental drug to Larson in jail, Superman. Yes. All right, go on, Willie. What happened when Marsh got here? Well, he talked to Larson in the living room. I, I was watching a Grayson kid in the back room. Then I heard a shot. Before I could get out of the room, the Grayson kid had his hands free. He lassoed me and tied me up. I, I don't know how we did it, but... Uh... Well, go on. Then what? Well, the kid started to tiptoe up, but when he opened the door, there was Marsh with a gun. Oh. Marsh said he'd shot Larson, and now he was going to finish Grayson. Then he said he'd tell the cops Larson shot the kid, and he shot Larson trying to make a getaway. Oh, so that was it. Why did Marsh want to kill Dick? I don't know. Well, never mind that now. I've got to find out what happened to Dick. Go on, keep talking, Willie. Yeah, uh, uh, well, this kid, he, he's a game little rooster, I gotta say that. He dives into Marsh and knocks him off balance. Then he beats it up the stairs to the attic with Marsh after him. I can hear Marsh kicking at the door. I know we'll bust it down soon and it'll be all up with the kid. On account of he can't get out because there's no windows in the attic, see? Yes. Uh-huh. Well, then all of a sudden it comes over me. I'm in a bad way, too. I know this Marsh is a killer, and he knows I know he rubbed out Larson, my boy. I can't walk, and I can't. The kid rope me up, but I can roll. So I roll myself out the door and down the stairs to sell. But what about Dick? I'm telling you, I'm te- I just got myself rolled in a coal pile when I heard the door bust in the attic, and I hear a shot. I know that's a kid getting it. Oh, poor Dick. But it doesn't add up. Where are Dick and Marsh? You said he intended to tell the police Larson shot Dick. I don't know what happened to Marsh or the kid. All I know, right after that shot, Marsh comes running downstairs calling for me. He looks all over the house, even down here in the cellar, but he don't see me, see? After a while, I don't hear nothing. I figure Marsh is sitting quiet, waiting for me to show up and get shot. So I dig in deep in the coal and lay low. Till you guys get here. How long ago was this? Since you heard the shot in the attic, I mean. Oh... Maybe an hour. Oh, we got here just an hour too late. Larson must have carried Dick's body away and now... Why should he, Batman? If he had it planned to blame Larson for the shooting. I don't know why Marsh did or why he even wanted to shoot Dick in the first place. But I'm going to find out when I find Marsh or Marshall or whatever his right name is. And I will find him if it's the last thing I ever... Well, I'll help you as soon as we get the police here. I'm not going to wait for the police. Marsh is an hour's start on me. Wait, Batman. I'll see you later, Superman. Where can I contact you? I'll contact you when I have a lead. So long. It's good to see you, Mr. Wayne. I've been so worried, sir. Well, thank you, Alfred. Is there any word of Master Dick, sir? I'm afraid he's done for. No, no, sir. Don't say that. You've got to face it, Alfred. Dick was cornered by a murderer named Marsh who had a gun. Now they're both missing. There's only one conclusion we can draw. If you'll forgive me, sir, I won't believe Master Dick is finished until... Uh, until I see his body. He's clever and resourceful, you know. And quick as a flash. Yes, I know. I've been telling myself all that, trying to find a ray of hope. But it's no good, Alfred. Dick was cornered in an attic from which there was no escape. Another man heard a shot fired. Now all that's left is to find Marsh. Find him and make him pay for what he did. Well, I'm going to my laboratory to get some equipment. Then I'm going. Hey, someone's at the door, sir. Yes, will you see who it is, Alfred? Uh, yes, sir. I, I can't believe it, sir. Poor Master Dick. Yes? You, Bruce Wayne. I'm his butler. Who shall I say is calling? Never mind that. Just tell him I got a message for him. I'll give it to him. Not to do one. I got to give it to Wayne first. Well, never mind, you... Alfred. I'm Bruce Wayne. You have a message for me? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So long. So long. I wonder what this is. Anything important, sir? I don't know, Alfred. Great Jupiter. 
What is it, sir? Why, the, this note. This note is from Dick. Their eyes bulging, Bruce Wayne and Alfred stare at the dirty scrap of paper which indicates that Dick Grayson, who is really Robin, is alive. We'll be back in a moment with the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, gang, they say good things come in threes. And that's certainly true about the three different kinds of prizes that come in packages of Kellogg's Pep. Yes, sir, there's one or the other in each package of Pep you open. And each prize is really slick. For instance, your next Pep prize may be a bright-colored comic button, picturing one of your favorite comic strip characters. Eighteen in all depend on your jacket or your beanie cap. Or uh, maybe you'll find a bird picture in bright color with a full description on the reverse side. Collect all 24 of these, and will you be hep on birds? Or uh, maybe you'll find one of the seven slick-colored cardboard plane models, easy and fun to put together. And all the while you're collecting these three kinds of prizes, you'll be enjoying just about the best breakfast dish you ever hustled across your tongue. Crunchy, golden whole wheat flakes of Kellogg's Pep. Mm Mmm-mm. Pep really sends you. What flavor? A fresh, brisk flavor. All crisp and catchy. A wonderful flavor for breakfast. So for a prize breakfast and prizes that are super... Ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Just as he had given up all hope for Dick Grayson, Bruce Wayne, who is really the famous Batman, received a note from his young companion. As Alfred, his loyal butler and man of all work, stands by eagerly, Wayne jubilantly announces... He's alive, Alfred. Dick's alive. Oh, thank heaven, sir. Where is he? Why... Oh, what, sir? Listen to this. Batman... Get the bat boat and come to Cove Harbor as quickly as you can. Cove Harbor? Yes, that's just a few miles down the coast. Listen. Look for a seagoing yacht painted black with two orange smokestacks. I'll be on it. A seagoing yacht? Yes. Come prepared for trouble. Plenty of trouble. Hurry, Robin. My word, sir. What does it mean? It means that Dick's alive, but he's in danger. Come on, Alfred. We're going to find him. Followed by Alfred, Bruce Wayne, who is Batman, races through his house to the back stairway and down to his garage to answer the SOS from his young companion. What does this latest development mean? What is Robin doing on a strange yacht in Cove Harbor? We'll know tomorrow, so don't miss the next exciting episode, fellows and girls. Be sure to tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, on a chilly morning when your nose wakes up half frozen, gang, that's crumbles weather. Just the time for a toasty kind of cereal with zip and go. Kellogg's Crumbles. Just the name to make you think of toasty words like crisp, crunchy, crinkly. Crumbles. You know, it's the only cereal in the whole wide world made in those little crinkly shreds of real whole wheat. Sort of sweet and mellow rich. This is Crumbles Weather, gang. Just the time for crisp, crunchy, crinkly Kellogg's Crumbles. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is... Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P, 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 Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Serial, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman still pursues the search for Robin in Metropolis, unaware that Batman is on the high seas in response to an SOS from his brave young companion. Hello there, gang. This is your pal, Dan McCullough. Say, uh, I'll bet you never heard of a football star who didn't pack away a good breakfast on the morning of the big game. Well, believe you me, if you know there's a bowl of Kellogg's Pep waiting for you at breakfast, you'll feel like you're heading for a touchdown. 
because you always play a winning game when you're heading toward those crisp golden whole wheat flakes of pep. They're that delicious, that full of smooth, catchy flavor, that fun to eat. And say, uh, while we're in the fun department, just take a look inside your next package of pep for your prize. See which one of the three different kinds of prizes you get. Maybe it'll be a model fighting plane in colored cardboard, one of seven great pet planes you can collect. Or uh, maybe it'll be a bird picture in bright color with a full description on the reverse side. You can collect 24 of them. Or uh, maybe it'll be a bright colored comic button picturing a favorite comic strip character, 18 in all to, to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap. And whether it's a plane, a bird, or a button, you keep right on having fun when you're collecting the three different kinds of prizes in packages of pep. So get going, gang. Ask Mom to get you a supply of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, tomorrow. And now, the adventures of Superman. Arriving at the hideout of Eric Larson, the escaped convict who had abducted Robin, Superman and Batman found Larson dead. But there was no sign of Robin. Then, when they found a thug hiding on the premises who revealed that a mysterious man named Marsh had shot both Larson and Robin, Batman gave up hope, certain he would never see his young companion again. But early that evening, a message was brought to him at his house. It was from Robin, and it read, Hop into the bat boat and come to Cove Harbor. Look for a black ocean-going yacht with two orange smokestacks. I'll be on it. Be prepared for trouble. Hurry. As we continue now, the long, curiously streamlined bat boat fairly leaps over the waves as it sweeps into Cove Harbor at the time when evening is slowly fading into night. Sighting his goal, Batman at the wheel throttles down and speaks to Alfred, his loyal butler and man Friday. Cove Harbor, Alfred. Do you see a black yacht with two orange smokestacks? No, sir. Do you suppose that note could have been some sort of trick? A forgery, perhaps, sir? No, it was in Robin's handwriting, all right. My hunch is that the yacht he mentioned has already left the harbor. Could be, sir. So what'll we do? It's getting dark, you know. Yes, I know, Alfred. Will you hand me those binoculars, please? Uh, yes. Here you are, Batman. Thanks, Alfred. Now let's have us a look out to sea. Hmm. Any sign of the yacht, sir? No. No sign. Well, there's only one thing to do. What's that, sir? Swing around and pile on the coal. Hang on, Alfred. Notice a black yacht come out of Cove Harbor? A black yacht? Yes. A private job with two orange smokestacks. I come to think of it, it's it. Oh, that's splendid, sir. Isn't it? Yes. Oh, will you tell me, please, about how long ago did she steam by here? About an hour ago, I say. An hour, huh? Well, which way was she headed? She south, around the narrow. South? Up the sea. Thanks very much. Here we go again, Alf. Watch out when you turn that first boy. The low reef there. I'll watch it. So long. How are we going out to sea after the yacht, sir? What do you think, Alfred? It's naturally, sir. Only it's getting dark fast. So what? The yacht's only got an hour to start on us, and this bat boat will outrun any boat in the water. Yeah, we're out of the channel now. Alfred, come here and take the wheel. Uh, yes, sir. But... Hold her steady on this course, straight out to sea. I'm going to go forward and keep a lookout with the binoculars. Uh, right, sir. I say, sir. Yes? What sort of a pickle do you suppose Master Robin is in now? Well, you've got me, Alf. All I know is that he's alive and in trouble, and that's enough for me. We'll find him all right, Edward. Uh-oh. Do you see the yacht, sir? No, not a sign of it. One of the sky is clouding over it, hiding the moon. I'm afraid now we are going to need help, Alfred. We're going to find that yacht. But whom can we get, sir? Well, I'm going to call Super, uh, uh, Clark Kent on the radio telephone. Clark Kent? If it's begging your pardon, sir, what can he do? <laughs> You'd be surprised, Alfred. Bottle her down, will you? Hey, there's something wrong here. Wrong, sir? Yes. Sounds like the radio batteries are down. Or... Oh, there. There, that's a little better. Seems to be okay now. 
I see. That's jolly good. But I wish you'd tell me why you want Clark Kent. Oh, never mind that. Batman calling Metropolis. Batman calling Metropolis. Come in, please. Did they come in, sir? No, not yet. Metropolis Marine Telephone Exchange. Here they are now. Go ahead, Batman. This is urgent. Connect me with Clark Kent at the Metropolis Daily Planet. I'll repeat that. Connect me with Clark Kent at the Metropolis Daily Planet. Have you got that? Clark Kent at the Metropolis Daily Planet. Right. Will you please rush the connection? This is urgent. Hold on. Call right through. Hey. Now if only Clark is there and if only this radio is on. I have Clark Kent for you, Batman. Oh, that's wonderful. Put him on. Hello, Batman. Clark. Clark, thank heaven I found you. Listen. Robin's alive. He is? How do you know? Tell me, man. Well, I got a note from him this evening. A note? Yes, and I need you at once. Robin's on a yacht and I... I can't hear you, Batman. Speak louder. Oh, this radio's going bad again, Alfred. Can you hear me now? Hardly. Just tell me where you are and I'll come there. I'm in the back post, Clark. I can't hear you at all now. This radio telephone is on the phone. Clark, listen. I'm in the back post. Clark. Clark, Hello. Hello. Hello, Clark. Well, how do you like that? Orm's gone dead entirely. Well, Alfred, whether we like it or not, we're on our own now. We usually are, sir, aren't we? Yes, I suppose so. Anyhow, those clouds cleared off the moon, that's something. Maybe I can see that black yacht now through these night binoculars. I certainly hope so, sir. Any luck, sir? No, not yet. No, wait. What's that? What, sir? There's a speck out there on the horizon. To the port, Albert. The port, sir. Yes, sir. Easy. Easy now. Hold it just like that. It's very good, sir. Easy, the yacht, sir. It may be, Alfred. I think I can make out two stacks on her. Sir, Robin said the yacht had two smokestacks. Yes, I know. We've got to get closer. Full throttle, Albert. Give her all she's got. Every last ounce. We'll know if she's the one in a few minutes. <laughs> Powerful engines roaring at full throttle, the bat boat leaps through the dark sea toward the tiny speck on the horizon. Is it the mysterious yacht on which Robin is held? We'll know in a moment when we return for the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, which is it, gang? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a button? Well, you might get any one of these three kinds of prizes in your next package of Kellogg's Pet. And are all three kinds smooth. For instance, those bird pictures. Each one's in bright color with a description on the reverse side so that you get the real lowdown on these high flyers. There are 24 pictures of birds in all. And then you can collect seven different models of famous fighting planes, all made of colored cardboard and easy to assemble. And the comic button. 18 different bright colored buttons to collect, each picturing a favorite comic strip character to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap. Now, that makes 49 different prizes in all you can collect. One in each package of Pep you open. And all of them are super to go with Pep's super terrific flavor, which is saying a lot because that sunny full wheat flavor of Pep is really out of this world. Each spoonful of these crisp golden flakes tastes so downright wonderful that you have to keep yourself from gobbling them down. So ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, tomorrow. And remember, look for the prize inside your package. Far out at sea, her twin orange smokestacks faintly illumined in the pale moonlight. The sleek black yacht cut swiftly through the dark waves. On the glass-enclosed bridge stands the captain and the helmsman, while two or three crewmen lounge at the rail. The others aboard are below deck at their mess table. With their eyes fixed idly on the waves, the sailors at the rail do not see the boy who steps noiselessly in his bare feet from the shadow of a lifeboat behind them. It is Dick Grayson whom we know as Batman's young companion, Robin. Swiftly, the boy moves across the deck to an open hatchway, slips down the few stairs to the carpeted corridor of the cabin deck. For a moment, he pauses, listening. Then, satisfied that he hears only the purr of the giant diesel engines, he starts moving cautiously along the corridor. Outside the door of a stateroom, he stops again. Holding his breath, he slowly turns the polished brass doorknob, pushes gently until, through the half-open door, he sees a handsome stateroom, empty, Softly closing the door, he moves to the next stateroom. 
There, a low, indistinguishable murmur of voices comes to his ears. Slowly, with the utmost care, he turns the doorknob, moves the door in with a scant inch or two, until he can clearly hear the conversation within. That's Marsh with my grandfather. I'm sorry. I did everything I could, Mr. Grayson, but unfortunately, I couldn't find your grandson. Oh, no? I can't understand that, Marsh. Why is there no trace of him? Well, he disappeared several years ago, shortly after after his parents uh, passed away. And he hasn't been seen or heard of since. I don't lie. What about that chap who adopted him, Marsh? Uh, What was his name? You mean Bruce Wayne? Yes, yes, Wayne. Didn't he know where the boy was? No, sir. He spent a fortune to locate him, he tells me. But to no avail. I don't uh, like that. I see. Well, this is a bad blow, Marsh. I had my heart set on seeing my grandson before before I died. Oh, please, sir, I don't speak of dying. You have many years ahead of you. No, no, I haven't. And you know it. We both know that I grow weaker every day. If there's only something I could do for you. To comfort you, sir. Oh, you've been a great comfort to me, Marsh. Thank you. And I appreciate it. You find out how much I appreciate it when my will is read. Oh, please, please don't speak that way. No. Mr. Oh. Mr. What, what happened? I say, the sea's getting a bit rough. Big wave must have hit us that time. Are you all right, sir? Yes, quite, quite. Hold right. on, hold on. Here it comes again. Oh, the door opened. What? What? Good God, Fred. Uh, what is it, Mark? It, why, it, it, it's nothing, sir. I've got to get out of sight. Whoever thought the boat would pitch and throw the door open. Here, this empty stateroom. Now, where can I hide? Marsh finds me. It'll be quick curtains. Uh oh, that chest under the porthole. I'm small enough to get into it. Now, if Marsh comes into the room and looks in this chest, I'm a dead pigeon. Huddled in a sea chest in the captain's stateroom, Robin makes himself as small as possible, praying that Marsh does not open the lid as he hears the murderous plotter moving about within a few feet of him. With Batman and Alfred miles away in the bat boat, helpless to aid him, and Clark Kent, who is Superman, unaware of his whereabouts and dangerous predicament, what will happen to Robin? Tomorrow's episode is swift and exciting, so don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Crumbles. Crumbles. Kellogg's Crumbles. Say that over a couple of times. Just goes with toasty words like crisp, crunchy, crinkly, doesn't it? And that's just what Crumbles is. A toasty kind of cereal for a frosty morning. Sort of sweet and mellow rich. And you know, gang, Kellogg's Crumbles is the only cereal in the whole wide world made in those crinkly shreds of real whole wheat. So good to eat and so good for you. Crisp, crunchy, crinkly, crumbles. Kellogg's Crumbles. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg. F. P. E. P. F. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Superman in Metropolis and Batman on the high seas hunting for Robin, the boy continues in danger, alone and unprotected among those who seek to destroy him. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it makes collecting prizes just about 49 times as much fun when you know that you can get not just one prize, but 49 different top-notch prizes right in packages of Kellogg's Pet. Yes, sir, you'll find a prize in every package. And there are three different kinds of prizes you may find there. For instance, you may find one of 18 different comic strip buttons, each picturing a favorite comic strip character. Or uh, you may find a colored cardboard model of a fighting plane, one of seven exciting plane models in the series. 
Or you may get a gay-colored bird picture from a series of 24, each with a full description on the reverse side so that you can make like you're a regular bird expert. Now, that makes 49 different prizes you can collect, all of them strictly super. And that goes double for Pep itself. Why, the way Pep lets loose with a sunshine flavor is something terrific. Every single one of these crisp flakes of whole wheat gives you the business. Every spoonful stacks up the flavor. Every bowlful tickles you plenty in the taste department. No fooling. Pep's a solid sender. So, what's keeping you, gang? Ask Mom for Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, and look for your prize inside the package. And now, the adventures of Superman. Just at the time he had given up hope of ever seeing Robin, his young companion, again, Batman was overjoyed to receive a message from the youngster, saying he was on a certain yacht in Cove Harbor. With Alfred, his butler, and Man Friday, Batman rushed to Cove Harbor in his bat boat, only to learn that the yacht had put to sea an hour before. Batman gave chase. But meanwhile, hidden aboard the yacht at Dick Grayson, Robin was seen by his grandfather's secretary, a man named Marsh, who thought he had shot the boy in Metropolis. Robin took refuge in a sea chest in the captain's stateroom. And as we continue now, Marsh has been joined in the stateroom by Captain Skinner. Huddled in the chest, Robin hears Marsh say... I tell you, the boy Dick Grayson is on this boat, Captain. We've got to find him. Uh, that's impossible, Mr. Marsh. He can't be on He is, boat. I tell you. I saw him. I was talking to the old man. Uh, that is Mr. Grayson in his stateroom. When the boat pitched and the door banged open. And there was Dick standing in the corridor looking at us. Nonsense. How could he be alive? You said you shot him. I did, and yet, yet I'm sure I just saw him in the corridor. Use your head, man. How could young Grayson be dead in Metropolis where you left him, and yet be seen alive on this yacht? Why, why, he couldn't, of course, but... Of course he couldn't. So, it stands to reason you just thought you saw him. I'm afraid it's just that, uh, well, uh, now we're coming close to the payoff. You're getting a bit jumpy, that's all. Incidentally, when's that going to be? What? When's what going to be? You know. When is the old gold... Uh, I mean, Mr. Grayson, going to kick off? Pretty soon now, I hope. About when, would you say? Oh, in a few weeks, I suppose. Perhaps a month. Why wait that long? Now that his grandson's finished, you inherit the old man's millions when he goes. So why not make quick work of it? What's your hurry, Captain? Just that I want to get my hands on my share. I see. Well, you know it takes time for the poison to work. He's getting very small doses in his food. Well, I'll give him big doses. Get it over with. Are you out of your mind? It's got to be done slowly and carefully. So when he goes, poisoning won't be suspected. If we gave him a big dose, the doctor would spot it at once and we'd be in for him. Not if it were done at sea. What do you mean? If Grayson dies while we're underway like this, we just bury him at sea. And who's going to be the wiser? I see. Uh, I see. That's good. No, no, it's too risky. Why, you've got nothing to worry about, Marsh. So take care of uh, the old man tonight, huh? Uh, but, but what if his grandson Dick is the liar? Will you come off that? I tell you, your nerves played a trick on your eyes. Now pull yourself together, old man. Let's finish the job on old Grayson tonight, and we'll be rid of this whole muddy mess. Well, all right, that's the way to talk. Let's see. He's had his dinner. But you always bring him a snack before he goes to sleep, don't you? Yes, a biscuit and a glass of wine. Good. We'll you put the stuff in the biscuit and the wine. <laughs> then when we get to England, they can probate the blooming well and we'll split millions. <laughs> Come on, chap. We'll go down to the galley and fix the old duffer snack. So they're going to poison my grandfather, eh? Well, those babies are due for a big surprise, I hope. Phew, that old sea chest makes close quarters. Now for some action. And the first thing to do is warn my newly discovered grandfather. down, Grandpa. Uh, what did you call me? <laughs> Sounds funny, huh? Now, look here, you. Shh, for the love of Mike, it'll be curtains for both of us, but quick. I, I don't understand. Who are you? Sir, get ready for a shot. I'm your grandson, Dick Grayson. My, my grandson? Uh-huh. Surprised? 
Why, George, you do look like my son John when he was a boy. Hmm, well, now, matter of fact, you you look just like him. Yeah, that's what everybody says. Now, yeah, but, listen... but you can't be. Marsh said my grandson had disappeared years ago. So how could you be on this yacht? My yacht. Look, Grandpa, we're wasting time. But if you must know, I followed Mr. Rat. Huh? That's my pet name for Marsh, to Cove Harbor. And then when he went aboard the launch, I made like a fish and swam to the yacht and stowed away. Now, it's a good thing I did, because Marsh is planning to slip you a Mickey tonight. The kind you don't wake up from. Uh, uh, Mickey, what, what are you saying, son? He's planning to poison you. Poison me? Check. You see, he thinks he finished me in Metropolis today. But I pulled the old Indian trick on him and fell just as he was pulling the trigger. Lucky for me, he didn't have time to check yeah, up. But, so... but, but why? Why? Look, Grandpa, get hep. With me out of the picture, Marsh inherits all your money, doesn't he? Why, yes, yes, but... All uh, right, there you are. Uh, but uh, that's impossible, son. Why, Paul Marsh has been with me for years. I, I, I trust him absolutely. You know, maybe I should let you go on trusting him. Especially after you gave my father the back of your neck. Well, just because he joined the circus and earned an honest living, instead of living like a parasite on your money. Oh, I must admit, I was a stupid, hard-headed snob, and I've lived to regret it. That's why I came to America. I wanted to find you, make it up to you. I've been very lonely, Dick. Well, now that you're here... That's I'll... just it, Grandpa. Don't you see, I won't be here long, or you either, unless we figure out a way to stop Marsh and your yacht, Captain, from carrying out their murderous scheme. Captain Skinner? Is he working with Marsh? Oh, and how. They're as chummy as two bugs in a dirty rug. And it's my hunch the crew are a nice bunch of rascals, too. Oh, this is a terrible shock, son. Terrible. Paul Marsh and Captain Skinner. I trust them. I... By heaven, I, I'll have the boundaries in here. I, I'll easy, tell them I... easy does it, Grandpa. Do you want us to wind up in Davy Jones' locker? Yeah, but, but, but look, look here, I... our only chance is to play foxy, see? Stole them somehow until Batman gets here. Batman? Oh, uh, uh, well, he's a friend of mine who's on his way. Yeah, I see. I hope. Now, listen, I've got to find a place to hide. But first, let me warn you. Whatever you do, don't take anything to eat or drink, savvy? But, but why? Because just for your information, Marsh has been slipping little doses of poison into your food for some time. Good God, Ray. No wonder I've been so weak lately. I couldn't even leave my bed to help search for you. I, I had to trust Marsh with everything. Why, by the bone... Relax, I... Grandpa. We don't want Marsh to get suspicious when he comes in here. Now, let's see. Where can I hide? I've got just the place for you, Dick. Marsh! Yeah, now, now, look here, Marsh. Grab him, Captain. Oh, no, you don't. Remember what I told you, Grandpa? Captain, look. Look, he's trying to get through the portal. Oh, you don't get up like that. Ah, let go of me, you no good murderer. Captain, release that boy. He's my grandson. Marsh, Marsh, tell Captain Skin to release him at once. That's one guy over here. That's it. That's it. Grab him. Then bring him up on deck. I'll see that he doesn't get away this time. Fighting furiously, Dick Grayson, who is Robin, is slowly overpowered by Marsh and the burly Captain Skinner, who swarm over him. We'll be back in a moment with the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, did you ever meet up with a fellow like Dawdler Dick? You know, a fellow who kind of dawdles over his food and keeps everybody waiting? Well, if there's a Dawdler Dick around your breakfast table, just put him next to a bowl of Kellogg's Pep and watch him go to town. Uh, you'd have a hard time finding anybody who wouldn't step up his pace while eating Pep, the sunshine cereal. That keen, catchy Pep flavor gets them time after time. Those crisp golden flakes of whole wheat taste so terrific that you get a bang out of every single spoonful. Say, who wouldn't get a bang out of those swell Pep prizes? Three different kinds of prizes. One or the other in every package of Pep you open. For instance, you may find one of 24 keen bird pictures in gleaming bright colors with a full description on the reverse side to help you spot these birds in the air. Or uh, you may find a colored cardboard model of a fighting plane, and all seven model planes in the series are collector's items. Or your next pet prize may be one of 18 bright colored comic buttons, picturing characters straight out of the funnies. So ask Mom to get you a supply of Kellogg's Pep and look for your prize inside the package. Dick Grayson, who is really Robin, has been overpowered by Marsh and Captain Skinner. Then, over the angry objections of his grandfather, was carried to the deck of the yacht. Now, standing by the rail in the moonlight, Marsh says, You won't get away this time, Dick, because this time it won't do you any good to play dead. Not when I throw you overboard. Big boat, Captain Skinner, there's a big speedboat drawing up on it, the boat. Yippee, it's the back boat. What? Oh, yes, I see it. Harris, let go. The prize. And the guns! Excuse me, Batman. 
Yes, Alfred, this is a bad break. I was hoping we could get right up to them. I think that's Master Dick, sir, on the after deck. Yes. Well, now we've got to try to get into the... Hi, what? Oh, firing at us. This seems bad. That isn't good, Alfred. I'm glad that moon came up so brightly. Well, we've got to do a bit of maneuvering now. We're not going away, sir, are we? I'm not, but you are. What do you mean, sir? As soon as we get around behind them in their shadow... I'm going to dive off and swim to the yard. But, sir... We you... Get, you get back to Metropolis. Contact Clark Kent, Alfred. But I can't leave you, sir. You must. But do as I say. It's our only chance. All right, Alfred. Take the wheel and swing her around. Sharp. But, sir... Don't I... argue, Alfred. I tell you our only chance is for Robin and me to stand these fellows off. It's possible. Until Super... Until Clark Kent takes over. So tear back to Metropolis. Here I go. Good luck, Alfred. Good luck, sir. Back to Metropolis, I go. He has not been seen. Batman dives from his sleek craft and swims underwater toward the yacht. As Alfred turns the fleet backboat and starts back toward Metropolis at full throttle, with the guns from the yacht blazing at him. What will happen? Will Batman's desperate plan succeed? Can he somehow sustain himself and Robin against desperate odds? As Alfred rushes toward Metropolis, where Clark Kent at this very moment is vainly trying to track Batman's interrupted call for help. Although Clark Kent, who is Superman, knows his friends are in trouble, he is helpless to aid them right now. But tomorrow brings another development. So be sure to be with us then, as Batman and Robin, together again, fight for their lives. Tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pet. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazine and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Hey, when you shiver out of bed on a frosty morning, gang, that's Crumble's weather. That's when you want a toasty kind of cereal with zip and go. Kellogg's Crumbles. Just the name makes you think of toasty words like crisp, crunchy, Crinkly, crumbles, sort of sweet and mellow rich. The only cereal in the whole wide world made in those crinkly shreds of real whole wheat. You bet, gang, this is crumbles weather. Time for crisp, crunchy, crinkly, Kellogg's crumbles. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcast. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P, E, P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, with Superman still unaware of their dangerous predicament, Batman and Robin put up a desperate but seemingly futile fight for their lives. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, 49 sure is a lucky number, because 49's the number of different prizes you can collect from packages of Kellogg's Pet. Yes, sir, there's one in every single package, and all of them are slick. For instance, uh, you can get seven different colored cardboard models of fighting planes. Easy and, and fun to assemble. And then there's a great new series of 24 bird pictures, each with a full description on the reverse side so that you can wow the gang with your knowledge of birds. And there are 18 bright colored comic buttons, each with a famous comic strip character to, to pin on your beanie cap or your jacket. Now, that makes 49 different prizes you can collect. And that's only a part of the fun in Kellogg's Pep. Think of the good eating fun of those crisp whole wheat flakes, all crammed with keen, catchy flavor. I mean, that wonderful golden toasted flavor, that sunny, strictly pep flavor is famous. Why, pep is called the sunshine cereal. Yes, sir, when it comes to brightening up breakfast, pep's a terrific hit. So get in on the fun, gang, 
Ask Mom to bring Kellogg's Pep from the grocer tomorrow, and be sure to look for your prize inside the package. Now, the adventures of Superman. Trapped on his grandfather's yacht far out at sea, Dick Grayson, who was really Batman's young companion, Robin, was about to be dispatched by Paul Marsh, his grandfather's secretary, when the swift and powerful bat boat was seen approaching. Under orders from Marsh, the crew of the yacht opened fire with machine guns. Recognizing the need for help, Batman told Alfred, his loyal butler, to race the bat boat back to Metropolis and contact Clark Kent. Then, when Alfred made a sharp U-turn, Batman dove into the dark ocean and swam underwater toward the yacht. As we continue now on the moonlit deck of the ship, two burly sailors hold Dick's armed pinion as Captain Skinner reports to Marsh. Listen. Everything is under control, Marsh. We put several holes in the bloody boat. She won't get far. Besides... There's a radio telephone on the boat. That me- uh, The men in the boat will call the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard? I, I think Stop that... Stop listening to this young puppy. Relax, Marsh. The two blighters who were in that boat won't call anybody. We plugged both of them. What? Are you sure? I'm jolly well sure. As a matter of fact, one of them fell overboard. Done for. Uh oh. I saw the other one pitch over the wheel as he swung about. Oh, no. I held my bimaxual on the blighter until I saw him slide to the deck. Lie there. He's through. And his blinking boat is heading straight for the boss. Splendid, Captain. Splendid. Why, you dirty... Hold it, Winston. Let go of Let go He'll me. let go in a moment, Dick. As soon as I put a bullet into you. Get it over with, Marsh. Then we'll take care of his grandfather. Captain Skinner, sir, look there. Coming over the stern rail. By Joe, who's that? Batman. It's Batman. Over here. Coming, Dick. Start dishing it off. Oh, brother, and how? Yes, sir. Step right up and get it. Put this in your bread bag, Captain. I'm sure you're tired of standing, Mr. Marsh, so no, I can help you sit down. Where's going, Dick? Pardon me, sailor boy, but your chin is showing. Oh, you kill Look up ahead, that man toward the bow. Oh, the gang from below ship, and they've got guns. Shoot them, men! Yes, shoot the kill! I hate being a clay pigeon. Quick, Robin, I see an open hatchway. Make like a mouth. Here I come, down the hatch. Come on, jump up on your feet. You all there? I think so, Batman. Good, let's make tracks. And I know where. Follow me. Lead on, McDuff. Hey, what are you stopping for, little fellow? Oh, sorry, I forgot to hold out my hand. Into this stateroom, quick. Okay, any old port in the store? Good thing there's a lock on the door. Well, that won't keep our friends out long. No, but... Dick, is that you? Hey, you've got company. Yes, it's my grandpa, oh, Batman. thank heavens you're alive, Your Your what? My grandfather, Mr. Grayson. Fine, trying to make gag. It's no gag. Grandpa, this is Batman, my pal. Open the door! Godfrey, what is this all about? Sorry, Mr. Marsh, but we're hard of hearing. Come on! My God, we'll blast you out! Blast away! But don't forget to duck when you come in! You haven't got a trunk! You might as well open the door before we break it! Huh? Don't you dare, Marsh, you bounder! I warn you, I have a pistol here! I'll blow your blooming head off! Oh, my grandpop, what big teeth you have! That's the spirit, Mr. Grayson. I'll teach those rats. Try to kill my grandson, will they? Try to poison me, eh? Listen. Seems as if all's quiet on the western front. You suppose Grandpa's pistol scared them away? No, not for long. You can be sure of that. They're probably plotting some new dirty work. While we're still around the fireside, Sonny Boy, suppose you bring me up to date. How did you get on this pirate ship, and what's with this Grandpa and Grandson? Well, you see, Mr. Uh, 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 just call me Batman. Sir. I'll tell him, Grandpa. Uh, very well. I can make it short and sweet. It's on the level, Batman. This wonderful fire-eating old gentleman with the walrus mustache is my long-lost and ever-loving grandfather. Why, incredible. Well, that's quite correct, sir. I can't believe it. John Grayson's father? Correct. You see, he disowned my father because he scorned the old family estate and grandpop's bloomin' millions, so to speak, and hooked up with a circus. That's yeah, because I was a hard-headed old fool. And now... But lately, he got softened up by old age, I now, suppose. Now, look here, you young scallywag. <laughs> Easy, Grandpop. He wanted to cast his fond eyes on me, see? So he toddled across the sea in his yacht and told his secretary, Mr. Paul Ratface Marsh. Marsh? His secretary? Uh Uh-huh. Grandpop told him to find me. But Mr. Ratface, knowing he would inherit Grandpop's spondulix if I were out of the picture, decided to chisel me out for keeps. Oh, I get it. So, knowing everything having to do with the Graysons, he got Eric Larson out of the cooler, planning to let Larson finish me. And then he figured to finish Larson, as he did, by the way. Yes, I know about that. And tell the police he shot Larson while trying to save me. Well, a very neat plan. And how? 
But the rest of it includes a plot to poison Grandpop, which he was all set to do tonight. Then dump him overboard and shoot back to England and collect your inheritance, right? Check and double check. The filthy scoundrel. I trusted him with everything. All the time he was planning to murder me and... and he... Yes, a very sweet character. Well, we almost fixed his clock, but now... Relax. Maybe we'll fix it yet. Ah, oh, stop kidding and let's face it. Marsh and Captain Skinner and company have us holed up here. They're not going to clap themselves in irons and bring us the key, you know. Uh, Dick's right, uh, Mr. Uh, Batman. Uh, we haven't a chance. We have if Alfred gets back to Metropolis in the Batboat. I told him to get in touch with Clark Kent. And Kent is... Uh, well, he may be able to contact Superman. Did uh, you say Superman? That's right. Uh, take a deep breath, Batman. This is going to hurt. Well? Alfred is done for. Why do you say that? Captain Skinner told Marsh he shot Alfred and shot the Batboat full of holes, too. He what? So, well, I guess that's all for poor old Alfred. Poor old Alfred. He was pretty swell. Yeah, you said it. Well, what do we do now, Pappy? I don't know. I've got to figure something. Uh, who, who is or was this Alfred person? Swell guy. And a good friend. Listen in there! Uh-oh. Our little playmates are back. Yes. What is it? We'll give you a justice. We need it to open the storm. Come out with your hands up. Don't make us laugh, rat face. Right. If you want us, come in and get us. Listen to me, you fool. There's no way you can escape. Either open the door and surrender, or we'll set fire to the ship, abandon it, and let the three of you go to death. Why, you scoundrel, you wouldn't dare. Oh, no. You try us and see. You have three minutes to make up your mind. Either come out. Or go down with a flaming ship! Fully realizing their danger, Batman and Robin and old Mr. Grayson hear Paul Marsh's ultimatum. What will they do? What can they do? We'll know in a moment when we return for the tenth climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, in order to be hep these crisp, cool autumn days, you have to feel hep. Sure, wide awake and alive. And you can't feel that way if you don't eat right. So, gang, give breakfast a chance to show you what it can do to help begin your day. Start right off with Kellogg's Pep. There's a treat that is a treat. Those golden flakes of pep are so crisp and, and keen and catchy tasting that, well, they practically say, Hi there, want a spoon? So you dig right in and get that lively golden toasted flavor. And is it super? Is it terrific? And the same goes for the swell bonus you get in every pet package. Meaning, of course, those keen prizes. All three kinds. For instance, you'll get either a colored cardboard model of a, of a famous fighting plane, one of seven in the great pet air fleet, or uh, you'll get one of 24 beautiful color pictures of birds with a full description on the reverse side to, to help you identify these birds anywhere. Or else you'll find a bright colored comic button picturing one of 18 characters straight out of the funnies to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap. So start collecting all three kinds of pep prizes, gang. Ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. While Batman and Robin appear hopelessly trapped on Mr. Grayson's yacht, Mark Kent and Beanie Martin, Daily Planet copy boy, have arrived at the handsome house where Batman and Robin live as Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. Odd. No answer to the bell. I guess there's nobody here, Mr. Kent. Yeah, so I see. Well, this is a tough break, Beanie. I was hoping Alfred the butler would be able to tell us where... Ba uh, that is, where Bruce Wayne went. You say Mr. Wayne called you by a radio telephone? Yes, uh, through the Marine Telephone Exchange. That means he's someplace on the water, but where? Yeah, that's just it. There's a lot of water around Metropolis. A huge ocean and two big rivers. Look, why didn't he give you his location, Wayne? Well, I thought I told you. Something happened to his radio phone just after we were connected. Oh. Now, all I know is that he and Dick need me. And I'm worried, Beanie. Plenty worried. You and me both, but what are we going to do? I don't know, except... Wait a minute. Come with me. Where? Downstairs in the basement of Wayne's house. I just noticed something very interesting there. <laughs> I didn't know Mr. Wayne had a setup like this under his house. Look at this. A garage, an airplane hangar, and even a boat slip. Uh-huh. Gee, I'll bet it's nice to be rich. Hey, wait, Mr. Kent. How can there be a place for boats here? This house isn't built in the water. That's right. 
But there's an underground canal which empties into the river a short distance away, and I suppose... It... Uh-oh. Hold it, Beanie. What is it? The bat boat is gone. A what? Bruce's speedboat. Uh, that means he must have been in it when he called me. Uh, wait here, Beanie. Yes, my friend is really jumping in the water for him, Mr. Kent. I saw something. There. I've got it. Wait, do you realize you've got your clothes on? Uh-huh. Get this note. Note? What note? I'll show you. Get out of the water. There. Well, let's see here. What is it? Well, the water blurred most of the writing. But I can make out Dick's signature. You can? Where? I can't see anything but what paper. Wait, Benny, wait, wait. I think I can make some of this out. Well, how can you? There's just a lot of blur. Wait a minute, mark. will you? Hold everything. Let's see. This says... Cove Harbor... Cove Harbor. Uh-huh. That's just a few miles down the coast. Yeah, I know, I know. Those are the only words I can make out, though. Except Dick's name. But it might be enough, I hope. All right, come on, Beanie. Let's get out of here. I've got a job to do. A job big enough for Superman. His eyes gleaming, Clark Kent prepares to follow the clue to Batman and Robin. Will he, as Superman, pick up the trail of the bat boat from Cove Harbor? And find the Grayson Yacht in time to save his friend. At this moment, far out at sea, Batman, Robin, and Robin's grandfather have been given an ultimatum. Surrender and be shot, or be abandoned in a burning yacht. What will happen? Don't miss Monday's thrilling episode, fellows and girls. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement... The Adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, who's in the know about kids in other countries, how they look and how they dress? Well, Kellogg has the answer with the cutouts on packages of Kellogg's Crumbles. Boy, will the kids in your family have a load of fun with these dolls of all nations. Cutting them out and changing their costumes and collecting all six countries in the series, like Switzerland and Russia, Sweden. Two cutout dolls on every package in full color. That's dolls of all nations on packages of Kellogg's Crumbles. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P Pep. Pep, the Sunshine Serial presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, while Superman continues his relentless search of the seas for his friends, Batman, Robin, and Grandpa Grayson are helpless prisoners, apparently doomed to die at the hands of Marsh and his murderous henchmen. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, these days, so many mothers of you fellows and girls are asking for Kellogg's Pep at the grocers that, well, uh, they sound almost like a chorus. Of course, Pep is mighty popular any time of the year, but on crisp, cool autumn mornings, there's something special about Pep's sunny, golden toasted flavor. Makes you want to warm right up to a big bowl of these crisp flakes of whole wheat at breakfast. Yes, sir, with a bowl of pep always waiting for you, you can be looking forward to that catchy, keen pep flavor from the first moment you wake up. So it's no wonder you're rushing to mom for Kellogg's pep. And uh, besides, you boys and girls are going overboard for those slick pep prizes. Three different kinds of prizes, one or the other in every pep package. For instance, those swell-colored cardboard models of fighting planes. Have you collected all seven model planes in the series? Or uh, maybe you're collecting Pep's 24 full-color bird pictures with a description on the reverse side to, to help you identify these birds anywhere. 
And uh, how you coming with your set of 18 comic buttons with comic strip characters to pin on your beanie cap or your jacket. Don't let any of the gang beat you at collecting all three kinds of pet prizes. Ask Mom to get you a supply of Kellogg's Pet, the sunshine cereal. And now, the adventures of Superman. Friday, as you remember, while Superman searched for his friends, Batman and Robin were aboard the yacht belonging to Mr. Grayson, Robin's newly discovered grandfather. Trapped in Mr. Grayson's stateroom, they were forced to listen as Paul Marsh, who will inherit Mr. Grayson's large fortune if the old man and Robin die, delivered an ultimatum to them. Standing in the corridor outside the locked stateroom, and backed by the captain of the yacht and a dozen armed members of the crew, Marsh bellowed. I'll give you just three minutes to go out for your hunger. If you don't come out, we'll set the boat afire and abandon it. And you three will burn with it. <laughs> As we continue now in the stateroom, Robin, and his, in his identity of Dick Grayson, turns to his old friend Batman for advice. Listen. Boy, this is really a tough spot. What do we do, Batman? I don't know. Let me think a minute. We open the door, they'll drill us full of holes. And if we sit tight, we'll be three pieces of brown toast. Any ideas yet? Uh-uh. I seem to be fresh out of them at the moment. We seem to be literally between the devil and the deep blue sea. And how... Uh, look here, Batman. I say Marsh is bluffing. Why, he and Captain Skinner wouldn't dare set the out of fire. They'd endanger their own lives. Well, they wouldn't run much risk, Mr. Grayson. There's a good launch up on deck, and we're only a few hours out from Metropolis. Golly, that's right. Yes, but uh, how could they explain the sinking of this craft to the authorities? Particularly with Marsh, Captain Skinner, and the entire crew saved. And only I, the yacht's owner, missing. Well, that's easy. They'll simply say that you perished in the fire, and even if the authorities are suspicious, they won't be able to prove anything. Oh, quite so, quite so. I must say you paint a nice picture, Batman. Well, there's no use kidding ourselves, Dick. Our only hope was that Alfred would get back to Metropolis in the bat boat and contact Superman. But since those rats shot him... Uh, Where's snafu, huh? I hate to admit it, but I'm afraid that's it. I say, hold on. I, I think I know a way out of this. You do? What yeah. do you mean, Grandpa? Well, Marsh is forgetting something. I can tell you... Oh, oh, here comes that little playmate again. Your three minutes are up. What are you going to do? We're going to serve tea. Come in and have some with us, rat face. Are you blighters going to open the door, surrender? Or do you prefer to burn with the ship? Hurry now! Why, you, you bounder, I, I, I should have you thrashed. I should. Come, come now. This is your last chance. You walk out to the blinking state room with your hands up. Or do we burn the ship and abandon you? Let's tell them we give up, Batman, and then we'll put up a fight for well, it. That suits me, Bad Job. I, I have two cartridges in my pistol. Two cartridges plus dicks in my fist won't stand much chance against 20 of those fellows, all armed with machine guns and pistols. Well, which will it be? We're running But if we don't go out and they burn the yacht, we won't have any chance. We might. How? I've got a little idea, so let's hold out. Well, whatever you say, pal. You have just one second more to the side. You have 32 teeth. How would you like to try for none? There's our answer, Marsh. Go soak your head. Very well. You'll not live long enough to regret me. The same to you, chum. Save your breath, Dick. You will need it. All the young men the ship, Captain Skinner. I still say they won't dare go through with this. I think they will. Now, quiet, both of you. Where are you going, Batman? I want to see if they left anyone to guard the corridor. Oh, you mean if they didn't, we... Quiet. Can... Out there? Out in front of the door. Stand back. I'm gonna put my hand out. Oh. I guess that's the answer. Check. Looks like Marsh is leaving a man or two to make sure we stay in here until they get their launch in the water and the fire well started. Oh, if only the porthole in here opened on the deck instead of out on the ocean. There's a more important if that I'm worrying about. What's that? Well, I'll tell you later. There's no use both of us building air castles. I see. I, I smell smoke. Hey, so do I. Batman, they I know, started... I know. I smelled it a minute ago. Apparently, they had everything ready, just in case. <laughs> the smoke's beginning to come in here. Yeah, <coughs> fast. Oh, that corridor's full of smoke. I didn't think it would spread this fast. The bounders must have set fire to the fuel tanks. <coughs> We've got to get out of here right now. <coughs> this smoke will help us. Now, get this, Dick. We'll make a dash, keeping down low and moving fast. Maybe we can take the boys with the guns at the head of the corridor. Okay. Check. Let's go. Right. You keep right behind us, Mr. Grayson. Come on. Oh, wait, wait. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm a bit too weak to walk. You two chaps go. Oh, no, Grandpa. 
This isn't good. Come on, Dick. We'll give him a hand. No, no, no. You two try to save yourselves. I, I'm an old man. I've lived my life. Oh, stow the chatter, Grandpa. Come on, put your arm over my shoulder. But confounded, boy. <laughs> I've got you, sir. Come on, now. Why would you leave me? Nothing doing. I forgot to tell you, Batman. Marsh has been slipping poison into Grandpa's <laughs> food for some time. <coughs> That's why he's so weak. <laughs> well, if we're lucky. And if my plan works, we'll get a chance to settle with Marsh. <laughs> now, move fast, Dick. The smoke is getting bad. <coughs> We've got to get up on deck before we choke to death. <laughs> Up here. Oh, yes. Look, Grandpa. Here goes the launch with Marsh and the crew in it. Oh, the boundless. The murderous scoundrels leaving us here to perish. Yeah, that's dirty. Thought oh, jeepers, this old yacht is going up like a matchbox. Say, where's Batman? He said he had something up his sleeve. I don't see him. Batman? Batman! I'm right here, Dick. Oh, what gives? I went to have a look at the life force. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Of course. Uh, we nope, can launch no one. Our friends stove them in, every one of them. Uh, oh, I see. We are in a nasty, nice thing. Well, that's putting it mildly, sir. Wait, what about the ship's radio? We can send out an SOS. Oh, it's a jolly I'm good sorry, idea. But... Marsh's boys wrecked the radio, too. Oh, no. Oh, Christopher Columbus, what are we going to do? This yacht won't last Easy, much longer. Chum. Easy. <sighs> yeah. Okay, Pappy. I guess we can always swim back to Metropolis, huh? It's only a couple of hundred miles away. Sure. Sure, the swim will give us a good appetite for oh, breakfast. I say, this seems hardly the time for humor. Now, that's not so funny, Grandpa. Right now, it looks as if swimming's the only thing left. As Batman, Robin, and Mr. Grayson stand helplessly on the flaming deck of the yacht, which burns like an oil-soaked torch on the inky surface of the night-darkened sea... Superman, having found a portion of Robin's note directing Batman to Cove Harbor, rockets to the quiet, rock-bound little harbor below Metropolis. Failing to see the Batboat or his friends, he streaks to the nearby lighthouse where Batman had paused several hours before and questions the lighthouse keeper. I'm looking for a long, powerful speedboat about the size of a PT boat with a prow card in the shape of a hooded bat. Do you remember seeing it? Ah, uh, yes, Superman. Come to think of it, I did. You did? Was... When? Uh, early this evening. Stopped right here, it did. And Where did it go? I... Can you remember? Why, sure. South round the Narrows and straight out to sea it went. Looking Straight out I... to sea. Thank you. I'll leave by this window if you don't mind. Oh, I don't mind, Superman. But first, I think you Sorry, ought to Sorry, no time to listen to any more now. Out. Up. And away. <laughs> Zooming from the lighthouse, Superman streaks away through the dark night, out over the sea to search for his friends. Without waiting just a moment more for the accommodating lighthouse keeper to tell him that Batman had been pursuing a black yacht with two orange smokestacks. Will he find his friends? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, you know something that'll make you a speeder upper while you're getting ready for breakfast? Kellogg's Pep. Yes, sir, if you know there's a bowl of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, waiting for you... Why, you're likely to show up at breakfast on the double quick. Because who can delay digging into that crisp golden tenderness of those good flakes of whole wheat? Who can delay when Kellogg's Pep is such a smooth treat? And say, speaking of smooth, did you ever see anything to beat the slick prizes Pep gives you? Three different kinds of prizes, each one a honey, and one or the other in each package of Pep. For instance, your next prize may be a beautiful bird picture in bright color with a full description on the reverse side. Collect all 24 of them, and will you be a wise bird on birds? Or uh, maybe your next pet prize will be one of the seven exciting colored cardboard plane models. Easy and fun to put together. Or uh, maybe it'll be a bright colored comic button, picturing a favorite comic strip character. 18 and all to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap. There's one or the other of these snappy prizes in every pet package. So make sure Mom keeps you supplied with Kellogg's Pep, won't you? As we rejoin him now, Superman is rocketing through the night sky, his keen eyes searching the dark waves below him for a sight of the ill-fated Batboat. No sign of the Batboat yet. And that's bad, because if it left the lighthouse only six hours ago, it can't have gone more than a couple of hundred miles. Surely I must have come that far. I'd better start doubling back and range around. Away! Still 
no sign of it. I hope that man didn't run into trouble when his radio telephone went out. Wait a minute. Over to the left. What's that? Great Scott, it's the bat boat. And it's sinking. With only one man aboard. Bow to it. Bow! Uh Uh-oh. It's Alfred, Batman's butler. No one else aboard. Now, where can I... Uh Uh-oh, he's been shot through the shoulder. Alfred. Alfred. Uh, Batman. Sir. Robin. Yes, yes. What about Batman and Robin? Where are they? They... They... What? (laughs) Try to tell me, Alfred. What happened? I... I... Oh, he fainted, poor chap. Bad shape. Well, I've got to get him back to shore and hope he'll be able to tell me what's happened to Batman and Robin. Up with him. Now, up and away! Leaping up from the foundering Batboat with the wounded, unconscious Alfred in his arms, Superman turns and rockets back to Metropolis, unaware that he is turning his back on Batman and Robin, who at this moment, a hundred miles farther out at sea, are trapped. Helpless to save themselves as the flaming yacht begins to sink under them. What will happen to Batman and Robin, and to Robin's aged grandfather? Will Alfred recover and be able to direct Superman to them? And in time... Don't miss the next tense, exciting episode, gang. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement... The Adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. You know, gang, one word leads to another, like the way those toasty words, crisp, crunchy, crinkly, lead you on to crumbles. Kellogg's Crumbles. So toasty and and sweet and mellow rich on a frosty morning. It's the only cereal in the whole wide world made in those little crinkly shreds of good wheat. And so good for you. Mom knows that. In fact, she'd probably like you to eat up a bowl of crumbles for breakfast tomorrow. Crisp, crunchy, crinkly crumbles. Kellogg's Crumbles. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcast. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents The Adventures of Superman. As Batman, Robin, and Grandpa Grayson helplessly cling to each other in an open sea, Superman zooms back to Metropolis with the only clue to his friend's whereabouts, the seriously wounded and unconscious Alfred. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, I'll bet now's the time when you fellas and girls are up to your ears in school games and athletics. And that means you're using up energy at a mighty fast clip. So eating a good breakfast is all the more important these days. And that's where Kellogg's Pep comes in. Sure, because Pep is such a slick dish. So crisp and and catchy tasting and full flavored that, well, it tickles your appetite so you want to eat. Yes, sir, breakfast sure gets the glad eye when Kellogg's Pep heads the menu. And will you give those swell Pep prizes the glad eye? Prizes that are always surprises because you never know which one of the three different kinds of prizes you'll find when you open your Pep package. For instance, you'll get either a colored cardboard model of a, of a famous fighting plane, one of seven in the great Pep Air Fleet, or uh, you'll get one of 24 beautiful color pictures of birds with a full description on the reverse side, or else you'll find a bright colored comic button picturing one of 18 characters straight from the funnies. Collect all 18 to, to pin on your jacket or your beanie cap. Just ask Mom to get Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, tomorrow and look for your prize inside the package. <laughs> The Adventures of Superman. Scheming to obtain the large fortune of Mr. Grayson, Robin's grandfather, 
Paul Marsh, Grayson's secretary, conspired with the captain of his employer's yacht, on which Robin, his grandfather, and Batman were trapped far out at sea. After setting the yacht on fire, Marsh and the crew abandoned it in a launch, leaving our friends to their fate. Searching for them, meanwhile, Superman sighted the crippled Batboat in which Alfred, Batman, and Robin's loyal butler had been trying to reach Metropolis after being shot. Superman carried the wounded man to a Coast Guard base, and as we continue now, once more in his guise of Clark Kent, he is speaking to Commander Schuyler, the Coast Guard medical officer. Listen. Tell me, Commander, will Alfred pull through? I'm quite sure he will, Mr. Kent. Fortunately, the bullet didn't puncture any vital organs. Oh, that's fine. May I speak to him now? I'm afraid not. We've just operated to remove the bullet. He's still under the anesthetic, you know. Oh, of course. Well, when will he come out of it, do you know? Oh, in about half an hour. Oh, may I talk with him then? Well, he's also suffering from exposure and shock. It would be better if he rested quietly until morning. Well, look, but... Commander, I don't want to do anything that might interfere with Alfred's recovery, but only he can tell me where Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson are. I know they're in danger, great danger, judging by what happened to Alfred. Yes. Every minute might mean the difference between life or death to them. I see. Well, in that case, I think I might consent to your questioning him when he recovers consciousness. Good. You say he'll come to in about half an hour? About that. Well, then if you don't mind, I'll wait right here. Uh, will you call me as soon as I can see him? I'll send for you. Thanks. Thanks very much. As Kent waits anxiously for Alfred to recover consciousness, Batman, Robin, and Mr. Grayson have been forced by the fire to leap from the flaming yacht into the sea. Supporting the old man between them, Batman and Robin tread water and watch as the yacht, a brilliant area of angry red flame in the dark night, suddenly tilts her bow high into the air. Then, with a loud hiss of steam, slides swiftly below the black waves to her final resting place at the bottom of the sea. Then, when the yacht is gone, there is only the faint, pale radiance of the stars over the three tiny human figures awash in the vast, heaving ocean. Oh, this water's cold, Batman. Oh, what did you expect? Oh. A hot bubble bath? No, but I sure wish I'd thought of putting on my fur-lined swimming suit. Ah, ridiculous. Cold water stimulates the circulation. <laughs> How are you doing, Mr. Grayson? Oh, I, I don't like to complain when... When you two are so brave, but I, I'm pretty weak. I don't think I can stand much more. <coughs> oh, look, that's no way to talk, Grandpa. Think how good you'll feel when you get into a warm bed and serve up a nice juicy steak and hot oh, chocolate. You'd better not promise steak, Dick. There's a meat shortage on, you know. Oh, gee, I forgot. Will you settle for fish, uh, Grandpa? I, I say, it, it's frightfully cold, and I... Oh, I... Oh. Grandpa... Grandpa. Rub his arms, Dick. Come on, Mr. Grayson. Try to kick your legs. Come on. I can't. I, it, it, it's no use. I, I'm done for. Oh, don't talk like that. Gee, Brazier, I just found you. You can't leave me now. I was figuring on your visiting us in Metropolis, and then maybe Batman and I would visit you in England. And I was hoping to, to, to spend my last few years with you, Dick, but... I... Oh, golly, you've got to try to... Oh, thanks to Paul Marsh, it wasn't paid to be... God, God bless you, boy. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm Grandpa. Batman. You're done kind Well, maybe it's better this way. Oh, that dirty rat, Marsh. If only I could get my hands on it him. It looks like he holds all the cards this time, chum. I guess so. Oh, he'll inherit all the grace and money and have himself a time. Well, Grandpa and you and, <laughs> you and I and poor Alfred. Oh, no. Easy, fella. Oh, Easy. that makes my blood boil. If only there was something we could do. <laughs> Something well, that... short of swimming a couple of hundred miles to Metropolis, I can't think of anything. I'm afraid that we're just going to... Batman. What's the matter, Dick? I'm getting kind of numb. Keep moving your arms and legs. Uh, Look, I'll hold on to Mr. Grayson alone. You let go, son. Go ahead. All right. But what's the use? We can't hold out much longer. We've got to hold out. Clark Kent knows we're in trouble. Chances are he's looking for us now. I hope... Uh, so what? Uh, why, even if Mr. Kent was Superman... That's what I mean. What? Well, I... I mean, Clark Kent has been able to contact Superman on occasion, you know, and... Well, even well, if he did contact him, Superman doesn't know where we are. So what good would it do? Well, not too much, I suppose. I was counting on Alfred getting back to Metropolis in the Batboat and telling Kent where we were. But when Marsh's gang shot Alf, well, they knocked that little idea on the head. Oh. Poor Alfred. He was a swell little guy. Yeah. Yeah, he sure was. Oh, and my grandpa. He's a pretty nice old boy, too. You're right again, son. And... Now, look. 
Don't you go slopping over on me, son. I'm not. Oh, gee. My hands and feet are like ice. Keep moving them like I said. Look. <coughs> Look, I'll, I'll tell you what. Let's kill time with a game of 20 questions. Okay? I'm thinking of an object. Okay. So am I. A bowl of hot soup. I'll cut that out. Let's stay with 20 questions. I'm thinking of an object. Okay. Animal or mineral? Mineral. <laughs> mineral, huh? Uh-huh. And don't, don't make it too tough. Between you and me and that big wave, I don't think I can last another hour. Will you cut out that kind of talk? I repeat, I'm thinking of an object. All right. It's mineral, huh? Right. Uh, that leaves me 19 questions. Mineral. I'm right here, Alfred. Mr. Kent. As soon as he came out of the evening, he began asking for you, Kent. Uh Clark Kent. Get him at Metropolis Daily Planet. Here I am, Alfred. Right here by your bed. You... Oh, I say, you are Mr. Kent, aren't you? Yes, I am. Make it as brief as possible. Right, Commander. Tell me, Alfred, what happened to uh, to, to Bruce Wayne and to Dick Grayson? Where are they? Oh, on the... On the yacht, sir. The yacht? What yacht? Black yacht. Two. two. A black yacht? Yes, sir. With two orange smokestacks. Right. Where is this yacht? South past the Narrows. South past the Narrows? Five points east, southeast. Yes. Then straight out to sea. Right. Good boy, Alfred. Oh, sir... They're in great danger. You... You must help them. At once. I'll do what I can. You get well. So long. Hurrying from the Coast Guard Infirmary, Clark Kent pauses on the dark beach and strips off his business suit, revealing the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Then... Up! Up! And away! Leaping high into the dark sky, the Man of Steel streaks away over the ocean to search for the black yacht with two orange smokestacks. The yacht which, although he doesn't know it, is now at the bottom of the sea. What will happen? We'll know in a moment when we return for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, have you noticed, gang, how fellas and girls who eat Kellogg's Pep are like a regular pep cheering section? Sure, at the drop of a hat, they'll go into detail and tell you how crisp and golden toasted pep is. Or uh, maybe they'll tell how keen and catchy these flakes of whole wheat taste. Why, you've probably said that yourself. And say, I'd sure like to be around when you tell somebody new in the gang about those swell prizes you find in packages of pep. I've got an idea you'll say, jeepers, are those pep prizes slick? Of course, uh... You'll tell about the three different kinds of prizes and how it's always a grand surprise to find out which one of the three you'll get in your next pet package. How it could be a model fighting plane in colored cardboard, one of seven great pet planes you can collect. Or it could be one of 24 new full-color bird pictures with a description on the reverse side so that you can identify these birds in the air. Or it could be one of 18 bright-colored comic buttons picturing a famous comic strip character. Swell for, for pinning on your jacket or your beanie cap. And say, while you're telling about those three kinds of pep prizes, don't forget to ask Mom to bring home a supply of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal for you. Far out over the dark, heaving ocean, Superman rockets through the skies, searching for Mr. Grayson's yacht on which he hopes to find his friends, Batman and Robin. Black yacht with two orange smokestacks, Alfred said. No sign of it yet. Not much moon tonight, so my visibility is slightly limited. But if the yacht held on her course, I'll catch up with her yet. Away! Uh, still no sign of it. I must... Wait a minute, what's that ahead? Well, there are islands. Quick, Scott, those are the Azores. I've come too far. Back again. That yacht stayed on the course Alfred gave me. I don't see how I could have missed her. I'll follow it once again. But if she took another course, heaven knows how or when I'll find her on this huge ocean. I... Wait. Down there in the water. Looks like... Yes, it is. A man. Two men. Quick, stop. One of them's Batman. Down to him. Go! 
Great Superman. Superman. Yes. Find time and place too big for a bass, Batman. Here, I'll take you. Hey, wait, who's this? It, it's Robin's grandfather. His grandfather? Yes. Listen, Superman, well, I... don't I... Care, but you can tell me about it later. Where's Robin? I don't know. What? The wave. Tremendous tidal wave swept him away from me a few minutes ago. Uh-oh. I couldn't let go of Mr. Drayson and go after him. So I've, I've been paddling around calling him. But I can't find him. I'm afraid that... Right, take it easy, Batman. Take it easy. Can you keep going a little while longer? Yes. But Robin... Oh, I'll find him. I hope. Up and away! <laughs> Leaping up from the dark waves, Superman begins ranging in ever-widening circles above the dark, sullen waves, searching for young Robin. What has happened to Batman's gallant young companion? Will Superman find Robin before he is claimed as another victim of the sea? We're approaching the smashing climax of our story, fellows and girls, so don't miss tomorrow's exciting episode when we encounter a startling surprise. Tune in, same time, same station. Remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Think of the wonderful toasty things that taste good on a frosty morning and you think of something crisp, crunchy, crinkly, crumbles. Why, there's that name again. Slips in every time. Crumbles. Kellogg's Crumbles. Just seems to go with words like crisp and crunchy. It's, it's such a toasty kind of cereal. Sort of sweet and metal rich. And you know, it's the only cereal in the whole wide world in those little crinkly shreds of good whole wheat. So when you think of good tasting words like crisp, crunchy... Crinkly, that means crumbles for breakfast. Kellogg's Crumbles. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P, E, P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, after the successful rescue of his friends and the apprehension of the criminals, Clark Kent returns to the Daily Planet office to learn startling and upsetting news. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, uh, when you're about to get going on your bowl of Kellogg's Pet, it's kind of fun to think how many others of the gang in thousands and thousands of homes are, are just about to dig into those crisp golden flakes of whole wheat, too. And you know, every morning when they take in that first mouthful of catchy, brisk pep flavor, most likely they're thinking just what you do. That pep is super. Pep's terrific. Why, chances are they're all excited, too, about those swell pep prizes. And uh, guessing which one of pep's three kinds of prizes uh, they're going to get in their next package. Say, uh, how are you coming along with your own prize-collecting gang? Have you got all seven of those colored cardboard models of fighting planes? Might be one in your next package of pep, you know. Or uh, your next uh, prize could be one of 24 new full-color bird pictures with a full description so that you'll be hep on these birds wherever you see them. Or it could be your next pep prize will be one of 18 bright-colored comic buttons picturing a famous comic strip character. Believe me, a, a whole collection of 18 will make a real show on your beanie cap or your jacket. So step lively, gang. Step right up and ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Then look for your prize inside the package. Now, the adventures of Superman. Trapped on a burning yacht far at sea, Batman, Robin, and Mr. Grayson, Robin's newly discovered grandfather, leaped into the water just before the yacht sank. Struggling in the cold, dark ocean in the middle of the night, they practically gave up all hope until Superman, who had picked up the trail from Alfred, their wounded butler, streaked through the night skies and finally spotted two tiny struggling figures in the inky water. They turned out to be Batman and the unconscious Mr. Grayson. In an agony of grief, Batman told the Man of Steel. A huge wave swept Robin away a few minutes ago. I haven't been able to find him. I'm, 
I'm afraid he's lost, Superman. Uh Uh-oh. You hang on to Grayson. I'll look for him. Up and away! As we continue now, ten minutes have passed. Supporting the unconscious Mr. Grayson, Batman treads water anxiously. When suddenly there is a great rush of wind and the blue-costumed Superman, his red cape streaming from his shoulders, looms out of the dark sky and drops into the choppy water beside Batman. In his arms is a small, limp figure. I've got him, Batman. Robin? Yes, he's about a hundred yards away. Oh, thank heaven. Robin! Robin! He's alive. He swallowed a lot of seawater, and he's suffering from exposure. Got to get him to a doctor in a hurry. Right. That, that goes for poor old Mr. Grayson here. All right. Wait a minute now. I'll take Mr. Grayson under my other arm. All right. That's it. There we are. Okay, you latch onto my belt, can you? Right. Good. Ready? Let her rip. Okay. We'll go back to the Coast Guard base where I left Alfred. There's a hospital there. Hang on now. Up! Up! And the way! Rob, uh, I mean Dick. I won't try to talk yet. You've had a tough time of it. I'm okay, Bruce. Oh, hello, Mr. Kent. Hello. How are you feeling, Dick? Fine. Commander Schuyler, the Coast Guard doctor, says I can get out of bed tomorrow. Oh, Fine. Well. But listen, how's my grandfather? Pretty weak, but he's going to be all right. Oh, gee, that's great. If only we hadn't lost poor Alfred. <laughs> Relax, Junior. We haven't lost Alfred. What? No, Alfred's going to be all right, too, thanks to Superman. He is. But how? I don't get it. He was shot and the bat boat was shot up under him. Well, Superman picked him up in time, learned from him where we were, and, well, you know the rest. Well, I'll be... Boy, oh boy, is that wonderful. Ah, oh, that Superman can play on my team any time. <laughs> how do you like that, Clark? Fine. I'll, I'll tell him that next time I see him, Dick. But wait, I forgot. What about that skunk, Paul Marsh, and the yacht captain, Skinner, who almost finished us? Did they get away? They certainly did not. But, but how? Bruce told me... Uh, I mean, he told Superman about them, Dick. Marsh, Captain Skinner, and the crew of the yacht are now in the city calaboose. Oh, you're kidding. No, I'm not. No, on the level, Dick. Superman went back and picked up the launch full of bad boys after he brought you here. Marsh is sure to get the chair for shooting Eric Lawson. And Skinner and company will undoubtedly be guests of the state for a long time for sinking and setting fire to your grandfather's yacht. Well, strike me pink... Superman wrapped up all the groceries and delivered them COD, huh? <laughs> he didn't overlook a thing. Uh-oh, but I overlooked something, Bruce. Oh, what's that, Clark? I forgot I'm a newspaper reporter with a scoop story in my pocket. i got to get back to the office, but fast. So long, you fellas. I'll be seeing you. So long, Mr. Kent. So long, Clark. And thanks more than I can ever say. Oh, it was a pleasure, Bruce. See you again. <laughs> That's that. Just in time for the noon edition, too. Uh, copy, boy. Hey, Beanie, on the double, huh? I'll take your copy, Mr. Kent. Oh, okay. See that the... Well, Mary Hennig, I didn't know you were running copy. Well, just today I was transferred from the... Oh, what are you to... doing here, Mary? Let's hear Mr. Kent call me. Oh, gosh, oh, well, I Well, that's did... all right, Beanie. It doesn't really matter who oh, takes yes, it. Oh, yes, sure, a... it does. I've had copy, boy, here. And I run your copy in Miss Lane's. Didn't I make that clear to you, Mary? Sure, Beanie, uh... I thought you were busy, oh, so Oh, now, I... look, it. Well... Wait a minute. Cut out the squabbling and get this copy to a rewrite man, but fast. It's a scoop yarn for page one of the noon edition. Oh, heavens, there's much time left. I know. That's why I'm trying oh, to get... Oh, boy, Mr. Kent, we'll make it. Here, Mary, rush this copy to rewrite. On the double now. Oh, yes, Go sir. Wow. Well. <laughs> How does it feel to boss a staff, Beanie? Well, it, it's quite a responsibility. Sure. Uh, running a department, I mean. Uh... Do you think uh, Mary will work out okay as a copy girl? Um, well, yes, I do. You do, huh? But that's confidential, of course. Oh, of course, sure. Wouldn't breathe a word of it. Mustn't let your uh, assistants get too sure of themselves, eh? Well, um, it ain't... I mean, it isn't just that exactly, Mr. Kent. No? You see, Mary was... Why, like, you know... Yes, yes, I know she has a record for juvenile delinquency. But I think she's done a good job of rehabilitating herself. Don't you think so? Oh, yeah, sure. Then 
Suppose we do everything we can to help her live down her mistakes by kind of forgetting about them, huh? Oh, gee whiz, Mr. Kent, I'd never bring it up on No, I know, you. I know, Beanie, sure. Say, uh, by the way, is Mr. White in? Uh-uh. He went zipping out of here just before you came in, running like a swarm of bees was after him. That's all. Yeah, Miss Lane, she was right on his heels, running so fast she couldn't even put her hat on. <laughs> That's odd. Must be a big story brewing. Uh, Jim Olsen around? Uh-uh. He didn't even come in yet. I guess he's out on an assignment or something. Yeah, probably. Well, I'm going down to the lobby cafe for some breakfast. Call me down there if you need me, huh? Sure, you bet. Just sharpen Mr. Kent's pencils, and now I'm kind of tidying up his desk. Oh. Well, I'm glad to see you're on the job. It's that kind of attention to details that gets you places, you know. Uh-huh. I know. Hey. That's a swell-looking ring you got on. Can I see it, huh? Sure, Beanie. Here. Gee, look at this. Hey, isn't that Superman on it? Uh-huh. See what it says on the band? Look. Superman Crusader. What's that mean? Oh, it means that I've pledged myself to be a good citizen and to crusade for tolerance and good sportsmanship and understanding. Golly, and... that's neat. How do you get one of them? Well, you... Oh. oh that's for Mr. Kent. Oh, shall I answer? Uh, no, you better let me. <clears throat> Hello? Mr. Kent's office. Mr. Kent ain't here. Th- 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 this is Beanie. What, what that stupid switchboard operator and connect me with you for? I asked for Kent. Well, but this is Mr. Kent's phone, Chief. I mean, Mr. White. Then get off the phone and put him on. Oh, he ain't. I mean, he isn't here. Why not? Where is he at this hour of the morning? Oh, well, he, he went Never back. mind. Find him. Right away. You want to Yes, sir. Find him and tell him to call me back at once because Jim Olson's in serious trouble. Jeepers, Jim? What kind of trouble? That's none of your business. Now do as you're told. Hurry. Well, gee whiz, wait. What's the number where... Mr. White. Mr. White. Oh, gee whiz, he hung up. Well, what's the matter, Beanie? Jim Olson's in very bad trouble and I got to get hold of Mr. Kent right away. <laughs> His face reflecting great concern, Beanie Martin turns abruptly away from Mary Hennig and dashes away to find Clark Kent. What has happened to Jim Olsen? We'll be back in a moment to find out, so stand by. You know, people who know say it's a mighty tough job to handle your schoolwork all morning unless you've had a good solid sort of breakfast. And uh, people who know what's good say that when Kellogg's Pep heads the breakfast menu, you're bound to want to eat hearty. Yes, sir, because when you dig into your bowl of pep, those crisp, sunny flakes let loose a golden toasted flavor, a full whole wheat flavor, a keen, catchy flavor that's terrific. And does Kellogg's Pep score for prizes? Why, you get three different kinds of prizes, one or the other in each package. Either a bright-colored comic button picturing one of 18 famous comic strip characters to to pin on your beanie cap or your jacket, or uh, it'll be a colored cardboard model of a fighting plane, easy and fun to assemble. Just swap duplicates with the gang and and collect all seven model planes in the series. Or uh, your next prize may be a full-color bird picture. There are 24 in all, each with a full description on the reverse side so that you'll really know a thing or two about birds. So start collecting all three kinds of these slick pep prizes. Today, ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Responding to Editor Perry White's urgent order to have Kent call him back at once, Beanie Martin located the reporter. Together, they have raced back to Kent's office where we find them now. Did the chief tell you what kind of trouble Jim's in, Beanie? No, Mr. Kent. He just kept saying, find Kent right away and have him call me back in a hurry. Okay, I'll try... Wait a minute. Where am I to call him? Oh, gosh. I don't know. Where is he? Golly, don't you know? Of course not. Didn't he tell you where he was calling from? Uh Uh-uh. Oh, great. What a sweet pickle this is. Jim's apparently in some kind of a serious jam. The chief needs my help, and I don't know where to reach them. Gee, I'm sorry, Mr. Kent. I should... I hope this is Lois. Clark Kent speaking. Kent, now why in places didn't you call me back? Did uh, that numbskull Beanie tell you that I... Oh, boy, that's Mr. Whitehall. Sure, he told me you called, Chief, but how could I call you back when you didn't have sense enough to tell him where you were? Now, look here, Kent, you can't... Okay, 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 skip it for now. Where are you and what's happened to Jim? I'm at police headquarters. Police headquarters? Yes, and Jim's been arrested. Jim arrested? Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. The boy's being held on a very serious charge. What? Federal offense. The way it looks now, Jim sent for a five-year stretch in the pen. Great Scott! Hold everything, Chief. I'll be right down. 
What can this mean? What can have happened to cause Jim's arrest on a federal charge carrying a five-year jail sentence? This is the beginning of a new and exciting Superman adventure gang in which Superman is called on to exert all of his great strength and cleverness to save his friends from a serious threat. So don't miss any of it. Tune in again tomorrow, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. On a shivery morning when your first idea is to beat it down to breakfast quick, gang, that's crumbles weather. That's when you want a toasty kind of cereal with zip and go. That's when you think of toasty words like crisp, crunchy, crinkly, Crumbles, Kellogg's Crumbles, the only cereal in the whole wide world made in those little crinkly shreds of good whole wheat. Sort of sweet and mellow rich, and so good for you. Mom knows that. So uh, when you think of something toasty on a cold morning, think of Crumbles, Kellogg's Crumbles. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual... From the heart of the jungle comes a savage cry of victory. This is Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. From the black core of dark Africa, land of enchantment, mystery, and violence, comes one of the most colorful figures of all time, transcribed from the immortal pen of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Tarzan, the bronzed white son of the jungle. And now in the very words of Mr. Burroughs, the story of Hunter's Fury. In the background, one could hear the trumpeting of an elephant, the howling of a hyena, the roar of a lion. And yet this was no tangled jungle, but a collection of concrete and steel buildings that made up the zoo of a modern American city. One of the buildings housed the administrative offices, and Douglas Hanley, a young assistant curator, occupied a tiny cubicle on the second floor. At the moment, he wore a look of pain and consternation, almost as though he were to face to face with one of his savage charges. But actually, he was alone in his office, and he was merely talking on the telephone. Talking? Well, for the most part, he was listening. Yes, dear. Yes, I know, but... No, but Esther, we can't afford it. No, we're overdrawn now. Well, I'll try to dig up the money somewhere, but... Hello? Hello? Uh... She hung up on you, huh? Riggs, where did you come from? The door was open. Well, that doesn't mean you can storm in here like you own the place. Oh, take it easy, Doug. I didn't mean to intrude on some private matter between you and your wife. The door was open oh, and I'm I... sorry, I guess it's just that Esther's got me on edge. She keeps forgetting about the size of my salary. She's got sort of fancy ideas. <laughs> Don't they all? Say, talking about fancy ideas, we finished building that stone archway for the special new polar bear cage. I thought you might like to okay it. Well, I can't get over there for a while. Uh, I've got a sick panther cub I've got to take a look at. But incidentally, Riggs, it's not a cage. The man who's contracting the job ought to know that. Well, <laughs> I keep forgetting there's not an iron bar in the whole contraption. But it seems sort of automatic to call a place where you keep animals a cage. If I had any, I'd put my own money into improving the quarters for all the animals. No iron bars, no concrete floors, no cages. Only natural barriers like like pits or water to keep the animals on the inside from the animals on the outside. Yeah. <laughs> well, this animal sure hopes they build a million of these fancy contraptions. I'm making a nice profit on the deal. I sure appreciate your putting the good word in for me. Your bid was the lowest and your specifications were the best. There was no reason why I shouldn't have insisted on your getting a job, Riggs. Now, Doug, I, I hope you won't take it wrong, but about that phone call I barged in on. Yes? Well, it looks like you're in a little hot water financially. I'd be glad to help you out with a couple of hundred bucks. 
Thanks just the same, Riggs, but I'll manage somehow. I heard you say you tried to dig up the money. Well, what's a good friend if he won't give you some dough? Give me? <laughs> no, I couldn't accept a gift. But, of course, uh, a loan of about 200 would help me out of a tough spot. Well, that's more like it. I'll write you out a check. Then we'll walk down and take a look at that swell job you threw my way. I'll meet you there right after I've taken a look at that sick panther cub. Thousands of miles away, deep in the heart of the African jungle, at exactly the same moment, another man knelt by the side of an ailing panther cub. And while Tarzan poured healing herbs into the animal's wounds, Torgo, his small native friend, looked at him curiously. Why you do that, Tarzan? Well, the little fellow's mother is dead, Torgo, so she can't lick the wounds Bolgani the gorilla inflicted. Unless we do something, you'll die. Torgo know that. Not what he means. You mean, why am I going to all this trouble to, to save his life? Dio, Tarzan often kills Cheetah the Panther. Why he not kill this one? Well, I've often told you, Torgo. I kill only when a jungle animal threatens my life or when I need food. Were I to kill every animal I encounter, the jungle would soon be completely empty of animals. Tarzan kill every animal in jungle? No. Oh, I have plenty of help. The members of your tribe kill many. Many other tribes do likewise. And the white man who comes with his thunder stick and his traps. He's the worst of all. Tarman Ghani bad. Oh, no, no, not all white men are bad, but they don't realize that when they kill more than they need for food, when they fire at every living thing that crosses their path, they're destroying the jungle. Destroy? The animals furnish our food. We make clothing and shelter of their hides. Their skins are used for our sleeping mats, and, and they feed on the rodents and insects that prey on our fields. Once Africa's animals are gone, we, we too are doomed. Animals gone soon? Well, many kinds of animals are already extinct. That, uh, that means that there are no more of them. That's why we must nurse sick animals back to health. And why we must fight the white men when they come to kill. The panther cub Tarzan nursed was soon healthy and strong again. And so was the cub Douglas Hanley had nursed. But the troubles of civilized life were more complex than those of the jungle. And now Douglas Hanley was faced with a serious threat. It was in the form of his friend, Herbert Riggs. Did you see that newspaper article about the animals? I gave the reporter the information. Then it's true that an African elephant's worth $6,000, that a giraffe brings 4000 a hippopotamus is worth five grand, and that a white rhinoceros is good for 15 Gs? <laughs> of course it's true. Good specimens are almost unobtainable these days. You know all about animals, don't you, Doug? Well, it's been my life's work. And you stand in with these zoo officials. They'd contract for any animals you'd bring back. That I'd bring back? I'm not a hunter, Riggs. Yeah, I know. You and I are going to Africa. Oh, but that's ridiculous. We're not... Well, it ain't ridiculous to me. There's a million in the racket. And you ain't turning me down. I'd like to oblige you, but my work's here in the zoo. And if you don't give me the okay on this deal, you won't have a job here. What do you mean, Riggs? Just this. I got a canceled check I made out to you for 200 bucks. But I paid you back in cash. And you didn't get a receipt. If I should give my version, you didn't pay it back. You got me that job building the polar bear contraption. And that was your rake off. Why, you... Now, easy, easy. <laughs> I suppose it would look like that. We'll contact every other zoo in the country, too. We'll supply them all. When we get back home, there won't be an animal left in the African jungle. In just a moment, we'll continue with our story of Hunter's Fury. Many months had passed since Tarzan had nursed the panther cub back to health, and he was on his way to the Punya village once again. He traveled rapidly through the upper level of jungle growth, and at his side, leaping from branch to branch, was Nakima, the tiny monkey, who looked upon Tarzan as a god. From time to time, Nakima scurried off on expeditions of his own. Now, as Tarzan dropped from a tree inside the boma of the Punya crawl, the chattering monkey scampered away. Jumbo, my monkey. Jumbo, Tarzan. 
why Manu run away? Oh, he distrusts men. <laughs> the only reason he accepts me is that he thinks I'm half monkey. Is right for animals distrust men. For men distrust animals. Not right other way. What are you getting at? Tarzan, member panther cub he saved after Borgani, the gorilla, killed panther's mama? Of course. When Tarzan leave Punya village, boy Torgo keep on like nurse to panther. Well, I can see nothing wrong in that. I'm, I'm happy that Torgo has begun to realize that animals can be our friends as well as our enemies. Panther and Torgo, too much good friends now. Everywhere Torgo walk, Panther come. Now Panther grow large, is dangerous. Already he claw Mama Nagama. Not want Torgo's own Mama touching. Oh, I'll see what I can do about that jealous Panther. Nadio, Tarzan do something. For Sheeta, the Panther, kill someone of tribe. <laughs> Torgo, can't you see that he is dangerous? He's even snarling at me. Not do anything if Torgo tell him not to. Well, perhaps you're right, but I would... He's right. Watch. Sheeta, not make noise. Quiet. Now, Sheeta, sit down. <laughs> well, you do seem to have him well trained. Now, lie down, Sheeta. Well, that's wonderful. You've done a marvelous job of training him, Torgo. But I'm told that he permits no one else to come near him, nor you, that, that he scratched Mama Nagama very badly. Yes, but that because Torgo left him alone. Not leave him again. She did not hurt anyone when Torgo with him. But you can't be with him night and day, and a grown panther Tarzan. is after... Tarzan! I'm inside the Hema. Come in, Maboki. Maboki, tell Chief Tarzan is here. And Chief, say he should... Watch out, Maboki! Watch out! No, Sheeta! No, stop, Sheeta! Not hurt Maboki! Good, Sheeta. He do what Torgo say. Torgo, I have tried to reason with you, but I'm through with words. Anyone who'd seen Sheeta leap at Maboki as he came through the door would know that he's not a safe pet to keep in a village. Now, Torgo, you may keep him with you tonight, but in the morning I must take him deep into the jungle and set him free. Oh, no, not take Sheeta. Not take friend of Torgo. Not take my Sheeta from me. <laughs> That night, when Tarzan and the people of Punya were asleep, Torgo fastened a slender rope of twisted vine around the neck of his pet and crept from the village. But when the two strange traveling companions had reached the tall grass and the dense undergrowth of Sheeta's birthplace, the animal lost all vestiges of domesticity. With a deep roar, he broke from Torgo. The slender rope snapped and the magnificent beast plunged into the jungle night with Torgo attempting vainly to follow. And a few miles away, a safari led by two white men plodded through the Congo night with the aid of flaming torches and trained guides. Douglas Hanley and Herbert Riggs were hunting for animals to take back to the zoos of America. Hey, you! Keep moving! You're getting paid enough to set a decent pace. I wouldn't shout at our guides, Riggs. We're pretty dependent on them. Besides, shouting's apt to frighten away any animals. How about those torches? Won't they frighten them? I don't think so. The jungle animals, like men, are curious. I think they may come to investigate the bright light. Say, uh, this little ravine here might be a good place to stop and spread the nets. Okay. Hey, you! Our expert says this is a good place to stop. Now, if we can mark off a small area and then take the nets and suspend them from the... Panther! Give me my gun, Doug. He's a magnificent specimen. Maybe we can catch one. I'm not taking any chances. My gun! Here. I used to be a good shot now if I can hold my arm steady. Get a bead on him. Kill Sheeta! Not shoot him, white man! Hold it! You'll hit the boy! So I hit him. I'm not risking no, my... No, Sheeta! That makes noise. Play it. Good, Sheeta. Now, sit. Good. Now, lie down. Hey, get that. It's amazing. Uh, lead the panther to this cage over here, little boy. No, not put she did, in cage. Now, just until we've had a chance to talk for a few minutes. We'll let him out later. Sure? Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's the fella. Right in here now. Go in cage, Sheeta. You White know, man let you out later. There's a kid that can handle animals the way he can. Why, he'll be a big asset for us. He'll be right handy to have around the camp. White man keep Torgo with them? Well, say, looks like he goes for that deal. You mean you'd uh, like to stay with us? The deal? Torgo stay with white men. If man called Tarzan come look for Torgo, you tell him you not see him. 
Uh, Torgo, why are you uh, afraid of this uh, Tarzan? He wants to take my panther and set him free. Oh, one of those birds who's against capturing animals, huh? <laughs> well, don't worry, Torgo. We won't tell him you're here. And if he starts trying to set the animals we capture free, he'll get more than he bargained for. <laughs> The white men had made camp, and Torgo was fast asleep in one of the tents, even before the hunters had spread their nets of steel-like cord and taken their sentry posts. In the darkness of the Congo night, a deceptive calm descended upon the encampment. But in the village of the Punyas, all was confusion. Torgo's absence had been discovered. Tarzan took to the trees following Torgo's spoor, and as he traveled through the upper level, Nakima the monkey joined in the pursuit, dancing ahead, chattering furiously. Suddenly, Nakima screamed. He had been caught in a giant net. Tarzan leaped to the aid of the small monkey, and he too was soon enmeshed in the steel-like nets of the white men. I wouldn't fight those nets, jungle man. What? We had them specially designed. The more you fight them, the tighter grip they get. So, you're responsible for these nets. You're a hunter who's come to rob the jungle of its animals, eh? Rob's an ugly word. And you're not in any position to start insulting people. Why are you raising that gun to your shoulder? We've been expecting you. You're Tarzan, ain't you? Yes, but yeah. what... Yeah. And you don't like the idea of people capturing animals, huh? Well, this gun will guarantee we won't have any interference from you. In just a moment, the exciting conclusion of Hunter's Fury. In the name of heaven, Riggs, put that gun down. This is my business. And mine. Up until now, I've taken all your orders, but I'm not going to stand by and see you commit murder. All right, Doug, I won't shoot him. But I can tell you this. We ain't setting him free. You, drag that heavy cage over here. Put it right under this tree. That's it. Right here. Now open the top and I'll drop our two prisoners in. Hey, Riggs, the monkey slipped through the bars. Yeah, well, monkeys don't bring much anyway. And Tarzan won't slip through. But he's got his knife arm free now. Well, he can't cut through those bars. You can bet your life on that. Well, I'm turning in now, Doug. You keep a watch over him. And if he escapes, you'll answer with your life. Pleasant dreams, Tarzan. I, uh, I heard the other man call you Doug. And you call him Riggs, huh? That's right. You seem strange, partners. Yeah, I guess we do. You don't seem like a man who hates animals enough to want to capture them and keep them behind bars for the rest of their lives. I don't approve of bars and cages at all. But I think a number of animals should be taken back to civilization. Why? Well, I don't believe a child's education is really complete unless he's seen an elephant, a mother kangaroo with her young, a few-day-old zebra running about, fending for itself. You, you talk about animals as though you love them. I do. I've seldom met white men with that feeling. You speak as though you weren't a white man. Oh, I'm white, all right, but sometimes the actions of men like Riggs make me ashamed of my race. Why do you take his orders? Well, that's uh, sort of a personal matter. It's obvious that you're afraid of him. Yes, I am. If, if you were to set me free, I'd guarantee he'd not harm you. I can't set you free, Tarzan. I've never pled for my own life, but... When I was caught in your nets, I was searching for a small native boy by the name of Torgo. He, he ran away from his home, and he may be in great danger somewhere here in the jungle. Torgo's safe. He, He's what? asleep in a tent on the far edge of the camp. Torgo's here? D does Riggs intend to take him home as a zoo specimen also? I don't know what Riggs intends to do, but I guess I'll have to go along with whatever he plans. <laughs> Well, Doug, how are things coming? Everything's repacked and ready. The safari will be ready to move along in a couple of minutes. What did you do with the boy? I bought him some breakfast into his tent for him. Then sent him ahead with one of the porters. I don't want to take any chance on his seeing Tarzan. Just what do you intend to do with Tarzan? We're just going to leave him here. We can spare that one cage. What? Why, snakes can get in, or scorpions. Or even even if they don't, he'll starve to death. Well, maybe you think I ought to let him loose so he can mess up our whole expedition. But you can't leave I him. I came here for animals. 
They're worth a fortune, and I intend having them. I'm going to fill every one of those cages, and I'm leaving that last big one for the white rhino. Fifteen thousand dollars. Fifteen grand. And I should let that jungle man free. Ha! Come on! Let's get rolling! Goodbye. Goodbye, Tarzan. Well, Nikima, you decided to come back and visit me in my cage, huh? But well, you brought me some fruit. It was very kind, very intelligent of you. Well, I'm afraid I can't live long on the food you'll be able to carry to me. Uh, if you could bring me a file so I could... Wait a minute. Nikima, do you see that stone over there? Dan Yeland? Get it for me, Nikima. Get me that stone. It took quite a bit of coaxing, but at last Nakima fetched the stone. It was too soft to make any impression on the bars. Later, Nakima fetched a second and a third stone, but they crumbled at the first touch. Not until the evening of the second day did the monkey bring a stone that was hard enough to serve as a crude file. And even then, it fit in slowly. Painfully so. Nakima watched his guard with animal curiosity. And then he too began to file away, imitating Tarzan monkey fashion. Nakima began to chatter happily, but Tarzan knew that it might be days or even weeks until he could free himself and follow the trail of Torgo and the hunters. And in the meantime, the safari moved further and further along the Congo Trail. Weeks passed, and fortune seemed to smile on the ambitions of Herbert Riggs. Well, there's another elephant to take back. See that he stayed down well. He won't get away. Nothing gets away from us. Yeah, you said it. Look at them all. Each one just a nice fat deposit in the bank. What, Riggs? Now I'll but last cage filled. Well, so? You say last cage for white rhino. Yeah, that's right. Hey, you've been a big help tracking down that game, Torgo. You promised if I help you let Sheeta out of cage. Yeah, he's a good specimen. We're keeping him. But you, you can scram. Riggs, we're not turning that boy loose in this wilderness. Oh, ain't we? As soon as we got our white rhino, we're heading back. And I'm not being held up acting as a nursemaid's ready. Hey! What's he saying? What's all the excitement about? Nancy white rhino in Riverbed. I see him. And I can shoot him from here. But you want to capture him. He'll get away if I don't shoot. But if I can pluck him in the leg, it'll slow him down. Now, get out of my way. I've got him. Now, get in there after him. Get in and tie him up. He's bad. Wounded and he's dangerous. You can't expect the natives to risk their lives trying to tie him up. Wait in there, I said. You, headman, lead the rest of them. Uh, who can kill us? If you don't start out after him, I'll kill you. I'm not letting 15 grand slip out of my hands. Now get going. No, let go. All right, you ask for it. Riggs, in the name of heaven. Hey! Now the rest of you, hop to it or I'll give you the same. Behind the frightened natives was a man mad with his elephant gun trained on them. And in front was a wounded and raged rhinoceros. But even the roaring beast was less fearful than the now almost insane reeks. They waded into the water, into the path of the charging rhino. And just when the death of a dozen of them seemed inevitable, a white savage leaped from the trees at the river's edge. His knife found the vulnerable spot between the soft folds of the rhino's belly, and the knife plunged again and again and again. <laughs> Now Tarzan headed for the bank. But the weeks of privation and near fasting had taken their toll. He staggered uncertainly and fell to the ground. All right, men. You can put Tarzan in the cage we had saved for the white rhino. And lock the boy in with his friend, the panther. Riggs, you're insane. Insane enough to kill you, too, if you try to interfere. Now do what I told you, men. Or I'll shoot you the way I did your head, man. Every one of you, if I have to. So the safari started back towards civilization. But a small monkey had decided that he liked the game of filing iron bars. Only this time he worked under Torgo's supervision with a steel file he'd stolen from the safari's toolbox. Unnoticed by the crazed rakes, he worked in the dead of night until finally several of the bars were almost cut through. Torgo think maybe Sheeta can break through bars now, Nikima. Quiet, Nikima. Quiet, Sheeta. Good, Sheeta. Now break through cage. Please, Sheeta. Understand, Torgo. Break through cage here. 
Right here. Good, Sheeta. Now we can find Tarzan's cage and then... Hey, what's going on over here? I thought I heard... Get the panther off me! Save me, Sheeta, come back! Sheeta! Sheeta! What's happened? I, I heard a panther roar it. Riggs. Sheeta killed bad man, then run away. Torgo not mean him to kill Buon Riggs. It's all right, Torgo. I know you would have stopped him if you could have. Not even Riggs deserved a death like that. Ah, but now there are other things to think about. Free Tarzan. Right. That's the first thing. Well, now what, Doug? I'll let you call the plays, Tarzan. And I know I don't deserve any consideration from you. If I hadn't been weak, I would have done something about Riggs. No, well, weakness can't be overcome in an instant. But I hope you'll gain strength now. I'm willing to free the animals, all of them. Tarzan, Torgo wants his Sheeta back. Torgo, Sheeta repaid us for saving his life when he was a cub, and, and now he's gone to join his own kind. And most of the animals you've captured, Doug, must also be free to join theirs. But I do think you should be permitted to take some of them back. A pair of each kind, perhaps, so that boys and girls everywhere, like, like Torgo can learn to know and understand the animals of the jungle. In just a moment, a preview of a very unusual story of Tarzan. Somewhere in the jungle, the drums beat ominously. Twins have been born to a native chief, and the tribesmen are scaring off the demons that have brought them. For more firmly implanted than any other superstitions are those surrounding accursed twins. And on their way into the jungle are two beautiful American girls, also twins, who are doomed to meet the strange consequences of these jungle superstitions. Tarzan, the transcribed creation of the famous Edgar Rice Burroughs, is produced by Walter White, Jr., prepared for radio by Bud Lesser, with original music by Albert Glasser. This is a Commodore production. Listen to our next story, Trouble Comes in Pairs, another thrilling episode of The Lord of the Jungle. planets and far-flung stars, we take you to the age of the conquest of space with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. In the steaming gaseous fog which forever shrouds the planet Venus, a tall, solidly built young man wearing the trim uniform of a space cadet strides briskly along a deserted street in the city of Venusport on his way toward the spaceport. Suddenly, another tall young man steps out of a darkened alleyway, trailed closely by a smaller, wizened follower, and plants himself in the cadet's path. Excuse me. You're Cadet Astro, aren't you? Hmm? Pardon? Yes, I am. Who are you? Don't you recognize me? Take a close look. What? Jumping. Jupiter. <laughs> Surprised? Why, you look just like me. Yes. Amazing resemblance, isn't it? In case you've forgotten, I'm your cousin, Merkel. My cousin? You've heard of me. Uh, yes, I have. Nothing very complimentary out that. No, no, not very. <laughs> I didn't think so. Come on, let's go someplace and get acquainted, Astro. Sorry, I, I've got to get to the spaceport, catch a ship back to Earth. 
I'm afraid you won't be able to make that ship, Astro. What do you mean? I've got other plans for you. All right, Beale. Hey, wait a minute. What is this? Who are you? Ooh. Nice work, Beale. Now let's drag my dear cousin Astro inside and go to work on him. Come on, Astro. Wake up. Wake up. How much sodium pentothal did you give him, Bill? Just enough to make sure he tells the truth when he comes to. <laughs> Will you look at him, though? You and him are like two peas in a pod, Mirko. Uh, my hair's a little darker. Uh, that's easily fixed. If you put his uniform on, nobody will be able to tell you apart. I hope not. If anything goes wrong, it'll mean my neck. Nothing needs to go wrong if you keep your wits about you. Oh. Ah, he's coming, too. Oh. Well, how are you feeling now, Astro, my lad? Who? Who are you? Where am I? You're with a friend, lad. A, a friend? That's right. Stay behind him. Listen sharp to the way he talks, my boat. Right. Now, Astro, I'd like you to tell me about Space Academy. About your friends there. Your unit mates. Yes, sir. I guess you know Tom Corbett and Roger Manning pretty well. Hey, Astro? They're, they're my best friends. Tell me about them. Corbett first. They don't come any better than Tom. He's a great guy. Deal. Ask him if he and Corbett have nicknames for each other. Tell me. You and Corbett have nicknames for each other? No. Roger and I call each other names sometimes. He calls me Venusian Hillbilly or, or Clunkhead. Uh-huh. What else about him? Nothing much. Roger's all right. <sighs> Just need some of the space gas blown out of his tubes once in a while. <laughs> Tom and I take care of that. We we keep him in line. We Astro, Astro, what's the matter with him, Deal? Why did he pass out? The drug acts like that. He'll come to again in a few minutes, and I can pump him some more. Did you get everything he said? Sure, sure. Next time, I'll ask him about Captain Strong and Commander Rock. Don't bother. I have all the information I need on them. Well, all right. You know. I think this will work out just fine, Mako. So far. But the big test comes when I show up at Space Academy. Incidentally, what happens to my dear cousin when I leave? <laughs> Never mind about him. I do mind. I wouldn't want him showing up at the Academy, too. You won't have to worry about that, Mako. Your dear cousin Astro ain't ever gonna see Space Academy again. <laughs> We'll return to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, in just a moment. So, stand by. Astro. Roger Manning. Dr. Joan Dale. Tom Corbett. You can get picture cutouts of all four on packages of Kellogg's Pep. You'll have a mountain of fun with these cutouts, spacemen. You can even build a setting to show your Space Cadet cutouts in action. Now, just suppose that the cadets had landed on the moon and were tracking down space pirates. Well, to show that, you draw a picture of the moon's surface, craters and all. Then you'd make a picture of the Polaris. Next, take the Space Cadet cutouts and put them right on the setting. And there you have it, a real Space Cadet scene. And once you get all four Space Cadet cutouts, you'll be able to use them all different ways. You can even act out today's adventure. So don't delay. Start collecting Space Cadet picture cutouts now. Have Kellogg's Pep for breakfast every morning. Kellogg's Pep gives you all the goodness of wheat, all the flavor of malt, all the get-up-and-go energy of a real Spaceman cereal. When you finish the package, cut out the Space Cadet picture on the back. It's loads of fun to play with Space Cadet cutouts, and it's loads of fun to start off each day with a build-up wheat cereal, Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P. Pep. Unaware that their unit mate Astro is being held prisoner on his home planet Venus, Tom Corbett and Roger Manning greet Astro's impersonator as he enters their dormitory. Astro! Greetings, space boys. Well, the Venusian hillbilly himself. Where you been, Lunkhead? You had us worry. Ah, uh, you know those space liners. We were held up half a day on Luna, rounding up a couple of tourists who got lost. A space liner? You came back on a space liner? Well... Well, sure. You mean you bought passage on a ship when you could fly for free on a Solar Guard cruiser? Oh, well, you know, finishing up your leave and all, you you like to make a splash. 
Dad, I always did want to ride in one of those floating space palaces. You always swore you'd never set foot in one. And where'd you get that kind of money? The fare on one of those jobs is almost a year's pay. Well, uh, you see... Don't tell me you put the bite on your uncle. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Brother, why in blazes did you talk me into leaving Venus a week early, Tom? Well, you said you wanted to prowl, Roger, and I wanted to see my folks, uh, so... Speaking of prowling, Roger... Any new conquests? Well, now that you mention it, Astro, old pal... Oh, Astro, why'd you give him the opening? There was the cutest little operator at Cadet Marshall's party last night. A real dick. Yeah? How is Marshall? I haven't seen him in a long time. Huh? Are you kidding, Astro? Why, why no. Oh, don't tell me you kissed and made up. Well, uh... You and he almost tore each other apart the last time you met. How come a sudden change of heart? Oh, well, I... I thought it over and... <laughs> that was kid stuff. I just as soon drop the whole matter. Huh? Well, I'll be a Martian mouse. What gives here? I never saw you act like this before, Astro, or talk this way either. Astro. Astro, don't you hear me? Tom, what's the matter with him? He's just standing there, staring. Astro, what's wrong? Come on, snap out of it, you big ape. Uh, what? Astro, are you all right? Uh, what? What happened? That's what we'd like to know. We were talking to you, and all of a sudden, you went clear out of this world. Oh, Oh, the doctor said this would happen. Oh, what doctor? What's wrong with you? Well, it's this way, fellas. I, I didn't want to say anything before, but Liner was... Well, I lied to you. But why, Astro? To cover up. You see, I, I had a little accident. It happened after you two left Venus. I hurt my head and, and was laid up at the hospital. Oh, why didn't you tell us? Oh, I didn't want to spoil your vacation. Anyhow, the, the medico said I'd have, well, spells, you might call it, when I'd go blank and... And forget things. Well, you still should be checked by the academy, Medico. Oh, but I'll fall behind in class. I'll lose my place with you fellas in the unit. Look, I promise, if I do any more blanking or anything like that, I'll see the Medico. But right now, let me sweat it out, huh? Well, if his doctor on Venus said it was okay for him to come back to the academy, I guess it is, Tom. Sure it is. Well, maybe. Okay, Astro, we'll sweat it out with you. But we'll keep a close eye on you. Thanks, Tom. Gosh, Astro, I was starting to get some cockeyed ideas about you, but if you just fell on your head, well, you can't really damage that Venusian rot. <laughs> no, I guess I can't. And, and you just watch, fellas. Everything's going to work out fine. <laughs> middle of the night. Where's he going? That's what we're going to find out. He had a package with him. Come on. Look, Roger. Astro's heading for the spaceport. What in blazes is that one head up to? That's what I want to know. Keep moving, but stay in the shadows. Tom, I don't like spying like this. Oh, neither do I, but I think Astro's in trouble. If we can find out what it is, maybe we can help him. Who said he's in trouble? Well, there's something wrong with him. Haven't you noticed how, how different he's been since he came back from Venus? Well, the poor guy had a bad accident. He fell on his head. I know, but there's something else. Something I can't put my finger on. He's been, well, kind of sly. Sly? Astro? Oh, come off it, Tom. Well, what do you call sneaking out here in the middle of the night like this? Well, he must have had a good reason. Wait, look. He's heading for the Unit 2 cruiser, the Vega. Come on. What in blazes is that ape up to? Search me. Hey, look out for that crate, Roger. Ooh, blast it. Quick, find this ramp. Astro's turning around. I don't think he spotted us. Tom, look. You can see him clearer now. I think the poor guy's walking in his sleep. Well, your space hat. He is. See how he's got his hands out in front of him? He wasn't walking like that before. Well, we couldn't see him clearly before. It was too dark. I'm sure of it. Hey, he went right past the bigger. He's heading for the canal. Come on, Tom. He's liable to fall right into the drink. Astro! 
Hey, Astro, wait. Not so loud, Roger. You'll bring the watch. Well, hurry up before he falls in. Here he is. I got him. See, his eyes are closed. Astro. Astro, wake up. What? 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 Tom, Roger. Take it easy now, fella. What are we doing out here? You were walking in your sleep. I was? Looks like it. You never did this before, Astro. Well, I... Uh, I did it at home a couple of times after the accident, Tom. Oh? Gosh, I'm sorry, fellas. Get it. It wasn't your fault. Uh-oh. There's the watch. Come on. We can slip into the door in the back oh, way. Wait a minute. What's the matter, Tom? Astro had a package with him. A package? Yes, you must have dropped it. Never mind. We've got to make tracks or we'll all land in the brig. Let's blast. <laughs> time you called in, Mirko. What in blazes happened last night? Listen. The boys were there when the Vega landed. And there wasn't anything aboard. Central control is burning mad. Corbett and Manny caught me. It's all right, though. I made them think I was sleepwalking. Manny bought my story, but I'm not positive about Corbett. How about that? Everything else is okay. But I don't want to try it again tonight in case Corbett is still suspicious. I'll wait till tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Understand? Tomorrow. Right. But nothing better go wrong again, Mirko. It won't. This time... I'll make sure those cadet punks don't follow me. Got to cut out now, Peel. I won't contact you again unless the schedule has changed. Right. Well, looks like Tom and Roger were too smart for Mirko, huh, Beal? <clears throat> if you're still alive, we'll let him court-martial you for a traitor. What? Well, that's the way you're going to play it, huh? That's <laughs> the way, exactly. Why, well, you dirty space crawler, out? Ha-ha, <laughs> go on. Bust your muscles. You can't break them ropes. Oh, I can't, huh? Hey, <laughs> Jupiter... Now, let's see if you can take it as well as you dish it out. No, you don't. Keep back. Don't go away, pal. You're going to have some sweet dreams. Right from my... No, no. 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 Hey, Roger, look. What's that? The package Astro was carrying the other night. I just fished it out of the canal. He must have thrown it in when he heard us coming. Oh? What is it? Just a box. I'll try to get the top off with my knife. Tom, I don't understand you. You're acting as if, well, as if you don't trust Astro. I'm not sure I do, Roger. Ah, there we are. Well, come on. What's in it? Kind of curious, aren't you, fellas? Astro. So you found it, eh, Corbett? I figured you did when it wasn't in the canal. Hey, Astro, what? Smart, Corbett. But this time you outsmarted yourself. Now you and your pal are in trouble. Maybe you're the one who's in trouble. Not me. I just have to change my plans a little. Look, what goes on here? Tom, Astro... He isn't Astro, Roger. Not Astro? No, I don't know who he is, but... A ray gun. Tom, he pulled a gun on us. What in the universe? We're going out to the spaceport, boys. Right now. What's the idea? Just do as I say. You'll walk in front, Manning. Then Corbett. And I'll be right behind you. If you make one sound, I'll blast you. Now, march! We'll return to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, in just a moment. So, stand by. There's big news at Kellogg's, Spaceman, and that means good news for you. All the swell Kellogg's cereals have been dressed up in brand new packages. You can see them right now at your grocery store. Why, some of the pictures on some Kellogg packages look good enough to eat. But they're just there to show you what a swell cereal there is waiting inside for you. And don't forget, on the regular size package of Kellogg's Pep, you get an exciting Space Cadet picture cutout. One that you can make a stand for and put in a Space Cadet setting of your own. All the new faces on the Kellogg cereal packages are bright and happy pictures. You want to have one on your breakfast table every morning. And if it's a Kellogg cereal, you know that you're going to want a big bowlful, too. So make a date right now to go to your grocery store and see all the new faces on the Kellogg cereals. Then you'll be saying, Did you see what I saw? Kellogg's on display. In brand new boxes, bright and gay, these famous cereals come your way. Go see this eyeful. The Kellogg's All-Star Breakfast Show has a cheerful look, a lift for you. Start you off with a hoop de doo Kellogg's for breakfast and a happy, happy day. Get a big supply today, today. See the big K-Day display of the new Kellogg packages at your grocery store. <laughs>
Academy sleeps, Tom and Roger are forced to go to the spaceport with Mirko, who is masquerading as Astro and who is armed. At Mirko's command, the two cadets approach the space cruiser Polaris, which looms sleek and gleaming under the pale light of the stars. Blasted, but I was dumb, Tom, not to realize this guy wasn't Astro. I wasn't exactly bright either, Roger, not to catch on sooner than I did. All right, you two, hold it. What happens now, Mr. Rat? You'll find out, Manning. Turn around and face the ship. Why? Turn around, I said. You too, Corbett. He's going to finish us with that ray gun blast off in the Polaris, Tom. Listen, Roger. Sounds like a ship coming in for a landing. Yeah, it is. A solar guy destroyer. It'll be too late to help you, Corbett. Hello. Oh, Why, you, you slug Tom. And here's yours, Manning. Oh. Now, brother cadets. Let's blast off for a nice little joyride in space. Tom. Tom, you okay? That phony slug that's been tied us up and dumped us down here in the hold of the Polaris. I feel like I've been run over by a steamroller, but I guess I'll live. Not for long. That crazy space joker up on the control deck can't handle this ship alone. Nothing much we can do about it now, I'm afraid. Hey, somebody's coming. You're supposed to jump in Jupiter Astro. What? Hello, fellas. Sorry I took so long getting up here, but riding acceleration without cushions is no picnic. Astro, how in the universe did Wait you... Wait a minute, Tom. Maybe, maybe he isn't Astro. It's that other joker trying to trick Why, him. you space-happy rockhead, if you don't know me by this time... <laughs> That's Astro, all right. Well, don't just stand there. Get us out of this. All right, all right. Keep your flaps trimmed. Well, what's going on here, anyway, Astro? Where have you been? Who is this character? He looks enough like you to be your twin. Uh, he's a cousin. Name's Mirko. Haven't heard from him in years. He and a gang he's working with nailed me on Venus when I was on my way back to the Academy. But why? Yeah. Look, will you guys stop wriggling around and let me get these wires off? Okay, okay, but keep talking. The idea was for Merker to pose as me at the Academy and help this gang smuggle stuff out of Earth. Where to? What kind of stuff? I don't know. When I broke away from them yesterday morning, I didn't hang around to ask questions. Anyhow, Merko would hide the stuff on Academy ships that wouldn't be suspected or, or even subject to custom search. And then the gang would pick it up at some spaceport en route. Pretty clever operation. Uh, there you are. You're both loose. Now, where's my dear cousin? Topside, on the control day. He's liable to kill us all the way he's handling this ship. Well, let's get him. nothing doing, Roger. This is my job. But Astro... Look, Tom, after what I went through, I deserve this. You stay down here. Better hurry up, Astro. Don't worry. This will be short and sweet. Just stay there and listen. Tom, you think maybe we'd better follow him? No, this is his party. Let him enjoy it. Hiya, cousin. Shake hands. Wow, he sure is. Oh, listen to him. Those punches even hurt down here. Maybe we have better break it up. There won't be anything left of Mirko. Uh-oh. That sounded like taps to me. Astro, are you all right? All right. I feel terrific. Well, let's get up on the control deck. This ship is running away with us. Okay. But look... I've been thinking, Tom. Stick to your fists, Astro. You think a lot better with them. No, I'm serious. Instead of going back to the Academy, why don't we head for Venus and pick up the rest of that smuggling gang before they get away? I left them there when I escaped. Hey, that's a great idea, Are Tom. you guys kidding? Commander Arkwright would have our ears if we blasted off on our own. But we'll put it up to him when we get back. <laughs> a fine thing. Just when I was beginning to enjoy myself. <laughs> Don't miss the next action-packed adventure with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, when Tom, Roger, and Astro rocket to Venus on a dangerous assignment with the smugglers and find themselves in the greatest peril of their lives in part two of The Riddle of Astro. Tune in, same time, same station, for the next thrilling interplanetary adventure with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Brought to you by Kellogg Pep, the build-up wheat cereal. Spaceman, this is Tom Corbett. Thousands of families have been driven from their homes by the floods in the Midwest, and they need our help now. And money from you and your parents will help them in this terrible emergency. So give to the Red Cross. <laughs> Tom 
Corbett, Space Cadet, starring Frankie Thomas, can also be seen on television and appears in the comic sections of many of America's leading newspapers. Look for it daily and in weekend editions. Featured in the cast were Al Markham and Jan Merlin. Today's program was written by Ben Peter Freeman and directed by Drex Hines. Jackson Beck speaking. Kellogg's Raisin Bran has a secret. Kellogg's Raisin Bran has a secret. And what a secret. In Kellogg's Raisin Bran, the tasty raisins are dipped in honeycomb. That means plumper, more tender raisins, along with delicious golden crisp bran flakes. Both fruit and cereal, all in one box. And no other raisin brand but Kellogg's gives you the tender goodness of raisins dipped in honeycomb. That's Kellogg's secret. So for your breakfast, make sure you get Kellogg's because... Kellogg's raisin brand has a secret. This program came to you from New York. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Transcribed. Kellogg's Pep, the build-up wheat cereal, invites you to rockin' into the future with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Stand by to raise ship. Blast off minus five, four, three, two, one, zero! Roaring rockets blast off to distant planets and far-flung stars. We take you to the age of the conquest of space with... Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. While Astro was held prisoner by mysterious smugglers on the planet Venus, his renegade cousin Mirko impersonated him at Space Academy. Managing to escape, Astro returned to the Academy where he, Tom Corbett, and Roger Manning captured Mirko. Now the three cadets have been summoned to the quarters of Commander Arkwright. Astro, the Solar Alliance has requested you to undertake a highly important but extremely dangerous mission. Me, sir? Cadets Corbett and Manning, your cooperation is also requested. I'm ready, sir. Same here. What's the mission, sir? As you know, Mirko was caught smuggling out Neo-RDX, the most powerful explosive in the universe. He's confessed that the explosives are to be used in a bigger operation, raiding the space lanes. Raiding? You mean piracy, sir? Exactly. Mirko had a supra-high-frequency transmitter by which he contacted Beale from the Academy. This morning, intelligence persuaded Mirko to contact Beale. This is a tape recording of their conversation. FC-394. Mirko calling Beal. FC-394. Mirko calling Beal. Come in, Beal. Beal here. I've been trying to contact you, Mirko. Astro got away. Yes, I know. He was here. What? <laughs> Luckily, the fool came to the dormitory first. I was there alone, and I took care of him. We'll never have to worry about my dear, stupid cousin again. Well, that's a relief. Nice work, Mirko. Now listen. I'm hiding the stuff aboard the rocket cruiser Polaris tonight. I've already given you the rocket schedule. Right. We'll be ready to pick it up. Oh, wait just a minute. Stand by. Right here, Beale was apparently interrupted. Perhaps by the leader of the operation who gave him other instructions. You'll hear him again in a minute. But, sir, what did Mirko mean? He took care of me. We instructed him to say that, Astro. If Beale and the others believed you were dead, they'd feel safe in continuing to work with Mirko. Then, we could put a dummy package aboard the Polaris, and intelligence officers could grab the gang when they picked it up. Oh, I get it. Okay, now, Mirko, listen sharp. Go ahead, Beale. Here's what you do. Since you're in that Polaris unit, you can bring the stuff out yourself. Bring it myself? You mean to Venusport? Well, now, maybe we ain't there no more. Where are you? We ain't quite settled on a place yet. We've got the Polaris schedule, so someplace along the line, one port or another, you'll be contacted. Uh, which port? We ain't quite sure of that, neither. You'll just get yourself away from Corbett and Manning on all the spaceports, and we'll be in touch with you. So long, Mirko. See you later. All right, that's the end of the recording. Now, do you understand your assignment, Astro? I think so, sir. Mirko posed as me, now you want me to pose as him and make contact with the gang. Right. Find out all you can about them and their plans. 
But I must warn you, this assignment is extremely dangerous. They're obviously suspicious. That's why they want to see Mirko. I realize that, sir. So, you may refuse the assignment if you wish. Refuse it? <laughs> Not me. Thank you. Cadets Corbett and Manning, you have the same choice. You needn't accompany Cadet Astro if you prefer not to. Huh? Let that hillbilly get his neck in a sling without us? Not in a million years. Uh, I, I beg your pardon, sir. I understand, Manning. Cadet Corbett? Count me in, sir. Naturally. Very well, then, cadets. You've made your decision, and I must say I'm proud of you. You will prepare to blast off in two hours. Use your heads and try to come home safely. Now, goodbye. And spaceman's luck to you all. We'll return to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, in just a moment. So, stand by. Tom Corbett, Astro, and Roger Manning are just about to blast off on another adventure in outer space. There they go. Say, how'd you like to have a picture of that? A picture that would show your favorite space cadets in action. You can, you know. All you have to do is collect the space cadet picture cutouts you find on the back of every regular size package of Kellogg's Pep. Soon you'll have picture cutouts of all the space cadets. You can cut them out and use them in your own space cadet adventures. Here's the latest special prize you get with every regular size package of Kellogg's Pep. Just look on the back of the package. Right there, you'll see a swell picture made from an actual photograph. Each cutout is a full-length picture, too. So you can see the official Space Academy uniform. You'll see Dr. Dale in her full-dress uniform. Another package shows you Roger Manning wearing a spacesuit, the same kind the cadets wear out in space or on another planet. Astro and Tom are in uniform, too, all ready for you to set up in a space cadet scene. And remember, that picture cutout comes with the best-tasting whole wheat and malt cereal you ever tasted. Just rustle those flavorful wheat flakes into your cereal bowl tomorrow morning. You'll say the swellest cereal in the whole solar system is Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P. Pep. In an attempt to discover the whereabouts and identity of a gang of men who plan to raid the space lanes, Tom, Roger, and Astro volunteer for a supposedly routine training flight in the rocket cruiser Polaris, hoping to lure the gang into a trap. Well, this is Marsport. Here's your last chance to be a hero, Astro. Ah, uh, nothing happened on Luna or Venus, and nothing will happen here either, Roger. It certainly won't if Roger and I keep you surrounded like this. Listen, Astro, we'll kind of evaporate. You make like Mirko and amble around the spaceport alone. I've ambled around almost every spaceport in the inner solar system, Tom, and all I've got to show for it is sore feet. That's the only place you've got any feeling, leadhead. Come on, Roger. But don't worry, Astro. We'll be near to protect you. Ah, oh, go blow your jets. Ah, uh, well, here we go again. Hey, got a match? <laughs> Sorry. Mirko? Hmm? Oh, Maybe I have. Here, take these matches. Light one for me. Oh, okay. You're making the contact? I ain't out for the walk. Hey, hey watch it. You almost burned me. What are you so nervous about? Oh, I, I was thinking. Tom, I mean, Corbett and Manning, they're around here someplace. Don't worry about them. Now, listen. Walk around behind that far hangar. You'll see a little guy waiting there. Go with him. But go on. What are you waiting for? What about Corbett and Manny? I said forget about them. You just get going and lead them to us. We'll take care of them good. Hey, Tom, look. Astro's leaving the spaceport. He's ducking behind that hangar. Uh-huh. I think he's made contact. Come on, Roger. After him. Hey, hey, just a minute, fellas. 
Got a match? No, sorry. How about you? No, let go of my arm. You don't have to get so up, buddy. I just asked you. All you... right, all right, and I told you. Now blow, will you? Oh, uh, you'll show you fresh punks. Hey, fellas! Hey, what gives? Look, Roger, those three men. Pile in, boys. Watch yourself, Roger. I can handle these jokers with one hand. Get them, fellas. Slug them. Hey, the spaceport police. Come on, let's get out of here. Come back here, you yellow space rats. What are you afraid of? Knock it off, Roger. Let's get after Astro. Astro? Jumping Jupiter, I almost forgot about him. Let's blast. He went around this hangar. See him? No. No sign of Astro anywhere, Tom. What do we do now? Nothing we can do but go back to the Polaris and hope Astro shows up. <laughs> Here he is, Bill. Signed, sealed, and delivered. Okay. You can take his blindfold off now, Nicky. There you are, Michael. Hey, what's the idea, Bill? They made me keep this blindfold on all the way from Marsport. Well, now, lad, we couldn't take no chances. You might be the other one. Astro? Well, this should make you change your mind. EORDX. That's right. Convinced now? Let's see. Well? Yeah. This looks like the stuff, all right. Well, you know how it is, Mirko. We had to make sure. This is a big deal we're in. Real big. Yeah, I know. Listen, Beale, when do we start operating? That's none of your business, Mirko. Oh, now, look, why all the secrecy with me? I'm risking my neck for you guys. I even killed a man. You're being well paid for it. Here. Here's your money. Oh. Oh, thanks. Nicky will take you back to your ship. When you get back to the academy, contact me and I'll tell you where to pick up the next load. Now I know you're okay, we'll carry on the way we started. Okay. So long, Bill. Be good, kid. Yeah, Bill here. Bill, this is Valdor. Yes, sir. Did you watch him through the teleceiver I hooked up? Yes, he looked like Mirko. Sure. I guess we were too suspicious. Were we? Did you notice he didn't try to get more out of you this time? He didn't even count what you gave him. Yeah. See, that's right. Ah, he's okay, though. He brought us the Neo RDX. Place it directly in front of the teleceiver lens so I can see it clearly. It's the right stuff. Do as I tell you. Okay, Valdor. See? It's the right Where stuff. Where are the detonators? Huh? The detonators, you fool. That explosive can't be set off without the special detonators. We ain't here. Get Mirko back. Hurry. Too late. They just took off. There's a radio in the jet boat. Call Nicky at once and tell him to bring Mirko back. Roger, look, it's Astro. The old Venusian hillbilly himself. Space boy, we were worried about you. We're in blazes. Look, fellas, you... no time to talk now. We gotta blast off fast. Come on. Why? What's the rush? What happened? Beale must have noticed by now I didn't bring the detonators. I pulled the audio wire in Nikki's jet boat so Beale couldn't call him, but they might have other contacts here. Come on. Climb into the airlock and let's blast. <laughs> All right now, Astro. Let's find out if you are still in the gang's confidence. Contact Beale. Uh, yes, Commander Arkwright. And you two boys, stay absolutely quiet. Yes, sir. FC-394, Mirko calling Beale. Come in, Beale. FC-394, Mirko to Beale. Come in. Beale here. Listen, Mirko, what happened to the detonators? Uh-oh, they're wild. Quiet, Roger. The what? The detonators. The little ball-like caps made out of vanadium. Explosives no good without them. I don't know anything about them, Beal. You must have got them with the Neo RDX. All I found in the locker was the package I brought up to you. You sure? Positive. Blast those jokers. They've messed it up then. Well, they'll have to get us a double supply this time. Now listen, Mirko. Here are your orders. Go ahead. Thursday night, you slip out of the academy. At 940, a westbound monorail leaves the village heading for Adam City. Get on it. Sit in the second car from the end. Got that? A westbound monorail... At 9.40 Thursday. Right. Then what? You'll be contacted on the car. When you get the stuff secured behind the rudder assembly on the next Academy rocket ship, making a train in flight the main solar ports. Then, really, it's scheduled to me. 
Check. Check. Right then. That's all. So long, Marco. You know, Tom, riding around a monorail train like this is a lot of fun. But has any one of these monorails ever fallen off the track? Well, not that I know of. Well, looks kind of dangerous hanging from that one rail going at this speed. Relax, will you? We've got bigger worries. Hey, we're slowing down. Think maybe something will happen here? Well, let's hope so. Where's Astro? Still in the car ahead. Now, keep your face in that newspaper now. We're stopping. Not too many people getting on. But one important guy is getting on. Who? Nicky. That character that picked a fight with us at Marsport. Oh, great. Roger. Nicky just motioned to Astro. Yeah. And Astro's getting up, walking to the door. Nicky's right alongside. They're getting off. Come on. We getting off, too? What do you think? Hurry. But Nicky may spot us. We'll have to take that chance. Maybe if we move fast enough and duck behind one of the station pillars, he won't. It might work. It's kind of dark out there. Move fast, Roger. All set. Come on. Down these steps. Duck behind here and hold still. Right. You see Astro? Wait a minute. Hey! What's the matter? <laughs> Nicky tricked us. He and Astro didn't get off. Jumping Jupiter. There goes the monorail. And Astro's on it. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Nicky? Can't you make up your mind? Why didn't we get off? Because I changed my mind. That's why, Marco. Now move up into the front car. Why? Because I tell you. Wait a minute. Who do you think you're ordering around? You, Buster. You think I didn't recognize those two jokers in the back car? They were Corbett and Manning. What? But yeah, I didn't... Yeah, I know. You said you ducked them. But I just made sure you did. Now move. Well... What's in the front car? Exactly what you're after, Boyko. And maybe a little more. Okay, crossover. Well, what now? There's nobody here. Sure there is, Beko, my boy. Bill. Well, you fellas sure do a lot of traveling. This trip was worth it. I made it special. Just to introduce you to someone you've been wanting to meet. Who? The name is Valdor. Valdor? Yes, Beal tells me you've been rather curious about well, me. Well, you're, you're the head of this whole operation. That's right, Marco, and I must confess I've been curious about you, too. You have? Yes, and the answer to one question will satisfy my curiosity, Marco. Oh, well, go ahead. Shoot. When and where did you meet our friend Beal? Why, uh, it, uh, it was back home on Venus. We, we, we did a job together, and, uh... And that's all. It certainly is for you, Astro. Why, you dirty space crawler. Nicky, watch him. I am. Hold still, big boy. I'll burn a hole through you with this heat ray. So you thought you could trap me, Astro, by using the same trick by masquerading as your cousin Merkel. You're already trapped, Valdor. The Solar Guard knows all about you. How could they when you didn't even know? Tom and Roger saw me on this monorail, and they saw Nicky, too. Your friends are far behind, and when they finally catch up to you, it'll be too late. You think so, huh? I know so. In a very few minutes, we will pass over a high chasm. There'll be a drop of some four or five hundred feet from this spells an accident. An extremely fatal accident. We'll return to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, in just a moment. So stand by. Listen to those giant presses. They're turning out new, completely new packages for the Kellogg Company. Each package is in bright new colors, gay new pictures. And do you know what's going into those packages? Kellogg cereals. A big selection of the world's finest breakfast foods, yours, and new picture packages. You want to see all the new faces on the Kellogg's. You want to try all the swell Kellogg cereals. And just for an example, listen to this. On the back of every regular size package of Kellogg's Pep... There's a picture of one of the space cadets or Dr. Dale. It's a full-length picture cutout showing one of the official Space Academy uniforms. You can get as many as four different picture cutouts because different pep packages have different cutouts. But one thing is still the same. 
And that's the swell whole wheat cereal you get inside. See other Kellogg packages at your grain. Did you see what play? In brand new boxes, bright and gay, these famous cereals come your way. Go see this eyeful. The Kellogg's All-Star Breakfast Show has a cheerful look, a lift for you. Start you off with a hoop de doo Kellogg's for breakfast and a happy, happy day. Get a big supply today, today. Yes, get a big supply today of the great Kellogg cereals in their bright new boxes. As the monorail trail hurtens through the night, suspended from a single gleaming rail and rapidly nears a wide, deep chasm, Astro faces death at the hands of the men he tried to trap. But meanwhile, some distance behind in a single monorail car speeding along a parallel track, Tom and Roger try desperately to catch up to their friend. Can't you make this old crate go faster, Tom? She's wide open, Roger. Don't worry, we're picking up time on that train. I still say we should have commandeered an auto jet. We would have caught up by now. And how would we have gotten aboard the train? Now, Commander Arkwright picked the best idea. Lucky this work car was parked on a siding at that last station. Well, all right, but suppose another train shows up on this track. We'll be in great shape then. The commander said he'd see that all traffic was cleared for us. Now, stop griping, will you? Okay, okay, but blast it, I wish we'd spot that train. Wait, there it is. See those red lights? Great galaxy, that's it. Come on, we've got to catch up. We can't miss now. <laughs> Close to the chasm. It's less than a minute away. Very good. Open this side door, Bill, and you, Nicky, stand by the door between the cars. See that none of the passengers interrupt us. All right, Baldo. Door's open, Baldo. Thank you, Bill. Move up to it, Astro. Oh, no, I won't. Take your choice. Jump by yourself or be thrown out. All right, big shot. You throw me if you can. Easily done. Bill, the parallel ray. Freeze them first. Wait a minute, Baldo. It's another monorail catching up on the next track. Huh? Someone in the front cabin. That cadet, Corbett. Tom! And the other one's leaning out of the side door. The car's coming alongside. Gangway! Hey. Stop him, quickly! Come on, Astro! Jump for it! Oh, you Come out of my way, Junior! Oh. Come on, Astro! What are you waiting for? Not a thing, pal. Here I come! Well... If it hadn't been for you guys, I'd be flying through 500 feet of nothing right now. Those guys really meant business. Well, they're going bankrupt in a few minutes, Astro. As soon as their monorail stops at the next station, they'll get an escort of honor. A squad of solar guards. Suppose he jumped the train before that. Yeah, where will they jump? Straight down? Not a chance. The whole gang is wrapped up for good. Hey, those words are music to my ears. Jupiter, I'm glad this operation is over. It isn't yet, Astro. Tom and I saw another one of your relatives, and he looked real mean. What? Where? Early this evening, when we passed the zoo. Don't miss the next action-packed adventure with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, when Tom and Roger are ordered to guard a huge sum of money and find themselves blasting through space with an escort of death. Tune in, same time, same station on Tuesday for the next thrilling interplanetary adventure with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Brought to you by Kellogg's Pep, the build-up wheat cereal. Spaceman, this is Tom Corbett. Thousands of families have been driven from their homes by the floods in the Midwest, and they need our help now. And money from you and your parents will help them in this terrible emergency. So give to the Red Cross. Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, starring Frankie Thomas, can also be seen on television and appears in the comic sections of many of America's leading newspapers. Look for it daily and in weekend editions. Featured in today's cast were Jan Merlin, Al Markham, Carter Blake, Joe DeSantis, and Gilbert Mack. 
Today's program was written by Ben Peter Freeman, directed by Drex Hines. Jackson Beg speaking. Kellogg's Raisin Bran has a secret. Kellogg's Raisin Bran has a secret. And what a secret. In Kellogg's Raisin Bran, the tasty raisins are dipped in honeycomb. That means plumper, more tender raisins, along with delicious golden crisp bran flakes. Both fruit and cereal all in one box. And no other Raisin Bran but Kellogg's gives you the tender goodness of raisins dipped in honeycomb. That's Kellogg's secret. So for your breakfast, make sure you get Kellogg's because... Kellogg's Raisin Bran has a secret. This program came to you from New York. The preceding was transcribed. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Prophecy is an easy thing, for rarely is the prophet brought to judgment. Tonight I bring you a false prophecy, a place set at this hour, yes, one minute after ten Eastern peacetime, but the years have moved onward to the number of fifty-five. The place of our story is a great rocket speeding away from the moon, yes, away, for the first trip to the moon has finally taken place and a triumphant airship is now rapidly returning to the Mother Earth. Here, then, is a story about a tomorrow 55 years hence, September 20th in the year of our Lord, 2000, on board a rocket ship. A play that is, I sincerely hope, a very false prophecy. <laughs> time we had a little celebration. There's a great deal of work to be done. Work's over, Doctor. 24 hours more and we're back. Yes, Doctor. We'll be back. We've done it. Complete. In 24 hours. If you're worried about our landing, I'm not. You worried, Reynolds? No, sir. Everything's in perfect order. Sure, Doctor. There's going to be a round trip. Anyway, there's 24 hours before we have to worry about that. Yes, Doctor. It's a time for celebration. Oh! Glad to be alive, boys. I'm glad to be alive. I'm riding on a rocket train, and soon I will arrive. Reynolds, oh, Major Reynolds. Are you men out of your minds? You, Major Russell. Reynolds is still a boy, but you're a mature man. Please act mature, eh? Oh, but Doctor. I'll grant you that our adventure has gone well. Well is right. We've been to the moon. My congratulations. Hello. Thank you, Major. Thank you. I'll put the medal on my other chair. Will you men listen to me? We're 48,000 miles from the Earth. And headed right for it. We're not there yet. Doc, pardon the expression, but you're a gloomy Joe. I am a realist. But, Doctor, the possibilities of anything going wrong are remote. Surely we're entitled to relax a little and relish the fact of what we've done. Yeah, we've done it, Doc. Even if we never get back, we've done it. We've been to the moon, and it'll always be there on the books. I'm not interested in becoming an historical fact, Major Russell. The data we've collected, that's my only interest. May I ask you and Reynolds to get back to your post? Oh, but everything's going like clockwork. Look at the gauges. But we are out of radio contact with the Earth. Yes, sir. But we are on course. Doc, what is wrong? Wrong? What should be wrong? Well, the kid's right, Doc. Ever since we made the circle and started back all these days, you've been acting as if we didn't make it. We've gone 243,000 miles, and we're three-quarters of the way back, and we're in, Doc. We're in. So what's the matter with you? How old were you, Major, when the Second World War ended? Oh, about five. What's that got to do? And you, Reynolds, you weren't even born. No, sir. I was 21 on that day in New Mexico when they set off the first chain reaction. 21. Doc, you mean to say you were in at the beginning of it? Of course he was. But Dr. Chamberlain was one of the original research men in the atomic bomb project back in 45. 
The only one of them alive today. Well, what do you know? So that's why you wanted to make this trip, Doc. I mean, you... Yes, Major. You wanted it as a substitution for what you missed as a boy. The excitement and glory of war. Oh, now, Doc. It's uh... true, and Reynolds here is young and idealistic. And the scientific wonder of it was what he wanted. And I... I was there at the birth of an era. Now atomic power is driving me into space, back to the Earth where it all began. And I'm thinking... Yeah, Doc? Let's not put in a twenty of this. We have no time to discuss our emotions. There's work to be done. Twenty-three four eighty-six. Interior temperature uh, sixty-eight point two. Interior temperature sixty-eight point two. Well, that's it. Yes. Any radio contact, Reynolds? No, sir. How about that, Doc? Unfortunate, but not very vital. We're definitely on course. How much longer will it be, Doc? Ten hours. At the most, ten hours. In the middle of LaGuardia Field. That's where I'd like to land. I hope not. Uh, Texas. Isn't that it? Sure, sure. We'll hit the flats right on the nose. If the auxiliary jets work. They worked on the moon. They'll work on landing. We're the good luck boys, Doc. We can't miss. <laughs> you have the optimism of a 16-year-old. Reynolds, you'd better get back to your radio. Try phone contact. Yes, sir. Major, check the jet temperatures. Uh, right jet, 1580. Right jet, 1580. Left jet, 1583. Left jet, 1583. Speed... 24832. Speed 24832. XR1 calling CQ. XR1 calling CQ. Hello, hello, hello. XR1 calling CQ. XR1 calling CQ. Hello, hello, hello. Any luck? No, sir. Put your transmitter back on automatic. Yes, sir. <laughs> Why do you laugh, Major? I was just thinking about how many millions of telescopes are turned in our direction. Yes? What you said a few hours ago. I mean, about my wanting the excitement and adventure. That's true, you know. I'm 60 years old, and I guess I just lived for this chance. The Army hadn't okayed my going. Well, here I am. Once we land, I'll admit, frankly, I'm going to cash in on every bit of it and have myself a time. You know something? I get to feeling kind of depressed when I think it'll soon be over. There's no reason for depression, is there? I couldn't answer that. Why not? And you've been wondering, undoubtedly, why ever since we left the moon, I've been acting strangely. That's right. I've never believed in predestination, and yet there's been sort of a motivation of fate in my life. At 21, I was part of that research team trying to adapt atomic power to military purposes. When that first bomb went off over the New Mexico desert, a newspaper man repeated the words, What hath God wrought? And no one quite knew. I've been waiting 55 years for the answer. I think I found it a few hours ago on the moon. And it's an answer full of horror. Oxygen valve. That's why you're yawning. Oh, yes, sir. Two points. Two points. Oh, the major's sure sleeping. Yes. It's only a few more hours, isn't it? Yes. Will we have to put on our compression suits the way we did on the takeoff? Yes, of course. Uh, Doctor, may may I ask you something? Yes. Uh, before. 
you spoke of finding an answer on the moon. And and then you didn't say any more. Well, I'd been thinking about it. I was wondering if it was something that the Major couldn't understand. And that's why you didn't speak of it further. And now you want to know. Yes, sir. I... I haven't lived anywhere as long as you two have, but my life has been built around atomic power. My dad, he was one of your men. Why, ever since I was a child, becoming a physicist like dad was and you are and Dr. Oppenheimer and all the rest, why, that was it. But now, all of a sudden, the way you spoke before, as if all our research has been criminal. Do you mean that? Do you... Collision. Radar. Get at it. What's the matter? What's the matter? Object approaching. Where? Where? Fifteen degrees west. There it is. Meteorite. It's a meteorite. It's all... Uh, uh, <sighs> that was the closest. Oh, it was indeed. Be sardonic indeed to collide with a meteorite at this point in our journey. I... I use a stronger word than sardonic, Doctor. Yeah, like fatal. It's all clear. Well, I... I'd better get back to No, my... Reynolds. Reynolds, you asked me a question before and I want to answer it. You too, Major Russell. I want you to hear this. Sure. Reynolds overheard what I said to you. That I'd found the answer to a very old question on the moon... He said that he felt that somehow I thought all of the research on atomic power had been criminal. No, oh, young man, I don't believe that. Not at all. Criminal to know more about a way of nature? No. And the answer I, I found was something else. I hadn't even an answer, perhaps only a theory. When we came within 100 miles of the moon and then began to de-accelerate, to turn back... What did we see through the observation ports? Well, Doc, we saw... No, just... please, let me tell you what I saw. The craters of the moon. Great, gigantic craters, and as we came closer and closer, the look of them was so familiar. Not because I had seen them through telescopes and in photographs, but for some reason that I, I couldn't quite understand. Craters of the moon, and suddenly, at the very moment when we'd come as close as we dared and our ship swung in an orbit to return, suddenly I knew... It was a memory of another crater I had seen 55 years before in New Mexico from an observation plane high over the ground a few hours after the first atomic bomb had lit the sky with a new sun. Yes. The crater in the crust of the earth that bomb had left was the same as the craters of the moon. Do you understand? The crater our bomb had left on the Earth was the same as the craters on the moon. So what? I don't get it. Yes, Doctor. What are you getting at? Why, the crater in that desert was a thousandth of the size of the ones you're talking about. I suddenly began to think. Was it not possible that the moon had gone through the same evolutionary processes as our Earth before our Earth? Yes. Wasn't it possible that men had come into being on the moon, developed their own civilization, had known scientific progress, even as we have, but long before we Earthmen had known it? Say, Doc! You do understand. These men of the moon had discovered the secret of atomic power long before we did, and then had used it to blast and to tear each other. Yes. And the craters on the moon, that terrible devastation, was the record of the destruction of their civilization. A final war which had burned up the very atmosphere and left the moon a dead planet circling endlessly through an airless sky. All right, Doctor. Presuming your theory is correct that, that the moon men had started through a war, a, a chain atomic reaction that they couldn't stop, well, what of it? It indicates that they were fools. Yeah, that's it. Fools. Are we any wiser?
Airspeed 2482. You'd better cut it down. Right. How much? About 15%. Right. You get anything, Reynolds? No, sir. Would you come here a moment? Yes, sir. Will you help me with this port covering? Yes, sir. Here they are. All right. Hey, you're going to take a look, huh? Yes, that's it. There she is. Mama Earth. Reynolds, the cameras? Yes, sir. How much should I run, Doctor? Put it on automatic exposure. Yes, sir. Six more hours, eh, Doctor? Or less. Sure we haven't made a mistake and headed for Venus. What are you? (laughs) It was just a bad joke, Doc. Now there's no two ways about it. The outline of the continents, we can't make any mistake about that being our home address. I wonder how much they can see of us. What are we, six, seven thousand miles out? You know, this reminds me of the time about 25 years ago. The Army sent me up to a thousand miles to take observation photographs. Well, you remember how the atomic reaction motors were then. We got up about 500 feet and... Major. What? What? Look down. Look. Hmm? What? Well, I don't see anything. Look, I tell you. Reynolds, come here. What's the matter? Something wrong? Well, the doctor says... There's Reynolds, something. look. Do you see? Yes. What is it? I see it, too. Bright lights going on and off. What's going on down there? Doctor, are they signaling us? Are they signaling? It's 6,000 miles. Why? Why should they? That's right. There's no such plan. Look at it. It is lights going on and off. But they're all from one area. Can you make out where? North America. Then they are signals. The candle in the window. Your own question. At 6,000 miles? Wait a minute. Are they explosions? Explosions? Major Doctor, is that it? Are they explosions? I don't know. CQ, CQ, hello, 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 CQ, CQ. Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor, I can't raise anyone. Doc, Doc, come here. Yes, but look, the closer we get, they are explosions. Three more hours, we'll know. I want to know now. Reynolds, what's the matter with you? Why can't you make radio contact? I'm doing everything I can. Major. Major. Uh, Doc, what are craters? Look. Craters. Craters? At this altitude, you couldn't possibly... After each flash... I do see them. Okay, okay. What does it mean? Well, what are you looking at me like that for? What does it mean? Dr. Major, something's coming through. Oh, it's well, about it time. I, I can only hear it faintly. What? What? Please, let me listen. United States. What? Uh, Reynolds, what is it? Tell us. What? Boy... I couldn't quite make up. Oh, he, he said... Said what? Tell us. War. He said war. Blasting the United States off the face of the earth. Blasting. The United... it, it's a joke, isn't it? Isn't it? Sending now. What now? It began an hour ago. No warning. Projectiles radio controlled. Point of origin unknown. Oh, it stopped again. The transmission. That's enough. Where's the international police force? What's being done about it? Doctor. Doctor, did you hear it was an attack without warning? Who could it be? What's the idea? 
The explosions are increasing in frequency. Reynolds! Reynolds, is there anything more coming through? No, nothing. I... Yes. Yes, they start a transmission again. All right, let's have it quick. Some station in Midwest. I can't get the call letters. Who cares? He says... It's hell. Ground shaking. No bombs landed near it, but air reconnaissance. It's so garbled I can hardly make out. Well, well. It started an hour ago. Everything burning. Oh, it stopped again. There's nothing. Doctor? Doctor, in heaven's name, what do you think it's all about? Stop staring out of the window and talk to me. What are they doing? What do you mean, what are they doing? They're bombing us, blasting us. It's war, but who? I've got to find out. Reynolds, find out who. What? It's no use. There's no transmission. Doctor, those bombs, where are they coming from? Can't you tell by the trajectory? At this distance? And what difference does the face of the enemy make? It, it, it's happening, that's all. Smashed them. I always said we should have smashed them. Exterminated them 50 years ago. Oh, they were so peaceful for so many years, and... The flashes are increasing in frequency. Reynolds, get on that radio. No, I'll try again. I've got to know who, the devils. We had agreements with everyone, the international devils, all of them. Call them devils, I don't even know who they are. Reynolds, you got anything? No, no, I don't. Doctor, faster, let's get down there faster. Let's open it up. You know better than that. We're entering atmosphere. Increased speed, we burn up like a meteorite. But I'm an army man. All my life I've been through. What? What? The bombs. Nothing. Can. I can hardly make it out. Keep at it. Panic. Paratroopers. Who? Who? Last message from United States of It's ended. There is no more. get down there faster. Only 500 more miles. Look at it down there. Our Air Force, protective measures. What happened to them? What happened? Doctor, you, why don't you say something? We'll just sit there for hours watching. This isn't a scientific experiment going on down there. They're blasting us to pieces. Us, us. Your atomic bombs, a great secret. Hold it over the world and have peace forever. You said that. Yes, you. I was a kid then. I heard you say it over the radio when they gave you a medal. Hold it over the world and have peace forever. Well, what do you got to say now? We had a wonderful 55 years. What? Everybody had a wonderful time. Reynolds, what's the matter with him? He's gone. No. Let him finish. First, we hung the criminals 55 years ago. And as soon as their body stopped swinging, we left the crowd and each went back to his own house and shut the door. You said the peace would hold forever. I... I said it because... I thought that when the secret was put away, the people of the world would remember the terror. I, I said to myself, now... Surely now that they've seen the possibility of the disintegration of their earth, they'll be drawn together once again into the... the family of men as it must have been in the beginning. I... I forgot what years could do. I forgot how quickly forgetfulness comes. I forgot that in only a few years, Hiroshima and Nagasaki would be only yesterday's sensations for a nation eager for sensations for today. You keep asking me who's sending those bombs against us. Who? I tell you, we're sending them against ourselves. Yes. Because had we made our way of life something more than a confused dream of shiny machines and happy endings, those bombs of hatred and revenge would not be flying at us. 
I said the peace would hold forever because I thought that out of that war at last men had learned that there was no defense against hatred and revenge, but the defense of education for the unity of people. It was a race, gentlemen, against time. And we wasted our last 55 years running backwards on a track of chromium and plastics. And so we've lost forever. No. We've never lost. Look, the blasts are increasing in frequency. There's nothing left. Nothing. We'll start someplace else. We'll build... Doctor, look. The color of the blast. Oh, dear God. What? What? Doctor, it's nitrogen, isn't it? Nitrogen? What? The fools, the everlasting fools, I warned them. The blast. More and more. They started something. They couldn't end the color of the blast. They've set off hydrogen atoms. I, I, I don't know what... We used uranium, plutonium, and when the initial blast was over, that was all. But hydrogen, that's part of life. One reaction sets off the other like setting off an endless chain until... Look down there. Blast. Faster and faster. They're spreading. The fools. God help the fools. God help the fools. The fools. <laughs> It happened. A sheet of flame around the earth. Doctor, tell me, what is it? What was it? Tell me. It burned up all the atmosphere. Burned up? Reynolds, what does he mean? The chain reaction burned up all the air. Oh, my. Major. Major, the left jet. It's all right. It's all right. All right. Where are we going? Can we go down there? There's no air, no life. The moon, the earth. The same. Uh, How much fuel? There's the gauge. Two, three hours? Yes. Yes, I think that's right. Isn't it, Major? Yeah. What? What do we do? You ask that question now? The Major no longer asks it. Do you know the answer, Major? Sure. We'll circle around. Then we'll crash. <gasps> no, 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 no. No, it'll be all right, my boy. My words again. Have peace forever. is Network Replay on Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, commander-in-chief of the Space Patrol! Now today's Space Patrol adventure, The Watchman of Warmont. On a recent voyage of exploration to the star Orion 14... 50,000 light years from the sun, Buzz and Happy discovered two planets. One called Gobonic is populated by human beings whose lives are completely controlled by electronic thinking machines and mechanical robots. The space patrollers saved one of these inhabitants from an attack by a robot. Now, after a brief flight back to Terra for supplies, Buzz and Happy have returned to Gobonic with their passenger Mono. The Terra 5 settles down in a valley hundreds of miles from the nearest city. Stand by for landing. Cut rockets. Hit repeller, ray. Eh? Yes, sir. Well, 
Carl. Here you are, Mono. Back on Kabonic. I'm deeply grateful. I don't know how safe you'll be with those robots looking for you. The robots seldom stray far from the city, unless they're directly on the trail of someone who has escaped. They don't use any kind of spacecraft or aircraft to search for you? No. Our only spaceships are the robot-controlled craft that take cargoes to the deserted planet. Oh, by the way, Mono, what do you call that planet? I believe it must be Warmark. At certain times of the year, a bright star moves across the night sky. Whether it is the same planet we visited in your ship, I cannot say. Oh, it must be. There's only one other planet circling Orion 14. You'd see it as a moving star against the fixed stars in your sky. I know you're anxious to explore, Warmark, for the mineral you're looking for, so I'll leave you now. All right. Hap, get that crate of space phones for Mono. Yes, sir. You remember how they operate, don't you, Mono? Yes, Commander. You want to be careful. Don't let these instruments get into the hands of the robots or the administrators. We'll be very careful, Commander. My first task will be to take one of these space phones to Anila in the city. Anila? Oh, that's the girl you told us about. But, Mono, how are you going to get to the city? I'll find a way. Here, Hap, I'll take the box. Okay, Mono. Careful, it's heavy. I've got it. Thank you. Open the hatch for him, Hap. Yes, sir. We'd like to give you more help, Mono, but we're outsiders. If we were to interfere actively, the administrators would turn the robots against us and also against large sections of your own people. Sure, they'd try to put down the revolt in a hurry. I understand. But with these spacephones placed with our sympathizers in the cities, we can tell the people the truth. We can tell them that half of all they produce is dumped on a deserted planet. Yeah, and when they hear that, they'll make the administrators change the robots. I'll open the outer hatch. Goodbye, Mono, and good luck. Goodbye, Commander. Goodbye, Happy, and thank you for everything. So long, Mono. Let's get ready to blast off, Hap. Yes, sir. I hope we've done the right thing. You mean about the space phones? Yes, the Gabonic administrators, like that fellow Rokna, aren't going to give up a good thing without a struggle. Well, they could still have a good thing if they listen to reason. A robot government is a form of dictatorship, Happy, and dictators aren't famous for listening to reason. Now, let's see what we're in for on Warmark. Close ports. Fire jets. Up, ship, and away. In the chief city of the planet Gobanic, a girl sits at a crude table in a small room writing. Yes. You're an administrator. Yes. I am Roknar, administrator of Class H functions and robot controls. And you are Anila. Yes, I, I'm Anila. Where is Mono? Mono? Yes, Mono. Your friend who works in the document reclamation plant. Where is he? Well, I don't know. That's the truth. I don't know. When did you see him last? Four days ago. We had lunch together in the fourth sector commissary. And you haven't seen him since? No. That's strange. You are such good friends. Have you wondered about him? Have you been worried? Yes. No. I haven't been worried. Why should I worry? You're lying. You know that Mono has escaped from the city. Escaped in it? No, I didn't know he'd escaped. But you knew he was going to try. You knew he was an aberrationist. An aberrationist? Apparently, you do not know that a few misguided individuals have that insane idea that they know more than the robots. They feel that they can improve upon the routine and regulations set down by the electronic computers. Mono did nothing wrong. Anila, are you an aberrationist? Well, are you? No. I've done nothing against the robots. That's good. Since you are loyal to the Gobanic control system, you will be happy to learn that Mono will never return to the city. You know where he is? Yes. I happen to witness his tragic fate. Oh, no. He has no one to blame but himself. He fled and was destroyed. What happened to him? His fate is too horrible to describe. Perhaps... You know some of his friends. People who may also be misguided. Perhaps you can keep them from making Mono's mistake. Oh, Mono. That's all, Anila. And I hope it will not be necessary to call on you again. 
Mona. Mona. Millions of DUs from Gobanic. Commander Corey brings the Terra 5 down on the huge spaceport of the deserted city on the planet Warmuck. The city is in ruins from a disaster that from all appearances occurred a century ago. Yet at regular intervals, robot spaceships from Gobanic land and dump their cargoes as they have for ages past. Mountains of unused supplies now almost cover the spaceport. Landing secured, sir. Okay, Hap. We'll stay in the ship till we make a thorough instrument check by spacephone, viewscope, and periscope. Oh, that city must be deserted, sir. There's no sign of life. Whatever or whoever wrecked the city sure did a thorough job. It looks that way. But if we're going to bring ships here from our solar system to mine super uranium, we want to be sure that Wormach is completely safe. Well, on our way back to Terra the last time, you said you thought robots might still be controlling Wormach. That's right. Well, but, sir... The city was destroyed years ago. What would keep the robots running? And if they're operating, where are they? Somewhere underground or in a partly wrecked building. Perhaps they're harmless. Perhaps they're not. It's our job to find out. Commander, there's a ship in the viewscope. It's one of the robot ships from Gabonic coming in with another cargo. It makes me sick just to think of it. The people of Gabonic working like slaves producing goods to dump here on Warmock. If Mona's successful, it'll be different, Hap. Empty ships will arrive from Gabonic and haul this stuff back to where it belongs. Well, I hope that'll be soon. Let's check the instruments, Hap. If you don't pick up any robot probe rays, we'll get out and look around after that robot ship takes off. For several hours, Anila has lain on her bed in her room, too stunned by grief even to think. Yes. Oh, no. Shh. Anila. Oh, you're alive. Oh, no, you're alive. Of course I'm alive. Oh, he told me something terrible had happened to you, that no one would ever see you again. Who told you? The administrator, Rokna. The administrator was here? Yes, but it doesn't matter. Now he's gone and you're safe. You've come back. Yes, but I can't stay. Listen, something wonderful has happened. I've got news that will free all of Gabonic from the robots. I've got proof that the robot control system is all wrong. With this little instrument here, we can broadcast that proof all over Gabonic. Oh, no, I've never seen you like this. So excited. Your eyes, there. Well, no, you've been through a terrible experience. Lie down and rest, and I'll... Listen to me, please. See this? It's a spaceophone. I can talk to our friends out on the farms hundreds of miles away. And they can talk to me here in the city. And the robots and the administrators will never know it. Watch. I'll show you how it works. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy have emerged from the spaceship and are working their way around the vast heaps of supplies toward the ruined city. Each is armed with a blast gun and carries a miniature spaceophone equipped with a translator. Well, so far, Warmock seems perfectly safe. No electronic control signals, no harmful radiation. Half yeah, hold it. Look up there, at the end of that big stack of supplies. It's an opening in the ground. Yes, but was it there a minute ago? Gee, sir, I don't know. I don't think so. Smoke and rockets. Look what's coming out of that hole. It's a giant beetle. It's a robot tank with legs and tractor treads. Well, whatever it is, it's a monster. And it's coming right toward us. Get back to the ship, Hap. Hurry. It's gaining on us. Commander Corey. Commander Corey, this is Mono in Gabonic City. It's Mono on the miniature space board. Commander, can you hear me? This is Mono. Yes, Mono. I can't talk to you now. Contact me in ten minutes. It's urgent, Commander. You've got to help me. Anila's in danger. Oh, whatever it is, I'll trade places with her. Hey, Commander, that robot's right behind us. Hey, it's closing in, Commander. We can't outrun it. Maybe we can hold it off a minute. There's a small space between those two stacks of supplies. Duck through the gap quickly. Yes, sir. We stopped it, sir. It can't get through the opening. Yeah, keep running, Hap. There may be other robots around. Hap, here comes one of those robot ships from Gobanic. Hey, we're right in this landing pad. Get away from this stack of supplies. It's probably going to dump its cargo right here. Commander's going to smash us. Hit the dirt, Hap. Oh, that was close. Look, 
Beetle shaped robots plowing through that stack of supplies. Oh, it's on our trail again, sir. You'll never make it to our ship. I don't mow us down before we can get a hundred yards. Cap, run for the other ship. Hurry. Great. The robot will attack that. Into the cargo hatch. Quick before it closes. Yes, sir. Oh. Oh. Hey, it worked. The robot stopped. Maybe our blast guns will put it out of commission. Whoever built that giant watchdog must have put teeth in it. If we attack it, it'd probably blow this whole ship apart. Sanders, the, the hatch closed. We're trapped. Well, at least we're safe from that elephant-sized beetle. Oh, we're out of one jam, and we're in another. This ship will take us back to Gabonic. Well, here we go, Hap. Relax and enjoy the trip. What happens when we set down on Gobanik? Uh, we'll stay in the ship. Then when it returns to Warmark with another load, we'll make a dash for the Terra 5 before the mechanical watchman wakes up. Commander Corey, can you hear me? Hey, it's Mono. I'd forgotten all about him. Uh, Corey here, Mono. Sorry I couldn't talk to you before, but we were a trifle busy. I was afraid you'd deserted me. I'm at Anila's place in the city. Yes? But there's a robot patrol in the streets. Rognar suspects something. If I leave now, the robot will follow him in. Rognar will arrest Anila. He'll find the space phones. If you can't help me, Commander, everything will be lost. I'd help you if I could, Mona, but there's nothing I can do. I thought of something, Commander. I may be able to get Anila out of the city. If you could pick us up in your ship before the robots track us That's down... That's just the trouble, Mono. I don't have my ship. What? I'm in a robot freighter bound for Gobanik. I'll have to ride out a round trip back to Wormach to get my own ship. But it may be hours or even days before that ship will be reloaded for blastoff. Days? Smoking rockets. All right, Mono. Pappy and I... Get to Anila's place and decoy the robots. You two could escape, right? Yes, Commander. It would give us a chance. Now, could Happy and I return to the spaceport and stow away in an outbound freighter without being caught? For a human being to get aboard a spaceship? Well, it's such an unheard of idea on Gabonic that the robots may not even be adjusted to detect it. Good. Now, what about our space patrol uniforms? Won't they attract attention when we walk down the streets of the city? I never thought of that. Of course they will. You'll be picked up as a non-conforming aberrationist. Well, uh, how can we get some Gobonic-style clothes? The work barracks at the port. During a shift, there'll be no one in the barracks. If you could sneak in without being seen, you could find some off-duty clothes. Okay. Now, Mono, give me the exact layout of the spaceport and how to find Anila's place. And the safest way to avoid the robot patrols. Tensely, Buzz and Happy crouch in the empty cargo hold as the robot ship sets down at the spaceport on Gobonic. A few seconds after landing, the cargo hatch automatically opens. Cautiously, the space patrollers peer out of the ship. No one in sight, sir, except clear over there. Over there where they're loading. That long, rambling structure down there must be the work barracks. Let's go, Hap, and keep on the far side of this row of ships. Yes, sir. Is our first real test, Hap. The barracks. I sure hope there's nobody in there goofing off. Have your ray gun ready. Right. Hey, we're in luck. It's deserted. There along the wall, Hap. Those racks of clothing. Yeah, with the numbers over them. Well, I guess they're numbers. Find a pair large enough to go over uniform, Hap. These look about right. Huh? Hey, is that an alarm? Maybe the signal for change of shift. Hurry, get into your outfit. This barracks will be swarming in a minute. In Anila's dimly lighted room some distance from the spaceport, the girl and Mono wait in anxious silence for a message from Commander Corey. The moments drag on. Then finally, Mono speaks. I should never have tried to involve the commander in our troubles. I was a fool to think they could make it. Mono, come to the window. What is it? They're gone. The robot patrol's gone. The street's deserted. Rope and I must have given up, at least for the time being. If I hadn't involved the commander in this, we could escape, but at least out of the city. Shh. I heard steps outside. In the hall. Hide those space phones quickly. I'll put them under the bed. I'll help you. There. It might just be the woman from down the hall. She sometimes comes. All right, you know. Don't move. Rope now. 
Administrator Roknar, if you please. Both of you, you are coming with me. No. No, not Anila. She hasn't done anything wrong. She's shielding an aberrationist, an escapee. Now, stand over there and by the wall so I can keep an eye on you while I search this room. You won't find anything here, Rognar. Better get a couple of your robot bodyguards to help you. By the way, where are they? They are waiting around the corner, near my surface car. You'll see them when we go to the discipline center. Discipline center? You can't take Anila there. I tell you, she hasn't done anything. Shut up. And get over by the wall, as I told you. Don't argue with him, Mono. It doesn't matter. If he takes you, I want to go, too. You shall, Anila, you shall. Now, let me see. Where would the twisted mind of an aberrationist attempt to hide something? Oh, yes. <laughs> Under the bed, of course. Commander Corey! Don't pull that gun, Rope, not... Wow, what a punch. Nice going, Commander. Pat, get Rooknar's weapon. Yeah. Yes, sir. You gave very clear directions, Mono. Oh, uh, the young lady, I suppose, is your friend, Anila. Oh, yes. Uh, excuse me. Anila, this is Commander Corey and Cadet Happy. Oh, how do you do? Here's Rooknar's gun, Commander. And this other thing. I don't know what it is, but it was fastened to his belt. Oh, thanks, Happy. What is this thing, Mono? Do you know? D- be careful. Don't touch any of those buttons. That's a robot control unit. Oh, how does it work? I've never seen one up close before. Only administrators have them. There's some lettering over the switches. Perhaps I could figure it out. I'm sorry. It's not in regular Gabonic. It's administrative code. Perhaps I can decipher it. I've operated computers that use this code. Good. Here, Anila. This control unit is for Z-type ARG robots. Oh, the Zargs. Yeah, the robots that look like human beings. Yes. This switch is a zone alarm control... Bring all Z-type robots toward the unit if it's pressed. Uh Uh-oh. We don't need that one. The second switch cuts in the command circuit to give specific orders to individual robots. Could either of you give orders to a robot? No. There are certain key words only the administrators know. And this third button, that's the proximity nullifier switch. A which switch? It cancels the impulses that are causing a robot to act. If the robot is near, it will stop. Could you get by any robot patrol or robot guard with that gadget? Well, most of them. Except perhaps those at the higher levels at the administrative headquarters. Good. Perhaps see if they can revive Roknar. They'll make him drive all of us to the spaceport. All of us? Yes. We can control Roknar with his own gun. And the robots with this gadget. I think Roknar's waking up, sir. Okay, get him on his feet. You and Mono keep his gun in his ribs and I'll handle the robot control. Anila, the space phones. Yes, I'll get them. Come on, Roknar, get up. You're going for a ride. Feeling the gun pressed against his back, Ropnar, the administrator, meekly accompanies Buzz and his friends down the stairs to the street and around the corner where three human-looking robots stand motionless by a surface car. Buzz presses the third button on the control unit and the robots remain rigid as Happy forces Ropnar behind the wheel. The others get in, then Buzz orders... All right, Ropnar, to the spaceport. Let's get going. You won't get away with this, Corey. Don't try any tricks. And drive carefully. Yeah, Roknar. The life you save may be your own. The reluctant Roknar drives through the city to the spaceport. As the car glides through the gate, Buzz presses the control switch and the robot guard stands motionless. Buzz forces Roknar to halt the surface car in the dark shadow of the stack of supplies. A few yards away loom the dim hulks of empty spaceships waiting to be moved to the loading area. It's all clear, Commander. No one's in sight. All right. Everybody out and get aboard the nearest ship. You too, Roknar. No. I can't leave Gobanek. It's unthinkable. Nobody's asking you to think. Anyway, isn't thinking just for robots? You're getting in that ship if we have to carry you. Get going. Let's go, Anila. Riding a spaceship, this is exciting. You're mad. All of you completely mad. Mad, I tell you, you're mad. Completely mad. Half carrying the terrified Roknar between them, Buzz and Happy move swiftly to the spaceship, followed by Mono and Anila. Climbing through the open cargo hatch, they work their way forward into a cramped compartment. After a seeming eternity, the ship is towed to the loading platform, and the cargo hold is crammed with supplies. As the hatch clangs shut, Buzz and Happy instinctively brace themselves for the shock of blastoff. When the ship is spaceborne, Buzz leads the others back toward the cargo hold. Working in the dark, 
they tie Roknar with strips torn from his jacket. Hours pass. And then... The repeller ray just cut on. We're setting down on Warmuck. Warmuck? Sure. That's where your stupid robot system has been sending half the wealth of your planet. Didn't you know? I didn't know where it went. That wasn't in my department. Listen, everybody. When the ship lands, the cargo hatch will automatically open and the cargo will be dumped out. Now, wait till I get the signal. Then jump out of the ship and follow Happy and me. Understand? Yes, Commander. I understand. Now, remember, when I give the word, move fast. Yes, sir. What about me? You got me tied up? You're going back to Gobanik in this ship. We just brought you along to make sure we'd get here. Yeah, you'll be able to work free of those bonds long before you get back to Gobanik. This is going to be noisy. What did I tell you? All right, let's go before that hatch closes. Give me your hand, Anila. There's Terra 5 right over there. Let's go. Bon voyage, Rockner. Commander, Commander, there it comes, old Beetlepuss again. What is it? It's a robot. It looks like some giant insect. Now don't look back. Just keep running. We're nearly to the ship. Commander, it's gaining on us. Get him aboard, Hap. Be ready to blast off. Quick, Anila, up the ladder. You're next, Mono. Into the ship. That monster, it's big enough to crush this ship. Get aboard, Hap. Gonna try to hold this robot off with a blaster. Commander, if you miss it, it'll go for you. Get dead, you've got passengers aboard. Prepare to blast off. That's an order. <laughs> Nice shot, Commander. You stopped it. I always wondered how those old-time big game hunters felt when they were charged by a rhinoceros. Now I know. You must have blasted that robot right in the control center. I sure hope that's the last of the robots here on Warmuck. You've given me courage, Commander. Now I know that the robots can be conquered. Good, Mono. You've got a real battle on your hands back in Gobanik. The other ship with Roknar and is gone. Yeah. Yeah, it blasted off while we were being chased by that iron beetle. Let's get back to Gobanik. I think Mono wants to get to work and show those robots who's boss. Join us again next week for another thrilling adventure with Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander in Chief of the Space Patrol! This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. fiction serial in seven parts by Victor Pemberton, with Morris Denham and Roger Delgado. The Slide, episode two, Down Came a Blackbird. Redlow Newtown has suffered a series of earth tremors. In nearby Holly Mill Lane, Dr. Richards and Inspector Baxter find mud seeping out of the vast fissure in the middle of the road. They immediately telephone the news to M.P. Hugh Deverell. Uh, 
Oh. Uh, Redwell 306, hello. Yes, Deborah speaking. Mm. Hmm? Oh, Inspector, do you know what time it is? It's six o'clock in the morning. Well, of course I'm in bed. Where do you think I am? What? What has? What is it, darling? Where are you sure? Well, is there any danger of it? Oh, well, there is. What is it, Hugh? Shh. Well, uh, I suppose we'd better get somebody down there. Darling, tell me. Anna, will you please wait? Yes, Look, Inspector, have you notified Professor Gomez and the others? Well, then please do so right away. I'll try and get down as quickly as possible. Right. Yes, yes. Oh, damn. What's the matter, Hugh? Oh, you got some trouble at Holly Mill Lane. Mud overflowing from the crack in the road. Mud? Mm, or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, oh, six o'clock in the morning. Where's it coming from? Hasn't been raining, has no, it? No, I don't think so. Well, have you seen my pullover, the green one? Uh, middle drawer. Well, ah, yes. Uh, how serious is it, then? Oh, uh, it's been gushing out all night, apparently. But all the way along? Oh, Baxter exaggerates. Oh, that fish is about a hundred yards long. It'll take them days to get the mess cleared up. Well, the slide's going to reach the Wilson farmhouse. It backs onto the lane. Slide. Yeah, down the hill. Hill? The mud has been sliding down the hill from the fissure. There isn't a hill. Huh? Oh, don't be stupid, please. I tell you, there isn't a hill. Holly Mill Lane's as flat as a pancake. I've been along there dozens of times. Well, then you couldn't have noticed. You see. Oh, Hugh. Hmm? Don't go. Look, I have to go. Very well, then go. Oh, darling, I have to go. You know that. You don't think I like going out in the middle of the night, dear? Leaving you here like this? I don't know. Well, I'll show you then. Mm. <sighs> Convinced? Don't be long, Hugh. I hate being on my own. Oh, just half an hour, dear. Hugh? Yeah? I don't care what you say. Holly Mill Lane isn't on a hill. It's as flat as a pancake. Yes, of course it is, my dear. Of course it is. Oh, it's no good. It's just like chipping away at stone. It's a, it's a hell of a job even to get a few pieces. I simply can't believe this was mud. Inspector, last night you told us that this was a slide. Well, last night it was, sir. Right up till dawn, just before you came. I went into Mr. Wilson's to phone you. When I came back, this is how it was. But it mm. couldn't possibly have dried up in so short a time. And look at it now. It's a solid mess. All I'm telling you, sir, is that when we came up here last night, we got the shock of our lives. The mud pouring out of that crack like nothing I've ever seen before. Right up there, by that first group of trays. Look, Inspector, can you remember what it looked like? Hmm? Well, was it the sort of mud you'd expect to find after a, a downfall of rain? No, sir. No, sir, it wasn't. It was filthy stuff. It's all the stuff you get out of a volcano. Like, uh, like lava? Yes, sir. It was bubbling, moving. But what I hated most of all was that noise. Noise? Yeah, sort of slithering, squeaking. What do you make of it, John? No, I'm dashed if I know, really, the... The thing that gets me is this color, this overall green. It could be an iron content. Yes, it could, but I've never come across it so distinctly in this part of the country before, and certainly not down here. And look, look, you see these long, thin streaks? They're, yes. they're a different color to the rest of the formation. You see, at first glance, it looks like a, a dried-up mud bank or something, but... Wherever does it come from? Under normal conditions, this sort of thing would, would take years to form. Yes, the soil has obviously been swamped by a vast amount of water. Maybe an underground stream. Well, if it has, it's happened beneath the surface of the earth. It's as dry as a bone up here. But how can mud harden into stone almost instantaneously? Robert, mm -hmm. you remember the year I did my channel survey? Yes, yes, indeed. Can you remember any seismograph readings for the British Isles about that time? Well, I know there was something on the French side, yeah. but nothing very much. If you want, I could get London to send me down some photostats. Could you do that, please? Of course. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Oh, well. Hmm. How the devil are we going to get rid of all this stuff? Well, I've been in touch with R.E.F. Redlow, sir. The station commandant says he's quite willing to let us have a few men if we get hold of some equipment. Well, what do you need? Uh, electric drills. Got to try and break up the stuff. 
Anyway, I'm all in favour of getting it sealed off before people start drifting around. Very well, do what you can. Yes, sir. Well, Professor Gomez, what do you make of all this? At the present moment, nothing. Huh? But have you ever seen anything like this? Well, where does the mud come from? Mr. Deverell, this is the epicentre of the tremors felt in this area. One cannot expect a fracture of the Earth's crust to go unnoticed. Geological disturbance of some description was inevitable. Look, I'm and... quite aware of that, Professor. I merely asked if you knew what was causing it. We have a feeling there's an underground river or stream. At this stage, it's very difficult to tell. With your permission, we should like to start a series of investigations. Well, go right ahead. The sooner the better. But uh, we would prefer these investigations to be carried out with the maximum secrecy. Uh, yes, we don't want to start a panic. No, no. But isn't the real danger over now? The mud has dried up. Once we've sealed the fissure, we shall just... Mr. Deverell, we have no guarantee that such a thing will not happen again. What do you mean? The mud might start again? Unfortunately, nature's ways are unpredictable until proved otherwise. She's like a naughty child. We don't know how to treat her until we know what is wrong. Ah. As it is flat, isn't it? I beg your pardon? Well, this lane, Anna was right. It's not on a hill, nor even an incline. Uh, no, no, I suppose it's not. I hadn't really thought about it. Why? Well, I can understand the mud sliding along the flat surface here, but how is it capable of sliding up the bank of the lane? That's all, gentlemen. Good shot, Tug. Good shot. Go on, Mickey. Go on, boy. Fetch him. Fetch him. <laughs> Number of years I've been shooting rabbits on this land, and still I can't seem to get rid of them. Not even with myxomatosis. Oh, it's so... so quiet, isn't it? Huh? What is, Doctor? Well, everything. The whole atmosphere. It's unnatural. You know, it's the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. What is? Why, Holly Mill Lane. Why, the earth can just be ripped apart in a matter of seconds. Mm. It cut through that road like like a tin opener. And that mud pouring out of it like nothing a man's ever seen before. Ah, here comes Mickey. Here, boy. Here. Come on, Mickey. Now, what's he got in his mouth? That's not a rabbit. Give it here, boy. That drop. Uh, oh, no, you don't. Be boy, it's a, it's a bird. A blackbird. Quite a big one. Has he killed it? No, don't think so. There aren't any marks on it. And it couldn't have been your bullet. That's funny. I didn't think it was the dog. He don't usually go after wild fowl. He's much too docile. Oh, wait a minute, Tug. Do you remember a little while ago, soon after we left your place, didn't I tell you I thought I saw something drop from the sky? Yeah, that's right. I didn't hear a bullet shot, did you? No. Anyway, who wants to kill a blackbird? Yes. Who? So glad you called, Inspector. And there we are. It's none of my business, you understand, but I wouldn't be doing my duty if I didn't keep you fully informed. I quite understand, Mrs. Luke, and I do appreciate it. Uh, will you take one or two lumps? Uh, no, sugar. Thank you very much. It was that terrible old man, you see, the one you're looking for. There you are, and I'm not surprised. Oh, Ted, the farmer. Yes, that's the fellow. What an unkempt person he is. I told him so, you know, many a time. You've seen him then, madam? Uh, of course. Well, when was this? First thing this morning. Oh. I was on my bicycle on the London Road. Tuesday is always my day to go into Redlow Market. Uh, yes, but it's I... about the only time I can leave my dear mother on her own, especially after all those awful earth shakes. Yes, of course. So, uh, he was walking along the London Road, was no. he? No, 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 no. I was on the London Road. He was in Holly Mill Lane. Holly Mill Lane? Are you sure? Absolutely sure. As I looked down, there he was, straggling along like the nasty old drunk he is. He always was a one for the bottle, you know. Mm. Anyway, I was terrified he was going to walk right into that dreadful crater thing. It was straight ahead of him. He'd have fallen in. Well, what did you do? I called out. And did he hear you? Not at all. He didn't even look round to see who it was. So I got off my bicycle, ran up to him, and tapped him on the shoulder. And he stopped? Yes, yes, he stopped. It wasn't until that moment I realized something was wrong. Wrong? For a moment we just stood there until gradually he turned round to face me. His face... Yes? It was yellow, so tired and drawn. He looked so old. But most of all was his eyes. They they looked strange somehow. 
Did he say anything? Yes, he gave me a vicious look and said, Go away, go away, and mind your own business. For one terrible moment, I, I thought he was going to hit me. But he didn't. No, no, he just turned his back on me and walked off. Thank goodness, at least he went in a different direction, away from the lane. Now, which direction, Mrs. Luke? Can you remember? Across the field to the back of Mr. Wilson's farm. Thank you. Inspector... What is wrong with that old man? He couldn't have been drunk all this time, could he? Is he ill or something? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Luke, but thank you very much for your information. You'll be most helpful. As soon as we know any more, we'll keep you advised. Oh, no, 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 Inspector, don't go. There's something more. Yes? What it, is it? It was horrible. I, I noticed it as he was walking away. A poor little thing, so cruel, so, so very cruel. Fancy wanting to go and kill a pigeon. A poor little... Wood pigeon. Dead as a donor. Hmm. It's still warm. Someone's been amusing himself. I'd like to know who. What, you mean you think someone's been putting down poison? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Doug, got a handkerchief on you? Uh, yes, I think so. Here you are. Uh, thanks. What are you going to do? I'm going to take a couple back. I want to know what's been going on. Uh. Hey, Doug. Uh. Keep still. Stay where you are. Hey, wh wh what's it? Get over here. Someone's coming. Quick. Uh. It'll be interesting to see what will. Hey, keep down. Here they come. Doc, do you see who it is? Look, can you see? Keep down. Hey, but can you see who it is? That's Mary. That's my wife, Mary. You know, I'm very surprised. I had no idea the British were capable of such a radical plan. Oh, yes, they're pretty with it down here, all right. I'd give my right arm to send my kids to a school like this. In fact, I could do with a laboratory like this for myself. Oh, think yourself lucky, my friend. You should come to Santiago sometime. You've never really forgiven us, have you, Joseph? Forgiven you for what? Well, we gave you a pretty lousy deal. Oh, don't oh, think I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that I was the blue-eyed boy who believed everything you said about that channel survey, but... Now, my dear John, I am a South American. We Latins were noted for our excitable nature. Oh. Eh? <laughs> no, no, I don't blame anyone for not believing me. What I knew, particularly at that time, it must have taken some believing, I know that. What do you believe, Joseph? I believe we are reaching a significant era in the history of the Earth's surface. What it is, as yet I don't know. But maybe if we have a look at that mud sample of yours, we'll find out, eh? Joseph! Uh, Joseph! Oh, my dear fellow, we've got to work fast. Yes, somebody had better do something before the whole country shakes to pieces. Well, why? What is wrong? Well, the same thing's happened. I've just been on the phone to London. They've now had some earth tremors in the north. What? Where? The Lake District and in Scotland. The water on Lake Belvedere was set in motion for nearly a minute. Apparently there's been absolute chaos. Any fractures in the soil? Oh, we're just waiting to hear. The shocks were felt as far away as the Shetland Isles. Oh, Joseph, what do you think this means? I'm not sure. But well, not sure... Well, what do you mean you're not sure? All I can tell you is that this appears to be part of a pattern. A pattern? Yes. First of all, the seabed in the English Channel. Then, the immediate south, here. And now, tremors in the north. Well, does that mean that we can expect more of these disturbances? Mr. Deverell, the first man who is able to foretell the exact place where the earth will shake will be a very rich man indeed. Hmm. Hey, Joseph, come and have a look at this. Why, what is it? The sample, well, it's burnt a hole in my briefcase. Burnt? Be careful, don't touch it. When I tried, it was like getting a hold of dry ice. Here, let's tip it out onto the table. Now, careful, careful now. Now, let's have a look. It's a bright green, extraordinary. Well, it could be the fluorescent lighting in here. In a way, it's really rather beautiful to look at. Like a precious stone. Oh, God, I can't God. understand it. Those streaks running through. Now, I remember where I've seen this before. We have a rocky beach just south of Valparaiso in Chile. I saw this type of thing soon after the earthquake in 1960. But, Joseph, this isn't rock. It's a definite mud formation. Yes. These streaks are usually part of a mechanical corrosion or, or something rather like a static type. In fact, look, I, I've seen this before myself in various parts of the Pennines. Well, couldn't this be the same thing? Mr. Deverell, stalactites are a formation which take, in some cases, thousands of years to corrode. Gentlemen, I'm going to London. Now, where can we reach you, sir? I shall either be at my club or at the house. And gentlemen, whatever you do, just do it quickly. I want Redlow to survive. 
I'm afraid we had to move Miss Marshall from the main ward, Doctor. She was beginning to disturb the other patients. But is she still delirious? Well, apparently, but it's so terribly difficult to tell. Mm. She's just lying there, mumbling to herself the whole time. Well, the extraordinary thing is, about an hour ago, one of the patients in the next bed told her she, she sat up, looked around the ward, and then just slumped back again. What? I suppose it is a form of concussion. What did Dr. Robson say? He sent for Mr. Furman. He's coming down from London in the morning. Uh, have you been able to make out anything she's been saying? No, not a thing. Just this awful sort of rambling. Oh, what a terrible shock for you, Doctor. You're due to be married shortly, aren't you? Uh, yes. I'm just amazed there weren't any more injuries. Most of the people they brought in were fairly old. Poor things. They're absolutely bewildered. Ah, uh, this is the room, Doctor. Thank goodness she seems to be fairly quiet. Janet. Janet, darling, can you hear me? It's me, Ken. I, uh, I don't think she can hear you. What's her temperature? Quite normal. Blood's just a fraction low, but I don't think it's anything to... Doctor, look, look, she's opening her eyes. Janet, can you hear me, darling? She, she's wide awake. She must be. Life, 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 it's life. She's closed her eyes again. She must be having a nightmare. Life? I wonder what she meant. Sister, hmm? I shall be at Mr. Wilson's farmhouse tonight. If there's any change in her condition at all, I want you to telephone me immediately. Yes, I don't care when it is, but I want to know. What are you digging this time of night? He's dead, that's why. Hmm? The dozy thing is dead. No good to us now, Mickey. Oh, your, your dog, Mickey. Well, what happened? I don't know and I don't care. All I know is he's dead and the sooner I get rid of him, the better. And now look, Tug, this can't go on. What with those birds and the rabbit and that? Did you speak to your wife? Yeah. I spoke to her. What was she doing out there in those woods? She was looking. Looking? Looking for what? Just looking. Now, don't be damn stupid, man. She was up to something. You know she was. And you listen to me, Dr. Richards. Don't start going around flinging accusations at folks. Oh, Chug, listen to me. If somebody's been using poison to kill off animals, I want to know about it. I want to know why and for what reason. She didn't put down no poison. Not my Mary. How do you know that? Because if she did, she must have been kept pretty busy. Look. You just take a walk over that field, Doctor. It's like a graveyard. Dead birds, dead squirrels, dead rabbits, dead field mice. What? Yeah, and this is where I found the dog. Just lying there in a heap. Oh, well. Maybe he's better off. This is a pretty rotten world we have to live in. Excuse me! Hmm? Hmm? Uh, Excuse me! Uh, yes! Uh, I'm sorry to trouble you. I'm looking for Dr. Richards. Uh, I'm Dr. Richards. Oh, Doctor. I'm sorry to trouble you, sir. They told me I could find you here. Hmm? A, a few of us have been exploring the caves. We're camped just up the road at Holly Crag. We could do with your help, Doctor. There's been an accident. Accident? Or at least we think there has. A couple of our blokes went down this morning. It was only supposed to have been a routine job, but I'm afraid they've met with some sort of trouble. Huh? One of them took a tumble, but we're not quite certain how bad. The other bloke said he's in too much pain to move him, so we thought we'd better get hold of you. Uh, how do you know about this? Well, we were in radio contact up until a while ago, but the transistor's flaked out on us. Oh, we don't know what's going on down there. Right, I'll get my things. Oh, that's very good of you, Doctor. And I'll come with you. Nobody knows them caves better than what I do. Yes? Uh, can I come in? Mrs. Deverell. I saw the light as I was passing. I thought it was you. Well, aren't you having any sleep tonight? Oh, I have to work. We're waiting for some equipment to arrive from London. It looks very odd in there. That small piece of stone in a huge glass tank. Mm. It's the school aquarium. We had to borrow it. What does it all mean, mud turning to stone like that? Uh, who knows, Mrs. Deverell? All we can do is to try and find out. He's pushing you very hard, isn't he? My husband. Your husband is a strong-willed man, Mrs. Deverell. Do you hate him? Oh, 
hate is for non-thinkers. I don't hate anybody. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that I have to respect them. You mustn't blame him, you know. He had to fight his own principles to bring you here. It wasn't exactly an easy decision for me to come here. Yes, I know. He was wrong about you, Joseph. But then he's often wrong about people. I suppose that's why he doesn't love me. I, uh... Oh, don't be embarrassed. Everybody knows. He's a lot older than me. We knew it wasn't going to be easy. Unfortunately, I'm just beginning to realize. Mrs. Deverell, I <laughs> Marriage think... is such an overestimated institution, don't you think? It cuts you down to size. Like those new town citizens out there. Look, Mrs. Deverell... You know... You're very really young to be a professor. I always thought professors had white hair and long beards. At least most of the ones I've met have. But I think I you... think maybe you should go home, Mrs. Devil. It's getting late. Oh, oh, Joseph, get your coat on quickly. Oh, Robert, what's the matter? The lane, my dear fellow, is absolutely fantastic. The lane? Holly Mill Lane, the fisher. It's swamped with mud. The whole place is slithering with the stuff. What? Mud? <laughs> It's dried up. I thought the whole thing was as hard as iron. At the present moment, Mrs. Devil, they've got half the men from the RAF station fighting to push it back. It's bursting out of the fissure all along the way, and, and the noise. Oh, Joseph, I don't think they're going to be able to hold it. I just don't think they can do it. Now, give me your hand, Doctor. Thanks. Keep your back well into the wall. Okay. Just coming up to Rich now. <laughs> Are you all right? Oh, yes. Okay. Hey, this is quite something, isn't it? Hey, it's some of the best stalactite formations on the entire crag. It's possible they were started in the Neolithic period. Neolithic? Do you mean you think there was a dwelling or something down there? If you'd like to have a look over here, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Wilson, could you turn your lamp this way, please? Oh, uh, thanks. You see here, these carvings. Good Lord, yes. The three figures. This shape here is a man, and, and a, a woman here, and, and just behind, the child. It, it looks as though they're turning their backs on something. Aye, whatever it is, they're scared out of their wits. They've got a photo repro of it in uh, the Dover Museum. Oh, by the way, um, have you looked down below? Oh, yes. Now, they're stalagmites, aren't they? Aye, that's right, but they're only babies here. But give them a few more thousand years. They're beautiful. But what a fantastic colour, that brilliant green. It, it's amazing how it stands out down here. Almost luminous. Hey, I can hear running water. Aye, that's the waterfall. Our blokes are quite near there. And we should be able to call out soon. It's quite a narrow ledge along here, so keep close, Doctor. Oh, well, you needn't worry about that. I'm right behind you. Can't you block it over at the other end? It's impossible, sir. Uh, as fast as we shovel and mud, another lot slides right back again. You've got to be so careful, sir. If you get any on your hands, it burns like mad. It, it keeps sticking to the shovel. Well, how far has it reached up there? Can you tell me? I should say about five or six feet, sir. The squad leader sent back for some more help. He's going to try and get over a couple of bulldogs. Oh, excellent. Oh, thank you very much, Corporal. Just do your best. Very good, sir. Hey, come on, you bloods, get a move on there. Robert, we're now, going to need some barriers here. Do you think you can get someone to do something about it? Uh, Johnny will have to do something about it. If this mud spreads any further, it will reach the farmhouse. Well, Joseph, I've never seen anything like this before in my whole life. For heaven's sake, what is it? We have to face the fact that there is something forcing the mud out from the root of the fish oil. As soon as we've been able to find what... Yes, yes, but this terrible noise... Yes, I know, I know. But we can't do anything until we've analyzed the mud sample. Joseph... There must be an acid content of some sort. The soil and the grass are being scorched right the way through. John, how deep is the mud? Can you tell? No more than the nine or ten inches at its deepest point. Look, do you think we could separate? How do you mean? Well, divide it into sections. Then we could clear each one at a time. Well, if that's the point, those bulldozers should be here soon. As you clear each section, cover the fish with boards and then put on it some heavy weight. No, that's not good. The boards would burn through. We've already tried. Well, then you have to use metal. Metal? Metal or stone or anything you could lay your hands on. The main thing is to seal up that fissure as quickly as we can. Joseph, what happens if it rains? Well... This makes things worse. It's very thundery. It rains. It feels as though it might. Rain. Yes, maybe it will rain. Barry! Barry! Keith! Are you there? Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, John. What is it? The leg? Yeah, yeah, the right one. I think it's broken. Where have you blokes been, then? Stay where you are. We've got the doctor. Uh, somebody's got my bag, please. Yeah, here we are. Oh. Todd, help me tear the trouser leg. Quick. Yeah. All right. No, be careful. Good. Now, does this hurt? Here. Sorry. Where's Keith, then? He's gone. Gone? What do you mean, gone? Gone. Gone, gone. What's the matter with you? Tell you the meaning of the words. He's gone. Dead. Dead? Barry, what the hell are you saying? He went over the edge there. There was nothing I could do about it. If you'd got here earlier, it wouldn't have happened. Who did it happen? But Keith looked round for a place for me to rest up a bit. Oh, be careful, Doc. Oh, sorry. We got as far as the waterfall, so we pitched down. We hadn't been here more than ten minutes when we heard someone coming. Down the ridge there. I thought it was you. Who was he? A bloke. An old bloke. How old? At least 80, if not more. Okay, I couldn't possibly be. He'd never have got down here on his own, not a man of his age. Uh, did he say anything? That's just it. He tried to speak to him, but he wouldn't say a word. Just kept right on walking. Walking until he reached the edge. Edge? And then he stopped. I remember his eyes. A bright blue. That kid, all right. They, they just fixed you with a stare. He gave me the creeps. And then? Then he started to sway about. Well, Keith rushed over and tried to grab him. But then suddenly, for no reason at all, the little boy started lashing out at him. Like a maniac he was. Well, it turned into a fight. Keith did his best to... Well, I shouted. But I was stuck here. I couldn't move an inch. But they both fell. Together. But the old boy... He had every intention of jumping. He wanted to, that I'll swear. Barry, now what age was this? Do you mean by the water? <laughs> water? <laughs> Take your lamp. Go and look for yourself. No, not that way. Over there. No, don't go too far. Now, stand with your back to the wall. Now, look down. I can't even see anything. It all looks complete. Oh, my. Doctor, you better come over here. Come and take a look at this. That was episode two of The Slide by Victor Pemberton, with Morris Denham as Hugh Deverell, MP, and Roger Delgado as Joseph Gomez. The part of Professor Landers was played by Rolf Lefevre, Dr. Ken Richards by David Spencer, Anna Deverell by Marion Mathy, and Professor Lippert by Alan McClelland. Inspector Baxter, Jeffrey Matthews, Tug Wilson, Stephen Jack, Mrs. Luke, Noel Hood. Nursing sister, Eva Haddon, Janet Marshall, Elizabeth Proud. Sorensen, Fraser Carr, RAF Corporal, Anthony Hall. Barry, Glyn Dearman. Other parts were played by members of the BBC Drama Repertory Company. The special sound was by the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, and the recorded production was by John Tiderman. <laughs> Episode 3 will be broadcast next Sunday at 7 o'clock. Breakfast of Champions presents... The Silver Eagle! A cry of the war! A trail of danger! A scarlet rider of the Northwest Mounted serving justice with the swiftness of an arrow! The Silver Eagle! The untamed north, frontier of adventure and peril. The lone, mysterious north, where one man dedicated to the motto of the Canadian Northwest Mounted Police faces danger and death to bring in the lawless and maintain the right. The most famous Monty of them all. The Silver Eagle. The transcribed record dealing with our Silver Eagle case after this message. 
Sailor Sam is the smartest boy who ever shouted, Ship a knows, yes, he's got go power. There he goes. <laughs> he's feeling his Cheerios, Cheerios, Cheerios. Good old Cheerios. They got go power. So nourishing because they're made from oats with minerals, vitamins, and proteins that your body needs. Yes, indeed, a bowl of Cheerios and milk really starts your day off right. Does all sorts of good things for your body. Helps you have strong bones and muscles, good red blood, and healthy nerves. So every morning, take on a bowl of Cheerios and milk for real go power. You'll like that wonderful toasted oat flavor, too. It's downright delicious. Come to think of it, Cheerios is one of the tastiest muscle-building foods you can eat. Try Cheerios, and you'll hear... He's feeling his Cheerios. And now our Silver Eagle adventure, Border Renegade. Fort Benton, Montana was a lusty steamboat fort, thronging with fur trappers, Indians, freight drivers, and blue-coated cavalry troopers. One afternoon in the Last Chance Cafe, two men sat talking together. One was a white man, the other a half-breed clad in greasy buckskins. Jake, from what I've heard, you stand in pretty well with the engines, don't you? You calling me a renegade? Don't get on the prod now. I'm just asking you a question. I get along with him, yeah. The old trust buffalo, Jake. I savvy the lingo. Does that go for the engines up north of the border in Canada? Sure, I've smoked the pipe with all of them. Bloods, Crees, Sassies. Why? I've got a chance to make a nice little deal with the Gravel Gulch Mining Company down near Butte. What kind of a deal? They need fresh beef to feed their hands. They've offered me a contract for a hundred steers at fifty dollars a head. That's five thousand dollars. How are you gonna fill a contract like that? You ain't got no cattle. That's why I got in touch with you. You mean you want me to rustle them? No need to use a word like that. The contract don't specify where or how I'm supposed to get hold of them. Not me, Bronson. You got the wrong man. I've got better use for my carcass than decorating limb of a tree. I'm not talking about getting them here in Montana. The Stock Growers Association's made that too risky. Then what are you talking about? They raise cattle in Canada, don't they? Yeah, and they got a bunch of red-coated troopers up there called the Mounted Police. They're bad medicine. Jake, I'm not asking you to do the rustling yourself. I just figured you might be able to arrange for it. Arrange for it? What are you driving at? You are chummy with the engines up there, so why not hire a few braves to do the job? You mean get them to steal the cattle? I've never seen a red skin who wasn't a natural bone horse thief. I reckon they can rustle beef just as easy. Well, maybe you've got something there. Sure. We'll pay them off in cheap trade goods. It won't cost more than a few hundred dollars. It'll still leave us over four thousand dollars to split between us. It'll be dangerous driving all that stock across the medicine line. We can't earn that much money without taking some risk. Yeah, I suppose so. Know any engines who might be interested? <sighs> well, uh... There's a young brave up in the sweet grass hills named Fightin' Elk. He don't like the way things are going for the engines. He's been trying to stir up the young bucks. This ought to be just a job for him. I suppose he'll want plenty of firewater. No, not firewater. If I know Fightin' Elk, he'll ask for guns. All right, we'll give him guns. Of course, I ain't seeing what kind of guns they'll be. I reckon I can make a deal with him. I'll get my horse and start for Canada right now. Two weeks later, on the opposite side of the Canadian border, Sergeant Jim West of the Mounties was camped on the shore of the Milk River. He had just finished preparing his evening meal when a horseman rode up out of the gathering darkness. Oh, oh, oh they're poison. I caught her. <laughs> Howdy, Jim. <laughs> hey, I heard you was camping somewhere around here. I thought you were going back to your practice in medicine hat. Oh, folks are getting too healthy up there. I figured it's time to go out and do a little circuit riding. Drum up some business, so to speak. <laughs> Which means you're out looking for excitement. Well, shucks, even the sawbones has a right to a little fun now and then. Not that they haven't been keeping busy. Take today, for instance. I've already set two broken arms, delivered one baby, and yanked out three teeth. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that you're here, how about a plate full of bacon and beans? That's one kind of invitation old Doc never refused. Yeah. There you are. Go to it. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Say... Where in Sanders, Joe Bedeau? Joe's gone home to Quebec to visit his folks. I, I thought this camp looked awful vacant. Yes, things get pretty lonesome when the big fella's not around, but he'll be back soon. You making a routine patrol? No, the inspector sent me down on a special assignment. 
There have been a number of cattle stolen hereabouts in the last two weeks. Some yank rustlers paying us best, huh? Not necessarily. We have some homegrown specimens on this side of the border. What do you think of? Some organized gang work? I don't know, but it looks that way. There have been eight cases reported in the last two weeks. They operating on a big scale? No, just a few heads stolen off each ranch. The biggest haul was 18 steers taken off the Bar K last Thursday night. Wait a second. Am I hearing things or is that shooting? Must be gunshots, all right. It came from west of here. Cy Moffat's homestead's over that way. Come here, Paddle. There. Get this saddle on. Here, steady, Paddle. You stay here, Doc. Watch the camp. Hey, here, nothing. What are you doing? Putting out the fire, my boy. I'm going with you. Cy Moffat's homestead was about a mile away. As we came in sight of his place, we saw Moffat coming out of his house with a lantern in one hand and a rifle in the other. Rain up there, you bombers, and keep your hands high, or I'll blast you. Hold your fire, Cy. Sure, we don't need no ventilation. Oh, 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 poison. Hey, Silver Eagle and Doc Carter. What's the idea of greeting us with that blunderbuss? I didn't recognize you in the dark. Well, what's the trouble here? Wrestlers, that's what they... Just run off my cattle, all ten head. Now how about that shooting we heard? That is me. I got off the reins just in time to catch on to what was happening. I fired after, but I, I don't reckon it did any good. Did you try to chase him? Sure I tried, but my horse dug into a gopher hole. Threw me clean out of the saddle. Did you get a look at any of the rustlers? No. No, it's too dark to see anything. It's the sound of the hoof beats and the cattle bell and that told me what was going on. But unless I missed my guess, those rustlers were Indians. Indians? That's right. That's why I came back to the house and got this lantern. Figured I'd take a look at the tracks. All right, let's go see. Well, wait till I saddle up another horse. Never mind, I get up behind me. Give me a hand. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. All right, let's go, battle. Yeah, poison. Up, Jim is right about here. Oh, ho, ho, battle. Oh, poison. Yeah. Yeah. Bring your lantern over this way, Si. Here they are, Jim. Fresh hoof prints. They're engine ponies, all right. That's not all. Ever hear of a man called Buffalo Jake? He's a half breed trader. I, I was hunting in the hills a couple of weeks ago, and I spotted Buffalo Jake holding a secret powwow with one of the young braves. An Indian named Fightin' Elk. We follow that trail, the sooner you'll get your cattle back. Well, all right. But from now on, I'm keeping my gun handy. And if I see any more Indians prowling on my range, I'll blast them right between the eyes. You keep your finger off the trigger and stay out of trouble. This is a matter for the police. All right, steady, boy. Good luck to you, Jim. Thanks. And remember what I said about taking the law into your own hands. Let's go, Edel. Yeah, poison. As the Silver Eagle and Doc set out in pursuit of the Indian cattle rustlers, a brisk wind began blowing and the snow was drifting fast. They had only a lantern to guide them. The trail led into the sweet grass hills, and after picking their way along blindly for about two hours, the Silver Eagle realized they had lost the sign of the two fugitives completely. There was only one thing for them to do, turn their horses around and ride back to the camp of Chief Rain Cloud and his blood Indians. Hey, Jim, who's the old gent getting up from the council fire? The one next to that big fat squaw. That's Chief Raincloud. That isn't a squaw, that's his daughter. Raincloud is one of the finest men I've ever known. Uh, he looks peaceful enough to fool that daughter. He thinks the sun rises and sets on her. She looks big enough to hold the sun. Oh, battle. Oh, boy. Oh, poison. She's got a face only a mother could love. What's she called? Little Fawn. Oh, no. Lahoya. Yep. <sighs> Lahoya, Chief Raincloud. Silver Eagle, friend of all red men in Eskimo. Him always welcome in lodges of my people. Thanks, but I'm afraid this visit may not be a pleasant one. I'm looking for cattle thieves. Why you come here? My braves not steal white men's cattle. The thieves were riding Indian ponies. Their trail led into these hills. When they steal cattle? Tonight, just a couple of hours ago. No braves bring cattle to village tonight. Are all your braves here at the village? Not all braves. Some go off on hunting party. When are they coming back? Maybe two days, three days, me not know. I bet you they're the boys we're looking for. Is there a young brave named Fighting Elk in your tribe? Mm, but him not here. Him go with hunting party. Uh, ain't that a coincidence. You think him steal cattle? I'd like to question him. Reckon we'll have to find him first. Rain cloud help you find him. Tonight? Mm, tonight. 
Me send out scouts. Look for fighting elk. If him steal white man's cattle, then you take him. Punish him by law of great white queen. Thanks, Rain Cloud. I accept your offer of help gladly. Throughout the night, the Indian scouts combed the hills. But the darkness hampered their search, and they found no trace of either the rustlers or the stolen cattle. During the hours the search went on, the Silver Eagle and Doc waited at Rain Cloud's camp. A short time after sunup, an Indian scout came in with the news that he had found fighting elk. Him make power with another man. A white man? Maybe a white man, maybe. Half-breed. Me no see him face. What did he look like? Him wear buckskin, have long black hair. Recognize the description, Jim? It could fit a lot of people, but it sounds like Buffalo Jake. How far away is this place where you saw them? Maybe two, three mile. Me take you there. Rain Cloud go with you. All right. Let's mount up and ride. We left the Indian camp and headed south through the hills. But before we reached the gully where the scout had seen fighting elk, the man we were looking for came riding toward us. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Your name is Fighting Elk? No, Whitka. When you left your village yesterday, you were with a hunting party. What happened to the others? Me ride off alone, trail grizzly. Get lost from other braves. Where did you spend the night? Me camp in hills. Did you steal cattle from a white settler last night? No, not true. Fighting elk, not steal cattle. Have you seen anyone else this morning? You tell truth. Speak not with forked tongue to Silver Eagle. Uh, me see, man. Who was he? Me not know. Looks like me, tis buffalo hunter. What did he want? We smoke pipe, make powwow. Him ask if my people have good hunting. I see. You think him tell truth? You always tell the truth, Rain Cloud. Your word is good. Therefore, I'll take the word of your brave. If fighting elk lie, bring shame to Rain Cloud, we punish. <laughs> Reckon that's no idle threat either. What do we do now, Jim? We'll backtrack fighting out to the place where he held the powwow and see if we can pick up the half breed's trail. You want Rain Cloud come with you? No, thanks. That won't be necessary. See you later, Rain Cloud. Let's go, battle. Yeah, poison. Cy Moffat had been waiting anxiously for Jim and Doc to return. When they failed to return by daybreak, he decided he would take a part in the search. He saddled his horse and rode off toward the sweet grass hills, where he figured the rustlers would be hiding his stuff. As he approached a wooded gully, he saw a lone rider ahead of him, and as he drew nearer to the man, he recognized him as a renegade trader from the States, a man he had met one time in Montana. It was Jake Bronson heading south toward the border. Hey there! Breed! Rain up! Uh, uh, whoa, whoa, boy! Well, what do you want? Uh, you don't remember me, do you? Why should I? The name's Moffat. I was hauling freight down at Silver Bowl the time you almost got lynched for knifing a miner. Uh, you got a good memory. I lost ten head of cattle last night. They were rustled by Indians. What about it? Uh, you always been chummy with Indians. I, I got a hunch you know something about it. Guess again, Mister. Turn your horse around, Jake. I'm taking you into the mountains for questioning. You and who else? Me and this bitch. You should have let that rifle stay put in your saddle boot, mister. Dangerous business going around pulling guns on strangers. You're no stranger to me, you dirty renegade. You, by thunder, you'll pay for this. You talk too much, Moffat, so I reckon I'll have to shut you up permanent. Oh. Old fool. Come on, hit up that. Back to our thrilling Silver Eagle adventure in just a few seconds. But first, listen to this. Pull back, Bobby is a boy of nine. He can really hit that line. He's a star because he knows he's got go power from Cheerios. Yes, he's got go power. There he goes. He's feeling his Cheerios. 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 Yes, it's a fact. Cheerios does give you real go power. You see, Cheerios is made from oats, and every delicious spoonful of Cheerios and milk is real muscle-building food. Each spoonful contains vitamins, minerals, and proteins your body needs. Yes, the good things in a Cheerios breakfast do good things for your body, help you have healthy nerves, good red blood, strong bones and muscles. And Cheerios is so much fun to eat with its distinctive O shape and its wonderful toasted oat flavor. So tomorrow morning and every morning, start the day right with a Cheerios breakfast. Then you'll hear people say, He's feeling his Cheerios. Now back to the 
the Silver Eagle, Sergeant Jim West of the Mounties, and his stirring adventure, Border Renegade. The Silver Eagle and Doc Carter had found the spot where Fighting Elk had talked with the half-breed Jake, and from there they set out to follow the breed's trail. They had ridden only about a mile when they heard the sound of shots, the shots which had knocked Cy Moffat off his horse. When they arrived at the spot, they saw the old man lying on the ground. <coughs> his eyes are opening. Jim. Doc. What, what do you think you're doing, laying here with that hole in your hide? Don't you know you might catch your death of cold? I, I was a blamed fool, all right. Should have heeded your warning, Jim. What happened? I, I started out for that gully where I saw the engine and Buffalo Jake had a hunch I, I might find the cattle and I didn't find the cattle, but I ran into Jake. Was he the one who shot you? Yeah. I tried to cover him. What? Right. He's passed out again. Think it'll be safe to move him? I reckon so. We can fix it, Trevor. Why? All right. But I want you to take him back home. What are you going to do? I'm going after Buffalo Jake. The Silver Eagle followed Buffalo Jake's trail to a point where it crossed the medicine line into the United States. Beyond that point, he was powerless to touch him. So he gave up temporarily and rode back, first to Rain Cloud's village and then to Cy Moffat's homestead. Doc Carter had arrived there a few hours earlier and was caring for his wounded patient. The hours dragged by slowly, and as it began getting dark out, Doc lit the oil lamp while Jim turned to old Cy, saying, How do you feel, Cy? Weak as a kitten, but Doc says I'll pull through. That's the main thing. Jim, I still don't savvy why you let Fighting Elk go free. What did you expect me to do? Well, he admits he is pow out with Buffalo Jake. We know Jake was up to some monkey business because he shot Cy to keep him getting hauled in. So why not arrest Fight Milk and make him talk? No one ever made an Indian talk if he didn't want to talk. Yeah, they're stubborn. Besides, he may be more useful to us if we let him run loose. You got something up your sleeve, Jim? Someone's right up outside. I'll go see who it is. Big Chief Rain in the face himself. Me. Me come see Silver Eagle. You've come to the right place, Chief. Step inside. Bahia, you, Silver Eagle. Bahia, you, Rain Cloud. You bring news? Uh, we have braves watch fighting elk like you say. A little while ago, leave him village. Ride off. We come here, tell you. Thank you, Rain Cloud. Has the rest of the hunting party come back yet? No. No, they not come back. How many were there in the party besides fighting elk? Ten, twelve braves. All right, wait till I get my coat. We'll follow his trail. <laughs> There's the cattle, Bronson. Nice bunch of steers they've rounded up for us. Yeah. Here comes the engines. Yeah, the tall one in the lead is fighting out. Let's get out. how are you? So how are you, fighting out? This is my partner. You bring guns? Sure, we got them loaded on these pack mules. Break out a couple and show them, Jake. Right. Calm down now, you lop here, devil. Second this will do for a sample. All right, fighting out. There you are. What you call this? It's an ordinary trade gun. What do you suppose? Old muzzle loader. What do you expect? A Winchester or a Sharps carbine? This gun, Coltus. Coltus nothing. That gun struck him and so are all the others. You're getting your money's worth. What are they talking about? They're all riled up. They say they're not going through with the deal. You lie to fighting elk. Promise good guns. Bring Coltus muzzle loaders. Now you take guns. Go. We not give you cattle. Simmer down, you redskin varmint. You made a deal, and by Judas, you're going through with it. We brought you your guns, and now we're taking them state. Watch it, Bronson. They're going for the knives. We'll see about that. Any more of you want a dose of safe medicine? You're gun hungry, all right. Feast your eyes on these two twin colts I'm holding. They talk loud, and they shoot straight. Now back up, and don't try no more of your injured tricks. What are we going to do now? Just what we come to do. We're going to drive these steers down over the medicine line. But what about these engines? We don't want no arrows in our back, that's for sure. So I reckon we better get rid of these scum right now. You mean kill the whole bunch of them? Only good engines are dead one. You're packing a gun, now use it. Drop those guns, you two. I'm out here. Let him have it. Keep I'm getting out of here. Here, me too. Grab your horse. Got me to show it. Help me, Roger. Help yourself. I'm clear now. You not get away. Fix you, you dirty red skin. I'm back, all of you. Hello. 
It was quite a job untangling that knot of maddened Indians. Five of them were wounded too badly, but there was plenty of fight left in the others, and they were out for the scalps of Bronson and Buffalo Jake. When things calmed down, Doc got busy bandaging up the wounded. Then Chief Raincloud spoke. What you do with these men? Honey, if these Indians die from their wounds, Buffalo Jake and his partner will hang for murder. If not, they'll still have several charges to answer for. What about young Braves? They'll have to stand trial for cattle rustling. Their punishment will be up to the judge. What happens after that will depend on their attitudes. Fighting elk, he big fool. Worse than fool. You lie to Silver Eagle, bring shame on your people. That's true, Raincloud, but I think they've learned their lesson. Haven't you, Fighting Elk? No, it, uh, Red Coat Law is just. Fighting Elk, keep sorry. Well, that's all well and good, but who's going to pay the doctor? Tribe pay you for help save wounded braves. Rain Cloud give you princess. Oh, now you don't have to get extravagant. Well, you're going to give me what? Princess Little Fawn. That's what I thought you said. Goodbye, Jim. Tell him I always work for nothing. Be seeing you soon. <laughs> I want you to hear a few seconds of an amazing record. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. Recognize it? Notice how sharp and clear it is? But what's really amazing about this record of Take Me Out to the Ball Game is that I got it off the front of a special Wheaties box. There's an actual five-inch plastic record sealed on the front of every one of these special Wheaties boxes I'm talking about. All you have to do is cut them out. These records play on any 78 RPM manually controlled record player. And listen, Take Me Out to the Ball Game is just one of the tunes you can get. There's also Pony Boy, Blue Tail Fly, Polly Wally Doodle, and others. And each record plays up to 60 seconds. So go down to your grocer right now and pick up the special Wheaties record box. Remember, these records are absolutely free of extra cost. A real bargain in fun. Today's story of the Great Northwest was written by James Lawrence. Jim Amici stars in the part of Jim West. Joe Badeau is played by Jacques Lestaire. The Silver Eagle is a copyrighted transcribed feature of Jewel Radio and Television Productions. Recording director, Robert Wilson. This is Bill O'Connor. rather efficaciously if this were brought down hard on it. And today, this open-end wrench can be seen in the Black Museum. From the 
annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. <laughs> down the hill. Uh, I say, there, there seems to be a woman in it. Look, you better come. Uh, bring help. The doctor, who was also the local coroner, needed little time to determine which of his functions were called for at the wreck. She's been past help for hours. Must have gone off the road during the night. I've notified the superintendent about the accident, doctor. Yes, well, you fellows will want to trace the car. Any identification on the body? Nothing in the woman's purse, sir. There ought to be laundry or dry cleaners, Mark. It's pretty hard to stay identified these days, Doctor. Yes, of course. You can tell the ambulance men to take it to the hospital. Hospital, sir? Or topsy. I can't just sign a certificate accidental death, you know, Constable. Yes, sir. Very well, sir. The ambulance drove off to the local hospital. Dr. Mason followed in his own car. At the wreck, the constable saluted a newcomer. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Johnson. Turn turtle, I see. Yes, sir. This is the man who discovered the wreck, sir. Mr. Frisbee, Superintendent Foster. Oh, how do you do, sir? Mr. Frisbee, yes. You uh, left your name and address? Hmm? I will with the constable, sir. Uh, um, if I may, I have a business appointment. Yes, you go ahead. We'll send for you if we need you for the inquest. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, just let me know if you want me. I'll be available. Any time, sir. Anything extraordinary, Johnson? Nothing, sir, so far as we've seen. No fire? No, sir. I'll have a look at it. Very good, sir. Superintendent Foster poked around in the twisted metal. A point caught his attention. Johnson, any idea which way she was traveling... Downgrade, sir. There are rather clear tar marks on the roadway, leading to the break in the fence, sir. Downgrade. Strange. The gear shift lever is in second position. Second gear, sir? Apparently. That grade isn't that steep. Just a point. Well, a woman driver, strange road at night. She wasn't in the driver's seat, sir. Oh? Tossed over as the car fell? Can't say, sir. 
I'd have expected, sir, that she'd have been pinned behind the steering wheel. Yeah. You may be right about that. Well, we'll leave things as they are. The insurance people usually want to see these wrecks. Hello, hello, what's this? Open end wrench, sir. Probably from the... Yes, constable? I was going to say the toolbox, sir. The toolbox was locked. No oh. other tools around. Ah. Well, bring it along to the station house. No sense leaving it out here to rust. And the usual routine. Trace the registration of the car, locate the owner or the next of kin, and check if it was the woman's car. <laughs> Another careless or sleepy driver. The usual telegrams were sent. The usual telephone calls were made. The same afternoon, Constable Johnston reported to his superintendent. Yes, Johnston? Papers on the accident, sir. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I see. Owner, Martin Beach. Avon Mews, London. Has he been notified? Yes, sir. He's on his way down. The woman was his wife, sir. Yeah. Must have been a shock. Well, I took the call, sir. He kept saying he couldn't understand what she was doing all the way out here. Well, we'll deal gently with him. Dr. Mason reported yet? No, sir. Nothing on the autopsy as yet. Taking him a long time. Well, let's see. Get me Dr. Mason, please. At the hospital. Did you make certain on the tire tracks, Johnson? We did, sir. They matched perfectly. The car was coming down, sir, on the side of the road away from the fence. Seems to have swerved suddenly, just above the curve, and made rather a beeline for the edge. Are you suggesting she went over purposely, Johnson? No, sir. It seemed like a point, sir. Most cars at least try to follow the road, sir. I notice you keep referring to the car, not to the woman. She wasn't in the driver's seat, sir, when we found her. Mm. Stickler for detail, aren't you, Constable? Come in. Ah. Ah, you're both here. Good. I just put a call through to you, Doctor. Yes? Oh, yes, thank you. Yes, he's just arrived. Well, what did you find, Doctor? You ask that as if you knew. Just a deduction. You don't usually take this long time on these jobs. I didn't expect to, until I found alcohol in her stomach. Oh, drunken driver. Oh, I wouldn't know about that. In any case, she wasn't driving when the car went through that fence. Hmm. Johnson's been suggesting that rather stubbornly. He couldn't be more right, Foster. Why not? The dead don't drive. Hello? Anything else? Quite a bit. In the first place, death was not caused by the accident. She was dead well before the car went over. You told us that? You know how? Strangulation. Choked. Probably unconscious at the time. Well, what do you base that conclusion on? Four bruises. Hey, the neck. I don't suppose. I thought the accident... Well, the dead don't drive and they don't bruise, Constable. Those marks were made while she was still alive. I see. Definitely murder, Doctor. Definitely. I'd like to see the body. Come along, Constable. Your instinct... Three men enter the morgue at the small country hospital. Three grim faces betray no emotion as they view the woman's body. The doctor says... You'll notice the marks the strangler's thumbs made there. The obvious bruise is here, just below her hairline, on her forehead. The superintendent of police says. I see. Interesting, the shape of that bruise. Almost like a small horseshoe. Diffidently, the constable clears his throat, inquiring glance from his superintendent. The young officer says. <coughs> we might try for actual size, sir. That kind of mark could have been made by that open-end wrench. And today, that open-end wrench is to be seen in the Black Museum. The doctor placed the bulged end of the tool against the woman's forehead... The three men stood there silently a moment. The constable spoke. No question about it, is there, sir? Not as far as I can see. Johnson, 
When this beach fellow arrives, say nothing about any of this. And I shall want a trunk call placed immediately. I want to speak with Inspector Hall at Scotland Yard. The ponderous, inevitable juggernaut that is police work began to move, gained momentum. A fast car brought Inspector Hall and Sergeant Williams from the yard before train connections permitted the arrival of Martin Beach. The inspector listened intently as Superintendent Foster outlined the details. Then, quietly, no fuss, no newspaper headlines. Detectives were dispatched to run a check. Shortly thereafter, a grief-stricken husband arrived at the station house in the company of Dr. Mason. There's no question about my identification, Superintendent. Dr. Mason will bear me out. I knew her the moment that... That is... Doctor. Yes, it's Mrs. Beach. I can't understand it. I simply can't. She was a good driver, better than I. How did it happen that she was out alone? We lived a quiet life. Avon Mills is in a suburb of London, really. She'd often take the car for a drive. I'd go to sleep. I had to get up early. My business is in the city. She, she said she wanted some fresh air last night. I didn't miss her until I woke this morning. I can't understand it. Why should she be so quiet? A simple story. Quite commonplace. Quite honest. One question seemed to puzzle her husband more than it disturbed him. Liquor? Whiskey, you mean? No, an occasional drink at a friend's place, that was all. Why? Are you suggesting Louise was a, a drunken driver? No, they were suggesting nothing, merely asking a routine question. Yes, they would release the body shortly. We, we have no relations, no one. We had only each other. I shall have to notify our friends. Yes, the police agreed sympathetically. And Superintendent Foster and Dr. Mason escorted him to his London train. Meanwhile, on the Middlebury Road... Your name, Carey? Yes, sir. My name's Williams, CID. My identification. Yes, Sergeant. Something go wrong? You um, heard of the accident down the hill? Yes, of course. How late do you keep this petrol station open? Twelve, one o'clock. Depends on the traffic. And last night? I closed up about one. Locked the tanks and... Mm. Any uh, customers around that time? Well, there was a dark sedan, man and woman. You got a good look at the woman? He was driving, bought five gathers. She was asleep in the front seat. Any sign of whiskey? Well, he had a breath on him, Sergeant. Seemed in a hurry, too. Edgy. Now, look. This uh, photo mean anything to you? Yes, it looks a little... It's hard to tell at night that the light's bad. Is she sleeping there in the picture? No. She's dead. They call it backtracking. They try to trace the car along the road it traveled. The gas stations first. In this case, where whiskey was present, the taverns and the inns were checked as well. You're the landlord here? Yes, sir. My wife said uh, you're the police. Yes. They're trying to trace a man and a woman. This picture mean anything to you? Uh, y- yes, sir. She was here last night. Till closing time. Had a bit too much, I'm afraid, sir. No. Was she uh, alone? No, sir. No, with her shortish fella. Dark, quiet, in a nervous sort of way. I remember, because, well, he he wanted to buy a bottle, but I'd none to spare. And I rather thought what with driving and all, they'd already had enough. That evening, Sergeant Williams gave the inspector his own report from that of the men assigned to the railroad portion of the inquiry. They uh, routed the conductor out of his bed. He remembers the fellow all right. Bought his ticket on the train. Complete stranger. Shortish and dark. Yes, she was with a man all right. Seems to me we'd better break the news to Beach. Hmm. It won't be pleasant. It wasn't pleasant. Martin Beach took it quietly, but with obvious shock. Louise? With another man? Inspector, you can't be serious. I'm afraid I am. Your wife's picture has been tentatively identified by a petrol station owner, and by an innkeeper on the Middlebury Road. They'll be taken over to the hospital to check tomorrow. 
And she was with the man. No, it's not possible. No one could have been that secretive. And why? We just lived for each other. Well, oh, it's an old story to us, Mr. Beach. You're a busy man. Your wife, wife was uh, alone a good deal. But when? How? Well, you told us yourself. She used the car alone and quite often at night. If I could get my hands on him. Oh, what fools we mortals be. We want him too, Mr. Beach. Now, will you help us? Of course, anything. Anything at all. Then, uh, may we search your wife's effects? Of course, Inspector. Search the whole house if you think it will. They were quite thorough, of course. And very quickly, they were successful. I found these in the uh, stocking box at the rear of the bureau drawer, Inspector. I see. Hmm. Letters. Mr. Beach, do you know uh, a Fred Hennessy? No. May I... May I see the letters? I... Well, I... I think you'd rather not. And we'll be checking them for fingerprints, of course. They're all addressed to your wife. The last one makes the arrangements for a meeting place. With the car. Is there... Is there a return address, Inspector? There is. Good luck, Inspector. Inspector and Sergeant Williams had luck. However, it was not exactly good luck. Fred Hennessy? No. There's no Hennessy living here. Well, now, perhaps he used another name. A, a shortish, dark fellow. With a flair for letter writing. No. I haven't had any shortish men staying here in months. Well, this is 346 Greenville Street, isn't it? <laughs> well, there's nowhere else, Inspector. And what's more, I don't have any letter writers here. Every one of my men rumours, except one, works at the car factory. They're a tough crowd, Inspector, but they're nice enough to me. I take good care of them, I do. And the one who doesn't build automobiles? Oh, he's a constable, he is. Well, what would you want to see him for? A good question, and a big disappointment. Still, the machinery ground on. The reports came in to the small bear office at the yard. Here we are. Fingerprint reports, Inspector. Now, the prints on the letters match those they found on the gear shift lever in the wrecked car. The ridge patterns conform to the smudges on the wrench, too, sir. The conclusion is obvious. At the very least, it placed the maker of those fingerprints in contact with a murdered woman in the murder car with the murder weapon. It looks so as if he pulled off the road, did the job, then started the car downgrade and jumped. Yes, probably. The unlocked door on the driver's side would indicate that. But what about those prints I told you to try and get? We have them, sir. Lifted them neatly. I was saving that for the last, sir. You see? They match. Yes, very good. Thought he was clever. Well, murder is usually an amateur's crime, isn't it, Sergeant? What about the men to identify him? They'll be in London in the morning, sir. To Sergeant Williams, the case seemed complete. The inspector was still somewhat cautious. It will stick, sir, in any court. I'll feel better if we have the motive, Sergeant. I'd like a complete case. Identifications have been upset before, and even fingerprints. Give them a good motive, we'll hang the gentleman. In fact, we may be able to say he hung himself with his own cleverness. Inspector Hall here. Hmm? I see. Very good, Davis. No. No, just keep your eye on the place. Williams and I'll be along directly. Get your head, Sergeant. Very good, sir. Our quarry has gone calling on the lady. And so are we. The police car sped silently through the London streets, out to a pleasant suburb. It drew up to the curb near a small house, detached from its neighbors, surrounded by a hedge and trees. A man stepped out of the shadows, spoke softly to the inspector. He remained at the car as the inspector and the sergeant walked to the front door of the house and rang the bell. Yes? Miss Jeffrey? Miss Dorothy Jeffrey? That's right. My name is Hall, C.I.D. My identification. May we come in? Why, yes. Why not? Thank you. 
What can I do for you? Well, as a matter of fact, Miss Jeffrey, we stopped by to see your caller, uh, a Mr. Marchin Beach, I believe? Inspector. Well, this is a pleasure to see you all the way out here. Is it, Mr. Beach? Of course. You know why we're here, don't you? I assume you saw me come by. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Don't you know, Miss Jeffrey? I know the ID inspectors just don't drop in or come by. Martin, have you been up to something? Stay out of this, Dorothy. I'll not stay out of it. If we're to be married, I'd like to know. We've dropped by to tell Mr. Beach about his wife. Wife? You never mentioned a wife, Martin. You're not arresting me, Inspector. I was home and asleep when she was killed. The innkeeper says not Beach. So does the petrol station owner. So does the conductor of the train you took back to London from Middlebury. I said you're not taking me in. You're not? You're not? Inspector, there are French doors into the garden. Your house is well covered. Front and back, Miss Jeffrey. You won't get far. That's his warning. He'll stop running now. Oh, this, this is not the, the expected way to break an engagement to be married. Yes, I understand, Miss. But you all get over it. This manner of ending a relationship is far less permanent than the one your fiancé used to gain his freedom from his wife. You know, Miss, the chances are quite good that they've got away with it. If you hadn't written some fake love letters and forgotten to hide a certain open-end wrench. And today, the open-end wrench can be seen in its special place in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. It's an old dodge, of course. May have worked many times. Commit a murder wreck an automobile to cover its traces. It might have worked this time if Martin Beach had known that dead bodies do not bruise. If he'd been really clever and had succeeded in burning the car and the body. If, if, if. But he was not really clever. His cleverness failed him. Failed him at 8 o'clock one morning in Dartmoor Prison. As for Dorothy Jaffrey... She disappeared when she had come into the great anonymity which is London. And so until next time, till we meet in the same place for another story about the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours. on the wall and you wonder if it's you or the day that makes it look so uninspiring. And you decide it's the calendar. They just aren't making good calendars anymore. You squirm around in your chair and take a look at the clock. 11.44. 11.44 of a Friday morning that shouldn't have happened. It's that dull. You swing back to your desk and pick up the phone. Detective Bureau, Lieutenant McDougal speaking. Hello, Lieutenant. This is Bill Rand out at the Hillway Airport. Yes, Mr. Rand. What can we do for you? Well, I want to report a stolen plane. I see. A what? An airplane. It's been stolen. I want to report it. Well, now, look, Mr. Rand. We we take reports on stolen articles here, cars, things like that, but a stolen airplane... I know there isn't much anyone can do about a stolen plane, but the trouble is, it's in the air. Well, that figures. The man who's flying it can't fly. Well, in that case, you have nothing to... What? I tried to stop him, but he had a gun. Oh, now, just a minute, Mr. Rand. Suppose we begin at the beginning. Well, this guy, he goofs around the field all the time, one of those hangar flyers. But today he showed up around 11 o'clock and said he decided to start taking lessons. So, uh... Hold it, Mr. Rand, just a moment. Frank! Yeah, Mac. Get on the extension and take this report. Okay. Now, Mr. Rand, what was the man's name? Regan. Charles Regan. Uh-huh. His address? 423... Excuse me, Mr. Rand. My other phone's ringing. You go ahead and give the report to the sergeant. I'll be back with you in a minute. Okay. Hello. Detective Bureau Lieutenant McDougal speaking. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, wait a moment. Where are you calling from? Yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah, all right, fine, Mrs. Stevens. We'll see what we can do right away, and thanks for calling. Uh, Mr. Rand. Yes, Lieutenant? I think we found your plane. Oh, that's great. Where is it? 
Well, the lady I just talked to wasn't too accurate, but according to her, was flying up and down in front of her house on Delaplane Avenue. Flying up and down? <laughs> well, that's the lady's way of putting it. I figure what she meant was that it was buzzing the street in front of her house. Good Lord, Lieutenant, he's liable to crash that thing. You've got to do something. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right, Mr. Rand, but there's, there's only one thing I'd like to ask you. Yes? What would you suggest? Yeah, the man's right. You've got to do something. But what? Reach out with a long arm and pluck the plane out of the sky? Put out a call to the radio cars and tell them to bring in an idiot in a stolen plane? You look at the report that Frank's taken and you try to figure out your first move. Any move. Here's the fellow's name and address. Yeah, it's probably a phony. No, I don't think so, Lieutenant. Rand said he got it off the man's driver's license. Yeah, well, we can take a run out there, I guess, but it isn't going to help us to get him down. Did Rand say anything to you about why he thought the guy wanted the plane? No, no. He, he said he acted fine until they got out to the takeoff line and warmed up the engine. Then he said the guy suddenly pulled his gun out and shoved it in his ribs and told him to get out. Mm -hmm. So he got out. What would you do, Lieutenant? I'd get out. I'll get it with you, Frank. Yeah. Uh, Detective Bureau, Sergeant Kelly speaking. Yes, sir. Yes, we've already got a report on that, sir. Where are you calling from? The courthouse. Yes, sir. Yes, we'll do all we can, sir. Thank you. Now what? The plane just rolled its wheels on the roof of the courthouse. They got a panic on their hands down there. All right, Frank. Get out a bulletin to the civil defense people. Alert the fire department, the sheriff's office, all of our cars. Tell them what we've got and to expect anything. I'm going to see if the Air Force can help us. You grab your phone and call the air base on the edge of town. It takes a little doing, but finally you get a colonel who's interested but firm. Look, Lieutenant, I assure you we'd like to help, but what can we do? Well, I thought maybe you could scramble a couple of your planes and, well, well sort of head him off, make him go away from the city. I'm afraid our jets can't fly that slow, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Only somebody's got to do something to get this guy down before he kills a lot of people. Has he got a radio on his plane? I don't know. Wait a minute. Hold on a minute, Colonel. Frank, did Rand say anything about a radio in the plane? He didn't mention it, Lieutenant. We don't know, Colonel. Well, I was thinking that if he had a radio and he had it turned on the tower frequency, we could contact him from here. At least talk to him. Well, well look, can you try it? If you can get him, maybe we can make him see what he's doing. What's the number and make of his ship? Uh, Oh, wait a minute. I got it here in the report somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. It's a it's a Cessna single engine, number N4091. Is that what you want? That's it. If you want to wait on the phone, I'll have the tower put out a call right away. Yeah, yeah, fine. I'll wait. You sit there waiting for the colonel to come back, and the minutes tick by, and you try to figure out some way to do this thing right, and you can't. If he has a radio, if he has the radio turned on, if... Why would he have it on? You listen to the phones and you hear Frank and the other people in the office taking calls. They're coming in faster now. And they're all about the same thing. An airplane with a fool in it who seems to be trying to kill himself. It... Trying to kill himself. Of course. But you can talk suicides out of it. You've done it more than once. Then the colonel's back on the phone again. No luck, Lieutenant. He either doesn't have a radio or he doesn't have it turned on. They called him on all the frequencies and there was no answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, well, thanks for trying anyway, Colonel. You you might keep calling. I'll do that. And if we raise him, where can we reach you? Call the detective bureau and ask for me. They can get me in my car if I'm out. And thanks, incidentally, very much. Hillway Airport, Bill Rand speaking. Hello, Mr. Rand. This is Lieutenant McDougal. Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. You got a line on my plane yet? Now, listen, Rand. Did that ship have a radio in it? Yes. Well, good. Was it turned on? Yeah. You sure? Well, sure, I'm sure. I turned it on myself. Well, the air base tower has been trying to reach the plane. It doesn't answer. It doesn't answer? Oh, wait a minute. I remember. While we were taxiing out to the flight line, I turned it down. Why? Well, I'd already gotten tower clearance. Well, but if it's on, why can't this character hear it? The engine noise would be too loud. Oh, oh, great. Okay, Mr. Rand, thanks. Frank. Yes, Lieutenant. We can't do anything here but answer phones. Let's take a ride out to the guy's address and see what we can find. Maybe he's got a wife that can tell us something. Such as what? Such as how do I know such as. But we can't sit around here waiting until he's crashed. At least we might find out why he's doing what he's doing. Okay, Lieutenant. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Nice looking place. Yeah, I hope someone's home. Yes? Mrs. Regan? Yes? 
I'm Lieutenant McDougal. This is Sergeant Kelly. Police? We're from the Detective Bureau. Your husband is Charles Regan? Yes, that's right, but... I wonder if we could talk to you for a moment, Mrs. Regan, about your husband. Well, well, yes, of course, but is something wrong? Is he hurt? No, not yet, Mrs. Regan, but tell me, has he ever flown an airplane? Charles? Why, no. Oh, he, he sometimes goes out and hangs around the airport out at Hillway, but... Oh, but he's never flown a plane. I, I don't think he's even been up in one. Well, can you think of any reason why he might want to take a plane? Take a plane? Fly one, Mrs. Regan. You know, take it up into the air. Now, what's this all about? These questions don't make any sense. Well, what's happened doesn't make sense to us either. Your husband went out to the Hillway Airport less than an hour ago, Mrs. Regan, and took an airplane away from the flying instructor, and he flew off in it. Oh, what? He could kill himself. You know any reason why your husband would want to kill himself, Mrs. Regan? Well, no. Everything all right between the two of you? I resent that, Lieutenant. I'm sorry, ma'am, but sometimes we have to ask questions like of that. Of course everything is all right between us, only... Only what? Well, Chuck... Chuck doesn't like people much. He, he sort of feels everyone's against him. He's so full of hate. And then this morning... What happened this morning? He was fired. Came home around 10.30 and told me he was fired. Where did he work? At the television station. And what kind of work did he do there? Well, he, he's sort of an idea man. He thinks up scripts and ideas and all. He has a lot of talent. I'm sure he has, ma'am. But somehow they just don't appreciate him. When they fired him this morning, it was the last straw. He, he was like somebody I didn't know. I'll show them, he said. I'll show them I hate them. I hate them all. Does he hate you, Mrs. Regan? Oh, no, Lieutenant. No, Chuck loves me. Oh, no, I can't believe it. Of course, my, my husband was upset, almost sick maybe, but he wouldn't do anything like this. Wouldn't he? Well, look up there. N-4091. That's the plane, Lieutenant. Is that your husband, Mrs. Regan? Yes. Yes, I can see him. He's waving to me. And now, we continue with 227 minutes of hate starring Charles McGraw, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Now you have a little more to go on. Not much, but a little. Now you know that Charles Regan is sick with hate. A hate that has given him the nerve to steal an airplane and the courage to fly it. Hate that may destroy him and who knows how many other people. You have to know more about this sick man before you can even begin to help him. And you haven't much time. His gas tank is racing the second hand right toward death. So you tell Mrs. Regan to stay near a phone in case you need her. And your next stop is the television station where Regan was employed up until this morning. The picture becomes a little more clear as you talk with the station manager, Carl Van Alden. He must be crazy. And he's got to be. Why did you fire him, Mr. Alder? I didn't fire him. I let him go. Why? Well, don't you try to implicate me in this insanity. But why did you let him go? He couldn't cut the mustard. Well, I understand from his wife that he had a lot of talent. Well, I'm the judge of talent around here. And in my book, if I ran this station on the judgment of housewives, I wouldn't be in business very long. Has Regan been back around here yet? Back here? You said he was up in the air. Well, that's exactly what I mean. Back around here in that plane. Why should he come back here? Well, I've got the impression that Regan's awfully sore at someone. And my hunch is that that someone is you. A man has the right to run his business as he sees fit. Oh, of course, Mr. Van Alden. And a man has a right to get mad about the way you run your business. Now, if the man is mad enough to go out and steal a plane, he can't... Crazy enough, you mean? Perhaps. If a man is that mad, I've got a funny feeling he wouldn't stop there. What are you driving at? I have a feeling that a man that full of hate would... Well, he would go for the man who hurt him. Hurt? Yeah, hurt. Like the guy who fired him. If I were that mad, I might even fly my airplane into the building where he worked. Nonsense. Well, well maybe. But if I were you, I'd start thinking about evacuating this place. Evacuate? Evacuate the building? Why, that's absurd. Not if someone's thinking about flying an airplane down your throat. Lieutenant McDougal, you're a policeman. 
Naturally, you think of things from your point of view. But think of mine for a minute. I thought I was. Oh, I don't mean my personal safety. I have a public trust. I must stay on the air. And then, well, think of the miserable publicity the station would get if all of a sudden, in, in, in the middle of a broadcasting day, I shut down and ordered everyone to leave the building. Why, it could be embarrassing. It could be pretty embarrassing, Mr. Van Alder, if you didn't order your people out and your former employee flew his airplane right through your roof and killed them all. He wouldn't dare. He might. Well, I won't do it, Lieutenant. I will not be intimidated by a crazy man. Besides, I don't think he has the nerve. He had the nerve to steal the plane and he saw at you. And he's flying around over the city like a punch-drunk moth. You don't think he'll do it? Well, I do. And I hope above everything else that I'm wrong. I'll put out some bulletins, Lieutenant. Warn the people about what's going on. I'll use what facilities I can. Do a public service job. But I will not order an evacuation. That I will not do. Okay, at least it might have. Good Lord. You got an antenna on the top of this building, Mr. Van Alden? Uh, yes, of course. Two of them, as a matter of fact. Well, I think your friend just flew between them. He flies pretty good for a guy that doesn't know how to fly. But he can't do that. He, he might hit them. He might... He might even want to, if he's a sore too as I think he is. Well, you've got to do something. Yeah, yeah, I know. In fact, I heard that somewhere else today. And you know what, Mr. Van Alden? What? I'm beginning to get a little tired of it. Yeah, you're getting a little tired of it and very tired of Van Alder. You can almost begin to feel sorry for Regan. But then he makes another pass in an hours and you forget about being sorry for him. Matter of fact, he starts thinking about getting out of there. Then Van Alder's secretary buzzes him and says there's a phone call for you and you pick up the phone and the colonel of the Air Force. I'm glad I found you, Lieutenant. We made contact with the plane. You have? Yes, we got on the radio. He answered our call, and we've got him on the tower frequency. Look, look, that's great. Now, just keep him occupied. Keep him talking. Say anything to keep him from thinking up new stunts in that thing. Uh, can you do that? We can try, Lieutenant. I'll be there as fast as I can make it. Air Force 306. You're clear for straight-in approach. Traffic, 3F86 outbound. One T-33 on final. Over. Roger. Clear for straight in approach. Air Force 306. Hello, Hello, Lieutenant. I'm glad you got here so fast. You still got him, Colonel? Yeah, we've been talking to him. He's not too receptive. How'd you get him to turn up his radio? It must have been a fluke. Evidently, he made a fairly steep dive on something, and when he pulled up, his knee hit the volume knob. First thing we knew, he answered one of our calls. Yeah, well, look, I want to talk to him. Can you get him for me? Sure. Try the Cessna again, will you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Hello, Cessna. 4091. This is Air Force Tower calling. Calling Cessna 4091. Come in, please, Cessna. Over. Hello, Air Force. This is me. What's on your mind now? Let me have that mic. Hello. Regan. Can you hear me, Regan? Yeah, sure I can hear you. Who are you? I'm Lieutenant McDougal of the Detective Bureau. Now, listen, Regan. I want you to fly that plane away from the city. Trying to get the light up here over the city, and I've got to stay here. Look, Regan, you've got to think of the people who are going to get killed if you crash that thing into a building. I've been thinking of Lieutenant, and I'm sorry for him, but I got something to do that's more important. Listen to me, Regan. Go ahead, kill yourself if that's what you want to do. But don't kill a lot of innocent people while you're doing it. Lieutenant, you're wasting your time. I'm getting so I can aim this plane pretty well. As soon as I get tired of flying around the city, I'm going to fly it right into those towers on top of the television station. I've been pretty close a couple of times. When I get ready, I will be close. I'll be right on target. Regan. Regan, you're acting like a kid who lost his lollipop. So you got fired. A lot of people get fired. A lot of people get fired and don't deserve it. If they don't go out and try to kill everybody. You say you can aim that plane pretty well? Okay. Okay, aim it towards the Air Force base on the edge of town. You ought to be able to find it. We'll get the crash trucks out, and we'll do everything we can to... Save it, Lieutenant, save it. If you want to use those crash trucks, send them over to the television station. I'll give them a show they won't forget for a long time. Now, knock it off. You bore me. Regan. Regan. Listen, Regan. Answer me. His radio's still answered. I can hear the carrier hum. Yeah. Yeah, Frank. Yeah, Lieutenant. Get on the phone and tell the boys to start evacuating the television station immediately. Right. And ask Radio Central to get a car to Mrs. Regan's house and bring her out here. Tell them to hurry. Maybe she can talk some sense into him. 
You light a cigarette and stand in the control tower, listening to the babble of voices from the sky. And you try to think what you've left undone. The clock says 2.14. Two hours and 29 minutes since that phone call that started this nightmare. And you're no better off now than you were then. You suddenly think of Rand's report and the words gas aboard. Approximately three hours. He'd only run out of gas in the country somewhere, but you know he won't. You know he means what he said about flying down into the towers. And you begin to get scared. The clock moves around to 2.45. You've called Regan regularly and he's answered twice. And his answers haven't helped. And then at last, Mrs. Regan arrives. Lieutenant, have you talked to him? Yes, Mrs. Regan, but he won't listen to me. Maybe he'll listen to you. Well, what can I tell him? You can, you can tell him you love him. You can tell him whatever a woman tells the man she's in love with that'll, that'll make him listen. Oh. There's very little time left. You're the last chance we have. Mrs. Regan, before you talk to him, I think you ought to know something. Yes. We've offered to help him land the plane here. We can do that. We've done it in bad weather with people who've had very little experience. Chuck's never flown before. I know, Mrs. Regan, but the main thing is to get him to come over here and make his try where we can help him. I want you to understand that we can help him if he'll let us. Yes, yes, thank you. We're going to call him now, Mrs. Regan. And if he doesn't answer me, I'll give you the mic. You can call him, okay? Yes, 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 all right. All right. Hello, Regan. Regan, this is Tower calling you, Regan. Can you hear me? Regan, your wife is here and wants to talk to you. You try, Mrs. Regan. Maybe he's not even up there anymore. Maybe. Maybe. But all we can do is try, Mrs. Regan. Now, please. Like this? Yes, yes, that's right. Just talk into the mic and ask him to answer you. Yes. Chuck. Chuck, please. If you hear me, please answer me. I hear you, Lil. Listen, honey. Just go away, please, and let me work this out my own way. Chuck, they can help you land your plane if you let them. Chuck, please, please, darling, do what they tell you. Oh, well, baby, I, I, I'm sorry. I told you how I felt about the job. I, I told you what they were trying to do to me. Darling, they weren't doing anything personal to you. Maybe they didn't understand you, but... Uh, they, they talk, but they never come through. Well, I'm going to come through for them, Lil. I'm going to put this thing right down their throats. I'll give them something to remember Charlie Regan for. He's getting hysterical, Mrs. Oh. Regan. Make him mad or something. Say something to get him back. Chuck! Chuck, please! You can work somewhere else. You can get another job. You've got talent. And you're young. And I love you. I love you. Lil? Lil? Baby. Oh, listen, baby. I, I don't want to hurt you. I never wanted to do anything to hurt you. But, you know, i got to do this now. Don't you see? I, I can't quit this time. You won't be quitting. You'll be winning, Chuck. Don't you see, darling? You'll be winning. Oh, baby, I don't want to hurt you. Bring the plane over here, Chuck. Please let them help you. Please. But I... I, I don't know whether I can do it. I don't know whether I, I, I can get the thing down even if I can find the field. You can try, Chuck. You can try. Okay. Okay, I'll try it. And, and honey. Yes. Yes, darling. I, I'm, I'm not bad anymore. I'm just scared. And if I don't make it, please know I, I, I didn't want to hurt you. I, I, I never wanted to hurt you. I know. I know. I don't think you ever wanted to hurt anybody. We better try to get him over here. He hasn't got much gas left. Right. Take over, Sergeant. Talk him down. Yes, sir. Hello, Regan. Can you read me? Can you hear me all right? Yeah. I can hear you. Okay. Now, I want you to do just as I tell you. First, climb slowly up to 3,000 feet. Can you do that? Yeah, I think so. 
the thing says 1500 now. Is that the right one? It should be. Watch it as you climb and see if it goes up. Yeah, I've been watching it. If, if it goes up and down, what I do? Okay, that's the one. Now, can you see the field from where you are? Look around carefully and see if you can see a big spread out field with several runways. Long concrete strips. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. You're pretty far away, but I, I think you're what I see. Okay, now keep climbing and steer towards us. Just take it easy and I'll tell you what to do. Now, I want you to get used to some of the things you're going to have to do when you start letting down for your landing. First, there's a small lever or a wheel. You watch in complete fascination as the sergeant speaks. Find it calmly, quietly, almost hypnotically. It's a lever. He makes it sound easy, almost like driving a car, and you begin to have hope. You actually begin to dare to hope that you'll work this thing out, get this kid down out of trouble. You see what you're flying. You look at the clock, and it's 3:07. Yeah, it's sort of scattered houses and what looks like a dry riverbed. Fine. You're about halfway here. Now, when I tell you, I want you to slow down and pull that lever down. I'll tell you when, but think about it so you can do it. Hey, the engine's firing. I think it's quitting. Listen to me, Regan. If it quits, keep the nose down and don't slow down under 80. It's quit. It's, it's all finished. Head for the river bottom. Keep the speed at 80 and head for the river bottom. If you can get there, slow down by easing back on the wheel and let her lose speed when you're right on the sand. I don't think I can do it. Chuck, please try. Please. I love you. What's his chances, Sarge? He could make it. He could make it if he remembers to kill his speed. I don't know. Don't worry, he'll make it, Mrs. Regan. I, I'm sure he'll make it. <laughs> you say the words, but you don't feel them. You wish you could believe them, but who's kidding? A guy in an airplane crash landing in a riverbed. You know there's not much chance. And you stand there waiting. And time keeps running, but for you and Mrs. Regan, it's run out. And then the colonel picks up a phone that suddenly rings and he's excited. And he hands the phone to you and you listen to a voice on the other end. He came right down over to my house and banged down on the alfalfa. I thought he was going to take the roof off. How about the pilot? Is he hurt? No, I don't figure he is. Won't get out of the plane, but he don't seem to be hurt. Just sits there staring out the window. Plane ain't hurt much neither, as far as I can see. It just come down and skidded around a little and stopped. He must be a right good pilot to bring that thing down like that. R real good. Yeah. Hey, even better than you know. We'll be right out to get him, and thanks for calling. Well, you hang up the phone and reach for a cigarette. And you take the first real breath you've had since 11.44 that morning. Three hours and 47 minutes of fear and terror for hundreds of helpless people because some guy let his hate get away from him. 227 minutes of hate. And you look at Mrs. Regan and you remember the way she sounded when she talked to her husband. Somehow you feel that it'll work out okay for Chuck Regan. Now that he's got rid of his hate, 